This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. The present recording is by Raju. Email Ramina45 at hotmail.com. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 21 Little Emily. There was a servant in that house, a man who, I understood, was usually with Steerforth, and had come into his service at the university, who was in appearance a pattern of respectability. I believe there never existed in this station a more respectable looking man. He was taciturn, soft footed, very quiet in his manner, deferential, observant, always at hand when wanted and never near when not wanted. But his great claim to consideration was his respectability. He had not a pliant face, he had rather a stiff neck, rather a tight smooth head with short hair clinging to it at the sides, a soft way of speaking, with a peculiar habit of whispering the letter S so distinctly that he seemed to use it oftener than any other man, but every peculiarity that he had he made respectable. If his nose had been upside down, he would have made that respectable. He surrounded himself with an atmosphere of respectability and walked secure in it. It would have been next to impossible to suspect him of anything wrong. He was so thoroughly respectable. Nobody could have thought of putting him in a livery. He was so highly respectable. To have imposed any derogatory work upon him would have been to inflict a wanton insult on the feelings of a most respectable man. And of this, I noticed the women servants in the household were so intuitively conscious that they always did such work themselves, and generally while he read the paper by the pantry fire. Such a self-contained man I never saw, but in the quality, as in every other he possessed, he only seemed to be the more respectable. Even the fact that no one knew his Christian name seemed to form a part of his respectability. Nothing could be objected against his surname, Littimer, by which he was known. Peter might have been hanged, or Tom transported, but Littimer was perfectly respectable. It was occasioned, I suppose, by the reverend nature of respectability in the abstract, but I felt particularly young in this man's presence. How old he was himself, I could not guess, and that again went to his credit on the same score, for... In the calmness of respectability, he might have numbered fifty years as well as thirty. Littimer was in my room in the morning before I was up to bring me the reproachful shaving water and to put out my clothes. When I undrew the curtains and looked out of bed, I saw him in an equal temperature of respectability, unaffected by the east wind of January and not even breathing frostily, standing my boots right and left in the first dancing position, and blowing specks of dust off my coat as he laid it down like a baby. I gave him good morning, and asked him what o'clock it was. He took out his pocket, the most respectable hunting watch I ever saw, and preventing the spring with his thumb from opening far, looked in at the face as if he were consulting an oracular oyster, shut it up again, and said, If I please, it was half past eight. Mr. Steerforth will be glad to hear how you have rested, sir. Thank you, said I. Very well indeed. Is Mr. Steerforth quite well? Thank you, sir. Mr. Steerforth is tolerably well. Another of his characteristics. No use of superlatives. A cool, calm medium always. Is there anything more I can have the honor of doing for you, sir? The warning bell will ring at nine. The family take breakfast at half past nine. Nothing. I thank you. I thank you, sir, if you please. And with that, and with a little inclination of his head, when he passed the bedside as an apology for correcting me, he went out, shutting the door as delicately as if I had just fallen into a sweet sleep on which my life depended. Every morning we held exactly this conversation, never any more, never any less. And yet, invariably, however far I might have been lifted out of myself overnight, 
and advanced towards maturer years by Steerforth's companionship or Mrs. Steerforth's confidence or Miss Dartle's conversation, in the presence of this most respectable man, I became, as our smaller poets sing, a boy again. He got horses for us, and Steerforth, who knew everything, gave me lessons in riding. He provided foils for us, and Steerforth gave me lessons in fencing, gloves, and I began, the, of the same master, to improve in boxing. It gave me no manner of concern that Steerforth should find me a novice in these sciences, but I never could bear to show my want of skill before the respectable Littimer. I had no reason to believe that Littimer understood such arts himself. He never led me to suppose anything of the kind. By so much as the vibration of one of his respectable eyelashes, yet whenever he was by, while we were practicing, I felt myself the greenest and the most inexperienced of mortals. I am particular about this man because he made a particular effect on me at that time and because of what took place thereafter. The week passed away in a most delightful manner. It passed rapidly, as may be supposed, to one entranced as I was, and yet it gave me so many occasions for knowing Steerforth better and admiring him more in a thousand aspects, that at its close I seemed to have been with him for a much longer time. A dashing way he had of treating me like a plaything was more agreeable to me than any behavior he could have adopted. It reminded me of our old acquaintance. It seemed the natural sequel of it. It showed me that he was unchanged. It relieved me of any uneasiness I might have felt in comparing my merits with his and measuring my claims upon his friendship by any equal standard. Above all, it was a familiar, unrestrained, affectionate demeanor that he used towards no one else. As he had treated me at school differently from all the rest, I joyfully believed that he treated me in life unlike any other friend he had. I believed that I was nearer to his heart than any other friend, and my own heart warmed with attachment to him. He made up his mind to go with me into the country, and the day arrived for our departure. He had been doubtful at first whether to take Littimer or not, but desired to leave him at home. The respectable creature, satisfied with his lot, whatever it was, arranged our portmanteau on the little carriage that was to take us into London, as if they were intended to defy the shocks of ages, and received my modesty proffered donation with perfect tranquility. We bade adieu to Mrs. Steerforth and Miss Dartle, with many thanks on my part and much kindness on the devoted mothers. The last thing I saw was Latimer's unruffled eye, fraught as I fancied, with the silent conviction that I was very young indeed. What I felt in returning so auspiciously to the old familiar places, I shall not endeavor to describe. We went down by the mail. I was so concerned, I recollect, even for the honor of Yarmouth, that when Steerforth said, as we drove through its dark streets to the inn, that, as well as he could make out, it was a good, queer, out-of-the-way kind of hole. I was highly pleased. We went to bed on our arrival. I observed a pair of dirty shoes and gaiters in connection with my old friend, the dolphin, as we passed the door, and breakfasted late in the morning. Steerforth, who was in great spirits, had been strolling about the beach before I was up, and had made acquaintance, he said, with half the boatmen in the place. Moreover, he had seen, in the distance, what he was sure must be the identical house of Mr. Peggotty, with smoke coming out of the chimney, and had had a great mind, he told me, to walk in and swear he was myself grown out of knowledge. When do you propose to introduce me there, Daisy? he said. I am at your disposal. Make your own arrangements. Why? I was thinking that this evening would be a good time, Steerforth, when they are all sitting round the fire. I should like you to see it when it is snug. It is such a curious place. So be it, returned Steerforth, this evening. I shall not give them any notice that we are here, you know, said I, delighted. We must take them by surprise. Oh, of course, it's no fun, said Steerforth, unless we take them by surprise. Let us see the natives in their aboriginal condition. 
though they are that sort of people that you mentioned, I retired. Aha! What? You recollect my skirmishes with Rosa, do you? He exclaimed with a quick look. Confound the girl. I am half afraid of her. She is like a goblin to me. But never mind her. Now, what are you going to do? You are going to see your nurse, I suppose. Why, yes, I said, I must see Peggotty first of all. Well, replies Steerforth, looking at his watch. Suppose I deliver you up to be cried over for a couple of hours. Is that long enough? I answered laughing that I thought we might get through it in that time, but that he must come also, for he would find that his renown had preceded him and that he was almost as great a personage as I was. I'll come anywhere you like, said Steerforth, or do anything you like. Tell me where to come to, and in two hours I'll produce myself in any state you please, sentimental or comical. I gave him minute directions for finding the residence of Mr. Barkis, carrier to Blunderstone, and elsewhere, and on this understanding went out alone. There was a sharp bracing air, the ground was dry, the sea was crisp and clear, the sun was diffusing abundance of light, if not much warmth, and everything was fresh and lively. I was so fresh and lively myself, in the pleasure of being there, that I could have stopped the people in the streets and shaken hands with them. The streets look small, of course. The streets that we have only seen as children always do, I believe, when we go back to them. But I had forgotten nothing in them and found nothing changed until I came to Mr. Omer's shop. Omer and Joram was now written up where Omer used to be, but the inscription Draper, Taylor, Haberdasher, Funeral Furnisher and remained as it was. My footsteps seemed to tend so naturally to the shop door after I had read these words from over the way that I went across the road and looked in. There was a pretty woman at the back of the shop, dancing a little child in her arms, while another little fellow clung to her apron. I had no difficulty in recognizing either Minnie or Minnie's children. The glass door of the parlor was not open, but in the workshop across the yard I could faintly hear the old tune playing as if it had never left off. Is Mr. Omer at home? said I, entering. I should like to see him for a moment, if he is. Oh, yes, sir, he is at home, said Minnie. The weather don't suit his asthma out of doors. Joe, call your grandfather. The little fellow who was holding her apron gave such a lusty shout that the sound of it made him bashful and he buried his face in her skirts to her great admiration. I heard a heavy puffing and blowing coming towards us and soon Mr. Omer, shorter winded than of yore, but not much older looking, stood before me. Servant, sir, said Mr. Omer, what can I do for you, sir? You can shake hands with me, Mr. Omer, if you please, said I, putting out my own. You are very good natured to me once, when I am afraid I didn't show that I thought so. Was I though, returned the old man, I am glad to hear it, but I don't remember when. Are you sure it was me? Quite. I think my memory has got as short as my breath, said Mr. Omer, looking at me and shaking his head, for I don't remember you. Don't you remember your coming to the coach to meet me, and my having breakfast here, and our riding out to Blunderstone together, you and I, and Mrs. Joram, and Mr. Joram too, who wasn't her husband then? Why? Lord bless my soul, exclaimed Mr. Omar after being thrown by his surprise into a fit of coughing. You don't say so? Minnie, my dear, you recollect? Dear me, yes, the party was a lady, I think. My mother, I rejoined. To be sure, said Mr. Omar, touching my waistcoat with his forefinger. And there was a little child too. There was two parties. The little party was laid along the other party. Over the blunderstone it was, of course. Dear me, and how have you been since? Very well. I thanked him, as I hoped he had been too. Oh, nothing to grumble at, you know, said Mr. Omer. I find my breath gets short, but it seldom gets longer as a man gets older. I take it as it comes, and make the most of it. That is the best way, ain't it? 
Mr. Romer coughed again, in consequence of laughing, and was assisted out of his fit by his daughter, who now stood close beside us, chancing her smallest child on the counter. Dear me, said Mr. Omer, yes, to be sure, two parties, why in that very ride, if you will believe me, the day was named for my Minnie to marry Joram. Do name it, sir, says Joram. Yes, two father, says Minnie, and now he has come into the business, and look here, the youngest. Minnie laughed and stroked her banded hair upon her temples, as her father put one of his fat fingers into the hand of the child she was dancing on the counter. Two parties, of course, said Mr. Omer, nodding his head retrospectively. Exactly so, and Joram's at work, at this minute, on a grey one with silver nails, not this measurement, the measurement of the dancing child upon the counter, by a good two inches. Will you take something? I thanked him, but declined. Let me see, Mr. Omer. Barkis, the carrier's wife, Pegotis, the boatman's sister, she had something to do with your family. She was in service there, sure? My answering in the affirmative gave him great satisfaction. I believe my breath will get long next. My memory is getting so much so, said Mr. Omer. Well, sir, we have got a young relation of hers here, under articles to us that has as elegant a taste in the dressmaking business. I assure you, I don't believe there is a duchess in England can touch her. Not little Emily, I said, involuntarily. Emily is her name, said Mr. Omar, and she is little too. But if you believe me, she has such a face of her own that half the women in this town are mad against her. Nonsense, father, cried Minnie. My dear, said Mr. Omar, I don't say it is the case with you, winking at me, but I say that half the women in Yarmouth, ah, and in five mile round, are mad against that girl. Then she should have kept her old station in life, father, said Minnie, and not have given them any hold to talk about her, and then they couldn't have done it. Couldn't have done it, my dear, retorted Mr. Omer. Couldn't have done it. Is that your knowledge of life? What's there that any woman couldn't do, that she shouldn't do, especially on the subject of another woman's good looks? I really thought it was all over with Mr. Omar. After he had uttered this libellous pleasantry, he coughed to that extent, and his breath eluded all his attempts to recover it with that obstinacy that I fully expected to see his head go down behind the counter and his little black breeches, with the rusty little bunches of ribbons at the knees, come quivering up in a last ineffectual struggle. At length, however, he got better, though he still panted hard, and was so exhausted that he was obliged to sit on the stool of the shop desk. You see, he said, wiping his head and breathing with difficulty, she hasn't taken much to any companions here. She hasn't taken kindly to any particular acquaintances and friends, not to mention sweethearts. In consequence, an ill-natured story got about that Emily wanted to be a lady. Now my opinion is that it came into circulation principally on account of her sometimes saying at the school that if she was a lady, she would like to do so and so for her uncle, don't you see, and buy him such and such fine things. I assure you, Mr. Omar, he has said so to me, I returned eagerly, when we were both children. Mr. Omar nodded his head and rubbed his chin. Just so. Then out of a very little, he, she could dress herself, you see, better than most others could out of a deal, and that made things unpleasant. Moreover, she was rather what might be called wayward. I'll go so far as to say what I should call wayward myself said Mr. Omar. Didn't know her own mind quite, a little spoiled, and couldn't at first exactly bind herself down. No more than what was ever said against her. Minnie? No, father, said Mrs. Joram. That's the worst I believe. So when she got a situation, said Mr. Omar, to keep a fractious old lady company, they didn't very well agree, and she didn't stop. At last she came here, apprenticed for three years, 
Nearly two of them are over, and she has been as good a girl as ever was. What any six? Minnie, is she worth any six now? Yes, father, replied Minnie. Never say I detracted from her. Very good, said Mr. Omar. That's right. And so, young gentleman, he added, after a few moments, further rubbing of his chin, that you may not consider me long-winded as well as short breath. I believe that's all about it. As they had spoken in a subdued tone while speaking of Emily, I had no doubt that she was near. On my asking now, if that were not so, Mr. Omer nodded yes, and nodded towards the door of the parlour. My hurried inquiry, if I might peep in, was answered with a free permission, and looking through the glass, I saw her sitting at her work. I saw her, a most beautiful little creature, with a cloudless blue eyes, that had looked into my childish heart, turned laughingly upon another child of Minnie's, who was playing near her, with enough of willfulness in her bright face to justify what I had heard, with much of the old capricious coyness lurking in it, but with nothing in her pretty looks, I am sure, but with what was meant for goodness and for happiness, and what was on a good and happy course. The tune across the yard that seemed as if it never had left off, alas, it was the tune that never does leave off, was beating softly all the while. Wouldn't you like to step in, said Mr. Omar, and speak to her? Walk in and speak to her, sir. Make yourself at home. I was too bashful to do so then. I was afraid of confusing her and I was no less afraid of confusing myself, but I informed myself of the hour at which she left off an evening in order that our visit might be timed accordingly, and taking leave of Mr. Omer and his pretty daughter and her little children, went away to my dear old Peggotty's. Here she was in the tiled kitchen cooking dinner. The moment I knocked at the door, she opened it and asked me what I pleased to want. I looked at her with a smile, but she gave me no smile in return. I had never ceased to write to her, but it must have been seven years since we had met. Is Mr. Barkis at home, ma'am? I said, feigning to speak roughly to her. He is at home, sir, returned Peggotty. But he is bad abed with the rheumatics. Don't he go over to Blunderstone now? I asked. When he is well, he do, she answered. Do you ever go there, Mrs. Barkis? She looked at me more attentively, and I noticed a quick movement of her hands towards each other. Because I want to ask a question about a house there that they call the, what is it, the rookery, said I. She took a step backward and put out her hands in an undesired, frightened way, as if to keep me off. Peggotty? I cried to her. She cried, My darling boy, and we both burst into tears and were locked in one another's arms. What extravagances she committed, what laughing and crying over me, what pride she showed, what joy, what sorrow, that she whose pride and joy I might have been could never hold me in a fond embrace. I have not the heart to tell. I was troubled with no misgiving that it was young in me to respond to her emotions. I had never laughed and cried in all my life, I dare say, not even to her more freely than I did that morning. Barkis will be so glad, said Peggotty, wiping her eyes with her apron, that it will do him more good than pints of liniment. May I go and tell him you are here? Will you come up and see him, my dear? Of course I would. But Peggotty could not get out of the room as easily as she meant to, for, as often as she got to the door and looked round at me, she came back again to have another laugh and another cry upon my shoulder. At last, to make the matter easier, I went upstairs with her, and having waited outside for a minute, while she said a word of preparation to Mr. Barkis, presented myself before that invalid. He received me with absolute enthusiasm. He was too rheumatic to be shaken hands with, but he begged me to shake the tassel on the top of his nightcap 
which I did most cordially. When I sat down by the side of the bed, he said that it did him a world of good to feel as if he was driving me on the Blunderstone Road again. As he lay in bed, face upward and so covered, with that exception that he seemed to be nothing but a face, like a conventional cherubim, he looked the queerest object I ever beheld. What name was it, as I wrote up in the cart, sir? said Mr. Barkis, with a slow rheumatic smile. Ah, Mr. Barkis, we had some grave talks about that matter, hadn't we? I was willing a long time, sir, said Mr. Barkis. A long time, said I. And I don't regret it, said Mr. Barkis. Do you remember what you told me once about her making all the apple pasties and doing all the cooking? Yes, very well, I returned. It was as true, said Mr. Barkis, as turnips is. It was as true, said Mr. Barkis, nodding his nightcap, which was his only means of emphasis, as taxes is, and nothing is truer than them. Mr. Barkis turned his eyes upon me, as if for my assent to this result of his reflections in bed, and I gave it. Nothing is truer than them, repeated Mr. Barkis. A man as poor as I am finds that out in his mind when he is laid up. I am a very poor man, sir. I am sorry to hear it, Mr. Barkis. A very poor man indeed I am, said Mr. Barkis. Here his right hand came slowly and feebly from under the bedclothes, and with a purposeless, uncertain grasp took hold of a stick, which was loosely tied to the side of the bed. After some poking about with his instrument, in the course of which his face assumed a variety of distracted expressions, Mr. Barkis poked it against a box, an end of which had been visible to me all the time. Then his face became composed. Old clothes, said Mr. Barkis. Oh, said I. I wish it was money, sir, said Mr. Barkis. I wish it was, indeed, said I. But it ain't, said Mr. Barkis, opening both his eyes as wide as he possibly could. I expressed myself quite sure of that, and Mr. Barkis, turning his eyes more gently to his wife, said, She is the usefulest and best of women, C. P. Barkis. All the praise that anyone can give to C. P. Barkis, she deserves, and more. My dear, you will get a dinner today. For company, something good to eat and drink, will you? I should have protested against this unnecessary demonstration in my honor. But that I saw Peggotty on the opposite side of the bed, extremely anxious I should not. So I held my peace. I got a trifle of money somewhere about me, my dear, said Mr. Barkis. But I am a little tired. If you and Mr. David will leave me for a short nap, I will try and find it when I wake. We left the room in compliance with this request. When we got outside the door, Peggotty informed me that Mr. Barkis, being a little nearer than he used to be, always resorted to this same device before producing a single coin from his store, and that he endured unheard of agonies in crawling out of bed alone and taking it from that unlucky box. In effect, we presently heard him uttering suppressed groans of the most dismal nature, as this magpie proceeding rocked him every joint. But while Peggotty's eyes were full of compassion for him, she said his generous impulse would do him good, and it was better not to check it. So he groaned on, until he got into bed again, suffering. I have no doubt a martyr dam, and then called us in, pretending to have just woke up from a refreshing sleep, and to produce a guinea from under his pillow. His satisfaction in which happy imposition on us, and in having preserved the impenetrable secret of the box, appeared to be sufficient compensation to him for all his tortures. I prepared Peggotty for Steerforth's arrival, and it was not long before he came. I am persuaded she knew no difference between his having been a personal benefactor of hers and a kind friend to me, and that she would have received him with the utmost gratitude and devotion in any case. But his easy, spirited good humor, his genial manner, his handsome looks, his natural gift of adapting himself to whomsoever he pleased, and making direct when he cared to do it, 
to the main point of interest in anybody's heart, bound her to him wholly in five minutes. His manner to me alone would have won her. But through all these causes combined, I sincerely believe she had a kind of adoration for him before he left the house that night. He stayed there with me to dinner. If I were to say willingly, I should not have expressed how readily and gaily. He went into Mr. Barkey's room like light and air, brightening and refreshing it as if he were healthy weather. There was no noise, no effort, no consciousness in anything he did, but in everything an indescribable lightness, a seeming impossibility of doing anything else or doing anything better, which was so graceful, so natural and agreeable that it overcomes me even now in the remembrance. We made merry in the little parlour where the book of martyrs, unthumbed since my time, was laid out upon the desk as of old, and where I now turned over its terrific pictures, remembering the old sensations they had awakened, but not feeling them. When Peggotty spoke of what she called my room, and of its being ready for me at night, and of her hoping I would occupy it before I could so much as look at Steerforth, hesitating, he was possessed of the whole case. Of course, he said, you will sleep here while we stay, and I shall sleep at the hotel. But to bring you so far I return, and to separate seems bad companionship, Steerforth. Why, in the name of heaven, where do you naturally belong? He said. What is seems, compared to that, it was settled at once. He maintained all his delightful qualities to the last, until we started forth at eight o'clock for Mr. Peggotty's boat. Indeed, they were more and more brightly exhibited as the hours went on, for I thought even then, and I have no doubt now, that the consciousness of success in his determination to please inspired him with a new delicacy of perception and made it subtle as it was more easy to him. If anyone had told me then that all this was a brilliant game played for the excitement of the moment, for the employment of high spirits, in the thoughtless love of superiority, in a mere wasteful, careless course of winning, what was worthless to him, and next minute thrown away. I say, if anyone had told me such a lie that night, I wonder in what manner of receiving it my indignation would have found a vent. Probably only in an increase, had that been possible, of the romantic feelings of fidelity and friendship with which I walked beside him over the dark, wintry sands towards the old boat, the wind sighing around us even more mournfully than it had sighed and moaned upon the night when I first darkened Mr. Peggotty's door. This is a wild kind of place, dear Forth, is it not? Dismal enough in the dark, he said, and the sea roars as if it were hungry for us. Is that the boat where I see a light yonder? That's the boat, said I. And it is the same I saw this morning, he returned. I came straight to it by instinct, I suppose. We said no more as we approached the light, but made softly for the door. I laid my hand upon the latch, and whispering Steerforth to keep close to me, went in. A murmur of voice had been audible on the outside, and at the moment of our entrance a clapping of hands, which later noise. I was surprised to see, proceeded from the generally disconsolate Mrs. Gummidge. But Mrs. Gummidge was not the only person there who was unusually excited. Mr. Peggotty, his face lighted up with uncommon satisfaction, and laughing with all his might, held his rough arms wide open, as if for little Emily to run into them. Ham, with a mixed expression in his face of admiration, exultation, and a lumbering sort of bashfulness that sat upon him very well, held little Emily by the hand, as if he were presenting her to Mr. Peggotty. Little Emily herself, blushing and shy, but delighted with Mr. Peggotty's delight, as her joyous eyes expressed, was stopped by our entrance, for she saw us first, in the very act of springing from ham to nestle in Mr. Peggotty's embrace. In the first glimpse we had of them all, and at the moment of our passing from the dark, cold night into warm, light room, this was the way in which they were all employed, Mrs. Gummidge in the background, clapping her hands like a mad woman. 
the little picture was so instantaneously dissolved by our going in that one might have doubted whether it had ever been. I was in the midst of the astonished family face to face with Mr. Peggotty and holding out my hand to him when Ham shouted, Master Davy, it's Master Davy. In a moment we were all shaking hands with one another and asking one another how we did and telling one another how glad we were to meet and all talking at once. Mr. Peggotty was so proud and overjoyed to see us that he did not know what to say or do, but kept over and over again shaking hands with me, and then with Steerforth, and then with me, and then ruffling taggy hair all over his head, and laughing with such glee and triumph that it was a treat to see him. Why that you two gentlemen, gentlemen Grau, should come to this here roof tonight, of all nights in my life, said Mr. Peggotty, is such a thing as never happened afore, I do rightly believe. Emily, my darling, come here, come here, my little witch. There's Master Davy's friend, my dear. There's the gentleman as you have heard on, Emily. He comes to see you along with Master Davy, on the brightest night of your uncle's life as ever was or will be. Gom the tea the other one, and roar for it. After delivering this speech all in a breath, and with extraordinary animation and pleasure, Mr. Peggotty put one of his large hands rapturously on each side of his niece's face, and kissing it a dozen times, laid it with a gentle pride and love upon his broad chest, and patted it as if his hand had been a lady's. Then he let her go, and as she ran into the little chamber where I used to sleep, looked round upon us, quite hot and out of breath with this uncommon satisfaction. If you two gentlemen, gentlemen growled now, and such gentlemen, said Mr. Pigotti. So they are, so they are, cried Ham. Well said, so they are. Master Davy bore. Gentlemen growled, so they are. If you two gentlemen, gentlemen growled, said Mr. Pigotti, don't excuse me for being in a state of mind when you understand matters. I will ask your pardon. Emily, my dear, she knows I am going to tell. Here his delight broke out again, and has made off. Would he be so good as look after her, mother, for a minute? Mrs. Gummidge nodded and disappeared. If this ain't, said Mr. Peggotty, sitting down among us by the fire, the brightest night of my life, I am a shellfish by two and more, I can't say. This here little Emily, sir, in a low voice to steer forth, her, as you see, a blushing here just now. Steerforth only nodded, but with such a pleased expression of interest and of participation in Mr. Peggotty's feelings that the latter answered him as if he had spoken. To be sure, said Mr. Peggotty, that's her, and so she is. Thank you, sir. Ham nodded to me several times, as if he would have said so too. This here little Emily of ours, said Mr. Peggotty, has been in our house, what I suppose. I am an ignorant man, but that's my belief. No one but a little bright-eyed creature can be in a house. She ain't my child. I never had one, but I couldn't love her more. You understand, I couldn't do it. I quite understand, said Steerforth. I know you do, sir, returned Mr. Peggotty, and thank you again. Must Davy, he can remember what she was. You may judge for your own self what she is, but neither of you can fully know what she has been, is, and will be to my loving heart. I am rough, sir, said Mr. Peggotty. I am as rough as a sea porcupine, but no one, unless, perhaps, it is a woman can know. I think what our little Emily is to me, and betwixt ourselves, sinking his voice lower yet, that woman's name ain't Miss Gummidge neither, though she has a word of Mary's. Mr. Pagotti ruffled his hair again with both hands as a further preparation for what he was going to say, and went on with a hand upon each of his knees. There was a certain person as had knowed our Emily from the time when, when her father was drowned, 
as I'd seen her constant, when a baby, when a young girl, when a woman, not much of a person to look at. He weren't, said Mr. Poggerty. Something, oh, my own Bill, rough, a good deal. Oh, this old oh, wester in him, very salt, but on the whole, a honest sort of a chap, with, with his art in the right place. I thought I had never seen Ham grin to anything like the extent to which he sat grinning at us now. What does this here blessed tarpaulin go and do? said Mr. Peggotty with his face one high noon of enjoyment. But he loses that, their art of his, to our little Emily. He follows her about, he makes himself a sort of servant to her. He loses in a great measure his relish for his victuals, and the long run he makes it clear to me what's amiss. Now I could wish myself, you see, that our little Emily was in a far way of being married. I could wish to see her at all events, under articles to an honest man, as had a right to defend her. I don't know how long I may live, or how soon I may die. But I know that if I was capsized any night in a gale of wind in Yarmouth Road's ear, and was to see the town lights shining for the last time over the rollers, as I couldn't make a head against, I could go down quite uh, for thinking there is a man ashore there, I am true to my little Emily. God bless her, and no wrong can touch my Emily, while so be as that man lives. Mr. Pegotti, in simple earnestness, waved his right arm, as if he were waving it at the town lights for the last time, and then exchanging a nod with Ham, whose eye he caught, proceeded as before. Well, I counsels him to speak to Emily. He is big enough, but he is bashfuller than a little urn, and he don't like, so I speak. What him, says Emily, him that I have knowed, so intimate, so many years, and like so much. Oh, uncle, I never can have him. He is such a good fellow. I gives her a kiss, and I says no more to her than, My dear, you are right to speak out. You are to choose for yourself. You are as free as a little bird. Then I always to him, and I says, I wish it could have been so, but it can't. But you can both be as you was. And what I say to you is, be as you was with her like a man. He says to me, a shaking of my hand, I will, he says, and he was honorable and manful for two years going on and was just the same at home here as afore. Mr. Pegotti's face, which had varied in its expression with the various stages of his narrative, now resumed all its former triumphant delight as he laid a hand upon my knee and a hand upon Steerforth's, previously wetting them both for the greater emphasis of the action, and divided the following speech between us. All of a sudden, one evening, as it might be tonight, comes little Emily from her work, and him with her. They ain't so much in that, you will say. No, because he takes care on her, like a brother, after dark, and indeed afore dark, and at all times. But this tarpaulin chap, he takes hold of her hand, and he cries out to me, joyful, Look here, this is to my little wife. And she says, half bold and half shy, and half a laughing and a half a crying, Yes, uncle, if you please. If I please, cried Mr. Peggotty, rolling his head in an ecstasy of the idea. Lord! as if I should do anything else. If you please, I am steadier now, and I have thought better of it, and I will be as good a little wife as I can to him, for he is a dear good fellow. Then Mrs. Gummidge, she claps her hands like a play, and you come in. There the murders out, said Mr. Pegotti. You come in. It took place this here present hour and here is the man that I will marry her. The minute she is out of her time. Ham staggered as well he might under the blow Mr. Pegotti dealt him 
in his unbounded joy as a mark of confidence and friendship, but feeling called upon to say something to us, he said with much faltering and great difficulty, She want no higher than you was, must Davy. When you first come, when I thought what she would grow up to be, I see her grown up, gentlemen, like a flower. I would lay down my life for her, Master Davy. Oh, most content and cheerful. She is more to me, gentlemen, than she is all to me that ever I can want, and more than ever I, than ever I could say, I, I love her true. There ain't a gentleman in all the land, nor it sailing upon all the sea, that can love his lady more than I love her, though there's many a common man would say better what he meant. I thought it affecting to see such a sturdy fellow as Ham was now, trembling in the strength of what he felt for the pretty little creature who had won his heart. I thought the simple confidence reposed in us by Mr. Peggotty and by himself was in itself affecting. I was affected by the story altogether. How far my emotions were influenced by the recollections of my childhood, I don't know. Whether I had come there with any lingering fancy that I was still to love little Emily, I don't know. I know that I was filled with pleasure by all this, but at first, with an indescribably sensitive pleasure that a very little would have changed to pain. Therefore, if it had depended upon me to touch the prevailing card among them with any skill, I should have made a poor hand of it. But it depended upon Steerford, and he did it with such address that in a few minutes we were all as easy and as happy as it was possible to be. Mr. Peggotty, he said, you are a thoroughly good fellow and deserve to be as happy as you are tonight. My hand upon it. Ham, I give you joy, my boy. My hand upon that too. Daisy, stir the fire and make it a brisk one. And Mr. Peggotty, unless you can induce your gentle niece to come back, for whom I vacate this seat in the corner, I shall go. Any gap at your fireside on such a night such a gap, least of all, I wouldn't make for the wealth of the Indies. So Mr. Peggotty went into my old room to fetch little Emily. At first little Emily didn't like to come, and then Ham went. Presently they brought her to the fireside, very much confused and very shy. But she soon became more assured when she found how gently and respectfully Steerforth spoke to her, how skillfully he avoided anything that would embarrass her how he talked to Mr. Peggotty of boats and ships and tides and fish, how he referred to me about the time when he had seen Mr. Peggotty at Salem House, how delighted he was with the boat and all belonging to it, how lightly and easily he carried on until he brought us by degrees into a charmed circle, and we were all talking away without any reserve. Emily, indeed, sat little all the evening, but she looked and listened, and her face got animated, and she was charming. Steerforth told a story of a dismal shipwreck, which arose out of his talk with Mr. Peggotty, as if he saw it all before him, and little Emily's eyes were fastened on him all the time, as if she saw it too. He told us a merry adventure of his own, as a relief to that, with as much gaiety as if the narrative were as fresh to him as it was to us and little Emily laughed until the boat rang with musical sounds. And we all laughed, Steerforth too, in irresistible sympathy with what was so pleasant and light-hearted. He got Mr. Peggotty to sing, or rather to roar, when the stormy winds do blow, do blow, do blow. And he sang a sailor's song himself, so pathetically and beautifully that I could have almost fancied that the real wind creeping sorrowfully round the house and murmuring low through our unbroken silence was there to listen. As to Mrs. Gummidge, he roused the victim of dependency with a success never attained by anyone else, so Mr. Peggotty informed me, since the disease of the old one. He left her so little leisure for being miserable that she said next day she thought she must have been bewitched. But 
he set up no monopoly of the general attention or the conversation. When little Emily grew more courageous and talked, but still bashfully across the fire to me, of her old wanderings upon the beach to pick up shells and pebbles, and when I asked her if she recollected how I used to be devoted to her, and when we both laughed and reddened, casting these looks back on the pleasant old times, so unreal to look at now, he was silent and attentive, and observed us thoughtfully. She sat at this time, and all the evening, on the old locker in her old little corner by the fire, ham beside her, where I used to sit. I could not satisfy myself, whether it was in her own little tormenting way, or in a maidenly reserve before us, that she kept quite close to the wall, and away from him, but I observed that she did so all the evening. As I remember, it was almost midnight when we took our leave. We had some biscuit and dried fish for supper, and Steerforth had produced from his pocket a full flask of Hollands, which we mean, I may say, we men now, without a blush, had emptied. We parted merrily, and as they all stood crowded round the door to light us as far as they could upon our road, I saw the sweet blue eyes of little Emily peeping after us from behind Ham, and heard her soft voice calling to us to be careful how we went. A most engaging little beauty, said Steerforth, taking my arm. Well, it's a quaint place, and they are quaint company, and it's quite a new sensation to mix with them. How fortunate we are too, I returned, to have arrived to witness their happiness in that intended marriage. I never saw people so happy. How delightful to see it, and to be made the sharers in their honest joy, as we have been. Thus rather a chuckle-headed fellow for the girl, isn't he? said Steerforth. He had been so hearty with him and with them all, that I felt a shock in this unexpected and cold reply. But turning quickly upon him, and seeing a laugh in his eyes, I answered much relieved. Ah, Steerforth, it's well for you to joke about the poor. You may skirmish with Miss Dartle, or try to hide your sympathies in jest for me. But I know better. When I see how perfectly you understand them, how exquisitely you can enter into happiness like this plain fisherman's, or humor a love like my old nurse's, I know that there is not a joy or sorrow, not an emotion of such people that can be indifferent to you, and I admire and love you for it, steer forth twenty times the more. He stopped, and looking in my face, said, Daisy, I believe you are in earnest and are good. I wish we all were. Next moment he was gaily singing Mr. Peggotty's song as we walked at a round place back to your mouth. End of chapter 21
and when he went out, boating with Mr. Peggotty, which was a favorite amusement of his, I generally remained ashore. My occupation of Peggotty's spare room put a constraint upon me, from which he was free. For, knowing how assiduously she attended on Mr. Barkis all day, I did not like to remain out late at night, whereas Steerforth, lying at the inn, had nothing to consult but his own humor. Thus it came about that I heard of his making little treats for the fisherman at Mr. Peggotty's house of call, the willing mine, after I was in bed, and of his being afloat, wrapped in fisherman's clothes, whole moonlight nights, and coming back when the morning tide was at flood. By this time, however, I knew that his restless nature and bold spirits delighted to find a vent in rough toil and hard weather, as in any other means of excitement that presented itself freshly to him. So none of his proceedings surprised me. Another cause of our being sometimes apart was that I had naturally an interest in going over to Blunderstone and revisiting the old familiar scenes of my childhood, while Steerforth, after being there once, had naturally no great interest in going there again. Hence, on three or four days that I can at once recall, we went our several ways after an early breakfast and met again at a late dinner. I had no idea how he employed his time in the interval, beyond a general knowledge that he was very popular in the place and had twenty means of actively diverting himself where another man might not have found one. For my own part, my occupation in my solitary pilgrimages was to recall every yard of the old road as I went along it, and to haunt the old spots of which I never tired. I haunted them as my memory had often done, and lingered among them as my younger thoughts had lingered when I was far away. The grave beneath the tree, where both my parents lay, on which I had looked out when it was my father's only, with such curious feelings of compassion, and by which I had stood so desolate when it was opened to receive my pretty mother and her baby, the grave which Peggotty's own faithful care had ever since kept neat and made a garden of, I walked near by the hour. It lay a little off the churchyard path in a quiet corner, not so far removed, but I could read the names upon the stone as I walked to and fro startled by the sound of the church bell when it struck the hour, for it was like a departed voice to me. My reflections at these times were always associated with the figure I was to make in life and the distinguished things I was to do. My echoing footsteps went to no other tune, but were as constant to that as if I had come home to build my castles in the air at a living mother's side. There were great changes in my old home. The ragness so long deserted by the roots were gone, and the trees were lopped and topped out of their remembered shapes. The garden had run wild, and half the windows of the house were shut up. It was occupied, but only by a poor lunatic gentleman and the people who took care of him. He was always sitting at my little window, looking out into the churchyard, and I wondered whether his rambling thoughts ever went upon any of the fancies that used to occupy mine on the rosy mornings when I peeped out of that same little window in my night clothes and saw the sheep quietly feeding in the light of the rising sun. Our old neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Graper, were gone to South America and the rain had made its way through the roof of their empty house and stained the outer walls. Mr. Chillip was married again to a tall raw-boned, high-nosed wife, and they had a weazen little baby, and a heavy head that it couldn't hold up, and two weak staring eyes, with which it seemed to be always wondering why it had ever been born. It was with a singular jumble of sadness and pleasure that I used to linger about my native place until the reddening winter sun admonished me that it was time to start on my returning walk. But when the place was left behind, and especially when Steerforth and I were happily 
seated over our dinner by a blazing fire. It was delicious to think of having been there. So it was, though in a softened degree, when I went to my neat room at night, and, turning over the leaves of the crocodile book, which was always there upon a little table, remembered with a grateful heart how blessed I was in having such a friend as Steerforth, such a friend as Peggotty, and such a substitute for what I had lost as my excellent and generous aunt. My nearest way to Yarmouth in coming back from these long walks was by a ferry. It landed me on the flat between the town and the sea, which I could make straight across, and so save myself a considerable circuit by the high road. Mr. Peggotty's house being on that waste place, and not a hundred yards out of my track, I always looked in as I went by. Steerforth was pretty sure to be there expecting me, and we went on together through the frosty air and gathering fog towards the twinkling lights of the town. One dark evening, when I was later than usual, for I had that day been making my parting visit to Blunderstone, as we were now about to return home, I found him alone in Mr. Pegotti's house, sitting thoughtfully before the fire. He was so intent upon his own reflections that he was quite unconscious of my approach. This, indeed, he might easily have been, if he had been less absorbed, for footsteps fell noiselessly on the sandy ground outside, but even my entrance failed to rouse him. I was standing close to him, looking at him, and still, with a heavy brow, he was lost in his meditations. He gave such a start when I put my hand upon his shoulder that he made me start too. You come upon me, he said almost angrily, like a reproachful ghost. I was obliged to announce myself. Somehow I replied, Have I called you down from the stars? No, he answered, No. Up from anywhere then, said I, taking my seat near him. I was looking at the pictures in the fire, he returned. But you are spoiling them for me, said I, as he stirred it quickly with a piece of burning wood, striking out of it a train of red hot sparks that went carrying up the little chimney and roaring out into the air. You would not have seen them, he returned. I detest this mongrel time, neither day or night. How late you are! Where have you been? I have been taking leave of my usual walk, said I. And I have been sitting here, said Steerforth, glancing round the room, thinking that all the people we found so glad on the night of our coming down might, to judge from the present wasted air of the place, be dispersed, or dead, or come to, I don't know, what harm. David, I wish to God I had had a judicious father these last twenty years. My dear Steerforth, what is the matter? I wish with all my soul I had been better guided, he exclaimed. I wish with all my soul I could guide myself better. There was a passionate dejection in his manner that quite amazed me. He was more unlike himself than I could have supposed possible. It would be better to be this poor Peggotty or his lout of a nephew, he said, getting up and leaning moodily against the chimney piece with his face towards the fire, than to be myself twenty times richer and twenty times wiser, and be the torment to myself that I have been in this devil's bark of a boat within the last half hour. I was so confounded by the alteration in him that at first I could only observe him in silence as he stood leaning his head upon his hand and looking gloomily down at the fire. At length I begged him with all the earnestness I felt, to tell me what had occurred to cross him so unusually, and to let me sympathize with him, if I could not hope to advise him. Before I had well concluded, he began to laugh, fretfully at first, but soon with returning gaiety. Thut! It's nothing, Daisy, nothing, he replied. I told you at the inn in London, I am heavy company for myself sometimes. I have been a nightmare to myself just now. Must have had one, I think. At odd dull times, nursery tales come up into the memory, unrecognized for what they are. I believe I have been confounding myself with the bad boy 
who didn't care, and became food for lions, a grander kind of going to the dogs, I suppose. What old women call the horrors have been creeping over me from head to foot. I have been afraid of myself. You are afraid of nothing else, I think, said I. Perhaps not, and yet may have enough to be afraid of too, he answered. Well, so it goes by. I am not about to be hipped again, David. But I tell you, my good fellow, once more, that it would have been well for me, and for more than me, if I had had steadfast and judicious father. His face was always full of expression, but I never saw it express such a dark kind of earnestness as when he said these words with his glance bent on the fire. So much for that, he said, making as if he tossed something light into the air with his hand. Why, being gone, I am a man again, like Macbeth, and now for dinner. If I have not, Macbeth-like, broken up the feast with most admired disorder, Daisy. But where are they all, I wonder, said I. God knows, said Steerforth. After strolling to the ferry looking for you, I strolled in here and found the place deserted. That set me thinking, and you found me thinking. The advent of Mrs. Gummidge with the basket explained how the house had happened to be empty. She had hurried out to buy something that was needed against Mr. Peggotty's return with the tide, and had left the door open in the meanwhile, lest Ham and little Emily, with whom it was an early night, should come home while she was gone. Steer forth after very much improving Mrs. Gummidge's spirits by a cheerful salutation, and a jacko's embrace, took my arm and hurried me away. He had improved his own spirits no less than Mrs. Gummidge's, for they were again at their usual flow, and he was full of vivacious conversation as we went along. And so, he said gaily, we abandon this buccaneer life tomorrow, do we? So we agreed, I returned, and our places by the coach are taken, you know. Aye, there's no help for it, I suppose, said Steerforth. I have almost forgotten that there is anything to do in the world but to go out tossing on the sea here. I wish there was not. As long as the novelty should last, said I, laughing. Like enough, he returned, though there is a sarcastic meaning in that observation for an amiable piece of innocence like my young friend. Well, I dare say I am a capricious fellow, David. I know I am, but while the iron is hot, I can strike it vigorously too. I could pass a reasonably good examination already, as a pilot in these waters, I think. Mr. Pegotti says, you are a wonder, I returned. A nautical phenomenon, eh? Laughed Steerforth. Indeed he does, and you know how truly. I know how ardent you are in any pursuit to follow, and how easily you can master it. And that amazes me most in you, Steerforth, that you should be contented with such fitful uses of your powers. Contented? He answered merrily. I am never contented except with your freshness, my gentle daisy. As to fitfulness, I have never learned the art of binding myself to any of the wheels on which the exigence of these days are turning round and round. I missed it somehow in a bad apprenticeship, and now don't care about it. You know I have bought a boat down here. What an extraordinary fellow you are, Steerforth, I exclaimed, stopping, for this was the first I had heard of it, when you may never care to come near the place again. I don't know that, he returned. I have taken a fancy to the place. At all events, walking me briskly on, I have bought a boat that was for sale, a clipper, Mr. Peggotty says, and so she is and Mr. Peggotty will be master of her in my absence. Now I understand you, Steerforth, said I ex exultingly. You pretend to have bought it for yourself, but you have really done so to confer a benefit on him. I might have known as much at first, knowing you. My dear kind Steerforth, how can I tell you what I think of your generosity? Shh! He answered, turning red. The less said, the better. Didn't I know? cried I, 
Didn't I say that there was not a joy or sorrow or any emotion of such honest arts that was indifferent to you? Eh, hey, eh, hey, he answered. You told me all that. There let it rest. We have said enough. Afraid of offending him by pursuing the subject when he made so light of it, I only pursued it in my thoughts as we went on at even a quicker pace than before. She must be newly rigged, said Tearforth, and I shall leave Littimer behind it to see it done, that I may know she is quite complete. Did I tell you Littimer had come down? No. Oh, yes, came down this morning with a letter from my mother. As our looks met, I observed that he was pale even to his lips, though he looked very steadily at me. I feared that some difference between him and his mother might have led to his being in the frame of mind in which I had found him at the solitary fireside. I hinted so. Oh, no, he said, shaking his head and giving a slight laugh. Nothing of the sort. Yes, he is come down, that man of mine. The same as ever, said I. The same as ever, said Steerforth, distant and quiet as the North Pole. He shall see to the boat being fresh named. She is the stormy Petre now. What does Mr. Pegotty care for stormy petrels? I will have her christened again. By what name? The little Emily. As he had continued to look steadily at me, I took it as a reminder that he objected to being extolled for his consideration. I could not help showing in my face how much it pleased me, but I said little, and he resumed his usual smile and seemed relieved. But see here, he said, looking before us, where the original little Emily comes, and that fellow with her, uh, upon my soul, he is a true knight, he never leaves her. Ham was a boat builder in these days, having improved a natural ingenuity in that handicraft until he had become a skilled workman. He was in his working dress and looked rugged enough, but manly withal, and a very fit protector for the blooming little creature at his side. Indeed, there was a frankness in his face, an honesty, and an undisguised show of his pride in her, and his love for her, which were to me the best of good looks. I thought, as they came towards us, that they were well matched even in that particular. She withdrew her hand timidly from his arm as we stopped to speak to them, and blushed as she gave it to Steerforth and to me. When they passed down, after we had exchanged a few words, she did not like to replace that hand, but still appearing timid and constrained, walked by herself. I thought all this very pretty and engaging, and Steerforth seemed to think so, too, as we looked after them, fading away in the light of a young moon. Suddenly there passed us, evidently following them, a young woman whose approach we had not observed but whose face I saw as she went by, and thought I had a faint remembrance of. She was lightly dressed, looked bold and haggard, and flaunting and poor, but seemed for the time to have given all that to the wind which was blowing, and to have nothing in her mind but going after them. As the dark distant level, absorbing their figures into itself, left but itself visible between us, and the sea and clouds, her figure disappeared in like manner, still no nearer to them than before. That's a black shadow to be following the girl, said Steerforth, standing still. What does it mean? He spoke in a low voice that sounded almost strange to me. She must have it in her mind to beg of them, I think, said I. A beggar would be no novelty, said Steerforth. But it's a strange thing that the beggar should take that shape tonight. Why? I asked. For no better reason, truly, than because I was thinking, he said after a pause, of something like it when it came by. Where the devil did it come from, I wonder? From the shadow of this wall, I think, said I, as we emerged upon a road on which a wall abutted. It's gone, he returned, looking over his shoulder, and all ill go with it. Now for our dinner.
but he looked again over his shoulder towards the sea line, glimmering afar off, and yet again, and he wondered about it in some broken expressions several times in the short reminder of our walk, and only seemed to forget it when the light of fire and candle shone upon us, seated warm and merry at table. Latimer was there, and had his usual effect upon me. When I said to him that I hoped Mrs. Steerforth and Miss Dottle were well, he answered respectfully, and of course respectably, that they were tolerably well, he thanked me, and had sent their compliments. This was all, and yet he seemed to me to say as plainly as a man could say, You are very young, sir. You are exceedingly young. We had almost finished dinner, when taking a step or two towards the table, from the corner where he kept watch upon us, or rather upon me, as I felt, he said to his master, I beg your pardon, sir. Miss Moucher is down here. Who? cried Steerforth, much astonished. Miss Moucher, sir. Why, what on earth does she do here? said Steerforth. It appears to be her native part of the country, sir. She informs me that she makes one of her professional visits here every year, sir. I met her in the street this afternoon, and she wished to know if she might have the honor of waiting on you after dinner, sir. Do you know the giantess in question, Daisy? inquired Steerforth. I was obliged to confess I felt ashamed, even of being at this disadvantage before Littimer, that Miss Moucher and I were wholly unacquainted. Then you shall know her, said Steerforth for she is one of the seven wonders of the world. When Miss Moucher comes, show her in. I felt some curiosity and excitement about this lady, especially as Steerforth burst into a fit of laughing when I referred to her, and positively refused to answer any question of which I made her the subject. I remained, therefore, in a state of considerable expectation until the cloth had been removed some half an hour, and we were sitting over our decanter of wine before the fire when the door opened and Littimer, with his habitual serenity quite undisturbed, announced, Miss Moucher. I looked at the doorway and saw nothing. I was still looking at the doorway, thinking that Miss Moucher was a long while making her appearance, when to my infinite astonishment there came waddling round a sofa which stood between me and it, a pursy dwarf of about forty or forty-five, with a very large head and face, a pair of roguish grey eyes, and such extremely little arms, that, to enable herself to lay a finger archly against her snub nose, as she ogled Steerforth, she was obliged to meet the finger halfway, and lay her nose against it. Her chin, which was what is called double chin, was so fat that it entirely swallowed up the strings of her bonnet, bow, and all. Throat she had none, waist she had none, legs she had none, worth mentioning. For though she was more than full size down to where her waist would have been, if she had had any, and though she terminated as human beings generally do in a pair of feet, she was so short that she stood at a common sized chair as at a table resting a bag she carried on the seat. This lady, dressed in an off and easy style, bringing her nose and her forefinger together with the difficulty I have described, standing with her head necessarily on one side, and with one of her sharp eyes shut up, making an uncommonly knowing face, after ogling Steerforth for a few moments, broke into a torrent of words. What my flower, she presently began, shaking her large head of him. You are there, are you? Oh, you naughty boy! Fie for shame! What do you do so far away from home? Up to mischief? I'll be bound. Oh, you are a downy fellow. Steer forth, so you are. And I am another, ain't I? Ha, ha, ha! You would have betted a hundred pound to five now that you wouldn't have seen me here, wouldn't you? Bless you, man alive! I am everywhere. I am here and there, and where not, like the conjurer's half-crown in the lady's handkerchief. Talking of handkerchiefs, and talking of ladies, what a comfort you are to your blessed mother, ain't you, my dear boy? 
over one of my shoulders, and I don't say which. Miss Moucher untied her bonnet at this passage of her discourse, threw back the strings, and sat down, panting, on a footstool in front of the fire, making a kind of arbor of the dining table, which spread its mahogany shelter above her head. Oh, my stars, and what's their names? she went on, clapping a hand on each of her little knees, and glancing shrewdly at me. I am of too full a habit, that's a fact, Steerforth. After a flight of stairs it gives me as much trouble to draw every breath I want, as if it was a bucket of water. If you saw me looking out of an upper window, you would think I was a fine woman, wouldn't you? I should think that wherever I saw you, replied Steerforth. Go along, you dog, do, cried the little creature, making a whisk at him with the handkerchief with which she was wiping her face, and don't be impudent, but I give you my word and honor. I was at Lady Mithers last week. There is a woman, how she was, and Mithers himself came into the room where I was waiting for her. There is a man, how he was and is weak too, for he has had it these ten years, and he went on at that rate in the complimentary line, that I began to think I should be obliged to ring the bell. Ha, ha, ha! He is a pleasant wretch, but he wants principle. What were you doing for Lady Mithers? asked Steerforth. That's tellings, my blessed infant, she retorted, topping her nose again, screwing up her face, and twinkling her eyes like an imp of supernatural intelligence. Never you mind. You'd like to know whether I stop her hair from falling off, or dye it, or touch up her complexion, or improve her eyebrows, wouldn't you? And so you shall, my darling. When I tell you, do you know what my great-grandmother's name was? No, said Steerforth. It was Walker, my sweet pet, replied Miss Moucher and he came of a long line of walkers, that I inherit all the hooky estates from him. I never beheld anything approaching to Miss Moucher's wink, except Miss Moucher's self-possession. She had a wonderful way, too, when listening to what was said to her, or when waiting for an answer to what she had said herself, of pausing with her head cunningly on one side, and one eye turned up like a magpie's. Altogether, I was lost in amazement, and sat staring at her, quite oblivious, I am afraid, of the loss of politeness. She had by this time drawn the chair to her side, and was busily engaged in producing from the bag, plunging in her short arm to the shoulder, at every dive, a number of small bottles, sponges, combs, brushes, bits of flannel, little pairs of curling irons, and other instruments, which she stumbled in a heap upon the chair. From this employment she suddenly desisted and said to Steerforth, much to my confusion, Who is your friend? Mr. Copperfield, said Steerforth, he wants to know you. Well, then he shall. I thought he looked as if he did, returned Miss Moucher, waddling up to me, bag in hand, and laughing on me as she came. Face like a peach, standing on tiptoe, to pinch my cheek as I sat. Quite tempting. I am very fond of peaches. Happy to make your acquaintance, Mr. Copperfield, I am sure. I said that I congratulated myself on having the honor to make hers, and that the happiness was mutual. Oh, my goodness, how polite we are, exclaimed Miss Moucher, making a preposterous attempt to cover her large face with her morsel of a hand. What a world of gammon and spinach it is, though, ain't it? This was addressed confidentially to both of us as the morsel of a hand came away from the face and buried itself, arm and all, in the bag again. What do you mean, Miss Moucher? said Steerforth. Ha, ha, ha! What a refreshing set of humbugs we are! To be sure, ain't we, my sweet child? replied that morsel of a woman feeling in the bag with her head on one side and her eye in the air. Look here, taking something out. Scrap of the Russian prince's nails. Prince Alphabet turned topsy-turvy. I call him, for his name has got all the letters in it, higgledy-piggledy. The Russian prince is a client of yours, is he? said Steerforth. 
I believe you, my pet, replied Miss Moucher. I keep his nails in order for him. Twice a week, fingers and toes. He pays well, I hope, said Steerforth. Pays, as he speaks, my dear child, through the nose, replied Miss Moucher. None of your close shavers the prince ain't. You would say so if you saw his mustachios. Red by nature, black by art. By your art, of course, said Sheerforth. Miss Moucher winked assent. Forced to send for me. Couldn't help it. The climate affected his dye. It did very well in Russia, but it was no go here. You never saw such a rusty prince in all your born days as he was, like old iron. Is that why you called him a humbug just now? inquired Steerforth. Oh, you are a broth of a boy, ain't you? returned Miss Moucher, shaking her head violently. I said what a set of humbugs we were in general, and I showed you the scraps of the prince's nails to prove it. The prince's nails do more for me in private families of the genteel sort than all my talents put together. I always carry them about. They are the best introduction. If Miss Moucher cuts the prince's nails, she must be all right. I give them away to the young ladies. They put them in albums, I believe. Ha, ha, ha. Upon my life, the whole social system, as the men call it when they make speeches in Parliament, is a system of Princess Neils. Said this least of women, trying to fold her short arms and nodding her large head. Steerforth laughed heartily, and I laughed too. Miss Moucher continuing all the time to shake her head which was very much on one side, and to look into the air with one eye, and to wink with the other. Well, well, she said, smitting her small knees, and rising. This is not business. Come, steer forth, let's explore the polar regions, and have it over. She then selected two or three of the little instruments, and a little bottle, and asked, to my surprise, if the table would bear. On Steerforth's replying in the affirmative, she pushed a chair against it, and begging the assistance of my hand, mounted up pretty nimbly to the top as if it were a stage. If either of you saw my ankles, she said, when she was safely elevated, say so, and I will go home and destroy myself. I did not, said Steerforth. I did not, said I. Well then, cried Miss Moucher, I will consent to live. Now, ducky, ducky, ducky. Come to Mrs. Bond and be killed. This was an invocation to steer forth to place himself under her hands, who accordingly sat himself down with his back to the table and his laughing face towards me and submitted his head to her inspection, evidently for no other purpose than our entertainment. To see Miss Moucher standing over him, looking at his rich profusion of brown hair through a large round magnifying glass, which she took out of her pocket was a most amazing spectacle. You are a pretty fellow, said Miss Moucher, after a brief inspection. You be as bald as a friar on the top of your head in twelve months but for me. Just half a minute, my young friend, and we will give you a polishing that shall keep your curls on for the next ten years. With this she tilted some of the contents of the little bottle on to one of the little bits of flannel and again importing some of the virtues of that preparation to one of the little brushes, began rubbing and scraping away with both on the crown of Steerforth's head in the busiest manner I ever witnessed, talking all the time. There is Charlie Pygrave, the Duke's son, she said. You know Charlie? Peeping round into his face. A little, said Steerforth. What a man he is. There is a whisker. As to Charlie's legs, if they were only a pair, which they ain't, they would defy competition. Would you believe he tried to do without me? In the lifeguards too? Mad, said Steerforth. It looks like it. However mad or sane he tried, returned Miss Moucher. What does he do? But lo, and behold you, he goes into a perfumer's shop and wants to buy a bottle of Madagascar liquid. Charlie does? said Steerforth. Charlie does, but they haven't got any Madagascar liquid. What is it? Something to drink? asked Steerforth. To drink? returned Miss Moucher, stopping to slap his cheek. 
to doctor his own mustachios with, you know. There was a woman in the shop, elderly female, quite a griffin, who had never even heard of it by name. Begging pardon, sir, said the griffin to Charlie. It's not, not, not rouge, is it? Rouge, said Charlie to Griffin. What the unmentionable to ears polite do you think I want with rouge? No offense, sir, said the griffin. We have it asked for by so many names. I thought it might be. Now that my child, continued Miss Moucher, rubbing all the time as busily as ever, is another instance of the refreshing humbug I was speaking of. I do something in that way myself, perhaps a good deal, perhaps a little. Sharps the word, my dear boy, never mind. In what way do you mean, in the rouge way? said Steerforth. Put this and that together, my tender people, returned the very moucher, touching her nose. Work it by the rule of secrets in all trades, and the product will give you the desired result. I say I do a little in that way myself. One dowager, she calls it lip slave, another she calls it blouse, another she calls it tucker edging, another she calls it a fan. I call it whatever they call it. I supply it for them, but we keep up the trick so, to one another, and make believe with such a face that they would as soon think of laying it on before a whole drawing room as before me. And when I wait upon them, they will say to me sometimes, with it on, thick and no mistake, how am I looking, Moucher? Am I pale? Ha, 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 ha. Isn't that refreshing, my young friend? I never did in my days behold anything like Moucher as she stood upon the dining table, intensely enjoying this refreshment, rubbing busily at Steerforth's head and winking at me over it. Ah, she said, such things are not in much demand hereabouts. That sets me off again. I haven't seen a pretty woman since I have been here, Jemmy. No, said Steerforth. Not the ghost of one, replied Miss Moucher. We could show her the substance of one, I think, said Steerforth, addressing his eyes to mine. Eh, Daisy? Yes, indeed, said I. Aha, cried the little creature, glancing sharply at my face, and then peeping round at Steerforth's. Mm. The first exclamation sounded like a question put to both of us, and the second like a question put to steer forth only. She seemed to have found no answer to either, but continued to rub with her head on one side and her eye turned up, as if she were looking for an answer in the air and were confident of its appearing presently. A sister of yours, Copperfield, she cried after a pause, and still keeping the same lookout. Eh, hey, hey. eh! No, said Steerforth, before I could reply. Nothing of the sort. On the contrary, Mr. Copperfield used, or I am much mistaken, to have a great admiration for her. Why hasn't he now? returned Miss Moucher. Is he fickle? Oh, for shame. Did he sip every flower and change every hour until Polly his passion requited? Is her name Polly? The elfin suddenness with which she pounced upon me with this question and a searching look quite disconcerted me for a moment. No, Miss Moucher, I replied. Her name is Emily. Aha! she cried exactly as before. Um, what a rattle I am. Mr. Copperfield, ain't I volatile? Her tone and look implied something that was not agreeable to me in connection with the subject. So I said in a graver manner than any of us had yet assumed. She is as virtuous as she is pretty. She is engaged to be married to a most worthy and deserving man in her own station of life. I esteem her for her good sense as much as I admire her for her good looks. Well said, cried Steerforth. Hear, hear, hear. Now I'll quench the curiosity of this little Fatima, my dear Daisy, by leaving her nothing to guess at. She is at present apprentice, Miss Moucher, or article, or whatever it may be, to Omar and Joram, haberdashers, milliners, and so forth in this town. Do you observe, Omar and Joram, the promise of which my friend has spoken, is made and entered into with her cousin, Christian name Ham, surname Peggotty, 
occupation boat builder, also of this town. She lives with a relative, Christian name unknown, surname Peggotty, occupation seafaring, also of this town. She is the prettiest and most engaging little fairy in the world. I admire her, as my friend does, exceedingly. If it were not that, I might appear to disparage her intended, which I know my friend would not like. I would add, that to me she seems to be throwing herself away, that I am sure she might do better, and that I swear she was born to be a lady. Miss Moucher listened to these words, which were very slowly and distinctly spoken, with her head on one side, and her eye in the air, as if she was still looking for that answer. When he ceased, she became brisk again in an instant, and rattled away with surprising volubility. "'Oh, and that's all about it, is it?' she exclaimed, trimming his whiskers with a little restless pair of scissors that went glancing round his head in all directions. "'Very well, very well. Quite a long story. Ought to end, and they lived happy ever afterwards. Ought end it? Ah, what is that game at four feet? I love my love with an E, because she is enticing. I hate her with an E, because she is engaged. I took her to the sign of the exquisite and treated her with an elopement. Her name is Emily, and she lives in the East. Ha, ha, ha. Mr. Copperfield, ain't I volatile? Merely looking at me with extravagant slyness and not waiting for any reply, she continued without drawing breath. There, if ever any scapegrace was trimmed and touched up to perfection, you are steerforth. If I understand any noddle in the world, I understand yours. Do you hear me when I tell you that, my darling, I understand yours? Peeping down into his face. Now you may mizzle, Jemmy, as we say at court, and if Mr. Copperfield will take the chair, I will operate on him. What do you say, Daisy? inquired Steerforth, laughing and resigning his seat. Will you be improved? Thank you, Miss Moucher, not this evening. Don't say no, returned the little woman, looking at me with the aspect of a connoisseur. A little bit more eyebrow? Thank you, I returned, some other time. Have it carried half a quarter of an inch towards the temple, said Miss Moucher. We can do it in a fortnight. No, I thank you, not at present. Go in for a tip, she urged. No, let's get the scaffolding up, then for a pair of whiskers, come. I could not help blushing as I declined, for I felt we were on my weak point now. But Miss Moucher, finding that I was not at present disposed for any decoration within the range of her art, and that I was, for the time being, proof against blandishments of the small bottle which she held up before one eye to enforce her persuasions, said we would make a beginning on an early day, and requested the aid of my hand to descend from her elevated station. Thus assisted, she skipped down with much agility, and began to tie her double chin into her bonnet. The fee, said Steerforth, is five bob, replied Miss Moucher, and dirt cheap, my chicken. Ain't I volatile, Mr. Copperfield? I replied politely, not at all. But I thought she was rather so, when she tossed up his two half-crowns like a goblin pie-man, caught them, dropped them in her pocket, and gave it a loud slap. That's the till, observed Miss Moucher, standing at the chair again, and replacing in the bag a miscellaneous collection of little objects she had emptied out of it. Have I got all my traps? It seems so. It won't do to be like long Ned Beadwood when they took him to church to marry him to somebody, as he says, and left the bride behind. Ha, ha, ha! A wicked rascal, Ned, but droll. Now I know I am going to break your hearts, but I am forced to leave you. You must call up all your fortitude and try to bear it. Goodbye, Mr. Copperfield. Take care of yourself. Jockey of Norfolk. How I have been rattling on. It's all the fault of you two wretches. I forgive you. Bob's four, as the Englishman said for good night. When he first learnt French and thought it so like English, Bob's four, my ducks.
with the bag slung over her arm and rattling as she waddled away. She waddled to the door, where she stopped to inquire if she should leave us a lock of her hair. Ain't I volatile? she added as a commentary on this offer, and with her finger on her nose departed. Steerforth laughed to that degree that it was impossible for me to help laughing too, though I am not sure I should have done so but for this inducement. When we had had our laugh quite out, which was after some time, he told me that Miss Moucher had quite an extensive connection and made herself useful to a variety of people in a variety of ways. Some people trifled with her as a mere oddity, he said, but she was as shrewdly and sharply observant as anyone he knew, and as long-headed as she was short-armed. He told me that what she had said of being here and there and everywhere was true enough, for she made little darts into the provinces, and seemed to pick up customers everywhere, and to know everybody. I asked him what her disposition was, whether it was at all mischievous, and if her sympathies were generally on the right side of things, but not succeeding in attracting his attention to these questions after two or three attempts, I forbore or forgot to repeat them. He told me instead, with much rapidity, a good deal about her skill and her profits, and about her being a scientific cupper, if I should have occasion for her service in that capacity. She was the principal theme of our conversation during the evening, and when we parted for the night, Steerforth called after me over the banisters. Bob's four as I went downstairs. I was surprised, when I came to Mr. Barkey's house, to find Ham walking up and down in front of it, and still more surprised to learn from him that little Emily was inside. I naturally inquired why he was not there too, instead of pacing the streets by himself. Why, you see, Master Davy, he rejoined, in a hesitating manner, Emily, she is talking to some un in there. I should have thought, said I, smiling, that that was a reason for your being in here too, Ham. Well, Master Davy, in a general way, so it would be, he returned. But looky here, Master Davy, lowering his voice and speaking very gravely, it's a young woman, sir, a young woman that Emily knowed once, and don't ought to know no more. When I heard these words, a light began to fall upon the figure I had seen following them some hours ago. It's a poor urum, Master Davy, said Ham, as it trod underfoot by all the town, up street and down street. They mould, oh, the churchyard don't hold any that the folk shrink away from more. Did I see her tonight, Ham, on the sand after we met you? Keep us in sight, said Ham. It's like you did, Master Davy. Not that I know them. She was there, sir, but along of her, creeping soon afterwards under Emily's little winder. When she see the light come, and whispering, Emily, Emily, for Christ's sake, have a woman's heart towards me. I was once like you. These were solemn words, Master Davy, for to hear. They were indeed ham. What did Emily do? Says Emily, Martha, is it you? Oh, Martha, can it be you? For they had sat at work together many a day at Mr. Omer's. I recollect her now, cried I, recalling one of the two girls I had seen when I first went there. I recollect her quite well. Martha Endel, said Ham, two or three years older than Emily, but was at the school with her. I never heard her name, said I. I didn't mean to interrupt you. For the matter, oh, that, Master Davy, replied Ham, all stole a most in them words. Emily, Emily, for Christ's sake, have a woman's heart towards me. I was once like you. She wanted to speak to Emily. Emily couldn't speak to her there, for her loving uncle was come home, and he wouldn't. No, Master Davy, said Ham, with great earnestness. He couldn't, kind-natured, tender-hearted, as he is, see them two together, side by side, for all the treasures that wrecked in the sea. I felt how true this was. I knew it on the instant, quite as well as Ham. 
So Emily writes in pencil in a bit of paper, he pursued, and gives it to her out of winder to bring here. So that, she says, to my aunt, Mrs. Barkis, and she will set you down by her fire for the love of me, till uncle is gone out, and I can come. By and by, she tells me what I tell you, Master Davy, and asks me to bring her. What can I do? She don't ought to know any such, but I can't deny her when the tears is on her face. He put his hand into the breast of his shaggy jacket and took out with great care a pretty little purse. And if I could deny her when the tears was on her face, Master Davy said Ham, tenderly adjusting it on the rough palm of his hand, how could I deny her when she give me this to carry for her, knowing what she brought it for? Such a toy as it is, said Ham, thoughtfully looking on it. With such a little money in it, Emily, my dear. I shook him warmly by the hand when he had put it away again, for that was more satisfactory to me than saying anything, and we walked up and down for a minute or two in silence. The door opened then, and Peggotty appeared, beckoning to Ham to come in. I would have kept away, but she came after me, entreating me to come in too. Even then, I would have avoided the room where they all were, but for its being the neat tiled kitchen I have mentioned more than once. The door opening immediately into it, I found myself among them before I considered whither I was going. The girl, the same I had seen upon the sands, was near the fire. She was sitting on the ground with her head and one arm lying on a chair. I fancied, from the disposition of her figure, that Emily had but newly risen from the chair and that the forlorn head might perhaps have been lying on her lap. I saw but little of the girl's face, over which her hair fell loose and scattered, as if she had been disordering it with her own hands. But I saw that she was young and of a fair complexion. Peggotty had been crying, so had little Emily. Not a word was spoken when we first went in, and the Dutch clock by the dresser seemed, in the silence, to tick twice as loud as usual. Emily spoke first. Martha wants, she said to Ham, to go to London. Why to London? returned Ham. He stood between them, looking on the prostrate girl with a mixture of compassion for her and of jealousy of her holding any companionship with her, whom he loved so well, which I have always remembered distinctly. They both spoke as if she were ill, in a soft, suppressed tone that was plainly heard, although it hardly rose above a whisper. "'Better then than here,' said a third voice aloud, Martha's, though she did not move. "'No one knows me there. Everybody knows me here.' "'What will she do there?' inquired Ham. She lifted up her head and looked darkly round at him for a moment then laid it down again, and curved her right arm about her neck, as a woman in a fever or in an agony of pain from a shot might twist herself. She will try to do well, said little Emily. You don't know what she has said to us. Does he? Do they? Aunt? Peggotty shook her head compassionately. I will try, said Martha, if you will keep me away. I never can do worse than I have done here. I may do better. Oh, with a dreadful shiver, take me out of these streets, where the whole town knows me from a child. As Emily held out her hand to Ham, I saw him put in it a little canvas bag. She took it as if she thought it were her purse, and made a step or two forward, but finding her mistake, came back to where he had retired near me and showed it to him. It's all you earn, Emily. I could hear him say, I haven't now in all the world that ain't yourn, my dear. It ain't of no delight to me except for you. The tears rose freshly in her eyes, but she turned away and went to Martha. What she gave her, I don't know. I saw her stooping over her and putting money in her bosom. She whispered something as she asked was 
that enough more than enough the other said and took her hand and kissed it then martha arose and gathering her shawl about her covering her face with it and weeping aloud went slowly to the door she stopped a moment before going out as if she would have uttered something or turned back but no word passed her lips making the same low dreary wretched moaning in her shawl she went away as the door closed little emily looked at us three in a hurried manner and then hid her face in her hands and fell to sobbing don't emily said ham tapping her gently on the shoulder don't my dear you don't ought to cry so pretty oh ham she exclaimed still weeping pitifully i am not so good a girl as i ought to be i know i have not the thankful heart sometimes i ought to have yes yes you have i am sure said ham no 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 cried little emily sobbing and shaking her head i am not as good a girl as i ought to be not near not near and still she cried as if her heart would break i try your love too much i know i do she sobbed i am often cross to you and changeable with you when i ought to be far different you are never so to me why am i ever so to you when i should think of nothing but how to be grateful and to make you happy you always make me so said ham my dear i am happy in the sight of you i am happy all day long in the thoughts of you ah that's not enough she cried that's because you are good not because i am oh my dear it might have been a better fortune for you if you had been fond of someone else of someone steadier and much worthier than me who was all bound up in you and never vain and changeable like me poor little tender heart said ham in a low voice Martha has overset her altogether. Please, aunt, sobbed Emily, come here and let me lay my head upon you. Oh, I am very miserable tonight, aunt. Oh, I am not as good a girl as I ought to be. I am not, I know. Peggotty had hastened to the chair before the fire. Emily, with her arms around her neck, kneeled by her, looking up most earnestly into her face. Oh, pray, aunt. Try to help me, Ham, dear. Try to help me, Mister David. For the sake of old times, do please try to help me. I want to be a better girl than I am. I want to feel a hundred times more thankful than I do. I want to feel more. What a blessed thing it is to be the wife of a good man and to lead a peaceful life. Oh me, oh me, oh my heart, my heart. She dropped her face on my old nurse's breast. and seizing this supplication which in its agony and grief was half a woman's half a child's as all her manner was being in that more natural and better suited to her beauty as i thought than any other manner could have been wept silently while my old nurse hushed her like an infant she got calmer by degrees and then we soothed her now talking encouragingly and now jesting a little with her until she began to raise her head and speak to us so we got on until she was able to smile and then to laugh and then to sit up half ashamed while peggotty recalled her stray ringlets dried her eyes and made her neat again lest her uncle should wonder when she got home why his darling had been crying i saw her do that night what i had never seen her do before I saw her innocently kiss her chosen husband on the cheek and creep close to his bluff form as if it were her best support when they went away together in the vanishing moonlight and I looked after them comparing their departure in my mind with Martha's I saw that she held his arm with both her hands and still kept close to him end of chapter 22 Recording by Raju, Ramina forty five at hotmail dot com.
Chapter twenty three of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Deborah Lynn. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter twenty three. I corroborate Mr. Dick and choose a profession. When I awoke in the morning, I thought very much of little Emily and her emotion last night after Martha had left. I felt as if I had come into the knowledge of those domestic weaknesses and tendernesses in a sacred confidence, and that to disclose them, even to Steerforth, would be wrong. I had no gentler feeling towards any one than towards the pretty creature who had been my playmate, and whom I have always been persuaded, and shall always be persuaded, to my dying day, I then devotedly loved. The repetition to any ears, even to Steerforth's, of what she had been unable to repress when her heart lay open to me by an accident, I felt would be a rough deed unworthy of myself, unworthy of the light of our pure childhood, which I always saw encircling her head. I made a resolution, therefore, to keep it in my own breast, and there it gave her image a new grace. While we were at breakfast, a letter was delivered to me from my aunt. As it contained matter on which I thought Steerforth could advise me as well as any one, and on which I knew I should be delighted to consult him, I resolved to make it a subject of discussion on our journey home. For the present we had enough to do in taking leave of all our friends. Mr. Barkis was far from being the last among them in his regret at our departure, and I believe would even have opened the box again and sacrificed another guinea if it would have kept us eight and forty hours in Yarmouth. Peggotty and all her family were full of grief at our going. The whole house of Omer and Joram turned out to bid us good-bye, and there were so many seafaring volunteers in attendance on Steerforth when our portmanteaus went to the coach that if we had had the baggage of a regiment with us we should hardly have wanted porters to carry it. In a word, we departed to the regret and admiration of all concerned, and left a great many people very sorry behind us. "'Do you stay long here, Littimer?' said I, as he stood waiting to see the coach start. "'No, sir,' he replied. "'Probably not very long, sir.' "'He can hardly say just now,' observed Steerforth carelessly. "'He knows what he has to do, and he'll do it.' "'That I am sure he will,' said I. Littimer touched his hat in acknowledgment of my good opinion, and I felt about eight years old. He touched it once more, wishing us a good journey— and we left him standing on the pavement as respectable a mystery as any pyramid in Egypt. For some little time we held no conversation, Steerforth being unusually silent, and I being sufficiently engaged in wondering within myself when I should see the old places again, and what new changes might happen to me or them in the meanwhile. At length Steerforth, becoming gay and talkative in a moment, as he could become anything he liked at any moment, pulled me by the arm. "'Find a voice, David. What about that letter you were speaking of at breakfast?' "'Oh,' said I, taking it out of my pocket, "'it's from my aunt.' "'And what does she say, requiring consideration?' "'Why, she reminds me, Steerforth,' said I, "'that I came out on this expedition to look about me and to think a little.' "'Which, of course, you have done?' "'Indeed, I can't say I have particularly. "'To tell you the truth, I am afraid I have forgotten it.' "'Well,' "'Look about you now, and make up for your negligence,' said Steerforth. "'Look to the right, and you'll see a flat country with a good deal of marsh in it. "'Look to the left, and you'll see the same. "'Look to the front, and you'll find no difference. "'Look to the rear, and there it is still.' "'I laughed, and replied that I saw no suitable profession in the whole prospect, "'which was perhaps to be attributed to its flatness. "'What says our aunt on the subject?' inquired Steerforth, "'glancing at the letter in my hand.' "'Does she suggest anything?' "'Why, yes,' said I. "'She asks me here if I think I should like to be a proctor. "'What do you think of it?' "'Well, I don't know,' replied Steerforth coolly. "'You may as well do that as anything else, I suppose.' "'I could not help laughing again at his balancing all callings and professions so equally, "'and I told him so. "'What is a proctor, Steerforth?' said I. "'Why, he is a sort of monkish attorney,' replied Steerforth. He is, to some faded courts held in Doctors' Commons, a lazy old nook near St. Paul's Churchyard, what solicitors are to the courts of law and equity. 
he is a functionary whose existence, in the natural course of things, would have terminated about two hundred years ago. I can tell you best what he is by telling you what Doctors' Commons is. It's a little out-of-the-way place where they administer what is called ecclesiastical law, and play all kinds of tricks with obsolete old monsters of Acts of Parliament, which three-fourths of the world know nothing about, and the other fourth supposes to have been dug up in a fossil state in the days of the Edwards. It's a place that has an ancient monopoly in suits about people's wills and people's marriages, and disputes among ships and boats. "'Nonsense, Steerforth!' I exclaimed. "'You don't mean to say that there is any affinity between nautical matters and ecclesiastical matters?' "'I don't indeed, my dear boy,' he returned. "'But I mean to say that they are managed and decided by the same set of people down in that same doctor's commons.' You shall go there one day and find them blundering through half the nautical terms in Young's Dictionary, apropos of the Nancy having run down the Sarah Jane, or Mr. Peggotty and the Yarmouth boatman having put off in a gale of wind with an anchor and cable to the Nelson Indiaman in distress, and you shall go there another day and find them deep in the evidence, pro and con, respecting a clergyman who has misbehaved himself and you shall find the judge in the nautical case, the advocate in the clergyman's case, or contrariwise. They are like actors. Now a man's a judge, and now he is not a judge. Now he's one thing, now he's another. Now he's something else, change and change about. But it's always a very pleasant, profitable little affair of private theatricals, presented to an uncommonly select audience. But advocates and proctors are not one and the same, said I, a little puzzled. Are they? No, returned Steerforth. The advocates are civilians, men who have taken a doctor's degree at college, which is the first reason of my knowing anything about it. The proctors employ the advocates. Both get very comfortable fees, and altogether they make a mighty snug little party. On the whole, I would recommend you to take to Doctor's Commons kindly, David. They plume themselves on their gentility there, I can tell you, if that's any satisfaction. I made allowance for Steerforth's light way of treating the subject, and considering it with reference to the staid air of gravity and antiquity which I associated with that lazy old nook near St. Paul's churchyard, did not feel indisposed towards my aunt's suggestion, which she left to my free decision, making no scruple of telling me that it had occurred to her on her lately visiting her own proctor in Doctors' Commons for the purpose of settling her will in my favour. "'That's a laudable proceeding on the part of our aunt, at all events,' said Steerforth, when I mentioned it, "'and one deserving of all encouragement. "'Daisy, my advice is that you take kindly to Doctor's Commons.' "'I quite made up my mind to do so. "'I then told Steerforth that my aunt was in town awaiting me, "'as I found from her letter, "'and that she had taken lodgings for a week "'at a kind of private hotel at Lincoln's Inn Fields, "'where there was a stone staircase and a convenient door in the roof, "'my aunt being firmly persuaded "'that every house in London was going to be burnt down every night.' We achieved the rest of our journey pleasantly, sometimes recurring to Doctors' Commons, and anticipating the distant days when I should be a proctor there, which Steerforth pictured in a variety of humorous and whimsical lights that made us both merry. When we came to our journey's end, he went home, engaging to call upon me next day but one, and I drove to Lincoln's Inn Fields, where I found my aunt up and waiting supper. If I had been round the world since we parted, we could hardly have been better pleased to meet again. My aunt cried outright as she embraced me, and said, pretending to laugh, that if my poor mother had been alive, that silly little creature would have shed tears, she had no doubt. "'So you have left Mr. Dick behind, aunt?' said I. "'I am sorry for that. "'Ah, Janet, how do you do?' As Janet curtsied, hoping I was well, I observed my aunt's visage lengthen very much. "'I am sorry for it, too,' said my aunt, rubbing her nose. "'I have had no peace of mind, Trot, since I have been here. "'Before I could ask why, she told me. "'I am convinced,' said my aunt, laying her hand with melancholy firmness on the table, "'that Dick's character is not a character to keep the donkeys off. "'I am confident he wants strength of purpose. "'I ought to have left Janet at home instead, and then my mind might perhaps have been at ease.' "'If ever there was a donkey trespassing on my green,' said my aunt, with emphasis, "'there was one this afternoon at four o'clock. "'A cold feeling came over me from head to foot, and I know it was a donkey.' "'I tried to comfort her on this point, but she rejected consolation. "'It was a donkey,' said my aunt. 
"'And it was the one with the stumpy tail which that murdering sister of a woman rode when she came to my house.' This had been ever since the only name my aunt knew for Miss Murdstone. "'If there is any donkey in Dover whose audacity it is harder to me to bear than another's, that,' said my aunt, striking the table, "'is the animal.' Janet ventured to suggest that my aunt might be disturbing herself unnecessarily, and that she believed the donkey in question was then engaged in the sand and gravel line of business, and was not available for purposes of trespass. But my aunt wouldn't hear of it. Supper was comfortably served and hot, though my aunt's rooms were very high up, whether that she might have more stone stairs for her money, or might be nearer to the door and the roof, I don't know and consisted of a roast fowl, a steak, and some vegetables, to all of which I did ample justice, and which were all excellent. But my aunt had her own ideas concerning London provision, and ate but little. "'I suppose this unfortunate fowl was born and brought up in a cellar,' said my aunt, "'and never took the air except on a hackney-coach stand. I hope the steak may be beef, but I don't believe it. Nothing's genuine in the place, in my opinion, but the dirt.' "'Don't you think the fowl may have come out of the country, aunt?' I hinted. "'Certainly not,' returned my aunt. "'It would be no pleasure to a London tradesman to sell anything which was what he pretended it was.' I did not venture to controvert this opinion, but I made a good supper, which it greatly satisfied her to see me do. When the table was cleared, Janet assisted her to arrange her hair, to put on her nightcap, which was of a smarter construction than usual, in case of fire.' my aunt said, and to fold her gown back over her knees, these being her usual preparations for warming herself before going to bed. I then made her, according to certain established regulations, from which no deviation, however slight, could ever be permitted, a glass of hot wine and water, and a slice of toast cut into long, thin strips. With these accompaniments we were left alone to finish the evening, my aunt sitting opposite to me, drinking her wine and water, soaking her strips of toast in it one by one before eating them, and looking benignantly on me from among the borders of her nightcap. "'Well, Trot,' she began, "'what do you think of the Proctor plan, or have you not begun to think about it yet?' "'I have thought a good deal about it, my dear aunt, and I have talked a good deal about it with Steerforth. I like it very much indeed. I like it exceedingly.' "'Come!' said my aunt. That's cheering. I have only one difficulty, aunt. Say what it is, Trot, she returned. Why, I want to ask, aunt, as this seems, from what I understand, to be a limited profession, whether my entrance into it would not be very expensive. It will cost, returned my aunt, to article you, just a thousand pounds. Now, my dear aunt, said I, drawing my chair nearer, I am uneasy in my mind about that. It's a large sum of money. You have expended a great deal on my education, and have always been as liberal to me in all things as it was possible to be. You have been the soul of generosity. Surely there are some ways in which I might begin life with hardly any outlay, and yet begin with a good hope of getting on by resolution and exertion. Are you sure that it would not be better to try that course? Are you certain that you can afford to part with so much money, and that it is right that it should be so expended?' I only ask you, my second mother, to consider. Are you certain? My aunt finished eating the piece of toast on which she was then engaged, looking me full in the face all the while, and then, setting her glass on the chimney-piece, and folding her hands upon her folded skirts, replied as follows. Trot, my child, if I have any object in life, it is to provide for your being a good, a sensible, and a happy man. I am bent upon it. So is Dick." I should like some people that I know to hear Dick's conversation on the subject. Its sagacity is wonderful. But no one knows the resources of that man's intellect except myself. She stopped for a moment to take my hand between hers and went on. It's in vain, Trot, to recall the past unless it works some influence upon the present. Perhaps I might have been better friends with your poor father. Perhaps I might have been better friends with that poor child, your mother, even after your sister, Betsy Trotwood, disappointed me. When you came to me, a little runaway boy, all dusty and wayworn, perhaps I thought so. From that time until now, Trot, you have ever been a credit to me, and a pride and a pleasure. I have no other claim upon my means. At least—here, to my surprise, she hesitated and was confused. No, I have no other claim upon my means, and you are my adopted child.' 
Only be a loving child to me in my age, and bear with my whims and fancies, and you will do more for an old woman whose prime of life was not so happy or conciliating as it might have been, than ever that old woman did for you. It was the first time I had heard my aunt refer to her past history. There was a magnanimity in her quiet way of doing so, and of dismissing it, which would have exalted her in my respect and affection, if anything could. "'All is agreed and understood between us now, Trot,' said my aunt, "'and we need talk of this no more. "'Give me a kiss, and we'll go to the Commons after breakfast tomorrow. "'We had a long chat by the fire before we went to bed. "'I slept in a room on the same floor with my aunt, "'and was a little disturbed in the course of the night "'by her knocking at my door as often as she was agitated "'by a distant sound of hackney-coaches or market-carts, "'and inquiring if I heard the engines.' But towards morning she slept better, and suffered me to do so too. At about midday we set out for the office of Messrs. Spenlow and Jorkins in Doctors' Commons. My aunt, who had this other general opinion in reference to London, that every man she saw was a pickpocket, gave me her purse to carry for her, which had ten guineas in it and some silver. We made a pause at the toy shop in Fleet Street to see the giants of St. Dunstan strike upon the balls. We had timed our going so as to catch them at it at twelve o'clock, and then went on towards Ludgate Hill and St. Paul's Churchyard. We were crossing to the former place when I found that my aunt greatly accelerated her speed and looked frightened. I observed at the same time that a lowering, ill-dressed man, who had stopped and stared at us in passing a little before, was coming so close after us as to brush against her. "'Trot! My dear Trot!' cried my aunt, in a terrified whisper, and pressing my arm. "'I don't know what I am to do.' "'Don't be alarmed,' said I. "'There's nothing to be afraid of. Step into a shop, and I'll soon get rid of this fellow.' "'No, no, child,' she returned. "'Don't speak to him for the world. I entreat. I order you.' "'Good heaven, aunt,' said I. "'He is nothing but a sturdy beggar.' "'You don't know what he is,' replied my aunt. "'You don't know who he is. You don't know what you say.' We had stopped in an empty doorway while this was passing, and he had stopped too. "'Don't look at him,' said my aunt, as I turned my head indignantly. "'But get me a coach, my dear, and wait for me in St. Paul's Churchyard.' "'Wait for you?' I replied. "'Yes,' rejoined my aunt. "'I must go alone. I must go with him.' "'With him, aunt? This man?' "'I am in my senses,' she replied, "'and I tell you I must. Get me a coach.' However much astonished I might be, I was sensible that I had no right to refuse compliance with such a peremptory command. I hurried away a few paces and called a hackney chariot which was passing empty. Almost before I could let down the steps, my aunt sprang in, I don't know how, and the man followed. She waved her hand to me to go away, so earnestly, that all confounded as I was, I turned from them at once. In doing so, I heard her say to the coachman, "'Drive anywhere. Drive straight on.' and presently the chariot passed me going up the hill. What Mr. Dick had told me, and what I had supposed to be a delusion of his, now came into my mind. I could not doubt that this person was the person of whom he had made such mysterious mention, though what the nature of his hold upon my aunt could possibly be I was quite unable to imagine. After half an hour's cooling in the churchyard, I saw the chariot coming back. The driver stopped beside me, and my aunt was sitting in it alone. She had not yet sufficiently recovered from her agitation to be quite prepared for the visit we had to make. She desired me to get into the chariot, and to tell the coachman to drive slowly up and down a little while. She said no more except, "'My dear child, never ask me what it was, and don't refer to it,' until she had perfectly regained her composure, when she told me she was quite herself now, and we might get out." On her giving me her purse to pay the driver, I found that all the guineas were gone, and only the loose silver remained. Doctor's Commons was approached by a little low archway. Before we had taken many paces down the street beyond it, the noise of the city seemed to melt, as if by magic, into a softened distance. A few dull courts and narrow ways brought us to the sky-lighted offices of Spenlow and Jorkins, in the vestibule of which temple, accessible to pilgrims without the ceremony of knocking, three or four clerks were at work as copyists. One of these, a little dry man, sitting by himself, 
who wore a stiff brown wig that looked as if it were made of gingerbread, rose to receive my aunt, and show us into Mr. Spenlow's room. "'Mr. Spenlow's in court, ma'am,' said the dry man. "'It's an arches day, but it's close by, and I'll send for him directly.' As we were left to look about us while Mr. Spenlow was fetched, I availed myself of the opportunity. The furniture of the room was old-fashioned and dusty, and the green baize on the top of the writing-table had lost all its colour, and was as withered and pale as an old pauper. There were a great many bundles of papers on it, some endorsed as allegations, and some, to my surprise, as libels, and some as being in the consistory court, and some in the arches court, and some in the prerogative court, and some in the Admiralty Court, and some in the Delegates' Court, giving me occasion to wonder much how many courts there might be in the gross, and how long it would take to understand them all. Besides these, there were sundry immense manuscript books of evidence taken on affidavit, strongly bound and tied together in massive sets, a set to each cause, as if every cause were a history in ten or twenty volumes. All this looked tolerably expensive, I thought, and gave me an agreeable notion of a proctor's business. I was casting my eyes with increasing complacency over these and many similar objects, when hasty footsteps were heard in the room outside, and Mr. Spenlow, in a black gown trimmed with white fur, came hurrying in, taking off his hat as he came. He was a little light-haired gentleman with undeniable boots and the stiffest of white cravats and shirt-collars. He was buttoned up, mighty trim and tight, and must have taken a great deal of pains with his whiskers, which were accurately curled. His gold watch-chain was so massive that a fancy came across me that he ought to have a sinewy golden arm to draw it out with, like those which are put up over the gold-beater's shops. He was got up with such care, and was so stiff, that he could hardly bend himself, being obliged, when he glanced at some papers on his desk, after sitting down in his chair, to move his whole body from the bottom of his spine like punch. I had previously been presented by my aunt, and had been courteously received. He now said, "'And so, Mr. Copperfield, you think of entering into our profession. I casually mentioned to Miss Trotwood, when I had the pleasure of an interview with her the other day, with another inclination of his body, punch again, that there was a vacancy here. Miss Trotwood was good enough to mention that she had a nephew who was her peculiar care, and for whom she was seeking to provide genteelly in life.' "'That nephew, I believe, I have now the pleasure of punch again. "'I bowed my acknowledgments and said my aunt had mentioned to me "'that there was that opening, and that I believed I should like it very much. "'That I was strongly inclined to like it, and had taken immediately to the proposal. "'That I could not absolutely pledge myself to like it until I knew something more about it. "'That although it was little else than a matter of form, "'I presumed I should have an opportunity of trying how I liked it "'before I bound myself to it irrevocably.' "'Oh, surely, surely,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'We always in this house propose a month, an initiatory month. "'I should be happy myself to propose two months, three, an indefinite period, in fact, "'but I have a partner, Mr. Jorkins.' "'And the premium, sir,' I returned, "'is a thousand pounds?' "'And the premium, stamp included, is a thousand pounds,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'As I have mentioned to Miss Trotwood, I am actuated by no mercenary considerations.' Few men are less so, I believe. But Mr. Jorkins has his opinions on these subjects, and I am bound to respect Mr. Jorkins's opinions. Mr. Jorkins thinks a thousand pounds too little, in short. "'I suppose, sir,' said I, still desiring to spare my aunt, "'that it is not the custom here, if an articled clerk were particularly useful, and made himself a perfect master of his profession—I could not help blushing, this looked so like praising myself— I suppose it is not the custom, in the later years of his time, to allow him any— Mr. Spenlow, by a great effort, just lifted his head far enough out of his cravat to shake it, and answered, anticipating the word salary. No, I will not say what consideration I might give to that point myself, Mr. Copperfield, if I were unfettered. Mr. Jorkins is immovable. I was quite dismayed by the idea of this terrible Jorkins— but I found out afterwards that he was a mild man of a heavy temperament, whose place in the business was to keep himself in the background, and be constantly exhibited by name as the most obdurate and ruthless of men. If a clerk wanted his salary raised, Mr. Jorkins wouldn't listen to such a proposition. 
If a client were slow to settle his bill of costs, Mr. Jorkins was resolved to have it paid. And however painful these things might be, and always were, to the feelings of Mr. Spenlow, Mr. Jorkins would have his bond. The heart and hand of the good angel Spenlow would have been always open, but for the restraining demon Jorkins. As I have grown older, I think I have had experience of some other houses doing business on the principle of Spenlow and Jorkins. It was settled that I should begin my month's probation as soon as I pleased, and that my aunt need neither remain in town nor return at its expiration, as the articles of agreement of which I was to be the subject could easily be sent to her at home for her signature. When we had got so far, Mr. Spenlow offered to take me into court then and there, and show me what sort of place it was. As I was willing enough to know, we went out with this object, leaving my aunt behind, who would trust herself, she said, in no such place, and who, I think, regarded all courts of law as a sort of powder-mills that might blow up at any time. Mr. Spenlow conducted me through a paved courtyard, formed of grave brick houses, which I inferred from the doctor's names upon the doors, to be the official abiding-places of the learned advocates of whom Steerforth had told me, and into a large dull room, not unlike a chapel, to my thinking, on the left hand. The upper part of this room was fenced off from the rest, and there, on the two sides of a raised platform of the horseshoe form, sitting on easy old-fashioned dining-room chairs, were sundry gentlemen in red gowns and grey wigs, whom I found to be the doctors aforesaid. Blinking over a little desk, like a pulpit desk, in the curve of the horseshoe, was an old gentleman whom, if I had seen him in an aviary, I should certainly have taken for an owl, but who, I learned, was the presiding judge. In the space within the horseshoe, lower than these, that is to say on about the level of the floor, were sundry other gentlemen of Mr. Spenlow's rank, and dressed like him in black gowns with white fur upon them, sitting at a long green table. Their cravats were in general stiff, I thought, and their looks haughty, but in this last respect I presently conceived I had done them an injustice, for when two or three of them had to rise and answer a question of the presiding dignitary, I never saw anything more sheepish. The public, represented by a boy with a comforter, and a shabby genteel man secretly eating crumbs out of his coat-pockets, was warming itself at a stove in the centre of the court. The languid stillness of the place was only broken by the chirping of this fire, and by the voice of one of the doctors who was wandering slowly through a perfect library of evidence, and stopping to put up from time to time at little roadside inns of argument on the journey. Altogether I have never on any occasion made one at such a cosy, dosy, old-fashioned, time-forgotten, sleepy-headed little family party in all my life, and I felt it would be quite a soothing opiate to belong to it in any character, except perhaps as a suitor. Very well satisfied with the dreamy nature of this retreat, I informed Mr. Spenlow that I had seen enough for that time, and we rejoined my aunt, in company with whom I presently departed from the Commons, feeling very young when I went out of Spenlow and Jorkins's, on account of the clerks poking one another with their pens to point me out. We arrived at Lincoln's Inn Fields without any new adventures, except encountering an unlucky donkey in a costermonger's cart, who suggested painful associations to my aunt. We had another long talk about my plans when we were safely housed, and as I knew she was anxious to get home, and between fire, food, and pickpockets, could never be considered at her ease for half an hour in London, I urged her not to be uncomfortable on my account, but to leave me to take care of myself. "'I have not been here a week to-morrow without considering that, too, my dear,' she returned. "'There is a furnished little set of chambers to be let in the Adelphi trot, which ought to suit you to a marvel.' With this brief introduction, she produced from her pocket an advertisement carefully cut out of a newspaper, setting forth that in Buckingham Street in the Adelphi there was to be let furnished, with a view of the river, a singularly desirable and compact set of chambers, forming a genteel residence for a young gentleman, a member of one of the inns of court or otherwise, with immediate possession. Terms moderate, and could be taken for a month only if required." "'Why, this is the very thing, aunt,' said I, flushed with the possible dignity of living in chambers. "'Then come,' replied my aunt, immediately resuming the bonnet she had a minute before laid aside. "'We'll go and look at them.' Away we went. 
The advertisement directed us to apply to Mrs. Crupp on the premises, and we rung the area bell, which we supposed to communicate with Mrs. Crupp. It was not until we had rung three or four times that we could prevail on Mrs. Crupp to communicate with us, but at last she appeared, being a stout lady with a flounce of flannel petticoat below a nankeen gown. "'Let us see these chambers of yours, if you please, ma'am,' said my aunt. "'For this gentleman?' said Mrs. Crupp, feeling in her pocket for her keys. "'Yes, for my nephew,' said my aunt. "'And a sweet set they is for sitch,' said Mrs. Crupp. "'So we went upstairs. "'They were on the top of the house, a great point with my aunt, being near the fire escape, "'and consisted of a little half-blind entry, where you could see hardly anything, "'a little stone-blind pantry, where you could see nothing at all, "'a sitting-room and a bedroom. "'The furniture was rather faded, but quite good enough for me, "'and sure enough the river was outside the windows.' As I was delighted with the place, my aunt and Mrs. Crupp withdrew into the pantry to discuss the terms, while I remained on the sitting-room sofa, hardly daring to think it possible that I could be destined to live in such a noble residence. After a single combat of some duration they returned, and I saw to my joy, both in Mrs. Crupp's countenance and in my aunt's, that the deed was done. "'Is it the last occupant's furniture?' inquired my aunt. "'Yes, it is, ma'am,' said Mrs. Crupp. "'What's become of him?' asked my aunt. Mrs. Crupp was taken with a troublesome cough, in the midst of which she articulated with much difficulty, "'He was took ill here, ma'am, and—a—a—a—dear uh, 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 dear me and he died.' "'Hey, what did he die of?' asked my aunt. "'Well, ma'am, he died of drink,' said Mrs. Crupp, in confidence, "'and smoke.' "'Smoke? You don't mean chimneys,' said my aunt. "'No, ma'am,' returned Mrs. Crupp. "'Cigars and pipes.' "'That's not catching, Trot, at any rate,' remarked my aunt, turning to me. "'No, indeed,' said I. "'In short, my aunt, seeing how enraptured I was with the premises, "'took them for a month, with leave to remain for twelve months when that time was out. "'Mrs. Crupp was to find linen and to cook. "'Every other necessary was already provided, "'and Mrs. Crupp expressly intimated that she should always yearn towards me as a son.' I was to take possession the day after to-morrow, and Mrs. Crupp said, "'Thank heaven she had now found someone she could care for.' On our way back, my aunt informed me how she confidently trusted that the life I was now to lead would make me firm and self-reliant, which was all I wanted. She repeated this several times next day, in the intervals of our arranging for the transmission of my clothes and books from Mr. Wickfield's, relative to which, and to all my late holiday, I wrote a long letter to Agnes, of which my aunt took charge, as she was to leave on the succeeding day. Not to lengthen these particulars, I need only add that she made a handsome provision for all my possible wants during my month of trial, that Steerforth, to my great disappointment, and hers too, did not make his appearance before she went away, that I saw her safely seated in the Dover coach, exulting in the coming discomfiture of the vagrant donkeys, with Janet at her side, and that when the coach was gone, I turned my face to the Adelphi, pondering on the old days when I used to roam about its subterranean arches, and on the happy changes which had brought me to the surface. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter twenty four. My first dissipation. It was a wonderfully fine thing to have that lofty castle to myself and to feel, when I shut my outer door, like Robinson Crusoe when he had got into his fortification and pulled his ladder up after him. It was a wonderfully fine thing to walk about town with the key of my house in my pocket, and to know that I could ask any fellow to come home, and make quite sure of its being inconvenient to nobody if it were not so to me. It was a wonderfully fine thing to let myself in and out, and to come and go without a word to any one and to ring Mrs. Crupp up, gasping from the depths of the earth when I wanted her, and when she was disposed to come. 
All this, I say, was wonderfully fine. But I must say, too, that there were times when it was very dreary. It was fine in the morning, particularly in the fine mornings. It looked a very fresh, free life by daylight, still fresher and more free by sunlight. But as the day declined, the life seemed to go down, too. I don't know how it was. It seldom looked well by candlelight. I wanted somebody to talk to, then. I missed Agnes. I found a tremendous blank in the place of that smiling repository of my confidence. Mrs. Crupp appeared to be a long way off. I thought about my predecessor, who had died of drink and smoke, and I could have wished he had been so good as to live, and not bother me with his decease. After two days and nights I felt as if I had lived there for a year, and yet I was not an hour older, but was quite as much tormented by my own youthfulness as ever. Steerforth not yet appearing, which induced me to apprehend that he must be ill, I left the Commons early on the third day, and walked out to Highgate. Mrs. Steerforth was very glad to see me, and said that he had gone away with one of his Oxford friends to see another, who lived near St. Albans, but that she expected him to return to-morrow. I was so fond of him that I felt quite jealous of his Oxford friends. As she pressed me to stay to dinner, I remained, and I believe we talked about nothing but him all day. I told her how much the people liked him at Yarmouth, and what a delightful companion he had been. Miss Dartle was full of hints and mysterious questions, but took a great interest in all our proceedings there, and said, "'Was it really, though?' and so forth, so often, that she got everything out of me she wanted to know. Her appearance it was exactly what I have described it when I first saw her, but the society of the two ladies was so agreeable and came so natural to me that I felt myself falling a little in love with her. I could not help thinking several times in the course of the evening, and particularly when I walked home at night, what delightful company she would be in Buckingham Street. I was taking my coffee and roll in the morning, before going to the Commons, and I may observe in this place that it is surprising how much coffee Mrs. Crupp used, and how weak it was, considering, when Steerforth himself walked in, to my unbounded joy. "'My dear Steerforth,' cried I, "'I began to think I would never see you again.' "'I was carried off by force of arms,' said Steerforth, "'the very next morning after I got home. "'Why, Daisy, what a rare old bachelor you are here!' I showed him over the establishment, not omitting the pantry, with no little pride, and he commended it highly. "'I tell you what, old boy,' he added, "'I shall make quite a town-house of this place, unless you give me notice to quit.' This was a delightful hearing. I told him, if he waited for that, he would have to wait till doomsday. "'But you should have some breakfast,' said I, with my hand on the bell-rope. "'And Mrs. Crupp shall make you some fresh coffee, and I'll toast you some bacon in a bachelor's Dutch oven that I've got here.' "'No, no,' said Steerforth. "'Don't ring. I can't. I'm going to breakfast with one of these fellows who is at the Piazza Hotel in Covent Garden.' "'But you'll come back to dinner,' said I. "'I can't, upon my life. There's nothing I should like better, but I must remain with these two fellows. We're all three off together to-morrow morning.' "'Then bring them here to dinner,' I returned. "'Do you think they'd come?' "'Oh, they would come fast enough,' said Steerforth. "'But we should inconvenience you. You'd better come and dine with us somewhere.' I would not by any means consent to this, for it occurred to me that I really ought to have a little housewarming, and that there never could be a better opportunity. I had a new pride in my rooms after his approval of them, and burned with a desire to develop their utmost resources. I therefore made him promise positively in the names of his two friends, and we appointed six o'clock as the dinner hour. When he was gone, I rang for Mrs. Crupp, and acquainted her with my desperate design. Mrs. Crupp said, in the first place, of course, it was well known she couldn't be expected to wait, but she knew a handy young man who she thought could be prevailed upon to do it, and whose terms would be five shillings, and what I pleased. I said, certainly we should have him. Next Mrs. Crupp said it was clear she couldn't be in two places at once, which I felt to be reasonable, and that a young gal, stationed in the pantry with a bedroom candle, there never to desist from washing plates, would be indispensable. I said, what would be the expense of this young female? And Mrs. Crupp said, 
She supposed eighteen pence would neither make me nor break me. I said I supposed not, and that was settled. Then Mrs. Crupp said, Now about the dinner. It was a remarkable instance of want of forethought on the part of the ironmonger who had made Mrs. Crupp's kitchen fireplace, that it was capable of cooking nothing but chops and mashed potatoes. As to a fish kittle, Mrs. Crupp said, Well, would I only come and look at the range? She couldn't say fairer than that. Would I come and look at it? As that should not have been much the wiser if I had looked at it, I declined and said, Never mind fish. But Mrs. Crupp said, Don't say that. Oysters was in. Why not them? So that was settled. Mrs. Crupp then said what she would recommend would be this. A pair of hot roast fowls from the pastry-cooks, a dish of stewed beef with vegetables from the pastry-cooks, two little corner things as a raised pie and a dish of kidneys from the pastry-cooks, a tart, and if I liked, a shape of jelly from the pastry-cooks. This, Mrs. Crupp said, would leave her at full liberty to concentrate her mind on the potatoes, and to serve up the cheese and celery as she could wish to see it done. I acted on Mrs. Crupp's opinion, and gave the order at the pastry-cooks myself. Walking along the strand afterwards, and observing a hard mottled substance in the window of a ham and beef shop, which resembled marble, but was labelled mock turtle, I went in and bought a slab of it, which I have since seen reason to believe would have sufficed for fifteen people. This preparation, Mrs. Crupp, after some difficulty, consented to warm up and it shrunk so much in a liquid state that we found it what Steerforth called rather a tight fit for four. These preparations happily completed, I bought a little dessert in Covent Garden Market, and gave a rather extensive order at a retail wine merchant's in that vicinity. When I came home in the afternoon, and saw the bottles drawn up in a square on the pantry floor, they looked so numerous though there were two missing, which made Mrs. Crupp very uncomfortable, I was absolutely frightened of them. One of Steerforth's friends was named Granger, and the other Markham. They were both very gay and lively fellows, Granger something older than Steerforth, Markham youthful-looking, and I should say not more than twenty. I observed that the latter always spoke of himself indefinitely as a man and seldom or never in the first person singular. "'A man might get on very well here, Mr. Copperfield,' said Markham, meaning himself. "'It's not a bad situation,' said I, "'and the rooms are really commodious.' "'I hope you have both brought appetites with you,' said Steerforth. "'Upon my honour," returned Markham, "'town seems to sharpen a man's appetite. "'A man is hungry all day long. "'A man is perpetually eating.' Being a little embarrassed at first, and feeling much too young to preside, I made Steerforth take the head of the table when dinner was announced, and seated myself opposite to him. Everything was very good. We did not spare the wine, and he exerted himself so brilliantly to make the thing pass off well that there was no pause in our festivity. I was not quite such good company during dinner as I could have wished to be, for my chair was opposite the door and my attention was distracted by observing that the handy young man went out of the room very often, and that his shadow always presented itself immediately afterwards, on the wall of the entry, with a bottle at its mouth. The young girl likewise occasioned me some uneasiness, not so much by neglecting to wash the plates as by breaking them. For, being of an inquisitive disposition, and unable to confine herself, as her positive instructions were, to the pantry, she was constantly peering in at us, and constantly imagining herself detected, in which belief she several times retired upon the plates with which she had carefully paved the floor, and did a great deal of destruction. These, however, were small drawbacks, and easily forgotten when the cloth was cleared and the dessert put on the table, at which period of the entertainment the handy young man was discovered to be speechless giving him private directions to seek the society of Mrs. Crupp, and to remove the young gal to the basement also. I abandoned myself to enjoyment. I began by being singularly cheerful and light-hearted. All sorts of half-forgotten things to talk about came rushing into my mind, and made me hold forth in a most unwonted manner. 
I laughed heartily at my own jokes, and everybody else's. Called Steerforth to order for not passing the wine, made several engagements to go to Oxford, announced that I meant to have a dinner-party exactly like that once a week until further notice, and madly took so much snuff out of Granger's box that I was obliged to go into the pantry and have a private fit of sneezing at ten minutes long. I went on by passing the wine faster and faster yet, and continually starting up with a corkscrew to open more wine, long before any was needed. I proposed Steerforth's health. I said he was my dearest friend, the protector of my boyhood, and the companion of my prime. I said I was delighted to propose his health. I said I owed him more obligations than I could ever repay, and held him in a higher admiration than I could ever express. I finished by saying, "'I'll give you Steerforth. God bless him. Hooray!' We gave him three times three, and another, and a good one to finish with. I broke my glass in going round the table to shake hands with him, and I said, in two words, "'Steerforth, you're the guiding star of my existence.' I went on by finding suddenly that somebody was in the middle of a song. Markham was the singer, and he sang, When the heart of a man is depressed with care. He said, when he had sung it, he would give us woman. I took objection to that, and I couldn't allow it. I said it was not a respectful way of proposing the toast, and I would never permit that, that toast to be drunk in my house otherwise than the ladies. I was very high with him mainly, I think, because I saw Steerforth and Granger laughing at me, or at him, or at both of us. He said a man was not to be dictated to. I said a man was. He said a man was not to be insulted, then. I said he was right there, never under my roof, where the ladies were sacred and the laws of hospitality paramount. He said it was no derogation from a man's dignity to confess that I was a devilish good fellow. I instantly proposed his health. Somebody was smoking. We were all smoking. I was smoking, and trying to suppress a rising tendency to shudder. Steerforth had made a speech about me, in the course of which I had been affected almost to, to tears. I returned thanks, and hoped the present company would dine with me to-morrow, and the day after, each day at five o'clock, that we might enjoy the pleasures of conversation and society through a long evening. I felt called upon to propose an individual. I give them my aunt. Miss Betsy Trotwood, the best of her sex. Somebody was leaning out of my bedroom window, refreshing his forehead against the cool stone of the parapet, and feeling the air upon his face. It was myself. I was addressing myself as Copperfield, and saying, Why did you try to smoke? You might have known you couldn't do it. Now somebody was unsteadily contemplating his features in the looking-glass. That was I, too. I was very pale in the looking-glass, my eyes had a vacant appearance, and my hair, only my hair, nothing else, looked drunk. Somebody said to me, "'Let us go to the theatre, Copperfield.' There was no bedroom before me, but again the jingling table covered with glasses, the lamp, Granger on my right hand, Markham on my left, and Steerforth opposite, all sitting in a mist and a long way off. The theatre? To be sure, the very thing. Come along.' but they must excuse me if I saw everybody out first and turned the lamp off in case of fire. Owing to some confusion in the dark, the door was gone. I was feeling for it in the window curtains when Steerforth, laughing, took me by the arm and led me out. We went downstairs, one behind the another. Near the bottom somebody fell and rolled down. Somebody else said it was Copperfield. I was angry at that false report until, finding myself on my back in the passage, I began to think there might be some foundation for it. A very foggy night, with great rings round the lamps in the streets. There was an indistinct talk of its being wet. I considered it frosty. Steerforth dusted me under a lamp-post, and put my hat into shape, which somebody produced from somewhere in a most extraordinary manner, for I hadn't had it on before. Steerforth then said, "'You are right, Copperfield, are you not?' And I told him, "'No, Vera.' A man, sitting in a pigeon-hole place, looked out of the fog and took money from somebody, inquiring if I was one of the gentlemen paid for, and appearing rather doubtful, as I remember in the glimpse I had of him, whether to take the money for me or not. Shortly afterwards 
we were very high up in a very hot theatre looking down into a large pit that seemed to me to smoke. The people with whom it was crammed were so indistinct. There was a great stage, too, looking very clean and smooth after the streets, and there were people upon it, talking about something or other, but not at all intelligibly. There was an abundance of bright lights, and there was music, and there were ladies down in the boxes, and I don't know what more. The whole building looked to me as if it were learning to swim. It conducted itself in such an unaccountable manner when I tried to steady it. On somebody's motion, we resolved to go downstairs to the dress-boxes where the ladies were. A gentleman lounging, full-dressed, on a sofa, with an opera-glass in his hand, passed before my view, and also my own figure at full length in a glass. Then I was being ushered into one of these boxes, and found myself saying something as I sat down, and people about me crying, Silence! to somebody, and ladies casting indignant glances at me, and, What! Yes! Agnes! sitting on the seat before me, in the same box, with a lady and gentleman beside whom I didn't know. I see her face now, better than I did then, I dare say, with this indelible look of regret and wonder turned upon me. Agnes! I said thickly. Lord bless me! Agnes! Hush! Pray! she answered. I could not conceive why. You disturb the company. Look at the stage! I tried, on her injunction, to fix it, and to hear something of what was going on there, but quite in vain. I looked at her again, by and by, and saw her shrink into her corner, and put her gloved hand to her forehead. Agnes, I said, I'm afraid you're not well. Yes, yes, do not mind me, Trotwood, she returned. Listen, are you going away soon? Am I going away soon? I repeated. Yes. I had a stupid intention of replying that I was going to wait to hand her downstairs. I suppose I expressed it somehow, for after she had looked at me attentively for a little while, she appeared to understand, and replied in a low tone, "'I know you will do as I ask you if I tell you I am very earnest in it. Go away now, Trotwood, for my sake, and ask your friends to take you home.' She had so far improved me for the time, that though I was angry with her, I felt ashamed, with a short, "'Hurry!' which I intended for good-night, got up and went away. They followed, and I stepped at once out of the box-door into my bedroom, where only Steerforth was with me, helping me to undress, and where I was by turn telling him that Agnes was my sister, and adjuring him to bring the corkscrew that I might open another bottle of wine. How somebody lying in my bed lay saying and doing all this over again, at cross-purposes in a feverish dream all night, the bed a rocking sea that was never still? How, as that somebody slowly settled down into myself, did I begin to parch, and feel as if my outer covering of skin were a hard board, my tongue the bottom of an empty kettle, furred with long service, and burning up over a slow fire, the palms of my hands hot plates of metal which no ice could cool? but the agony of mind, the remorse and shame I felt when I became conscious next day. My horror of having committed a thousand offences I had forgotten, and which nothing could ever expiate. My recollection of that indelible look which Agnes had given me. The torturing impossibility of communicating with her, not knowing, beast that I was, how she came to be in London or where she stayed. My disgust, of the very sight of the room where the revel had been held, my racking head, the smell of smoke, the sight of glasses, the impossibility of going out, or even getting up. Oh, what a day it was! Oh, what an evening, when I sat down by my fire to a basin of mutton broth, dimpled all over with fat, and thought I was going the way of my predecessor, and should succeed to his dismal story as well as to his chambers, and had half a mind to rush express to Dover, and reveal all. What an evening! When Mrs. Crupp, coming in to take away the broth basin, produced one kidney on a cheese plate as the entire remains of yesterday's feast, and I was really inclined to fall upon her nankeen breast and say in heartfelt penitence, Oh, Mrs. Crupp, Mrs. Crupp, never mind the broken meats. I'm very miserable. Only that I doubted, even at that pass, if Mrs. Crupp were quite the sort of woman to confide in. End of chapter 24 Recording by Simon Evers
Chapter Twenty Five of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Five. Good and Bad Angels. I was going out at my door on the morning after that deplorable day of headache, sickness, and repentance, with an odd confusion in my mind relative to the date of my dinner-party, as if a body of titans had taken an enormous lever and pushed the day before yesterday some months back, when I saw a ticket-porter coming upstairs with a letter in his hand. He was taking his time about his errand then, but when he saw me on the top of the staircase, looking at him over the banisters, he swung into a trot, and came up panting as if he had run himself into a state of exhaustion. "'T. Copperfield, Esquire,' said the ticket-porter, touching his hat with his little cane. I could scarcely lay claim to the name. I was so disturbed by the conviction that the letter came from Agnes. However, I told him that I was T. Copperfield, Esquire, and he believed it, and gave me the letter which he said required an answer. I shut him out on the landing to wait for the answer, and went into my chambers again in such a nervous state that I was fain to lay the letter down on my breakfast-table and familiarise myself with the outside of it a little before I could resolve to break the seal. I found when I did open it that it was a very kind note containing no reference to my condition at the theatre. All it said was, My dear Trotwood, I am staying at the house of my papa's agent, Mr. Waterbrook, in Ely Place, Holborn. Will you come and see me to-day, at any time you like to appoint? Ever yours affectionately, Agnes. It took me such a long time to write an answer at all to my satisfaction, that I don't know what the ticket-porter can have thought, unless he thought I was learning to write. I must have written half a dozen answers at least. I began one, How can I ever hope, my dear Agnes, to efface from your remembrance the disgusting impression? There I didn't like it, and then I tore it up. I began another. Shakespeare has observed, my dear Agnes, how strange it is that a man should put an Emmy into his ma— That reminded me of Markham, and it got no farther. I even tried poetry. I began one note, in a six-syllable line. Oh, do not remember— But that associated itself with the 5th of November, and became an absurdity. After many attempts, I wrote, My dear Agnes— your letter is like you, and what could I say of it that would be higher praise than that? I will come at four o'clock. Affectionately and sorrowfully, T. C. With this missive, which I was in twenty minds at once about recalling as soon as it was out of my hands, the ticket-porter at last departed. If the day were half as tremendous to any other professional gentleman in Doctors' Commons as it was to me, I sincerely believe he made some expiation for his share in that rotten old ecclesiastical cheese. Although I left the office at half-past three, and was prowling about the place of appointment within a few minutes afterwards, the appointed time was exceeded by a full quarter of an hour, according to the clock of St. Andrew's Holborn, before I could muster up sufficient desperation to pull the private bell-handle let into the left-hand door-post of Mr. Waterbrake's house. The professional business of Mr. Waterbrook's establishment was done on the ground floor, and the genteel business, of which there was a good deal, in the upper part of the building. I was shown into a pretty but rather close drawing-room, and there sat Agnes knitting a purse. She looked so quiet and good, and reminded me so strongly of my airy, fresh school-days at Canterbury, and the sodden, smoky, stupid wretch I had been the other night, that, nobody being by, I yielded to my self-reproach and shame, and, in short, made a fool of myself. I cannot deny that I shed tears. To this hour I am undecided whether it was upon the whole the wisest thing I could have done, or the most ridiculous. "'If it had been any one but you, Agnes,' said I, turning away my head, "'I should not have minded it half so much. But that it should have been you who saw me. I almost wish I had been dead first. She put her hand— its touch was like no other hand, upon my arm for a moment, and I felt so befriended and comforted that I could not help moving it to my lips and gratefully kissing it. "'Sit down,' said Agnes cheerfully. "'Don't be unhappy, Trotwood. 
if you cannot confidently trust me, whom will you trust? Our Agnes, I returned, you are my good angel. She smiled rather sadly, I thought, and shook her head. Yes, Agnes, my good angel, always my good angel. If I were indeed Trotwood, she returned, there is one thing that I should set my heart on very much. I looked at her inquiringly, but already with a foreknowledge of her meaning. On warning you, said Agnes, with a steady glance, against your bad angel. My dear Agnes, I began, if you mean Steerforth, I do, Trotwood, she returned. Then, Agnes, you wrong him very much. He my bad angel, or any one's. He anything but a guide, a support, and a friend to me. My dear Agnes, now is it not unjust and unlike you to judge him from what you saw of me the other night? I do not judge him from what I saw of you the other night, she quietly replied. From what, then? From many things, trifles in themselves, but they do not seem to me to be so when they are put together. I judge him partly from your account of him, Trotwood, and your character, and the influence he has over you. There was always something in her modest voice that seemed to touch a chord within me, answering to that sound alone. It was always earnest, but when it was very earnest, as it was now, there was a thrill in it that quite subdued me. I sat looking at her as she cast her eyes down on her work. I sat seeming still to listen to her, and Steerforth, in spite of all my attachment to him, darkened in that tone. "'It is very bold in me,' said Agnes, looking up again, "'who have lived in such seclusion, and can know so little of the world, "'to give you my advice so confidently, or even to have this strong opinion. "'But I know in what it is engendered, Trotwood, "'in how true a remembrance of our having grown up together, "'and in how true an interest in all relating to you. "'It is that which makes me bold. "'I am certain that what I say is right. "'I am quite sure it is.' I feel as if it were someone else speaking to you, and not I, when I caution you that you have made a dangerous friend. Again I looked at her, again I listened to her after she was silent, and again his image, though it was still fixed in my heart, darkened. "'I am not so unreasonable as to expect,' said Agnes, resuming her usual tone, after a little while, "'that you will—' or that you can at once change any sentiment that has become a conviction to you, least of all a sentiment that is rooted in your trusting disposition. You ought not hastily to do that. I only ask you, Trotwood, if you ever think of me, I mean, with a quiet smile, for I was going to interrupt her, and she knew why, as often as you think of me, to think of what I have said. Do you forgive me for all this?' "'I will forgive you, Agnes,' I replied, "'when you come to do Steerforth justice, "'and to like him as well as I do.' "'Not until then,' said Agnes. "'I saw a passing shadow on her face "'when I made this mention of him, "'but she returned my smile, "'and we were again as unreserved "'in our mutual confidence as of old. "'And when, Agnes,' said I, "'will you forgive me the other night?' "'When I recall it,' said Agnes.' She would have dismissed the subject so, but I was too full of it to allow that, and insisted on telling her how it happened that I had disgraced myself, and what chain of accidental circumstances it had the theatre for its final link. It was a great relief to me to do this, and to enlarge on the obligation that I owed to Steerforth for his care of me, when I was unable to take care of myself. "'You must not forget,' said Agnes, calmly changing the conversation as soon as I had concluded, that you are always to tell me, not only when you fall into trouble, but when you fall in love. Who has succeeded to Miss Larkins, Trotwood? No one, Agnes. Some one, Trotwood, said Agnes, laughing and holding up her finger. No, Agnes, upon my word. There is a lady, certainly, at Mrs. Steerforth's house, who is very clever, and whom I liked to talk to, Miss Dartle. But I don't adore her. Agnes laughed again at her own penetration, and told me that if I were faithful to her in my confidence, she thought she could keep a little register of my violent attachments, with the date, duration, and termination of each, like the table of the reigns of the kings and queens in the history of England. Then she asked me 
if I had seen Uriah. Uriah Heep, said I. No. Is he in London? He comes to the office downstairs every day, returned Agnes. He was in London a week before me. I am afraid on disagreeable business, Trotwood. On some business that made you uneasy, Agnes, I see, said I. What can that be? Agnes laid aside her work, and replied, folding her hands upon one another, and looking pensively at me out of those beautiful soft eyes of hers. I believe he is going to enter into partnership with papa. What? Uriah? That mean, fawning fellow, worm himself into such promotion? I cried indignantly. Have you made no remonstrance about it, Agnes? Consider what a connection it is likely to be. You must speak out. You must not allow your father to take such a mad step. You must prevent it, Agnes, while there's time. Still looking at me, Agnes shook her head while I was speaking, with a faint smile at my warmth, and then replied, "'You remember our last conversation about Papa? It was not long after that, not more than two or three days, when he gave me the first intimation of what I tell you. It was sad to see him struggling between his desire to represent it to me as a matter of choice on his part, and his inability to conceal that it was forced upon him. I felt very sorry.' "'Forced upon him, Agnes? Who forces it upon him?' "'Uriah,' she replied, after a moment's hesitation, "'has made himself indispensable to Papa. "'He is subtle and watchful. "'He has mastered Papa's weaknesses, fostered them, "'and taken advantage of them, until, "'to say all that I mean in a word, Trotwood, "'until Papa is afraid of him.' "'There was more that she might have said, "'more than she knew, or that she suspected.' I clearly saw. I could not give her pain by asking what it was, for I knew that she withheld it from me to spare her father. It had long been going on to this, I was sensible. Yes, I could not but feel on the least reflection that it had been going on to this for a long time. I remained silent. His ascendancy over Papa, said Agnes, is very great. He professes humility and gratitude, with truth, perhaps, I hope so, but his position is really one of power, and I fear he makes a hard use of his power. I said he was a hound, which at the moment was a great satisfaction to me. At the time I speak of as the time when Papa spoke to me, pursued Agnes, he had told Papa that he was going away, that he was very sorry and unwilling to leave, but that he had better prospects. Papa was very much depressed then, and more bowed down by care than ever you or I have seen him. But he seemed relieved by this expedient of the partnership, though at the same time he seemed hurt by it and ashamed of it. "'And how did you receive it, Agnes?' "'I did, Trotwood,' she replied, "'what I hoped was right. Feeling sure that it was necessary for Papa's peace that the sacrifice should be made, I entreated him to make it. I said it would lighten the load of his life.' I hope it will, and that it will give me increased opportunities of being his companion. Oh, Trotwood! cried Agnes, putting her hands before her face as her tear started on it. I almost feel as if I had been Papa's enemy instead of his loving child. For I know how he has altered in his devotion to me. I know how he has narrowed the circle of his sympathies and duties in the concentration of his whole mind upon me. I know what a multitude of things he has shut out for my sake— and how his anxious thoughts of me have shadowed his life and weakened his strength and energy by turning them always upon one idea. If I could ever set this right, if I could ever work out his restoration, as I have so innocently been the cause of his decline. I had never before seen Agnes cry. I had seen tears in her eyes when I had brought new honours home from school, and I had seen them there when we last spoke about her father, and I had seen her turn her gentle head aside when we took leave of one another. But I had never seen her grieve like this. It made me so sorry that I could only say in a foolish, helpless manner, "'Pray, Agnes, don't. Don't, my dear sister!' But Agnes was too superior to me in character and purpose, as I know well now, whatever I might know or not know then, to be long in need of my entreaties. The beautiful, calm manner which made her so different in my remembrance from everybody else came back again as if a cloud had passed from a serene sky. 
"'We are not likely to remain alone much longer.' said Agnes, and while I have an opportunity, let me earnestly entreat you, Trotwood, to be friendly to Uriah. Don't repel him. Don't resent, as I think you have a general disposition to do, what may be uncongenial to you in him. He may not deserve it, for we know no certain ill of him. In any case, think first of papa and me. Agnes had no time to say more, for the room door opened, and Mrs. Waterbrook, who was a large lady, or who wore a large dress, I don't exactly know which, for I don't know which was dress and which was lady, came sailing in. I had a dim recollection of having seen her at the theatre, as if I had seen her in a pale magic lantern. But she appeared to remember me perfectly, and still to suspect me of being in a state of intoxication. Finding by degrees, however, that I was sober, and, I hope, that I was a modest young gentleman, Mrs. Waterbrook softened towards me considerably, and inquired, firstly, if I went much into the parks, and secondly, if I went much into society. On my replying to both these questions in the negative, it occurred to me that I fell again in her good opinion, but she concealed the fact gracefully, and invited me to dinner next day. I accepted the invitation, and took my leave, making a call on Uriah in the office as I went out, and leaving a card for him in his absence. When I went to dinner next day, and on the street door being open plunged into a vapour bath of haunch of mutton, I divined that I was not the only guest, for I immediately identified the ticket porter in disguise, assisting the family servant, and waiting at the foot of the stairs to carry up my name. He looked, to the best of his ability, when he asked me for it confidentially, as if he had never seen me before but well did I know him, and well did he know me. Conscience made cowards of us both. I found Mr. Waterbrook to be a middle-aged gentleman with a short throat, and a good deal of shirt-collar, who only wanted a black nose to be the portrait of a pug-dog. He told me he was happy to have the honour of making my acquaintance, and when I had paid my homage to Mrs. Waterbrook, presented me with much ceremony to a very awful lady in a black velvet dress, and a great black velvet hat, whom I remember as looking like a near relation of Hamlet's, say, his aunt. Mrs. Henry Spiker was this lady's name, and her husband was there too, so cold a man that his head, instead of being grey, seemed to be sprinkled with hoar-frost. Immense deference was shown to the Henry Spikers, male and female, which Agnes told me was on account of Mr. Henry Spiker being solicitor to something, or to somebody, I forget what or which, remotely connected with the treasury. I found Uriah Heap among the company, in a suit of black, and in deep humility. He told me, when I shook hands with him, that he was proud to be noticed by me, and that he really felt obliged to me for my condescension. I could have wished he had been less obliged to me, for he hovered about me in his gratitude all the rest of the evening, and whenever I said a word to Agnes was sure, with his shadowless eyes and cadaverous face, to be looking gauntly down upon us from behind. There were other guests, all iced for the occasion, as it struck me, like the wine. But there was one who attracted my attention before he came in, on account of my hearing him announced as Mr. Traddles. My mind flew back to Salem House, and could it be Tommy, I thought, who used to draw the skeletons? I looked for Mr. Traddles with unusual interest. He was a sober, steady-looking young man of retiring manners, with a comic head of hair, and eyes that were rather wide open, and he got into an obscure corner so soon that I had some difficulty in making him out. At length I had a good view of him, and either my vision deceived me, or it was the old, unfortunate Tommy. I made my way to Mr. Waterbrook, and said that I believed I had the pleasure of seeing an old schoolfellow there. "'Indeed,' said Mr. Waterbrook, surprised. "'You are too young to have been at school with Mr. Henry Spiker.' Oh, I, "'I don't mean him,' I replied. "'I mean the gentleman named Traddles.' "'Oh, I, I indeed,' said my host, with much diminished interest. Uh, "'Possibly.' "'If it's really the same person,' said I, glancing towards him, "'it was at a place called Salem House where we were together, "'and he was an excellent fellow.' 
Oh, yes, Traddles is a good fellow, returned my host, nodding his head with an air of toleration. Traddles is quite a good fellow. It's a curious coincidence, said I. It is really, returned my host, quite a coincidence that Traddles should be here at all, as Traddles was only invited this morning, when the place at table intended to be occupied by Mrs. Henry Spiker's brother, became vacant in consequence of his indisposition. A very gentlemanly man, Mrs. Henry Spiker's brother, Mr. Copperfield. I murmured an assent, which was full of feeling, considering that I knew nothing at all about him, and I inquired what Mr. Traddles was by profession. Uh, Traddles, returned Mr. Waterbrook, is a young man reading for the bar. Yes, he is quite a good fellow. Nobody's enemy but his own. Is he his own enemy? said I, sorry to hear this. Well, returned Mr. Waterbrook, pursing up his mouth and playing with his watch-chain in a comfortable, prosperous sort of way. I should say he was one of those men who stand in their own light. Yes, I should say he would never, for example, be worth five hundred pound. Uh, Traddles was recommended to me by a professional friend. Oh, yes, yes, he has a kind of talent for drawing briefs and stating a case in writing, plainly. I am able to throw something in Traddles' way in the course of the year. Something for him considerable. Oh, yes, yes. I was much impressed by the extremely comfortable and satisfied manner in which Mr. Waterbrook delivered himself of this little word, yes, every now and then. There was wonderful expression in it. It completely conveyed the idea of a man who had been born, not to say with a silver spoon, but with a scaling ladder, and had gone on mounting all the heights of life, one after another, until now he looked from the top of the fortifications, with the eye of a philosopher and a patron, on the people down in the trenches. My reflections on this theme were still in progress when dinner was announced. Mr. Waterbrook went down with Hamlet's aunt. Mr. Henry Spiker took Mrs. Waterbrook. Agnes, whom I should have liked to take myself, was given to a simpering fellow with weak legs. Uriah, Traddles, and I, as the junior part of the company, went down last, how we could. I was not so vexed at losing Agnes as I might have been, since it gave me an opportunity of making myself known to Traddles on the stairs, who greeted me with great fervour, while Uriah writhed with such unobtrusive satisfaction and self-abasement that I could gladly have pitched him over the banisters. Traddles and I were separated at table, being billeted in two remote corners, he in the glare of a red velvet lady, I in the gloom of Hamlet's aunt. The dinner was very long, and the conversation was about the aristocracy and blood. Mrs. Waterbrook repeatedly told us that if she had a weakness, it was blood. It occurred to me several times that we should have got on better if we had not been quite so genteel. We were so exceedingly genteel that our scope was very limited. A Mr. and Mrs. Gulpidge were of the party, who had something to do at second hand at least Mr. Gulpidge had, with the law business of the bank. And what with the bank, and what with the treasury, we were as exclusive as the court circular. To mend the matter, Hamlet's aunt had the family failing of indulging in soliloquy, and held forth in a desultory manner by herself on every topic that was introduced. These were few enough, to be sure, but as we always fell back upon blood, she had as wide a field for abstract speculation as her nephew himself. We might have been a party of ogres, the conversation assumed such a sanguine complexion. "'I confess I am of Mrs. Waterbrook's opinion,' said Mr. Waterbrook, with his wine-glass at his eye. "'Other things are all very well in their way, but give me blood.' "'Oh, there is nothing.' observed Hamlet's aunt, so satisfactory to one, there is nothing that is so much one's beau ideal of, of all that sort of thing, speaking generally. There are some low minds, not many, I am happy to believe, but there are some, that would prefer to do what I should call bow down before idols, positively idols, before service, intellect, and so on, but these are intangible points. Blood is not so. We see blood in a nose, and we know it. We meet it with a chin, and we say, There it is. That's blood. It is an actual matter of fact. We point it out. It admits of no doubt. 
a simpering fellow with a weak legs, who had taken Agnes down, stated the question more decisively yet, I thought. "'Oh, you know, deuce take it,' said this gentleman, looking round the board with an imbecile smile. "'We can't forego blood, you know. We must have blood, you know. Some young fellows, you know, may be a little behind their station, perhaps, in point of education and behaviour, and may go a little wrong, you know, and get themselves and other people into a variety of fixes and all that, but deuce take it, it's delightful to reflect that they've got blood in them.' "'Myself, I'd rather at any time be knocked down by a man who'd got blood in him "'than I'd be picked up by a man who hadn't.' "'This sentiment, as compressing the general question into a nutshell, "'gave the utmost satisfaction, and brought the gentleman to great notice "'until the ladies retired. "'After that, I observed that Mr. Gulpidge and Mr. Henry Spiker, "'who had hitherto been very distant, "'entered into a defensive alliance against us, the common enemy,' and exchange a mysterious dialogue across the table for our defeat and overthrow. "'That affair of the first bond for four thousand five hundred pounds has not taken the course that I was expecting, Spiker,' said Mr. Gulpidge. "'Do you mean the D of A's?' said Mr. Spiker. "'The C of B's,' said Mr. Gulpidge. Mr. Spiker raised his eyebrows and looked much concerned. "'When the question was referred to Lord... "'I needn't name him,' said Mr. Carpidge, checking himself. "'I understand,' said Mr. Spiker. "'N.' Mr. Galpidge darkly nodded. "'Was referred to him. His answer was, "'Money or no release.' "'Lord bless my soul!' cried Mr. Spiker. "'Money or no release,' repeated Mr. Galpidge firmly. "'The next in reversion. You understand me?' "'K.' said Mr. Spiker, with an ominous look. K. then positively refused to sign. He was attended at Newmarket for that purpose, and he point-blank refused to do it. Mr. Spiker was so interested that he became quite stony. "'So the matter rests at this hour,' said Mr. Galpidge, throwing himself back in his chair. "'Our friend Waterbrook will excuse me if I forbear to explain myself generally on account of the magnitude of the interests involved.' Mr. Waterbrook was only too happy, as it appeared to me, to have such interests and such names even hinted at across his table. He exhumed an expression of gloomy intelligence, though I am persuaded he knew no more about the discussion than I did, and highly approved of the discretion that had been observed. Mr. Spiker, after the receipt of such a confidence, naturally desired to favour his friend with a confidence of his own. Therefore, a foregoing dialogue was succeeded by another, in which it was Mr. Galpidge's turn to be surprised, and that by another, in which the surprise came round to Mr. Spiker's turn again, and so on, turn and turn about. All this time, we, the outsiders, remained oppressed by the tremendous interests involved in the conversation, and our host regarded us with pride as the victims of a salutary awe and astonishment. I was very glad indeed to get upstairs to Agnes, and to talk with her in a corner, and to introduce Traddles to her, who was shy but agreeable, and the same good-natured creature still. As he was obliged to leave early on account of going away next morning for a month, I had not nearly so much conversation with him as I could have wished. But we exchanged addresses, and promised ourselves the pleasure of another meeting when he should come back to town. He was greatly interested to hear that I knew Steerforth, and spoke of him with such warmth that I made him tell Agnes what he thought of him. But Agnes only looked at me the while, and very slightly shook her head when only I observed her. As she was not among people with whom I believed she could be very much at home, I was almost glad to hear that she was going away within a few days, though I was sorry at the prospect of parting from her again so soon. This caused me to remain until all the company were gone. Conversing with her, and hearing her sing, was such a delightful reminder to me of my happy life in the grave old house she had made so beautiful, that I could have remained there half the night. But, having no excuse for staying any longer, when the lights of Mr. Waterbrook's society were all snuffed out, I took my leave very much against my inclination. I felt then, more than ever, that she was my better angel and if I thought of her sweet face and placid smile, as though they had shone on me from some removed being, like an angel, 
I hope I thought no harm. I have said that the company were all gone, but I ought to have accepted Uriah, whom I don't include in that denomination, and who had never ceased to hover near us. He was close behind me when I went downstairs. He was close beside me when I walked away from the house, slowly fitting his long skeleton fingers into the still longer fingers of a great Guy Fawkes pair of gloves. It was in no disposition for Uriah's company, but in remembrance of the entreaty Agnes had made to me, that I asked him if he would come home to my rooms and have some coffee. "'Oh, really, Mr. Copperfield,' he rejoined, "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Copperfield, but the other comes so naturally. I don't like that you should put a constraint upon yourself to ask a numble person like me to your house.' "'There is no constraint in the case,' said I. "'Will you come?' "'I should like to very much,' replied Uriah, with a writhe. "'Well, then, come along,' said I. I could not help being rather short with him, but he appeared not to mind it. We went the nearest way, without conversing much upon the road, and he was so humble in a respect to those scarecrow gloves, that he was still putting them on, and seemed to have made no advance in that labour, when we got to my place. I led him up the dark stairs, to prevent his knocking his head against anything, and really his damp, cold hand felt so like a frog in mine that I was tempted to drop it and run away. Agnes and hospitality prevailed, however, and I conducted him to my fireside. When I lighted my candles, he fell into meek transports with the room that was revealed to him, and when I heated the coffee in an unassuming block-tin vessel in which Mrs. Crupp delighted to prepare it, chiefly, I believe, because it was not intended for the purpose, being a shaving-pot, and because there was a patent invention of great price mouldering away in the pantry, he professed so much emotion that I could joyfully have scalded him. "'Oh, really, Master Copperfield, I, I mean, Mr. Copperfield,' said Uriah. To see you waiting upon me is what I never could have expected. But one way and another so many things happen to me which I could never have expected. I am sure in my humble station that it seems to rain blessings on me head. You have heard something, I dare say, of a change in my expectations, Master Copperfield, I should say, Mr. Copperfield. As he sat on my sofa with his long knees drawn up under his coffee-cup, his hat and gloves upon the ground close to him, his spoon going softly round and round, his shadowless red eyes, which looked as if they had scorched their lashes off, turned towards me without looking at me, the disagreeable dints I have formerly described in his nostrils coming and going with his breath, and a snaky undulation pervading his frame from his chin to his boots, I decided in my own mind that I just disliked him intensely. It may be very uncomfortable to have him for a guest, for I was young then, and unused to disguise what I so strongly felt. "'You've heard something, I dare say, of a change in my expectations, Master Copperfield, I should say, Mr. Copperfield,' observed Uriah. Uh, "'Yes,' I said, "'something.' "'Ah, I thought Miss Agnes would know of it,' he quietly returned. "'I'm glad to find Miss Agnes knows of it. Oh, thank you, Master, uh, Mr. Copperfield.' I could have thrown my boot-jack at him, it lay ready on the rug, for having entrapped me into the disclosure of anything concerning Agnes, however immaterial. But I only drank my coffee. "'What a profit you've shown yourself, Mr. Copperfield!' pursued Uriah. "'Dear me, what a profit you've proved yourself to be! Don't you remember saying to me once that perhaps I should be a partner in Mr. Wickfield's business, and perhaps it might be Wickfield and Heap? You may not recollect it, but when a person is humble, Master Copperfield, a person treasures such things up. I recollect talking about it, said I, so I certainly did not think it very likely then. Who, who would have thought it likely, Mr. Copperfield? returned Uriah enthusiastically. I'm sure I didn't myself. I recollect saying with my own lips that I was much too humble. So I considered myself really and truly... He sat with that carved grin on his face, looking at the fire, as I looked at him. "'But the humblest persons, Master Copperfield,' he presently resumed, "'may be the instruments of good. I'm glad to think I've been the instrument of good to Mr. Wickfield, and that I may be more so. Oh, what a worthy man he is, Mr. Copperfield, but how imprudent he has been!' 
I am sorry to hear it, said I. I could not help adding, rather pointedly, on all accounts. Oh, decidedly so, Mr. Copperfield, replied Uriah, on all accounts. Miss Agnes is above all. You don't remember your own eloquent expressions, Master Copperfield? But I remember how you said one day that everybody must admire her, and how I thanked you for it. You forgot that, I have no doubt, Master Copperfield? No, said I dryly. Oh, how glad I am you have not! exclaimed Uriah. To think that you should be the first to kindle the sparks of ambition in my humble breast, and that you've not forgotten it. Oh, uh, would you excuse me asking for a cup more coffee? Something in the emphasis he laid upon the kindling of those sparks, and something in the glance he directed at me as he said it, had made me start, as if I had seen him illuminated by a blaze of light. Recalled by his request, preferred in quite another tone of voice, I did the honours of the shaving-pot, but I did them with an unsteadiness of hand a sudden sense of being no match for him, and a perplexed suspicious anxiety as to what he might be going to say next, which I felt could not escape his observation. He said nothing at all. He stirred his coffee round and round, he sipped it, he felt his chin softly with his grisly hand, he looked at the fire, he looked about the room, he gasped rather than smiled at me, he writhed and undulated about in his deferential servility, he stirred and sipped again, but he left the renewal of the conversation to me. "'So, Mr. Wickfield,' said I at last, "'who is worth five hundred of you or me, for my life, I think I could not have helped dividing that part of the sentences with an awkward jerk, has been imprudent, has he, Mr. Heap?' "'Oh, very imprudent indeed, Master Copperfield,' returned Uriah, sighing modestly. "'Oh, very much so. But I wish you'd call me Uriah, if you please. It's like old times.' "'Well, Uriah,' said I, bolting it out with some difficulty. "'Thank you,' he returned with fervour. "'Thank you, Master Copperfield. It's like the blowing of old breezes of the ringing of old bells is to hear you say Uriah.' "'I beg your pardon.' "'Was I making any observation?' Uh, "'About Mr. Wickfield,' I suggested. "'Oh, yes, truly,' said Uriah. "'Ah, great imprudence, Master Copperfield. "'It's a topic that I wouldn't touch upon to any cell but you. "'Even to you I can only touch upon it, and no more. "'If anyone else had been in my place during the last few years, "'by this time he would have had Mr. Wickfield. "'Oh, what a worthy man he is, Master Copperfield, too. "'Under his thumb. "'Under his thumb. Thumb, said Uriah, very slowly, as he stretched out his cruel-looking hand above my table, and pressed his own thumb upon it, until it shook, and shook the room. If I had been obliged to look at him with his splay foot on Mr. Wickfield's head, I think I could scarcely have hated him more. "'Oh, dear, yes, Master Copperfield,' he proceeded, in a soft voice, most remarkably contrasting with the action of his thumb, which did not diminish its hard pressure in the least degree. "'There's no doubt of it. There would have been loss, disgrace, I don't know what at all. Mr. Wickfield knows it. I am the humble instrument of humbly serving him, and he puts me on an eminence I hardly could have hoped to reach. How thankful should I be!' With his face turned towards me as he finished, but without looking at me, he took his crooked thumb off the spot where he had planted it, and slowly and thoughtfully scraped his lank jaw with it, as if he were shaving himself. I recollect well how indignantly my heart beat, as I saw his crafty face, with the appropriately red light of the fire upon it, preparing for something else. "'Master Copperfield,' he began, "'but am I keeping you up?' "'You are not keeping me up. I generally go to bed late.' "'Thank you, Master Copperfield. I have risen from my humble station since first you used to address me, it is true. But I am humble still. I hope I never shall be otherwise than humble. You will not think the worse of my humbleness if I make a little confidence to you, Master Copperfield, will you?' "'Oh, no,' said I, with an effort. "'Thank you.' He took out his pocket-handkerchief, and began wiping the palms of his hands. "'Miss Agnes, Master Copperfield?' "'Well, Uriah?' "'Oh, how pleasant to be called Uriah spontaneously!' he cried, 
and gave himself a little jerk, like a convulsive fish. "'You thought her looking very beautiful to-night, Master Copperfield?' "'I thought her looking as she always does, superior in all respects to everyone around her,' I returned. "'Oh, thank you, it's so true,' he cried. "'Oh, thank you very much for that.' "'Not at all,' I said loftily. "'There is no reason why you should thank me.' "'Why, that, Master Copperfield,' said Uriah, "'is in fact the confidence that I am going to take the liberty of reposing. "'Humble as I am,' he put his hands harder, and looked at them and at the fire by turns, "'humble as my mother is, and lowly as our poor but honest roof has ever been, "'the image of Miss Agnes—' I don't mind trusting you with my secret, Mr. Copperfield, for I have always overflowed towards you since the first moment I had the pleasure of beholding you in a pony chay. Has been in my breast for years. Oh, Master Copperfield, with what a pure affection do I love the ground my Agnes walks on! I believe I had a delirious idea of seizing the red-hot poker out of the fire and running him through with it. It went from me with a shock like a ball fired from a rifle, but the image of Agnes, outraged by so much as a thought of this red-headed animal's, remained in my mind when I looked at him, sitting all awry, as if his mean soul griped his body, and it made me giddy. He seemed to swell and grow before my eyes, the room seemed full of the echoes of his voice, and the strange feeling, to which perhaps no one is quite a stranger, that all this had occurred before, at some indefinite time, and that I knew what he was going to say next, took possession of me. A timely observation of the sense of power that there was in his face did more to bring back to my remembrance the entreaty of Agnes in its full force than any effort I could have made. I asked him, with a better appearance of composure than I could have thought possible a minute before, whether he had made his feelings known to Agnes. "'Oh, no, Master Copperfield,' he returned. "'Oh, dear, no, not to any one but you. "'You see, I am only just emerging from my lowly station. "'I rest a good deal of hope on her observing how useful I am to her father, "'for I trust to be very useful to him indeed, Master Copperfield. "'And how I smooth the way for him and keep him straight. "'She's so much attached to her father, Master Copperfield. "'Oh, what a lovely thing it is in a daughter!' that I think she may come, on his own account, to be kind to me. I fathomed at the depth of the rascal's whole scheme, and understood why he laid it bare. "'If you'll have the goodness to keep my secret, Master Copperfield,' he pursued, "'and not in general to go against me, I should take it as a particular favour. "'You wouldn't wish to make unpleasantness. I know what a friendly heart you've got. "'But having only known me on my humble footing—' on my humblest, I should say, for I am very humble still, you might, unbeknown, go against me, rather, with my Agnes. I call her mine, you see, Master Copperfield. There's a song that says, I'd crowns resign to call her mine. I hope to do it one of these days. Dear Agnes, so much too loving and too good for any one that I could think of, was it possible that she was reserved to be the wife of such a wretch as this? "'There's no hurry at present, you know, Master Copperfield,' Uriah proceeded, in his slimy way, as I sat gazing at him, with this thought in my mind. "'My Agnes is very young still. Her mother and me will have to work our way upwards and make a good many new arrangements before it would be quite convenient. So I shall have time gradually to make her familiar with my hopes, as opportunities offer.' Oh, I'm so much obliged to you for this confidence. Oh, it's such a relief. You can't think to know that you understand our situation, and are certain, as you wouldn't wish to make unpleasantness in the family, not to go against me. He took the hand which I dared not withhold, and having given it a damp squeeze, referred to his pale-faced watch. Dear me, he said, it's past one. The moments slip away so in the confidence of old times, Master Copperfield, that it's almost half-past one. I answered that I thought it was later. Not that I had really thought so, but because my conversational powers were effectually scattered. Dear me, he said, considering, the house that I am stopping at, a sort of a private hotel and boarding house, Master Copperfield, near the new river-head, 
will have gone to bed these two hours. I'm sorry, I returned, but there is only one bed here, and that I— Oh, don't think of mentioning beds, Master Copperfield, he rejoined ecstatically, drawing up one leg. But would you have any objections to my laying down before the fire? If it comes to that, I said, pray take my bed, and I'll lie down before the fire. His repudiation of this offer was almost shrill enough, in the excess of its surprise and humility, to have penetrated to the ears of Mrs. Crupp, then sleeping, I suppose, in a distant chamber situated at about the level of low water-mark, soothed in her slumbers by the ticking of an incorrigible clock, to which she always referred me when we had any little difference on the score of punctuality, and which was never less than three-quarters of an hour too slow, and had always been put right in the morning by the best authorities. As no arguments I could urge in my bewildered condition had the least effect upon his modesty in inducing him to accept my bedroom, I was obliged to make the best arrangements I could for his repose before the fire. The mattress of the sofa, which was a great deal too short for his lank figure, the sofa pillars, a blanket, the table clother, a clean breakfast cloth, and a great coat, made him a bed and covering, for which he was more than thankful. Having lent him a nightcap, which he put on at once, and in which he made such an awful figure that I have never worn one since, I left him to his rest. I never shall forget that night. I never shall forget how I turned and tumbled, how I wearied myself with thinking about Agnes and this creature, how I considered what could I do, and what I ought to do, how I could come to no other conclusion than that the next best course for her peace was to do nothing and to keep to myself what I had heard. If I went to sleep for a few moments, the image of Agnes with her tender eyes, and of her father looking fondly on her, as I had so often seen him look, arose before me with appealing faces, and filled me with vague terrors. When I awoke, the recollection that Uriah was lying in the next room sat heavy on me like a waking nightmare, and oppressed me with a leaden dread as if I had had some meaner quality of devil for a lodger. The poker got into my dozing thoughts besides, and wouldn't come out. I thought, between sleeping and waking, that it was still red-hot, and I had snatched it out of the fire, and run him through the body. I was so haunted at last by the idea, though I knew there was nothing in it, that I stole into the next room to look at him. There I saw him, lying on his back, with his legs extending to I don't know where, gurglings taking place in his throat, stoppages in his nose, and his mouth open like a post-office. He was so much worse in reality than in my distempered fancy, that afterwards I was attracted to him in very repulsion, and could not help wandering in and out every half-hour or so, and taking another look at him. Still, the long, long night seemed heavy and hopeless as ever, and no promise of day was in the murky sky. When I saw him going downstairs early in the morning, for, thank heaven, he would not stay to breakfast, it appeared to me as if the night was going away in his person. When I went out to the commons, I charged Mrs. Crupp with particular directions to leave the windows open, that my sitting-room might be aired and purged of his presence. End of chapter 25 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter twenty six of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter twenty six. I fall into captivity. I saw no more of Uriah Heep until the day when Agnes left town. I was at the coach-office to take leave of her and see her go, and there was he, returning to Canterbury by the same conveyance. 
it was some small satisfaction to me to observe his spare, short-waisted, high-shouldered, mulberry-coloured great-coat perched up, in company with an umbrella like a small tent, on the edge of the back seat on the roof, while Agnes was, of course, inside. But what I underwent in my efforts to be friendly with him, while Agnes looked on, perhaps deserved that little recompense. At the coach-window, as at the dinner-party, he hovered about us without a moment's intermission like a great vulture, gorging himself on every syllable that I said to Agnes, or Agnes said to me. In the state of trouble into which his disclosure by my fire had thrown me, I had thought very much of the words Agnes had used in reference to the partnership. I did what I hoped was right, feeling sure that it was necessary for Papa's peace that the sacrifice should be made, I entreated him to make it. A miserable foreboding that she would yield too, and sustain herself by the same feeling in reference to any sacrifice for his sake, had oppressed me ever since. I knew how she loved him. I knew what the devotion of her nature was. I knew from her own lips that she regarded herself as the innocent cause of his errors, and as owing him a great debt she ardently desired to pay. I had no consolation in seeing how different she was from this detestable Rufus with the mulberry-coloured greatcoat, for I felt that in the very difference between them, in the self-denial of her pure soul and the sordid baseness of his, the greatest danger lay. All this, doubtless, he knew thoroughly, and had, in his cunning, considered well. Yet I was so certain that the prospect of such a sacrifice afar off must destroy the happiness of Agnes, and I was so sure, from her manner, of its being unseen by her then, and having cast no shadow on her yet, that I could have soon have injured her as given her any warning of what impended. Thus it was, that we parted without explanation, she waving her hand and smiling farewell from the coach-window, her evil genius writhing on the roof, as if he had had her in his clutches, and triumphed. I could not get over this farewell glimpse of them for a long time. When Agnes wrote to tell me of her safe arrival, I was as miserable as when I saw her going away. Whenever I fell into a thoughtful state, this subject was sure to present itself, and all my uneasiness was sure to be redoubled. Hardly a night passed without my dreaming of it, it became a part of my life, and as inseparable from my life as my own head. I had ample leisure to refine upon my uneasiness, for Steerforth was at Oxford, as he wrote to me, and when I was not at the Commons, I was very much alone. I believe I had at this time some lurking distrust of Steerforth. I wrote to him most affectionately in reply to his, but I think I was glad, upon the whole, that he could not come to London just then. I suspect the truth to be that the influence of Agnes was upon me, undisturbed by the sight of him, and that it was the more powerful with me because she had so large a share in my thoughts and interest. In the meantime, days and weeks slipped away. I was articled to Spenlow and Jorkins. I had ninety pounds a year, exclusive of my house rent and sundry collateral matters, from my aunt. My rooms were engaged for twelve months certain, and though I still found them dreary of an evening, and the evenings long, I could settle down into a state of equable low spirits, and resign myself to coffee, which I seem, on looking back, to have taken by the gallon at about this period of my existence. At about this time, too, I made three discoveries. First, that Mrs. Crupp was a martyr to a curious disorder called the spasms which was generally accompanied with inflammation of the nose, and required to be constantly treated with peppermint. Secondly, that something peculiar in the temperature of my pantry made the brandy-bottles burst. Thirdly, that I was alone in the world, and much given to record that circumstance in fragments of English versification. On the day when I was articled, no festivity took place beyond my having sandwiches and sherry into the office for the clerks, and going alone to the theatre at night. I went to see The Stranger, as a Doctor's Commons sort of play, and was so dreadfully cut up that I hardly knew myself on my own glass when I got home. 
Mr. Spenlow remarked, on this occasion, when we concluded our business, that he should have been happy to have seen me at his house at Norwood to celebrate our becoming connected, but for his domestic arrangements being in some disorder, on account of the expected return of his daughter from finishing her education at Paris. But he intimated that when she came home he should hope to have the pleasure of entertaining me. I knew that he was a widower with one daughter, and expressed my acknowledgments. Mr. Spenlow was as good as his word. In a week or two he referred to this engagement, and said that if I would do him the favour to come down next Saturday and stay till Monday, he would be extremely happy. Of course I said I would do him the favour, and he was to drive me down in his phaeton, and to bring me back. When the day arrived, my very carpet-bag was an object of veneration to the stipendiary clerks, to whom the house at Norwood was a sacred mystery. One of them informed me that he had heard that Mr. Spenlow ate entirely off plate and china, and another hinted at champagne being constantly on draught after the usual custom of table-beer. The old clerk with the wig, whose name was Mr. Tiffey, had been down on several occasions on business in the course of his career, and had on each occasion penetrated to the breakfast parlour. He described it as an apartment of the most sumptuous nature, and said that he had drunk brown East India sherry there, of a quality so precious as to make a man wink. He had an adjourned case in the consistory that day, about excommunicating a baker who had been objecting in a vestry to a paving rate and as the evidence was just twice the length of Robinson Crusoe, according to a calculation I made, it was rather late in the day before we finished. However, we got him excommunicated for six weeks, and sentenced in no end of costs, and then the baker's proctor, and the judge, and the advocates on both sides, who were all nearly related, went out of town together, and Mr. Spenlow and I drove away in the Phaeton. The Phaeton was a very handsome affair, the horses arched their necks and lifted up their legs, as if they knew they belonged to Doctors' Commons. There was a good deal of competition in the Commons on all points of display, and it turned out some very choice equipages then, though I always have considered, and always shall consider, that in my time the great article of competition there was starch, which I think was worn among the proctors to as great an extent as it is in the nature of man to bear. We were very pleasant going down, and Mr. Spenlow gave me some hints in reference to my profession. He said it was the genteelest profession in the world, and must on no account be confounded with the profession of a solicitor, being quite another sort of thing, infinitely more exclusive, less mechanical, and more profitable. We took things much more easily in the Commons than they could be taken anywhere else, he observed, and that set us, as a privileged class, apart. He said it was impossible to conceal the disagreeable fact that we were chiefly employed by solicitors, but he gave me to understand that they were an inferior race of men, universally looked down upon by all proctors of any pretensions. I asked Mr. Spenlow what he considered the best sort of professional business. He replied that a good case of a disputed will, where there was a neat little estate of thirty or forty thousand pounds, was, perhaps, the best of all. In such a case, he said, not only were there very pretty pickings in the way of arguments at every stage of the proceedings, and mountains upon mountains of evidence on interrogatory and counter-interrogatory, to say nothing of an appeal lying first to the delegates and then to the lords, but the costs being pretty sure to come out of the estate at last, both sides went at it in a lively and spirited manner, and expense was no consideration. Then he launched into a general eulogium on the Commons. What was but to be particularly admired, he said, in the Commons, was its compactness. It was the most conveniently organised place in the world. It was the complete idea of snugness. It lay in a nutshell. For example, you brought a divorce case, or a restitution case, into the consistory. Very good. You tried it in the consistory. You made a quiet little round game of it among a family group, and you played it out at leisure. Suppose you were not satisfied with the consistory. What did you do then? Why, you went into the arches. What was the arches? The same court, in the same room, with the same bar, and the same practitioners, but another judge, for there the consistory judge could plead any court day as an advocate. 
Well, you played your round game out again. Still you were not satisfied. Very good. What did you do then? Why, you went to the delegates. Who were the delegates? Why, the ecclesiastical delegates were the advocates without any business, who had looked on at the round game when it was playing in both courts, and had seen the cards shuffled and cut and played, and had talked to all the players about it, and now came fresh, as judges, to settle the matter to the satisfaction of everybody. Discontented people might talk of corruption in the Commons, closeness in the Commons, and the necessity of reforming the Commons, said Mr. Spenlow solemnly. In conclusion, but when the price of wheat per bushel had been highest, the Commons had been busiest, and a man might lay his hand upon his heart and say this to the whole world, Touch the Commons, and down comes the country. I listened to all this with attention, and though I must say I had my doubts whether the country was quite as much obliged to the Commons as Mr. Spenlow made out, I respectfully deferred to his opinion. That about the price of wheat per bushel, I moderately felt, was too much for my strength, and quite settled the question. I have never to this hour got the better of that bushel of wheat. It has reappeared to annihilate me, all through my life, in connection with all kinds of subjects. I don't know now exactly what it has to do with me, or what right it has to crush me, on an infinite variety of occasions, but whenever I see my old friend the bushel brought in by the head and shoulders, as he always is, I observe, I give up a subject for lost. This is a digression. I was not the man to touch the commons and bring down the country. I submissively expressed, by my silence, my acquiescence in all I had heard from my superior in years and knowledge, and we talked about the stranger, and the drama, and the pairs of horses, until we came to Mr. Spenlow's gate. There was a lovely garden to Mr. Spenlow's house, and though that was not the best time of year for seeing a garden, it was so beautifully kept that I was quite enchanted. There was a charming lawn, there were clusters of trees, and there were perspective walks that I could just distinguish in the dark, arched over with trellis-work, on which shrubs and flowers grew in the growing season. Here Miss Spenlow walks by herself, I thought. Dear me! We went into the house, which was cheerfully lighted up, and into a hall where there were all sorts of hats, caps, greatcoats, plaids, gloves, whips, and walking-sticks. "'Where is Miss Dora?' said Mr. Spenlow to the servant. Dora, I thought, what a beautiful name! We turned into a room near at hand, I think it was the identical breakfast room made memorable by the brown East Indian sherry, and I heard a voice say, Mr. Copperfield, my daughter Dora, and my daughter Dora's confidential friend. It was, no doubt, Mr. Spenlow's voice, but I didn't know it, and I didn't care whose it was. All was over in a moment. I had fulfilled my destiny. I was a captive and a slave. I loved Dora Spenlow to distraction. She was more than human to me. She was a fairy, a sylph. I don't know what she was. Anything that no one ever saw, and everything that everybody ever wanted. I was swallowed up in an abyss of love in an instant. There was no pausing on the brink, no looking down or looking back. I was gone, headlong before I had sense to say a word to her. "'I,' observed a well-remembered voice, when I had bowed and murmured something, "'have seen Mr. Copperfield before.' The speaker was not Dora. No, the confidential friend, Miss Murdstone. I don't think I was much astonished. To the best of my judgment, no capacity of astonishment was left in me. There was nothing worth mentioning in the material world but Dora Spenlow to be astonished about. I said, "'How do you do, Miss Murdstone? I hope you are well.' She answered, "'Very well.' I said, "'How is Mr. Murdstone?' She replied, "'My brother is robust. I am obliged to you.' Mr. Spenlow, who I suppose had been surprised to see us recognise each other, then put in his word. "'I'm glad to find,' he said, "'Copperfield, that you and Miss Murdstone are already acquainted.' "'Mr. Copperfield and myself,' said Miss Murdstone, with severe composure, "'are connections. We were once slightly acquainted. It was in his childish days. Circumstances have separated us since. I should not have known him.' 
I replied that I should have known her anywhere, which was true enough. "'Miss Murdstone has had the goodness,' said Mr. Spenlow to me, "'to accept the office, if I may so describe it, of my daughter Dora's confidential friend. My daughter Dora having unhappily no mother, Miss Murdstone is obliging enough to become her companion and protector.' A passing thought occurred to me that Miss Murdstone, like the pocket instrument called a life-preserver, was not so much designed for purposes of protection as of assault. But as I had none but passing thoughts for any subject save Dora, I glanced at her directly afterwards, and was thinking that I saw, in her prettily pettish manner, that she was not very much inclined to be particularly confidential to her companion and protector, when a bell rang which Mr. Spenlow said was the first dinner-bell, and so carried me off to dress. The idea of dressing oneself, or doing anything in the way of action, in that state of love, was a little too ridiculous. I could only sit down before my fire, biting the key of my carpet-bag, and think of the captivating, girlish, bright-eyed, lovely Dora. What a form she had! What a face she had! What a graceful, variable, enchanting manner! The bell ran again so soon that I made a mere scramble of my dressing, instead of the careful operation I could have wished under the circumstances, and I went downstairs. There was some company. Dora was talking to an old gentleman with a grey head. Grey as he was, and a great-grandfather into the bargain, for he said so. I was madly jealous of him. What a state of mind I was in! I was as jealous of everybody. I couldn't bear the idea of anybody knowing Mr. Spenlow better than I did. It was torturing to me to hear them talk of occurrences in which I had had no share. When a most amiable person with a highly polished bald head asked me across the dinner-table if that were the first occasion of my seeing the grounds, I could have done anything to him that was savage and revengeful. I don't remember who was there except Dora. I have not the least idea what we have for dinner, besides Dora. My impression is that I dined off Dora entirely, and sent away half a dozen plates untouched. I sat next to her. I talked to her. She had the most delightful little voice, the gayest little laugh, the pleasantest and most fascinating little ways that ever led a lost youth into hopeless slavery. She was rather diminutive altogether. So much the more precious, I thought. When she went out of the room with Miss Murdstone, no other ladies were of the party, I fell into a reverie, only disturbed by the cruel apprehension that Miss Murdstone would disparage me to her. The amiable creature with the polished head told me a long story which I think was about gardening. I think I heard him say, My gardener, several times. I seemed to pay the deepest attention to him, but I was wandering in a garden of Eden all the while, with Dora. My apprehensions of being disparaged to the object of my engrossing affection were revived when we went into the drawing-room by the grim and distant aspect of Miss Murdstone. But I was relieved of them in an unexpected manner. "'David Copperfield,' said Miss Murdstone, beckoning me aside to a window, "'a word!' I confronted Miss Murdstone alone. "'David Copperfield,' said Miss Murdstone, I need not enlarge upon family circumstances. They are not a tempting subject. Far from it, ma'am, I returned. Far from it, assented Miss Murdstone. I do not wish to revive the memory of past differences or of past outrages. I have received outrages from a person, a female, I am sorry to say, for the credit of my sex, who is not to be mentioned without scorn and disgust, and therefore I would rather not mention her. I felt very fiery on my aunt's account, but I said it would certainly be better, if Miss Murdstone pleased, not to mention her. I could not hear her disrespectfully mentioned, I added, without expressing my opinion in a decided tone. Miss Murdstone shut her eyes, and disdainfully inclined her head. Then, slowly opening her eyes, resumed, "'David Copfield, I shall not attempt to disguise the fact that I formed an unfavourable opinion of you in your childhood. It may have been a mistaken one, or you may have ceased to justify it. That is not in question between us now. I belong to a family remarkable, I believe, for some firmness, 
and I am not the creature of circumstance or change. I may have my opinion of you. You may have your opinion of me. I incline my head in my turn. But it is not necessary, said Miss Murdstone, that these opinions should come into collision here. Under existing circumstances it is as well on all accounts that they should not. As the chances of life have brought us together again, and may bring us together on other occasions, I would say, let us meet here as distant acquaintances. Family circumstances are a sufficient reason for our only meeting on that footing, and it is quite unnecessary that either of us should make the other the subject of remark. Do you approve of this? Miss Murdstone, I returned, I think you and Mr. Murdstone used me very cruelly, and treated my mother with great unkindness. I shall always think so, as long as I live. But I quite agree in what you propose. Miss Murdstone shut her eyes again, and bent her head. Then, just touching the back of my hand with the tips of her cold, stiff fingers, she walked away, arranging the little fetters on her wrists and round her neck, which seemed to be the same set in exactly the same state as when I had seen her last. These reminded me, in reference to Miss Murdstone's nature, of the fetters over a jailed door, suggesting on the outside to all beholders what was to be expected within. All I know of the rest of the evening is that I heard the Empress of my heart sing enchanted ballads in the French language, generally to the effect that, whatever was the matter, we ought always to dance tra-la-la, tra-la-la, accompanying herself on a glorified instrument resembling a guitar. That I was lost in blissful delirium, that I refused refreshment, that my soul recoiled from punch particularly, that when Miss Murdstone took her into custody and led her away, she smiled and gave me her delicious hand. That I caught a view of myself in a mirror, looking perfectly imbecile and idiotic. That I retired to bed in a most maudlin state of mind, and got up in a crisis of feeble infatuation. It was a fine morning, and early, and I thought I would go and take a stroll down one of those wire-arched walks, and indulge my passion by dwelling on her image. On my way through the hall I encountered her little dog, who was called Jip, short for Gypsy. I approached him tenderly, for I loved even him, but he showed his whole set of teeth, got under a chair expressly to snarl, and wouldn't hear of the least familiarity. The garden was cool and solitary. I walked about, wondering what my feelings of happiness would be if I could ever become engaged to this dear wonder. As to marriage and fortune and all that, I believe I was almost as innocently undesigning then as when I loved little Emily. To be allowed to call her Dora, to write to her, to dote upon and worship her, to have reason to think that when she was with other people she was yet mindful of me, seemed to me the summit of human ambition. I am sure it was the summit of mine. There is no doubt whatever that I was a lackadaisical young spoony, but there was a purity of heart in all this that prevents my having quite a contemptuous recollection of it, let me laugh as I may. I had not been walking long, when I turned a corner, and met her. I tingle again from head to foot as my recollection turns that corner, and my pen shakes in my hand. "'You are out early, Miss Spenlow,' said I. "'It's so stupid at home,' she replied, "'and Miss Murdstone is so absurd. She talks such nonsense about its being necessary for the day to be aired before I come out. Aired!' She laughed here, in the most melodious manner. On a Sunday morning when I don't practice, I must do something. So I told Papa last night I must come out. Besides, it's the brightest time of the whole day. Don't you think so? I hazarded a bold flight, and said, not without stammering, that it was very bright to me then, though it had been very dark to me a minute before. Do you mean a compliment, said Dora, or that the weather has really changed? I stammered worse than before in replying, that I meant no compliment but the plain truth, though I was not aware of any change having taken place in the weather. It was in the state of my own feelings, I added bashfully, to clench the explanation. 
I never saw such curls. How could I, for there never were such curls, as those she shook out to hide her blushes. As to the straw hat and blue ribbons which was on the top of the curls, if I could only have hung it up in my room in Buckingham Street, what a priceless possession it would have been. "'You have just come home from Paris,' said I. "'Yes,' said she. "'Have you ever been there?' "'No. "'Oh, I hope you'll go soon. "'You would like it so much.' Traces of deep-seated anguish appeared in my countenance. That she should hope I would go, that she should think it possible I could go, was insupportable. I depreciated Paris, I depreciated France. I said I wouldn't leave England under existing circumstances for any earthly consideration. Nothing should induce me. In short, she was shaking the curls again, when the little dog came running along the walk to our relief. He was mortally jealous of me, and persisted in barking at me. She took him up in her arms, oh my goodness, and caressed him, but he persisted upon barking still. He wouldn't let me touch him, when I tried, and then she beat him. It increased my sufferings greatly to see the pats she gave him for punishment on the bridge of his blunt nose, while he winked his eyes and licked her hand, and still growled within himself like a little double bass. At length he was quiet. Well he might be, with her dimpled chin upon his head. And we walked away to look at a greenhouse. "'You are not very intimate with Miss Murdstone, are you?' said Dora. "'My pet!' The two last words were to the dog. Oh, "'I've only they been to me!' "'No,' I replied, "'not at all so.' "'She's a tarsome creature,' said Dora, pouting. "'I can't think what papa could have been about "'when he chose such a vexatious thing to be my companion. "'Who wants a protector? "'I'm sure I don't want a protector. "'Jip can protect me a great deal better than Miss Murdstone. "'Can't you, Jip, dear?' "'He only winked lazily when she kissed his ball of a head. "'Papa calls her my confidential friend.' "'But I am sure she is no such thing, is she, Jip? "'We are not going to confide in any such cross people, Jip and I. "'We mean to bestow our confidence where we like, "'and to find out our own friends, "'instead of having them found out for us, don't we, Jip?' "'Jip made a comfortable noise in answer, "'a little like a tea-kettle when it sings. "'As for me, every word was a new heap of fetters "'riveted above the last.' "'It is very hard, because we have not a kind mamma, "'that we are to have instead a sulky, gloomy old thing like Miss Murdstone "'always following us about, isn't it, Jip? "'Never mind, Jip. "'We won't be confidential, and we'll make ourselves happy as we can, in spite of her, "'and we'll tease her and not please her, won't we, Jip?' "'If it had lasted any longer, I think I must have gone down on my knees on the gravel.' with the probability before me of grazing them, and of being presently ejected from the premises besides. But by good fortune the greenhouse was not far off, and these words brought us to it. It contained quite a show of beautiful geraniums. We loitered along in front of them, and Dora often stopped to admire this one or that one, and I stopped to admire the same one, and Dora, laughing, held the dog up childishly to smell the flowers and if we were not all three in Fairyland, certainly I was. The scent of a geranium leaf at this day strikes me with a half-comical, half-serious wonder as to what change has come over me in a moment. And then I see a straw hat, and blue ribbons, and a quantity of curls, and a little black dog being held up in two slender arms against a bank of blossoms and bright leaves. Miss Murdstone had been looking for us. She found us here, and presented her uncongenial cheek, the little wrinkles in it filled with hair-powder, to Dora to be kissed. Then she took Dora's arm in hers, and marched us into breakfast, as if it were a soldier's funeral. How many cups of tea I drank, because Dora made it, I don't know. But I perfectly remember that I sat swilling tea until my whole nervous system, if I'd had any in those days, must have gone by the board. By and by, we went to church. Miss Murdstone was between Dora and me in the pew, but I heard her sing, and the congregation vanished. A sermon was delivered, about Dora, of course, and I'm afraid that is all I know of the service. 
We had a quiet day. No company, a walk, a family dinner of four, and an evening of looking over books and pictures. Miss Murdstone, with a homily before her, and her eye upon us, keeping guard vigilantly. Ha! Little did Mr. Spenlow imagine, when he sat opposite to me after dinner that day, with his pocket-handkerchief over his head, how fervently I was embracing him in my fancy as his son-in-law. Little did he think, when I took leave of him at night, that he had just given his full consent to my being engaged to Dora, and that I was invoking blessings on his head. We departed early in the morning, for we had a salvage case coming out in the Admiralty Court, requiring a rather accurate knowledge of the whole science of navigation, in which, as we couldn't be expected to know much about those matters in the Commons, the judge had entreated two old Trinity masters, for charity's sake, to come and help him out. Dora was at the breakfast-table to make the tea again, however, and I had the melancholy pleasure of taking off my hat to her in the phaeton, as she stood on the doorstep with Jip in her arms. What the admiralty was to me that day, what nonsense I made of our case in my mind as I listened to it, how I saw Dora engraved upon the blade of the silver oar which there lay upon the table as the emblem of that high jurisdiction, and how I felt when Mr. Spenlow went home without me. I had had an insane hope that he might take me back again, as if I were a mariner myself, and the ship to which I belonged had sailed away and left me on a desert island. I shall make no fruitless effort to describe. If that sleepy old court could rouse itself and present in any visible form the daydreams I have had in it about Dora, it would reveal my truth. I don't mean the dreams that I dreamed on that day alone, but day after day, from week to week, and term to term. I went there, not to attend what was going on, but to think about Dora. If ever I bestowed a thought upon the cases, as they dragged their slow length before me, it was only to wonder, in the matrimonial cases, remembering Dora, how it was that married people could ever be otherwise than happy, and in the prerogative cases, to consider if the money in question had been left to me, what were the foremost steps I should immediately have taken in regard to Dora. Within the first week of my passion I bought four sumptuous waistcoats, not for myself, I had no pride in them, for Dora, and took to wearing straw-coloured kid gloves in the streets, and laid the foundations of all the corns I have ever had. If the boots I wore at that period could only be produced compared with the natural size of my feet, they would show what the state of my heart was in a most affecting manner. And yet, wretched cripple as I made myself by this act of homage to Dora, I walked miles upon miles daily in the hope of seeing her. Not only was I soon as well known on the Norwood Road as the postman on that beat, but I pervaded London likewise. I walked about the streets where the best shops for ladies were. I haunted the bazaar like an unquiet spirit. I fagged through the park again and again long after I was quite knocked up. Sometimes, at long intervals, and on rare occasions, I saw her. Perhaps I saw her glove waved in a carriage window. Perhaps I met her, walked with her, and Miss Murdstone a little way, and spoke to her. In the latter case I was always very miserable afterwards to think that I had said nothing to the purpose, or that she had no idea of the extent of my devotion, or that she cared nothing about me. I was always looking out, as may be supposed, for another invitation to Mr. Spenlow's house. I was always being disappointed, for I got none. Mrs. Crupp must have been a woman of penetration, for when this attachment was but a few weeks old, and I had not had the courage to write more explicitly even to Agnes than that I had been to Mr. Spenlow's house, whose family I had it consists of one daughter's, I say, Mrs. Crupp must have been a woman of penetration, for even in that early stage she found it out. She came up to me one evening, when I was very low, to ask me, she be then afflicted with the disorder I have mentioned, if I could oblige her with a little tincture of cardamoms mixed with rhubarb, and flavoured with seven drops of the essence of cloves, which was the best remedy for her complaint, or, if I had not such a thing by me, with a little brandy, which was the next best. It was not, she remarked, so palatable to her, but it was the next best. 
as I had never even heard of the first remedy, and always had the second in the closet, I gave Mrs. Crupp a glass of the second, which, that I might have been no suspicion of its being devoted to any improper use, she began to take in my presence. "'Cheer up, sir,' said Mrs. Crupp. "'I can't bear to see you so, sir. I'm a mother myself.' I did not quite perceive the application of this fact to myself, but I smiled on Mrs. Crupp, as benignly as was in my power. "'Come, sir,' said Mrs. Crupp, "'excuse me. I know what it is, sir. There's a lady in the case.' "'Mrs. Crupp,' I returned, reddening. "'Oh, bless you! Keep a good heart, sir,' said Mrs. Crupp, nodding encouragement. "'Never say die, sir. If she don't smile upon you, there's as many a will.' "'You are a young gentleman to be smiled on, Mr. Copperfull, and you must learn your value, sir.' Mrs. Crupp always called me Mr. Copperfull, firstly, no doubt, because it was not my name, and secondly, I am inclined to think, in some indistinct association with a washing-day. "'What makes you suppose there is any young lady in the case, Mrs. Crupp?' said I. "'Mr. Copperfull,' said Mrs. Crupp, with a great deal of feeling, "'I'm a mother myself.' For some time Mrs. Crupp could only lay her hand upon her nankeen bosom, and fortify herself against returning pain with sips of her medicine. At length she spoke again. "'When the present set were took for you by your dear aunt, Mr. Copperfull,' said Mrs. Crupp, "'my remark were, I have now found someone I could care for.' "'That evening,' was the expression, "'I have now found someone I can care for. "'You don't eat enough, sir, nor yet drink.' "'Is that what you found your supposition on, Mrs. Crupp?' said I. "'Sir,' said Mrs. Crupp, in a tone approaching to severity, "'I've laundressed other young gentlemen besides yourself. "'A young gentleman may be over-careful of himself, or he may be under-careful of himself. "'He may brush his hair too regular or too unregular. "'He may wear his boots much too large for him or much too small. "'That is according as the young gentleman has his original character formed. But let him go to the which extreme he may, sir. There's a young lady in both of them. Mrs. Crupp shook her head in such a determined manner that I had a not an inch of vantage ground left. It was but the gentleman which died here before yourself, said Mrs. Crupp, that fell in love with a barmaid, and had his waistcoats took in directly, though much swelled by drinking. Uh, "'Mrs. Crupp,' said I, I, "'I must beg you not to connect the young lady in my case with a barmaid, or anything of that sort, if you please.' "'Mr. Copperfull,' returned Mrs. Crupp, "'I'm a mother myself, and not likely. I ask your pardon, sir, if I intrude. I should never wish to intrude where I were not welcome. But you are a young gentleman, Mr. Copperfull, and my advice to you is to cheer up, sir, to keep a good heart, and to know your own value.' "'If you was to take to something, sir,' said Mrs. Crupp, "'if you was to take to Skittles now, which is healthy, "'you might find it divert your mind and do you good.' "'With these words, Mrs. Crupp, affecting to be very careful of the brandy, "'which was all gone, thanked me with a majestic curtsy, and retired. "'As her figure disappeared into the gloom of the entry, "'this counsel certainly presented itself to my mind "'in the light of a slight liberty on Mrs. Crupp's part.' but at the same time I was content to receive it, in another point of view, as a word to the wise, and a warning in future to keep my secret better. End of chapter 26 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 27 of David Copperfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Deborah Lynn. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 27 Tommy Traddles. It may have been in consequence of Mrs. Crupp's advice, and perhaps for no better reason than because there was a certain similarity in the sound of the word Skittles and Traddles, that it came into my head next day to go and look after Traddles. The time he had mentioned was more than out, and he lived in a little street near the veterinary college at Camden Town, 
which was principally tenanted, as one of our clerks who lived in that direction informed me, by gentlemen students who bought live donkeys and made experiments on those quadrupeds in their private apartments. Having obtained from this clerk a direction to the academic grove in question, I set out the same afternoon to visit my old schoolfellow. I found that the street was not as desirable a one as I could have wished it to be for the sake of travels. The inhabitants appeared to have a propensity to throw any little trifles they were not in want of into the road, which not only made it rank and sloppy, but untidy too, on account of the cabbage leaves. The refuse was not wholly vegetable, either for I myself saw a shoe, a doubled-up saucepan, a black bonnet, and an umbrella, in various stages of decomposition, as I was looking out for the number I wanted. The general air of the place reminded me forcibly of the days when I lived with Mr. and Mrs. Micawber. An indescribable character of faded gentility that attached to the house I sought, and made it unlike all the other houses in the street, though they were all built on one monotonous pattern, and looked like the early copies of a blundering boy who was learning to make houses, and had not yet got out of his cramped brick-and-mortar pot-hooks, reminded me still more of Mr. and Mrs. Micawber. Happening to arrive at the door as it was opened to the afternoon milkman, I was reminded of Mr. and Mrs. Micawber more forcibly yet. "'Now,' said the milkman to a very youthful servant-girl, "'has that there little bill of mine been heared on?' "'Oh, Master says he'll attend to it immediate,' was the reply. "'Because,' said the milkman, going on as if he had received no answer, and speaking, as I judged from his tone, rather for the edification of somebody within the house than of the youthful servant, an impression which was strengthened by his manner of glaring down the passage, "'because that there little bill has been running so long that I begin to believe it's run away altogether and never won't be heard of. Now I'm not a-going to stand it, you know,' said the milkman, still throwing his voice into the house and glaring down the passage. As to his dealing in the mild article of milk, by the by, there never was a greater anomaly. His deportment would have been fierce in a butcher or a brandy-merchant.' The voice of the youthful servant became faint, but she seemed to me, from the action of her lips, again to murmur that it would be attended to immediate. "'I tell you what,' said the milkman, looking hard at her for the first time, and taking her by the chin, "'are you fond of milk?' "'Yes, I likes it,' she replied. "'Good,' said the milkman. "'Then you won't have none to-morrow, do you hear? Not a fragment of milk you won't have to-morrow.' I thought she seemed, upon the whole, relieved by the prospect of having any to-day. The milkman, after shaking his head at her darkly, released her chin, and with anything rather than good will, opened his can, and deposited the usual quantity in the family jug. This done, he went away, muttering, and uttered the cry of his trade next door, in a vindictive shriek. "'Does Mr. Traddles live here?' I then inquired. A mysterious voice from the end of the passage replied, Yes, upon which the useful servant replied, Yes. Is he at home? said I. Again the mysterious voice replied in the affirmative, and again the servant echoed it. Upon this I walked in, and in pursuance of the servant's directions, walked upstairs, conscious as I passed the back parlour door that I was surveyed by a mysterious eye, probably belonging to the mysterious voice. When I got to the top of the stairs, the house was only a story high above the ground floor, Traddles was on the landing to meet me. He was delighted to see me, and gave me welcome with great heartiness to his little room. It was in the front of the house, and extremely neat, though sparsely furnished. It was his only room, I saw, for there was a sofa bedstead in it, and his blacking brushes and blacking were among his books, on the top shelf behind a dictionary. His table was covered with papers, and he was hard at work in an old coat. I looked at nothing that I know of, but I saw everything, even to the prospect of a church upon his china inkstand, as I sat down, and this, too, was a faculty confirmed in me in the old Micawber times. Various ingenious arrangements he had made for the disguise of his chest of drawers, and the accommodation of his boots, his shaving-glass, and so forth, particularly impressed themselves upon me as evidences of the same Traddles who used to make models of elephants' dens in writing-paper to put flies in, and to comfort himself under ill-usage with the memorable works of art I have so often mentioned. 
In a corner of the room was something neatly covered up with a large white cloth. I could not make out what that was. "'Traddles,' said I, shaking hands with him again, after I had sat down, "'I am delighted to see you.' "'I am delighted to see you, Copperfield,' he returned. "'I am very glad indeed to see you. "'It was because I was thoroughly glad to see you when we met in Ely Place, "'and was sure you were thoroughly glad to see me, "'that I gave you this address instead of my address at Chambers.' "'Oh, you have Chambers,' said I. "'Why, I have the fourth of a room and a passage.' "'And the fourth of a clerk,' returned Traddles. Three others and myself unite to have a set of chambers, to look business-like. "'And we quarter the clerk, too. Half a crown a week he costs me.' "'His old simple character and good temper, and something of his old unlucky fortune also, I thought, "'smiled at me in the smile with which he made this explanation. "'It's not because I have the least pride, Copperfield, you understand,' said Traddles. "'but I don't usually give my address here. "'It's only on account of those who come to me "'who might not like to come here. "'For myself, I am fighting my way on in the world against difficulties, "'and it would be ridiculous if I made a pretense of doing anything else.' "'You are reading for the bar, Mr. Waterbrook informed me,' said I. "'Why, yes,' said Traddles, rubbing his hands slowly over one another. "'I am reading for the bar.' "'The fact is, I have just begun to keep my terms, after rather a long delay. "'It's some time since I was articled, but the payment of that hundred pounds was a great pull. "'A great pull,' said Traddles, with a wince, as if he had had a tooth out. "'Do you know what I can't help thinking of, Traddles, as I sit here looking at you?' I asked him. "'No,' said he. "'That sky-blue suit you used to wear.' "'Lord, to be sure!' cried Traddles, laughing. "'Tight in the arms and legs, you know.' "'Dear me! Well, those were happy times, weren't they?' "'I think our schoolmaster might have made them happier, "'without doing any harm to any of us, I acknowledge,' I returned. "'Perhaps he might,' said Traddles. "'But, dear me, there was a good deal of fun going on. "'Do you remember the nights in the bedroom "'when we used to have the suppers, "'and when you used to tell the stories? "'Ha, ha, ha! "'And do you remember when I got caned for crying about Mr. Mel, "'old Creakle? "'I should like to see him again, too.' "'He was a brute to you, Traddles,' said I, indignantly, "'for his good humour made me feel as if I had seen him beaten but yesterday.' "'Do you think so?' returned Traddles. "'Really? Perhaps he was, rather. "'But it's all over a long while. Old Creakle.' "'You were brought up by an uncle, then?' said I. "'Of course I was,' said Traddles. "'The one I was always going to write to and always didn't, eh? "'Ha, ha, ha! Yes, I had an uncle, then.' He died soon after I left school. Indeed. Yes, he was a retired, what do you call it, draper, cloth merchant, and had made me his heir. But he didn't like me when I grew up. Do you really mean that? said I. He was so composed that I fancied he must have some other meaning. Oh, dear, yes, Copperfield, I mean it, replied Traddles. It was an unfortunate thing, but he didn't like me at all. He said I wasn't at all what he expected, and so he married his housekeeper. "'And what did you do?' I asked. "'I didn't do anything in particular,' said Traddles. "'I lived with them, waiting to be put out in the world, until his gout unfortunately flew to his stomach, and so he died, and so she married a young man, and so I wasn't provided for.' "'Did you get nothing, Traddles, after all?' "'Oh, dear, yes,' said Traddles. "'I got fifty pounds. "'I had never been brought up to any profession, "'and at first I was at a loss what to do for myself. "'However, I began with the assistance of the son of a professional man, "'who had been to Salem House, "'yaller, with his nose on one side. "'Do you recollect him?' "'No, he had not been there with me. "'All the noses were straight in my day.' "'It don't matter,' said Traddles. "'I began, by means of his assistance, to copy law writings.' That didn't answer very well, and then I began to state cases for them, and make abstracts, and that sort of work, for I am a plodding kind of fellow, Copperfield, and had learnt the way of doing such things pithily. Well, that put it in my head to enter myself as a law student, and that ran away with all that was left of the fifty pounds. Yaller recommended me to one or two other offices, however, Mr. Waterbrook's for one, and I got a good many jobs. I was fortunate enough, too, to become acquainted with a person in the publishing way, who was getting up an encyclopedia, and he set me to work. And indeed, glancing at his table, I am at work for him at this minute. 
"'I am not a bad compiler, Copperfield,' said Traddles, preserving the same air of cheerful confidence in all he said. "'But I have no invention at all, not a particle. I suppose there never was a young man with less originality than I have.' As Traddles seemed to expect that I should assent to this as a matter of course, I nodded, and he went on with the same sprightly patience. I can find no better expression. As before. So, by little and little, and not living high, I managed to scrape up the hundred pounds at last, said Traddles, and thank heaven that's paid, though it was, though it certainly was, said Traddles, wincing again, as if he had had another tooth out, a pull. I am living by the sort of work I have mentioned still, and I hope, one of these days, to get connected with some newspaper, which would almost be the making of my fortune. Now, Copperfield, you are so exactly what you used to be, with that agreeable face, and it's so pleasant to see you, that I shan't conceal anything. Therefore, you must know that I am engaged. Engaged? Oh, Dora! She is a curate's daughter, said Traddles, one of ten, down in Devonshire. Yes, for he saw me glance involuntarily at the prospect on the inkstand. That's the church. "'You come round here to the left, out of this gate,' tracing his finger along the inkstand, "'and exactly where I hold this pen, there stands the house, facing, you understand, towards the church.' The delight with which he entered into these particulars did not fully present itself to me until afterwards, for my selfish thoughts were making a ground-plan of Mr. Spenlow's house and garden at the same moment.' "'She is such a dear girl,' said Traddles, "'a little older than me, but the dearest girl. "'I told you I was going out of town. "'I have been down there. "'I walked there, and I walked back, "'and I had the most delightful time. "'I dare say ours is likely to be a rather long engagement, "'but our motto is wait and hope. "'We always say that. "'Wait and hope, we always say, "'and she would wait, Copperfield, till she was sixty, "'any age you can mention, for me.' Traddles rose from his chair, and with a triumphant smile put his hand upon the white cloth I had observed. "'However,' he said, "'it's not that we haven't made a beginning towards housekeeping. No, no, we have begun. We must get on by degrees, but we have begun. Here,' drawing the cloth off with great pride and care, "'are two pieces of furniture to commence with. This flower-pot and stand she bought herself. You put that in a parlour window,' said Traddles, falling a little back from it, to survey it with the greater admiration, with a plant in it, and there you are. This little round table with the marble top, it's two feet ten in circumference, I bought. You want to lay a book down, you know, or somebody comes to see you or your wife, and wants a place to stand a cup of tea upon, and and there you are again, said Traddles. It's an admirable piece of workmanship, firm as a rock. I praised them both highly, and Traddles replaced the covering as carefully as he had removed it. "'It's not a great deal towards the furnishing,' said Traddles, "'but it's something. The tablecloths and pillowcases and articles of that kind are what discourage me most, Copperfield. So does the ironmongery, candle-boxes and gridirons and that sort of necessaries, because those things tell and mount up. However, wait and hope, and I assure you she's the dearest girl.' "'I'm quite certain of it,' said I. "'In the meantime,' said Traddles, coming back to his chair, "'and this is the end of my prosing about myself, "'I get on as well as I can. "'I don't make much, but I don't spend much. "'In general, I board with the people downstairs, "'who are very agreeable people indeed. "'Both Mr. and Mrs. Micawber have seen a good deal of life "'and are excellent company.' "'My dear Traddles!' I quickly exclaimed. "'What are you talking about?' Traddles looked at me as if he wondered what I was talking about. "'Mr. and Mrs. Micawber,' I repeated. "'Why, I am intimately acquainted with them.' An opportune double knock at the door, which I knew well from old experience in Windsor Terrace, and which nobody but Mr. Micawber could ever have knocked at that door, resolved any doubt in my mind as to their being my old friends. I begged Traddles to ask his landlord to walk up. Traddles accordingly did so over the banister. And Mr. Micawber, not a bit changed, his tights, his stick, his shirt collar, and his eyeglass, all the same as ever, came into the room with a genteel and youthful air. I beg your pardon, Mr. Traddles, said Mr. Micawber, with the old roll in his voice, as he checked himself in humming a soft tune. 
I was not aware that there was any individual alien to this tenement in your sanctum. Mr. Micawber slightly bowed to me, and pulled up his shirt-collar. "'How do you do, Mr. Micawber?' said I. "'Sir,' said Mr. Micawber, "'you are exceedingly obliging. I am in statu quo.' "'And Mrs. Micawber?' I pursued. "'Sir,' said Mr. Micawber, "'she is also, thank God, in statu quo.' "'And the children, Mr. Micawber?' "'Sir,' said Mr. Micawber, "'I rejoice to reply that they are, likewise, "'in the enjoyment of salubrity.' All this time Mr. Micawber had not known me in the least, though he had stood face to face with me. But now, seeing me smile, he examined my features with more attention, fell back, cried, "'Is it possible? Have I the pleasure of again beholding Copperfield?' and shook me by both hands with the utmost fervour. "'Good heaven, Mr. Traddles,' said Mr. Micawber, "'to think that I should find you acquainted with a friend of my youth, the companion of earlier days.' "'My dear!' calling over the banisters to Mrs. Micawber, while Traddles looked, with reason, not a little amazed at this description of me. "'Here is a gentleman in Mr. Traddles's apartment, whom he wishes to have the pleasure of presenting to you, my love.' Mr. Micawber immediately reappeared and shook hands with me again. "'And how is our good friend the doctor, Copperfield?' said Mr. Micawber, "'and all the circle at Canterbury.' "'I have none but good accounts of them,' said I. "'I am most delighted to hear it,' said Mr. Micawber. "'It was at Canterbury where we last met, "'within the shadow, I may figuratively say, "'of that religious edifice immortalized by Chaucer, "'which was anciently the resort of pilgrims "'from the remotest corners of—' "'In short,' said Mr. Micawber, "'in the immediate neighbourhood of the cathedral.' "'I replied that it was. "'Mr. Micawber continued talking as volubly as he could.' but not, I thought, without showing, by some marks of concern in his countenance, that he was sensible of sounds in the next room, as of Mrs. Micawber washing her hands and hurriedly opening and shutting drawers that were uneasy in their action. "'You find us, Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, with one eye on Traddles, "'at present established on what may be designated as a small and unassuming scale.' "'But you are aware that I have, in the course of my career, "'surmounted difficulties and conquered obstacles. "'You are no stranger to the fact that there have been periods of my life "'when it has been requisite that I should pause "'until certain expected events should turn up, "'when it has been necessary that I should fall back "'before making what I trust I shall not be accused of presumption "'in terming a spring. "'The present is one of those momentous stages in the life of man. "'You find me fallen back, for a spring, and I have every reason to believe that a vigorous leap will shortly be the result. I was expressing my satisfaction when Mrs. Micawber came in, a little more slatternly than she used to be, or so she seemed now, to my unaccustomed eyes, but still with some preparation of herself for company, and with a pair of brown gloves on. "'My dear,' said Mr. Micawber, leading her towards me, "'here is a gentleman of the name of Copperfield, who wishes to renew his acquaintance with you.' It would have been better, as it turned out, to have led gently up to this announcement, for Mrs. Micawber, being in a delicate state of health, was overcome by it, and was taken so unwell that Mr. Micawber was obliged, in great trepidation, to run down to the water-butt in the back yard, and draw a basinful to lave her brow with. She presently revived, however, and was really pleased to see me. We had half an hour's talk all together, and I asked her about the twins, who, she said, were grown great creatures, and after Master and Miss Micawber, whom she described as absolute giants, but they were not produced on that occasion. Mr. Micawber was very anxious that I should stay to dinner. I should not have been averse to do so, but that I imagined I detected trouble and calculation relative to the extent of the cold meat in Mrs. Micawber's eye. I therefore pleaded another engagement, and observing that Mrs. Micawber's spirits were immediately lightened, I resisted all persuasion to forego it. But I told Traddles, and Mr. and Mrs. Micawber, that before I could think of leaving, they must appoint a day when they would come and dine with me. The occupations to which Traddles stood pledged rendered it necessary to fix a somewhat distant one, but an appointment was made for the purpose that suited us all, and then I took my leave. Mr. Micawber, under pretense of showing me a nearer way than that by which I had come, 
accompanied me to the corner of the street, being anxious, he explained to me, to say a few words to an old friend in confidence. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, "'I need hardly tell you that to have beneath our roof, under existing circumstances, a mind like that which gleams, if I may be allowed the expression, which gleams in your friend Traddles, is an unspeakable comfort. With a washerwoman, who exposes hard bake for sale in her parlour window, dwelling next door, and a Bow Street officer residing over the way, you may imagine that his society is a source of consolation to myself and to Mrs. Micawber. I am at present, my dear Copperfield, engaged in the sale of corn upon commission. It is not an avocation of a remunerative description. In other words, it does not pay, and some temporary embarrassments of a pecuniary nature have been the consequence. I am, however, delighted to add that I have now an immediate prospect of something turning up. I am not at liberty to say in what direction, which I trust will enable me to provide, permanently, both for myself and for your friend Traddles, in whom I have an unaffected interest. You may, perhaps, be prepared to hear that Mrs. Micawber is in a state of health which renders it not wholly improbable that an addition may be ultimately made to those pledges of affection which— in short, to the infantine group. Mrs. Micawber's family have been so good as to express their dissatisfaction at this state of things. I have merely to observe that I am not aware that it is any business of theirs, and that I repel that exhibition of feeling with scorn and with defiance. Mr. Micawber then shook hands with me again and left me. End of chapter 27《Chapter Twenty Eight of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Deborah Lynn. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Eight. Mr. Micawber's Gauntlet. Until the day arrived on which I was to entertain my newly found old friends, I lived principally on Dora and coffee. In my lovelorn condition my appetite languished, and I was glad of it, for I felt as though it would have been an act of perfidy towards Dora to have a natural relish for my dinner. The quantity of walking exercise I took was not in this respect attended with its usual consequence, as the disappointment counteracted the fresh air. I have my doubts, too, founded on the acute experience acquired at this period of my life, whether a sound enjoyment of animal food can develop itself freely in any human subject who is always in torment from tight boots. I think the extremities require to be at peace before the stomach will conduct itself with vigor. On the occasion of this domestic little party I did not repeat my former extensive preparations. I merely provided a pair of soles, a small leg of mutton, and a pigeon pie. Mrs. Crupp broke out into rebellion on my first bashful hint in reference to the cooking of the fish and joint, and said, with a dignified sense of injury, "'No, no, sir, you will not ask me such a thing, for you are better acquainted with me than to suppose me capable of doing what I cannot do with ample satisfaction to my own feelings.' But in the end a compromise was effected, and Mrs. Crupp consented to achieve this feat, on condition that I dined from home for a fortnight afterwards. And here I may remark that what I underwent from Mrs. Crupp, in consequence of the tyranny she established over me, was dreadful. I never was so much afraid of any one. We made a compromise of everything. If I hesitated, she was taken with that wonderful disorder which was always lying in ambush in her system, ready at the shortest notice to prey upon her vitals. If I rang the bell impatiently, after half a dozen unavailing modest pulls, and she appeared at last, which was not by any means to be relied upon, she would appear with a reproachful aspect, sink breathless on a chair near the door, lay her hand upon her nankeen bosom, and become so ill that I was glad, at any sacrifice of brandy or anything else, to get rid of her. If I objected to having my bed made at five o'clock in the afternoon, which I do still think an uncomfortable arrangement, one motion of her hand towards the same nankeen region of wounded sensibility was enough to make me falter an apology. 
In short, I would have done anything in an honourable way rather than give Mrs. Crupp offence, and she was the terror of my life. I bought a second-hand dumb-waiter for this dinner-party, in preference to re-engaging the handy young man, against whom I had conceived a prejudice, in consequence of meeting him in the Strand one Sunday morning, in a waistcoat remarkably like one of mine, which had been missing since the former occasion. The young gal was re-engaged, but on the stipulation that she should only bring in the dishes, and then withdraw to the landing-place beyond the outer door, where a habit of sniffing she had contracted would be lost upon the guests, and where her retiring on the plates would be a physical impossibility. Having laid in the materials for a bowl of punch to be compounded by Mr. Micawber, having provided a bottle of lavender water, two wax candles, a paper of mixed pins, and a pincushion, to assist Mrs. Micawber in her toilette at my dressing-table, having also caused the fire in my bedroom to be lighted for Mrs. Micawber's convenience, and having laid the cloth with my own hands, I awaited the result with composure. At the appointed time my three visitors arrived together. Mr. Micawber with more shirt-collar than usual, and a new ribbon to his eyeglass. Mrs. Micawber with her cap and a whitey-brown paper parcel, Traddles carrying the parcel, and supporting Mrs. Micawber on his arm. They were all delighted with my residence. When I conducted Mrs. Micawber to my dressing-table, and she saw the scale on which it was prepared for her, she was in such raptures that she called Mr. Micawber to come in and look. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, "'this is luxurious. "'This is a way of life which reminds me of the period "'when I was myself in a state of celibacy, "'and Mrs. Micawber had not yet been solicited "'to plight her faith at the hymeneal altar.' "'He means solicited by him, Mr. Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber archly. "'He cannot answer for others.' "'My dear,' returned Mr. Micawber with sudden seriousness, "'I have no desire to answer for others.' I am too well aware that when, in the inscrutable decrees of fate, you were reserved for me, it is possible you may have been reserved for one, destined after a protracted struggle, at length to fall a victim to pecuniary involvements of a complicated nature. I understand your allusion, my love. I regret it, but I can bear it. Micawber! exclaimed Mrs. Micawber in tears. Have I deserved this? I, who never have deserted you, who never will desert you, Micawber? My love, said Mr. Micawber, much affected, you will forgive, and our old and tried friend Copperfield will, I am sure, forgive, the momentary laceration of a wounded spirit made sensitive by a recent collision with the minion of power, in other words, with a ribald turncock attached to the waterworks, and will pity, not condemn, its excesses. Mr. Micawber then embraced Mrs. Micawber, and pressed my hand, leaving me to infer from this broken allusion that his domestic supply of water had been cut off that afternoon, in consequence of default in the payment of the company's rates. To divert his thoughts from this melancholy subject, I informed Mr. Micawber that I relied upon him for a bowl of punch, and led him to the lemons. His recent despondency, not to say despair, was gone in a moment. I never saw a man so thoroughly enjoy himself amid the fragrance of lemon peel and sugar, the odour of burning rum, and the steam of boiling water as Mr. Micawber did that afternoon. It was wonderful to see his face shining at us out of a thin cloud of these delicate fumes, as he stirred and mixed and tasted, and looked as if he were making, instead of punch, a fortune for his family down to the latest posterity. As to Mrs. Micawber, I don't know whether it was the effect of the cap, or the lavender water, or the pins, or the fire, or the wax candles, but she came out of my room, comparatively speaking, lovely, and the lark was never gayer than that excellent woman. I suppose, I never ventured to inquire, but I suppose, that Mrs. Crupp, after frying the soles, was taken ill, because we broke down at that point. The leg of mutton came up very red within, and very pale without, besides having a foreign substance of a gritty nature sprinkled over it, as if it had had a fall into the ashes of that remarkable kitchen fireplace. But we were not in condition to judge of this fact from the appearance of the gravy, for as much as the young gal had dropped it all upon the stairs, where it remained, by the by, in a long train until it was worn out. 
The pigeon pie was not bad, but it was a delusive pie, the crust being like a disappointing head, phrenologically speaking, full of lumps and bumps, with nothing particular underneath. In short, the banquet was such a failure that I should have been quite unhappy, about the failure, I mean, for I was always unhappy about Dora, if I had not been relieved by the great good humour of my company, and by a bright suggestion from Mr. Micawber. "'My dear friend Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, "'accidents will occur in the best regulated families, and in families not regulated by that pervading influence which sanctifies while it enhances the—' A, I would say, in short, by the influence of woman, in the lofty character of wife, they may be expected with confidence, and must be borne with philosophy. If you will allow me to take the liberty of remarking that there are few comestibles better in their way than a devil, and that, I believe, with a little division of labour, we could accomplish a good one if the young person in attendance could produce a gridiron, I would put it to you that this little misfortune may be easily repaired." There was a gridiron in the pantry, on which my morning rasher of bacon was cooked. We had it in, in a twinkling, and immediately applied ourselves to carrying Mr. Micawber's idea into effect. The division of labour to which he had referred was this. Traddles cut the mutton into slices. Mr. Micawber, who could do anything of this sort to perfection, covered them with pepper, mustard, salt, and cayenne. I put them on the gridiron, turned them with a fork, and took them off under Mr. Micawber's direction, and Mrs. Micawber heated and continually stirred some mushroom ketchup in a little saucepan. When we had slices enough done to begin upon, we fell to with our sleeves still tucked up at the wrist, more slices sputtering and blazing on the fire, and our attention divided between the mutton on our plates and the mutton then preparing. What with the novelty of this cookery, the excellence of it, the bustle of it, the frequent starting up to look after it, the frequent sitting down to dispose of it as the crisp slices came off the gridiron hot and hot, the being so busy, so flushed with the fire, so amused, and in the midst of such a tempting noise and savour, we reduced the leg of mutton to the bone. My own appetite came back miraculously. I am ashamed to record it, but I really believe I forgot Dora for a little while. I am satisfied that Mr. and Mrs. Micawber could not have enjoyed the feast more if they had sold a bed to provide it. Traddles laughed as heartily almost the whole time as he ate and worked. Indeed, we all did, all at once, and I dare say there was never a greater success. We were at the height of our enjoyment, and were all busily engaged in our several departments, endeavouring to bring the last batch of slices to a state of perfection that we should crown the feast, when I was aware of a strange presence in the room, and my eyes encountered those of the staid Littimer, standing hat in hand before me. "'What's the matter?' I involuntarily asked. "'I beg your pardon, sir. I was directed to come in. Is my master not here, sir?' "'No.' "'Have you not seen him, sir?' "'No. Don't you come from him?' "'Not immediately so, sir.' "'Did he tell you?' you would find him here? Not exactly so, sir, but I should think he might be here to-morrow, as he has not been here to-day. Is he coming up from Oxford? I beg, sir, he returned respectfully, that you will be seated and allow me to do this, with which he took the fork from my unresisting hand and bent over the gridiron, as if his whole attention were concentrated on it. We should not have been much discomposed, I dare say, by the appearance of Steerforth himself, but we became in a moment the meekest of the meek before his respectable serving-man. Mr. Micawber, humming a tune to show that he was quite at ease, subsided into his chair with the handle of a hastily concealed fork sticking out of the bosom of his coat, as if he had stabbed himself. Mrs. Micawber put on her brown gloves and assumed a genteel languor. Traddles ran his greasy hands through his hair and stood it bolt upright, and stared in confusion on the tablecloth. As for me, I was a mere infant at the head of my own table, and hardly ventured to glance at the respectable phenomenon, who had come from heaven knows where to put my establishment to rights. Meanwhile he took the mutton off the gridiron, and gravely handed it round. We all took some, but our appreciation of it was gone, and we merely made a show of eating it. As we severally pushed away our plates, he noiselessly removed them and set on the cheese. 
He took that off, too, when it was done with, cleared the table, piled everything on the dumbwaiter, gave us our wine-glasses, and, of his own accord, wheeled the dumbwaiter into the pantry. All this was done in a perfect manner, and he never raised his eyes from what he was about. Yet his very elbows, when he had his back towards me, seemed to teem with the expression of his fixed opinion that I was extremely young. "'Can I do anything more, sir?' I thanked him, and said no, but would he take no dinner himself? None. I am obliged to you, sir. Is Mr. Steerforth coming from Oxford? I beg your pardon, sir? Is Mr. Steerforth coming from Oxford? I should imagine that he might be here to-morrow, sir. I rather thought he might have been here to-day, sir. The mistake is mine, no doubt, sir. If you should see him first, said I, "'If you'll excuse me, sir, I don't think I shall see him first. "'In case you do,' said I, "'pray say that I am sorry he was not here to-day, "'as an old schoolfellow of his was here.' "'Indeed, sir!' "'And he divided a bow between me and Traddles "'with a glance at the latter. "'He was moving softly to the door "'when, in a forlorn hope of saying something naturally, "'which I never could to this man, "'I said, "'Oh, Littimer, sir!' "'Did you remain long at Yarmouth that time?' "'Not particularly so, sir.' "'You saw the boat completed?' "'Yes, sir. I remained behind on purpose to see the boat completed.' "'I know.' He raised his eyes to mine respectfully. "'Mr. Steerforth has not seen it yet, I suppose?' "'I really can't say, sir. I think, but I really can't say, sir. I wish you good night, sir.' He comprehended everybody present in the respectful bow with which he followed these words, and disappeared. My visitors seemed to breathe more freely when he was gone, but my own relief was very great, for besides the constraint arising from that extraordinary sense of being at a disadvantage which I always had in this man's presence, my conscience had embarrassed me with whispers that I had mistrusted his master, and I could not repress a vague, uneasy dread that he might find it out. How was it, having so little in reality to conceal, that I always did feel as if this man were finding me out? Mr. Micawber roused me from this reflection, which was blended with a certain remorseful apprehension of seeing Steerforth himself, by bestowing many encomiums on the absent Littimer as a most respectable fellow and a thoroughly admirable servant. Mr. Micawber, I may remark, had taken his full share of the general bow, and had received it with infinite condescension. "'But punch, my dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, tasting it, "'like time and tide waits for no man. "'Ah, it is at the present moment in high flavour. "'My love, will you give me your opinion?' "'Mrs. Micawber pronounced it excellent. "'Then I will drink,' said Mr. Micawber, "'if my friend Copperfield will permit me to take that social liberty, "'to the days when my friend Copperfield and myself were younger, "'and fought our way in the world side by side.' I may say of myself and Copperfield, in words we have sung together before now, that we twa hae run about the braes and pud the gowns fine, in a figurative point of view, on several occasions. I am not exactly aware, said Mr. Micawber, with the old roll in his voice, and the old indescribable air of saying something genteel, what gowans may be, but I have no doubt that Copperfield and myself would frequently have taken a pull at them if it had been feasible. Mr. Micawber, at the then-present moment, took a pull at his punch. So we all did. Traddles evidently lost in wondering at what distant time Mr. Micawber and I could have been comrades in the battle of the world. "'Ahem,' said Mr. Micawber, clearing his throat, and warming with the punch and with the fire. "'My dear, another glass?' Mrs. Micawber said it must be very little, but we couldn't allow that, so it was a glass full. "'As we are quite confidential here, Mr. Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber, sipping her punch, "'Mr. Traddles being a part of our domesticity, "'I should much like to have your opinion on Mr. Micawber's prospects. "'For corn,' said Mrs. Micawber argumentatively, "'as I have repeatedly said to Mr. Micawber, "'may be gentlemanly, but it is not remunerative. "'Commission to the extent of two and nine pence in a fortnight "'cannot, however limited our ideas, be considered remunerative.' We were all agreed upon that. 
"'Then,' said Mrs. Micawber, who prided herself on taking a clear view of things, and keeping Mr. Micawber straight by her woman's wisdom, when he might otherwise go a little crooked, "'then I ask myself this question. If corn is not to be relied upon, what is? Are coals to be relied upon? Not at all. We have turned our attention to that experiment on the suggestion of my family, and we find it fallacious.' Mr. Micawber, leaning back in his chair with his hands in his pockets, eyed us aside and nodded his head as much as to say that the case was very clearly put. "'The articles of corn and coals,' said Mrs. Micawber, still more argumentatively, "'being equally out of the question, Mr. Copperfield, I naturally look round the world and say, "'What is there in which a person of Mr. Micawber's talent is likely to succeed?' and I exclude the doing anything on commission, because commission is not a certainty. What is best suited to a person of Mr. Micawber's peculiar temperament is, I am convinced, a certainty. Traddles and I both expressed, by a feeling murmur, that this great discovery was no doubt true of Mr. Micawber, and that it did him much credit. "'I will not conceal from you, my dear Mr. Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'that I have long felt the brewing business to be particularly adapted to Mr. Micawber. "'Look at Barclay and Perkins. Look at Truman, Hanbury, and Buxton. "'It is on that extensive footing that Mr. Micawber, I know from my own knowledge of him, "'is calculated to shine, and the profits, I am told, are enormous. "'But if Mr. Micawber cannot get into those firms, which decline to answer his letters, "'when he offers his services, even in an inferior capacity,' "'What is the use of dwelling upon that idea? None. "'I may have a conviction that Mr. Micawber's manners—' <clears throat> "'Really, my dear,' interposed Mr. Micawber. "'My love, be silent,' said Mrs. Micawber, laying her brown glove on his hand. "'I may have a conviction, Mr. Copperfield, that Mr. Micawber's manners peculiarly qualify him for the banking business. "'I may argue within myself that if I had a deposit at a banking-house, the manners of Mr. Micawber, as representing that banking-house, would inspire confidence, and must extend the connection. But if the various banking-houses refuse to avail themselves of Mr. Micawber's abilities, or receive the offer of them with contumely, what is the use of dwelling upon that idea? None. As to originating a banking business, I may know that there are members of my family who, if they chose to place their money in Mr. Micawber's hands, might found an establishment of that description. But if they do not choose to place their money in Mr. Micawber's hands, which they don't, what is the use of that? Again, I contend that we are no farther advanced than we were before. I shook my head and said, Not a bit. Traddles also shook his head and said, Not a bit. "'What do I deduce from this?' Mrs. Micawber went on to say, still with the same air of putting a case lucidly. "'What is the conclusion, my dear Mr. Copperfield, to which I am irresistibly brought? Am I wrong in saying it is clear that we must live?' I answered, "'Not at all,' and Traddles answered, "'Not at all,' and I found myself afterwards sagely adding, alone, that a person must either live or die.' "'Just so,' returned Mrs. Micawber. "'It is precisely that. "'And the fact is, my dear Mr. Copperfield, "'that we cannot live without something widely different "'from existing circumstances shortly turning up. "'Now I am convinced myself, "'and this I have pointed out to Mr. Micawber "'several times of late, "'that things cannot be expected to turn up of themselves. "'We must, in a measure, assist to turn them up. "'I may be wrong, but I have formed that opinion.' Both Traddles and I applauded it highly. "'Very well,' said Mrs. Micawber. "'Then what do I recommend? "'Here is Mr. Micawber with a variety of qualifications, "'with great talent—' "'Really, my love,' said Mr. Micawber. "'Pray, my dear, allow me to conclude. "'Here is Mr. Micawber with a variety of qualifications, "'with great talent, I should say with genius, "'but that may be the partiality of a wife.' "'Traddles and I both murmured no.' "'And here is Mr. Micawber without any suitable position or employment. "'Where does that responsibility rest? "'Clearly on society. "'Then I would make a fact so disgraceful known "'and boldly challenge society to set it right. "'It appears to me, my dear Mr. Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber forcibly, "'that what Mr. Micawber has to do is to throw down the gauntlet to society "'and say, in effect, show me who will take that up. "'Let the party immediately step forward.' 
I ventured to ask Mrs. Micawber how this was to be done. "'By advertising,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'in all the papers. "'It appears to me that what Mr. Micawber has to do, "'in justice to himself, in justice to his family, "'and I will even go so far as to say in justice to society, "'by which he has been hitherto overlooked, "'is to advertise in all the papers, "'to describe himself plainly as so-and-so, "'with such-and-such such qualifications, and to put it thus.' Now employ me on remunerative terms, and address post paid to W. M. Post Office, Camden Town. This idea of Mrs. Micawber's, my dear Copperfield, said Mr. Micawber, making his shirt-collar meet in front of his chin, and glancing at me sideways, is in fact the leap to which I alluded when I last had the pleasure of seeing you. Advertising is rather expensive, I remarked dubiously. "'Exactly so,' said Mrs. Micawber, preserving the same logical air. "'Quite true, my dear Mr. Copperfield. I have made the identical observation to Mr. Micawber. It is for that reason especially that I think Mr. Micawber ought, as I have already said, in justice to himself, in justice to his family, and in justice to society, to raise a certain sum of money on a bill.' Mr. Micawber, leaning back in his chair, trifled with his eyeglass, and cast his eyes up at the ceiling. But I thought him observant of Traddles, too, who was looking at the fire. "'If no member of my family,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'is possessed of sufficient natural feeling to negotiate that bill, I believe there is a better business term to express what I mean.' Mr. Micawber, with his eyes still cast up at the ceiling, suggested, "'Discount?' "'To discount that bill,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'then my opinion is that Mr. Micawber should go into the city, "'should take that bill into the money market, "'and should dispose of it for what he can get. "'If the individuals in the money market oblige Mr. Micawber "'to sustain a great sacrifice, "'that is between themselves and their consciences. "'I view it steadily as an investment. "'I recommend Mr. Micawber, my dear Mr. Copperfield, "'to do the same, to regard it as an investment "'which is sure of return,' "'and to make up his mind to any sacrifice. "'I felt, but I am sure I don't know why, "'that this was self-denying and devoted in Mrs. Micawber, "'and I uttered a murmur to that effect. "'Traddles, who took his tone from me, did likewise, "'still looking at the fire. "'I will not,' said Mrs. Micawber, finishing her punch, "'and gathering her scarf about her shoulders "'preparatory to her withdrawal to my bedroom, I will not protract these remarks on the subject of Mr. Micawber's pecuniary affairs. At your fireside, my dear Mr. Copperfield, and in the presence of Mr. Traddles, who, though not so old a friend, is quite one of ourselves, I could not refrain from making you acquainted with the course I advise Mr. Micawber to take. I feel that the time has arrived when Mr. Micawber should exert himself, and, I will add, assert himself, and it appears to me that these are the means— I am aware that I am merely a female, and that a masculine judgment is usually considered more competent to the discussion of such questions. Still, I must not forget that when I lived at home with my papa and mamma, my papa was in the habit of saying, Emma's form is fragile, but her grasp of a subject is inferior to none. That my papa was too partial, I well know. But that he was an observer of character in some degree, my duty and my reason equally forbid me to doubt." With these words, and resisting our entreaties that she would grace the remaining circulation of the punch with her presence, Mrs. Micawber retired to my bedroom, and really I felt that she was a noble woman, the sort of woman who might have been a Roman matron, and done all manner of heroic things in times of public trouble. In the fervour of this impression I congratulated Mr. Micawber on the treasure he possessed. So did Traddles. Mr. Micawber extended his hand to each of us in succession, and then covered his face with his pocket-handkerchief, which I think had more snuff upon it than he was aware of. He then returned to the punch in the highest state of exhilaration. He was full of eloquence. He gave us to understand that in our children we lived again, and that under the pressure of pecuniary difficulties any accession to their number was doubly welcome. He said that Mrs. Micawber had latterly had her doubts on this point, but that he had dispelled them and reassured her. As to her family, they were totally unworthy of her, and their sentiments were utterly indifferent to him, and they might, I quote his own expression, go to the devil. Mr. Micawber then delivered a warm eulogy on Traddles. 
He said Traddles's was a character to the steady virtues of which he, Mr. Micawber, could lay no claim, but which he thanked heaven he could admire. He feelingly alluded to the young lady unknown, whom Traddles had honoured with his affection, and who had reciprocated that affection by honouring and blessing Traddles with her affection. Mr. Micawber pledged her. So did I. Traddles thanked us both by saying, with a simplicity and honesty I had sense enough to be quite charmed with, "'I am very much obliged to you indeed, and I do assure you she's the dearest girl.' Mr. Micawber took an early opportunity after that of hinting, with the utmost delicacy and ceremony, at the state of my affections. "'Nothing but the serious assurance of his friend Copperfield to the contrary,' he observed, could deprive him of the impression that his friend Copperfield loved and was beloved. After feeling very hot and uncomfortable for some time, and after a good deal of blushing, stammering, and denying, I said, having my glass in my hand, "'Well, I would give them D,' which so excited and gratified Mr. Micawber that he ran with a glass of punch into my bedroom, in order that Mrs. Micawber might drink D, who drank it with enthusiasm, crying from within in a shrill voice, "'Here, here, my dear Mr. Copperfield, I am delighted, here!' and tapping at the wall by way of applause. Our conversation afterwards took a more worldly turn, Mr. Micawber telling us that he found Camden Town inconvenient, and that the first thing he contemplated doing, when the advertisement should have been the cause of something satisfactory turning up, was to move. He mentioned a terrace at the western end of Oxford Street, fronting Hyde Park, on which he had always had his eye, but which he did not expect to attain immediately, as it would require a large establishment. There would probably be an interval, he explained, in which he should content himself with the upper part of a house over some respectable place of business, say in Piccadilly, which would be a cheerful situation for Mrs. Micawber, and where, by throwing out a bow window, or carrying up the roof another story, or making some little alteration of that sort, they might live comfortably and reputably for a few years. Whatever was reserved for him, he expressly said, or wherever his abode might be, we might rely on this, there would always be a room for Traddles and a knife and fork for me. We acknowledged his kindness, and he begged us to forgive his having launched into these practical and business-like details, and to excuse it as natural in one who was making entirely new arrangements in life. Mrs. Micawber, tapping at the wall again to know if tea were ready, broke up this particular phase of our friendly conversation. She made tea for us in a most agreeable manner, and whenever I went near her, in handing about the teacups and bread and butter, asked me in a whisper whether D was fair or dark, or whether she was short or tall, or something of that kind, which I think I liked. After tea we discussed a variety of topics before the fire, and Mrs. Micawber was good enough to sing us, in a small, thin, flat voice, which I remembered to have considered, when I first knew her, the very table-beer of acoustics, the favourite ballads of The Dashing White Sergeant and Little Taflin. For both of these songs Mrs. Micawber had been famous when she lived at home with her papa and mamma. Mr. Micawber told us that when he heard her sing the first one, on the first occasion of his seeing her beneath the parental roof, she had attracted his attention in an extraordinary degree, but that when it came to little Taflin, he had resolved to win that woman or perish in the attempt. It was between ten and eleven o'clock when Mrs. Micawber rose to replace her cap in the whitey-brown paper parcel and to put on her bonnet. Mr. Micawber took the opportunity of Traddles putting on his greatcoat to slip a letter into my hand, with a whispered request that I would read it at my leisure. I also took the opportunity of my holding a candle over the banisters to light them down, when Mr. Micawber was going first, leading Mrs. Micawber, and Traddles was following with the cap, to detain Traddles for a moment on the top of the stairs. "'Traddles,' said I, "'Mr. Micawber don't mean any harm, poor fellow, but if I were you, I wouldn't lend him anything.' "'My dear Copperfield,' returned Traddles, smiling, "'I haven't got anything to lend.' "'You have got a name, you know,' said I. "'Oh, you call that something to lend?' returned Traddles, with a thoughtful look. "'Certainly.' "'Oh,' said Traddles, "'yes, to be sure. I am very much obliged to you, Copperfield. But I am afraid I have lent him that already.' 
"'For the bill that is to be a certain investment?' I inquired. "'No,' said Traddles, "'not for that one. "'This is the first I have heard of that one. "'I have been thinking that he will most likely propose that one on the way home. "'Mine's another.' "'I hope there will be nothing wrong about it,' said I. "'I hope not,' said Traddles. "'I should think not, though, because he told me only the other day that it was provided for. "'That was Mr. Micawber's expression, provided for.' Mr. Micawber, looking up at this juncture to where we were standing, I had only time to repeat my caution. Traddles thanked me and descended. But I was much afraid when I observed the good-natured manner in which he went down with the cap in his hand and gave Mrs. Micawber his arm, that he would be carried into the money-market neck and heels. I returned to my fireside and was musing, half gravely and half laughing, on the character of Mr. Micawber and the old relations between us, when I heard a quick step ascending the stairs. At first I thought it was Traddles coming back for something Mrs. Micawber had left behind. But as the step approached I knew it, and felt my heart beat high and the blood rush to my face, for it was Steerforth's. I was never unmindful of Agnes, and she never left that sanctuary in my thoughts, if I may call it so, where I had placed her from the first. But when he entered and stood before me with his hand out, the darkness that had fallen on him changed to light, and I felt confounded and ashamed of having doubted one I loved so heartily. I loved her none the less. I thought of her as the same benignant, gentle angel in my life. I reproached myself, not her, with having done him an injury, and I would have made him any atonement if I had known what to make and how to make it. "'Why, Daisy, old boy, dumbfoundered,' laughed Steerforth, shaking my hand heartily and throwing it gaily away. "'Have I detected you in another feast, you cyberite? "'These doctors' commons fellows are the gayest men in town, I believe, "'and beat us sober Oxford people all to nothing.' "'His bright glance went merrily round the room "'as he took the seat on the sofa opposite to me, "'which Mrs. Micawber had recently vacated, "'and stirred the fire into a blaze. "'I was so surprised at first, said I, "'giving him welcome with all the cordiality I felt, "'that I had hardly breath to greet you with, Steerforth.' "'Well, the sight of me is good for sore eyes, as the Scotch say,' replied Steerforth. "'And so is the sight of you, Daisy, in full bloom. "'How are you, my bacchanal?' "'I am very well,' said I, "'and not at all bacchanalian to-night, "'though I confess to another party of three. "'All of whom I met in the street, "'talking loud in your praise,' returned Steerforth. "'Who's our friend in the tights?' "'I gave him the best idea I could, in a few words, of Mr. Micawber.' He laughed heartily at my feeble portrait of that gentleman, and said he was a man to know, and he must know him. "'But who do you suppose our other friend is?' said I, in my turn. "'Heaven knows,' said Steerforth. "'Not a bore, I hope. I thought he looked a little like one.' "'Traddles!' I replied triumphantly. "'Who's he?' asked Steerforth, in his careless way. "'Don't you remember Traddles? Traddles in our room at Salem House?' "'Oh, that fellow,' said Steerforth, beating a lump of coal on the top of the fire with the poker. "'Is he as soft as ever? And where the deuce did you pick him up?' I extolled Traddles in reply as highly as I could, for I felt that Steerforth rather slighted him. Steerforth, dismissing the subject with a light nod and a smile, and the remark that he would be glad to see the old fellow too, for he had always been an odd fish, inquired if I could give him anything to eat. During most of this short dialogue, when he had not been speaking in a wild, vivacious manner, he had sat idly beating on the lump of coal with the poker. I observed that he did the same thing while I was getting out the remains of the pigeon pie, and so forth. "'Why, Daisy, here's a supper for a king!' he exclaimed, starting out of his silence with a burst and taking his seat at the table. "'I shall do it justice, for I have come from Yarmouth.' "'I thought you came from Oxford,' I returned." "'Not I,' said Steerforth. "'I have been seafaring. Better employed.' "'Littimer was here to-day to inquire for you,' I remarked. "'And I understood him that you were at Oxford, "'though, now I think of it, he certainly did not say so. "'Littimer is a greater fool than I thought him "'to have been inquiring for me at all,' said Steerforth, "'jovially pouring out a glass of wine and drinking to me. "'As to understanding him, "'you are a cleverer fellow than most of us, Daisy, if you can do that.' "'That's true indeed,' said I, moving my chair to the table. 
"'So you have been at Yarmouth, Steerforth. "'Interested to know all about it. "'Have you been there long?' "'No,' he returned. "'An escapade of a week or so.' "'And how are they all? "'Of course little Emily is not married yet?' "'Not yet. "'Going to be, I believe, in so many weeks, "'or months, or something or other. "'I have not seen much of them. "'By the by,' he laid down his knife and fork, "'which he had been using with great diligence, "'and began feeling in his pockets. "'I have a letter for you.' "'From whom?' "'Why, from your old nurse,' he returned, "'taking some papers out of his breast-pocket. "'J. Steerforth, Esquire, debtor to the willing mind. "'That's not it. "'Patience, and we'll find it presently. "'Old what's-his-name's in a bad way, "'and it's about that, I believe. "'Barkus, do you mean?' "'Yes. "'Still feeling in his pockets and looking over their contents. "'It's all over with poor Barkus, I am afraid.' "'I saw a little apothecary there, surgeon or whatever he is, "'who brought your worship into the world. "'He was mighty learned about the case to me, "'but the upshot of his opinion was that the carrier "'was making his last journey rather fast. "'Put your hand into the breast-pocket of my greatcoat on the chair yonder, "'and I think you'll find the letter. Is it there?' "'Here it is,' said I. "'That's right.' "'It was from Peggotty, something less legible than usual and brief.' It informed me of her husband's hopeless state, and hinted at his being a little nearer than heretofore, and consequently more difficult to manage for his own comfort. It said nothing of her weariness and watching, and praised him highly. It was written with a plain, unaffected, homely piety that I knew to be genuine, and ended with, My duty to my ever-darling, meaning myself. While I deciphered it, Steerforth continued to eat and drink. "'It's a bad job,' he said, when I had done. "'But the sun sets every day, and people die every minute, "'and we mustn't be scared by the common lot. "'If we failed to hold our own, "'because that equal foot at all men's doors "'was heard knocking somewhere, "'every object in this world would slip from us. "'No, ride on. "'Rough shot, if need be. "'Smooth shot, if that will do. "'But ride on. "'Ride on over all obstacles, and win the race.' "'And win what race?' said I. "'The race that one has started in,' said he. "'Ride on.' "'I noticed, I remember, as he paused, "'looking at me with his handsome head a little thrown back "'and his glass raised in his hand, "'that though the freshness of the sea-wind was on his face "'and it was ruddy, there were traces in it, "'made since I last saw it, "'as if he had applied himself to some habitual strain "'of the fervent energy which, when roused, "'was so passionately roused within him.' I had it in my thoughts to remonstrate with him upon his desperate way of pursuing any fancy that he took, such as this buffeting of rough seas and braving of hard weather, for example, when my mind glanced off to the immediate subject of our conversation again, and pursued that instead. "'I tell you what, Steerforth,' said I, "'if your high spirits will listen to me—' "'They are potent spirits, and will do whatever you like,' he answered, moving from the table to the fireside again." "'Then I tell you what, Steerforth, I think I will go down and see my old nurse. "'It is not that I can do her any good, or render her any real service, "'but she is so attached to me that my visit will have as much effect on her as if I could do both. "'She will take it so kindly that it will be a comfort and support to her. "'It is no great effort to make, I am sure, for such a friend as she has been to me. "'Wouldn't you go a day's journey if you were in my place?' His face was thoughtful, and he sat considering a little before he answered, in a low voice, "'Well, go. You can do no harm.' "'You have just come back,' said I, "'and it would be in vain to ask you to go with me.' "'Quite,' he returned. "'I am for Highgate to-night. I have not seen my mother this long time, and it lies upon my conscience, for it's something to be loved as she loves her prodigal son. Bah! Nonsense!' "'You mean to go to-morrow, I suppose,' he said, "'holding me out at arm's length with a hand on each of my shoulders. "'Yes, I think so. "'Well, then, don't go till next day. "'I wanted you to come and stay a few days with us. "'Here I am on purpose to bid you, and you fly off to Yarmouth. "'You are a nice fellow to talk of flying off, Steerforth, "'who are always running wild on some unknown expedition or other.' "'He looked at me for a moment without speaking.' and then rejoined, still holding me as before, and giving me a shake, "'Come, say the next day, and pass as much of to-morrow as you can with us. Who knows when we may meet again else? 
come, say the next day. I want you to stand between Rosa Dartle and me and keep us asunder. Would you love each other too much without me? Yes, or hate, laughed Steerforth, no matter which. Come, say the next day. I said the next day, and he put on his great coat and lighted his cigar and set off to walk home. Finding him in this intention, I put on my own great coat, but did not light my own cigar, having had enough of that for one while, and walked with him as far as the open road, a dull road then at night. He was in great spirits all the way, and when we parted and I looked after him, going so gallantly and airily homeward, I thought of his saying, "'Ride on over all obstacles and win the race,' and wished for the first time that he had some worthy race to run. I was undressing in my own room when Mr. Micawber's letter tumbled on the floor. Thus reminded of it, I broke the seal and read as follows. It was dated an hour and a half before dinner. I am not sure whether I have mentioned that, when Mr. Micawber was at any particularly desperate crisis, he used a sort of legal phraseology, which he seemed to think equivalent to winding up his affairs. Sir, for I dare not say my dear Copperfield, it is expedient that I should inform you that the undersigned is crushed. Some flickering efforts to spare you the premature knowledge of his calamitous position you may observe in him this day, but hope has sunk beneath the horizon, and the undersigned is crushed. The present communication is penned within the personal range, I cannot call it the society, of an individual in a state closely bordering on intoxication, employed by a broker. That individual is in legal possession of the premises, under a distress for rent. His inventory includes, not only the chattels and effects of every description belonging to the undersigned, as yearly tenant of this habitation, but also those appertaining to Mr. Thomas Traddles, lodger, a member of the Honourable Society of the Inner Temple. If any drop of gloom were wanting in the overflowing cup, which is now commended, in the language of an immortal writer, to the lips of the undersigned, it would be found in the fact that a friendly acceptance granted to the undersigned by the before-mentioned Mr. Thomas Traddles, for the sum of two hundred and thirty-one, four shillings, nine and a half pence, is overdue, and is not provided for. Also in the fact that the living responsibilities clinging to the undersigned will, in the course of nature, be increased by the sum of one more helpless victim, whose miserable appearance may be looked for, in round numbers, at the expiration of a period not exceeding six lunar months from the present date. After promising thus much, it would be a work of supererogation to add that dust and ashes are forever scattered on the head of Wilkins Micawber. Poor Traddles! I knew enough of Mr. Micawber by this time to foresee that he might be expected to recover the blow, but my night's rest was sorely distressed by thoughts of Traddles and of the curate's daughter, who was one of ten down in Devonshire, and who was such a dear girl, and who would wait for Traddles, ominous praise, until she was sixty or any age that could be mentioned. End of chapter 28《Chapter Twenty Nine of David Copperfield》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. C. Y. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Nine. I visit Steerforth at his home again. I mentioned to Mister Spenlow in the morning that I wanted leave of absence for a short time, and as I was not in the receipt of any salary, and consequently was not obnoxious to the implacable Jorkins, there was no difficulty about it. I took that opportunity with my voice sticking in my throat, and my sight failing as I uttered the words, to express my hope that Miss Spenlow was quite well, to which Mr. Spenlow replied, with no more emotion than if he had been speaking of an ordinary human being, that he was much obliged to me, and she was very well. We article clerks, as germs of the patrician order of proctors, were treated with so much consideration 
that I was almost my own master at all times. As I did not care, however, to get to Highgate before one or two o'clock in the day, and as we had another little excommunication case in court that morning, which was called the office of the judge promoted by Tipkins against Bullock, for his soul's correction, I passed an hour or two in attendance on it with Mr. Spenlow, very agreeably. It arose out of a scuffle between two church wardens, one of whom was alleged to have pushed the other against a pump, the handle of which pump projecting into a schoolhouse, which a schoolhouse was under a gable of the church roof, made the perch an ecclesiastical offence. It was an amusing case, and sent me up to Highgate on the box of the stage coat, thinking about the commons, and what Mr. Spenlow had said about touching the commons and bringing down the country. Mrs. Steerforth was pleased to see me, and so was Rosa Dartle. I was agreeably surprised to find that Littimer was not there, and that we were attended by a modest little parlour maid, with blue ribbons in her cap, whose eye it was much more pleasant, and much less disconcerting, to catch by accident than the eye of that respectable man. But what I particularly observed, before I had been half an hour in the house, was the close and attentive watch Miss Dartle kept upon me, and the lurking manner in which she seemed to compare my face with Steerforth's, and Steerforth with mine, and to lie in wait for something to come out between the two. So surely as I looked towards her did I see that eager visage, with its gaunt black eyes and searching brow intent on mine, or passing suddenly from mine to Steerforth's, or comprehending both of us at once. In this lynx-like scrutiny she was so far from faltering when she saw I observed it, that at such a time she only fixed a piercing look upon me with a more intent expression at still. Blameless as I was, and knew that I was, in reference to any wrong she could possibly suspect me of, I shrunk before her strange eyes, quite unable to endure their hungry lust. All day she seemed to pervade the whole house. If I talked to Steerforth in his room, I heard her dress rustle in the little gallery outside. When he and I engaged in some of our old exercise on the lawn behind the house, I saw her face pass from window to window, like a wandering light, until it fixed itself in one and watched us. When we all four went out, walking in the afternoon, she closed her thin hand on my arm like a spring, to keep me back, while Steerforth and his mother went on out of hearing, and then spoke to me. "'You have been a long time,' she said, without coming here. "'Is your profession really so engaging and interesting as to absorb your whole attention?' "'I ask because I always want to be informed when I am ignorant. Is it really, though?' I replied that I liked it well enough, but that I certainly could not claim so much for it. Oh, I am glad to know that, because I always like to be put right when I am wrong, said Rosa Dartle. You mean it is a little dry, perhaps? Well, I replied, perhaps it was a little dry. Oh, and that's the reason why you want relief and change, excitement and all that, said she. Ah, very true. But isn't it a little uh, for him? I don't mean you. A quick glance of her eye towards the spot where Steerforth was walking, with his mother leaning on his arm, showed me whom she meant, but beyond that I was quite lost. And I looked so, I have no doubt. Don't it? I don't say that it does, mind I want to know. Don't it rather engross him? Don't it make him, perhaps, a little more remiss than usual in his visits to his blindly doting, eh? With another quick glance at them, and such a glance at me as seemed to look into my innermost thoughts. Miss Dartle, I returned, pray do not think. I don't, she said. Oh, dear me, don't suppose that I think anything. I am not suspicious. I only ask a question. I don't state any opinion. I want to found an opinion on what you tell me. Then, it's not so. 
"'Well, I am very glad to know it.' "'It certainly is not the fact,' said I, perplexed, "'that I am accountable for Steerforth's having been away from home longer than usual, "'if he has been, which I really don't know at this moment, unless I understand it from you. "'I have not seen him this long while, until last night.' "'No? Indeed, Miss Dartle, no.' As she looked full at me, I saw her face grow sharper and paler, and the marks of the old wound lengthen out until it cut through the disfigured lip, and deep into the nether lip, and slanted down the face. There was something positively awful to me in this, and in the brightness of her eyes, as she sat looking fixedly at me. "'What is he doing?' I repeated these words, more to myself than her, being so amazed. "'What is he doing?' she said, with an eagerness that seemed enough to consume her like a fire. "'In what is that man assisting him, who never looks at me without an inscrutable falsehood in his eyes? If you are honourable and faithful, I don't ask you to betray your friend. I ask you only to tell me, is it anger, is it hatred, is it pride?' Is it restlessness? Is it some wild fancy? Is it love? What is it that is leading him? Miss Dartle, I returned, how shall I tell you, so that you will believe me, that I know of nothing in Steerforth different from what there was when I first came here? I can think of nothing. I firmly believe there is nothing. I hardly understand even what you mean. As she still stood looking fixedly at me, twitching or throbbing, from which I could not dissociate the idea of pain, came into the cruel mark, and lifted the corner of her lip as if with scorn, or with a pity that despised its object. She put her hand upon it hurriedly, a hand so thin and delicate, that when I had seen her hold it up before the fire to shade her face, I had compared it in my thoughts to fine porcelain and saying in a quick, fierce, passionate way, "'I swear you to secrecy about this,' said not a word more. Mrs. Steerforth was particularly happy in her son's society, and Steerforth was, in this occasion, particularly attentive and respectful to her. It was very interesting to me to see them together, not only on account of their mutual affection, but because of the strong personal resemblance between them, and the manner in which what was haughty or impetuous in him was softened by age and sex in her to a gracious dignity. I thought more than once that it was well no serious cause of division had ever come between them, or to such natures, I ought rather to express it, to such shades of the same nature might have been harder to reconcile than the two extremist opposites in creation. The idea did not originate in my own discernment, I am bound to confess, but in a speech of Rosa Dartle's. She said at dinner, "'Oh, but do tell me, though, somebody, because I have been thinking about it all day, and I want to know.' "'You want to know what, Rosa?' returned Mrs. Steerforth. "'Pray, pray, Rosa, do not be mysterious.' "'Mysterious?' she cried. "'Oh, really, do you consider me so?' "'Do I constantly entreat you,' said Mrs. Steerforth, "'to speak plainly in your own natural manner?' "'Oh, then this is not my natural manner,' she rejoined. "'Now you must really bear with me, because I ask for information. "'We never know ourselves.' "'It has become a second nature,' said Mr. Steerforth, "'without any displeasure. "'But I remember, and so must you, I think.' When your manner was different, Rosa, when it was not so guarded, and was more trustful. I am sure you are right, she returned, and so it is that bad habits grow upon one. Really, less guarded and more trustful. How can I imperceptibly have changed, I wonder? Well, that's very odd. I must study to regain my former self. "'I wish you would,' said Mrs. Steerforth, with a smile. "'Oh, I really will, you know,' she answered. "'I will learn frankness from—let me see—from James.' 
"'You cannot learn frankness, Rosa,' said Mrs. Steerforth quickly, for there was always some effect of sarcasm in what Rosa Dartle said, though it was said, as this was, in the most unconscious manner in the world, in a better school. "'That I am sure of,' she answered, with uncommon fervor. "'If I am sure of anything, of course, you know, I am sure of that.' Mrs. Tearforth appeared to me to regret having been a little nettled, for she presently said in a kind tone, "'Well, my dear Rosa, we have not heard what it is that you want to be satisfied about.' "'That I want to be satisfied about,' she replied with provoking coldness. "'Oh, it was only whether people who are like each other in their moral constitution, is that the phrase?' "'It's as good a phrase as another,' said Steerforth. Thank you. Whether people who are like each other in their moral constitution are in greater danger than people not so circumstanced, supposing any serious cause of variance to arise between them, are being divided angrily and deeply. I should say yes, said Steerforth. Should you? she retorted. Dear me, supposing then, for instance, any unlikely thing will do for a supposition, that you and your mother were to have a serious quarrel. My dear Rosa, interposed Mrs. Steerforth, laughing good-naturedly, suggest some other supposition. James and I know our duty to each other better, I pray heaven. Oh, said Miss Dartle, nodding her head thoughtfully, to be sure that would prevent it. Why, of course you would. Exactly. Now I am glad I have been so foolish as to put the case, for it is so very good to know that your duty to each other would prevent it. Thank you very much. One other little circumstance, connected with Miss Dartle, I must not omit, for I had reason to remember it thereafter, when all the irremediable past was rendered plain. During the whole of this day, but especially from this period of it, Steerforth exerted himself with his utmost skill, and that was with his utmost ease, to charm this singular creature into a pleasant and pleased companion. That he should succeed was no matter of surprise to me. That she should struggle against the fascinating influence of his delightful art, delightful nature, I thought it then, did not surprise me either, for I knew that she was sometimes jaundiced and perverse. I saw her features and her manner slowly change. I saw her look at him with growing admiration. I saw her try more and more faintly, but always angrily, as if she condemned a weakness in herself to resist the captivating power that he possessed. And finally, I saw her sharp glance soften, and her smile become quite gentle. And I ceased to be afraid of her, as I had really been all day, and we all sat about the fire, talking and laughing together, with as little reserve as if we had been children. Whether it was because we had sat there so long, or because Tearforth was resolved not to lose the advantage he had gained, I do not know, but we did not remain in the dining-room more than five minutes after her departure. "'She is playing her harp,' said Tearforth softly, at the drawing-room door, and nobody but my mother has heard her do that, I believe, these three years. He said it with a curious smile, which was gone directly, and we went into the room and found her alone. Don't get up, said Steerforth, which she had already done. My dear Rosa, don't. Be kind for once and sing us an Irish song. What do you care for your an Irish song? she returned. Much, said Steerforth, much more than for any other. Here's Daisy, too, loves music from his soul. Sing us an Irish song, Rosa, and let me sit and listen as I used to do. He did not touch her, or the chair from which she had risen, but sat himself near the harp. She stood beside it for some little while, in a curious way, going through the motion of playing it with her right hand, but not sounding it. At length she sat down, and drew it to her with one sudden action, and played and sang. 
I don't know what it was in her touch or voice that made that song the most unearthly I have ever heard in my life, or can imagine. There was something fearful in the reality of it. It was as if it had never been written or set to music, but sprung out of passion within her, which found imperfect utterance in the low sounds of her voice, and crouched again when all was still. I was dumb when she leaned beside the harp again, playing it, but not sounding it, with her right hand. A minute more, and this had roused me from my trance. Steerforth had left his seat, and gone to her, and had put his arm laughingly about her, and had said, "'Come, Rosa, for the future we will love each other very much.' And she had struck him, and had thrown him off, with the fury of a wild cat, and had burst out of the room. "'What is the matter with Rosa?' said Mrs. Steerforth, coming in. "'She has been an angel, mother,' returned Steerforth, "'for a little while, and has run into the opposite extreme sense by the way of compensation.' "'You should be careful not to irritate her, James. "'Her temper has been soured, remember, and ought not to be tried.' "'Rosa did not come back, and no other mention was made of her, until I went with Tearforth into his room to say good night. Then he laughed about her, and asked me if I had ever seen such a fierce little piece of incomprehensibility. I expressed as much of my astonishment as was then capable of expression, and asked if he could guess what it was that she had taken so much amiss so suddenly. Oh, heaven knows, said Tearforth, anything you like, or nothing. I told you she took everything, herself included, to a grindstone and sharpened it. She is an edged tool, and requires great care in dealing with. She is always dangerous. Good night. Good night, said I, my dear Steerforth. I shall be gone before you wake in the morning. Good night. He was unwilling to let me go, and stood holding me out, with a hand on each of my shoulders, as he had done in my own room. Daisy, he said with a smile, for though that's not the name your godfathers and godmothers gave you, it's the name I like best to call you by, and I wish, I wish, I wish you could give it to me. Why, so I can if I choose, said I. Daisy, if anything should ever separate us, you must think of me at my best, old boy. Come, let us make that bargain. Think of me at my best if circumstances should ever part us. "'You have no best to me, Steerforth,' said I, "'and no worst. You are always equally loved and cherished in my heart.' So much compunction for having even wronged him, even by a shapeless thought, did I feel within me that the confession of having done so was rising to my lips. But for the reluctance I had to betray the confidence of Agnes, but for the uncertainty how to approach the subject with no risk of doing so, it would have reached them before he said, God bless you, Daisy, and good night. In my doubt, it did not reach them, and we shook hands, and we parted. I was up with the dull dawn, and having dressed as quietly as I could, looked into his room. He was fast asleep, lying easily with his head upon his arm, as I had often seen him lie at school. The time came in its season, and that was very soon, when I almost wondered that nothing troubled his repose as I looked at him. But he slept. Let me think of him so again, as I had often seen him sleep at school, and thus, in the silent hour, I left him. Nevermore, O oh God, forgive you, Steerforth, to touch that passive hand in love and friendship, Never, never more. End of chapter 29、Chapter、thirty of David Copperfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. David Copperfield 
by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty, A Loss. I got down to Yarmouth in the evening and went to the inn. I knew that Pigotti's spare room, my room, was likely to have occupation enough in a little while, if that great visitor, before whose presence all the living must give place, were not already in the house. So I betook myself to the inn, and dined there, and engaged my bed. It was ten o'clock when I went out. Many of the shops were shut, and the town was dull. When I came to Omar and Joram's, I found the shutters up, but the shop door standing open. As I could obtain a perspective view of Mr. Omar inside, smoking his pipe by the parlor door, I entered, and asked him how he was. "'Why, bless my life and soul,' said Mr. Omar, "'how do you find yourself? Take a seat. Smoke not disagreeable, I hope.' Uh, "'By no means,' said I. "'I like it. In somebody else's pipe. "'What, not in your own, eh?' Mr. Omar returned, laughing. "'All the better, sir. Bad habit for a young man. Take a seat. I smoke myself for the asthma.' Mr. Omar had made room for me, and placed a chair. He now sat down again very much out of breath, gasping at his pipe as if it contained a supply of that necessary, without which he must perish. "'I am sorry to have heard bad news of Mr. Barkus,' said I. Mr. Omer looked at me, with a steady countenance, and shook his head. "'Do you know how he is to-night?' I asked. "'The very question I should have put to you, sir,' returned Mr. Omar. "'But on account of delicacy. It's one of the drawbacks of our line of business. When a party's ill, we can't ask how the party is.' The difficulty had not occurred to me, though I had had my apprehensions, too, when I went in of hearing the old tune. On its being mentioned, I recognized it, however, and said as much. "'Yes, yes, you understand,' said Mr. Omar, nodding his head. "'We don't do it. Bless you, it would be a shock that the generality of parties mightn't recover, to say, "'Elmar and Joram's compliments, and how do you find yourself this morning, or this afternoon, as it may be?' Mr. Omar and I nodded at each other, and Mr. Omar recruited his wind by the aid of his pipe. "'It's one of the things that cut the trade off from the intentions they could often wish to show,' said Mr. Omar. "'Take myself. If I had known Barkus a year to move to as he went by, I have known him forty years. But I can't go and say, how is he?' I felt it was rather hard on Mr. Omar, and I told him so. "'I am not more self-interested, I hope, than another man,' said Mr. Omer. "'Look at me. My wind may fail me at any moment, and it ain't likely that, to my knowledge, I'd be self-interested under such circumstances. I say, it ain't likely, in a man who knows his wind will go, when it does go, as if a pair of bellows was cut open, and that man a grandfather,' said Mr. Omer. I said, not at all. "'It ain't that I complain of my line of business,' said Mr. Omer. "'It ain't that. Some good and some bad goes, no doubt, to all callings. What I wish is that parties was brought up stronger-minded.' Mr. Omer, with a very complacent and amiable face, took several puffs in silence, and then said, resuming his first point, "'Accordingly, we're obliged in ascertaining how Barkus goes on to limit ourselves to Emily.' She knows what our real objects are, and she don't have any more alarms or suspicions about us than if we was so many lambs. Minnie and Jorm have just stepped down to the house. In fact, she's there, after hours, helping her aunt a bit, to ask her how he is to-night. And if you was pleased to wait till they come back, they give you full particulars. Will you take something, a glass of shrub and water now? I smoke on shrub and water myself, said Mr. Omar, taking up his glass. "'because it's considered softening to the passages "'by which this troublesome breath of mine gets into action. "'But, Lord bless you,' said Mr. Omar huskily, "'it ain't the passages that's out of order. "'Give me breath enough,' said I to my daughter Minnie, "'and all fine passages, my dear.' "'He really had no breath to spare, "'and it was very alarming to see him laugh. "'When he was again in a condition to be talked to, 
I thanked him for the proffered refreshment, which I declined, as I had just had dinner, and, observing that I would wait, since he was so good as to invite me, until his daughter and his son-in-law came back, I inquired how little Emily was. "'Well, sir,' said Mr. Omar, removing his pipe that he might rub his chin, "'I tell you truly, I should be glad when her marriage has taken place.' "'Why so?' I inquired. "'Well, she's on settle at present,' said Mr. Omar. "'It ain't that she's not as pretty as ever, for she's prettier. I do assure you she is prettier. It ain't that she don't work as well as ever, for she does. She was worth any six, and she is worth any six. But somehow she wants heart, if you understand.' said Mr. Omar, after rubbing his chin again and smoking a little. "'Well, I mean in a general way, by the expression, "'A long pull and a strong pull and a pull all together, me hearty is hurrah! "'I should say to you that that was, in a general way, what I miss in Emily.' Mr. Omar's face and manners went for so much that I could conscientiously nod my head as divine his meaning. My quickness of apprehension seemed to please him and he went on. "'Now I consider this is principally on account of her being in an unsettled state, you see. We have talked it over a good deal, her uncle and myself, and her sweetheart and myself, after business, and I consider it is principally on account of her being unsettled. You must always recollect of Emily,' said Mr. Omar, shaking his head gently, "'that she's a most extraordinarily affectionate little thing.' The proverb says, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Well, I don't know about that. I rather think you may, if you begin early in life. She has made a home out of that old boat, sir, that stone and marble couldn't beat. I am sure she has, said I. To see the clinging of that pretty little thing to her uncle, said Mr. Omar, to see the way she holds on to him, tighter and tighter, and closer and closer every day, is to see a sight. "'Now you know there's a struggle going on when that's the case. "'Why should it be made a longer one than is needful?' "'I listened attentively to the good old fellow, "'and acquiesced with all my heart in what he said. "'Therefore I mentioned to them,' said Mr. Omar, "'in a comfortable, easy-going tone. "'This. I said, "'Now don't consider Emily nailed down in point of time at all. "'Make it your own time.' Her services have been more valuable than was supposed. Her leaning has been quicker than was supposed. Emma and Joram can run their pen through what remains, and she's free when you wish. If she likes to make any little arrangement afterwards, in the way of doing any little thing for us at home, very well. If she don't, very well still. We're no losers anyhow, for, don't you see, said Mr. Omar, touching me with his pipe, it ain't likely that a man so short of breath as myself, and a grandfather too, would go in straight points with a little bit of a blue-eyed blossom like her. Not at all, I am certain, said I. Not at all, you're right, said Mr. Omar. Well, sir, her cousin, you know it's a cousin she's going to be married to. Oh, yes, I replied, I know him well. Of course you do, said Mr. Omar. Well, sir. Her cousin, being, as it appears, in good work, and well-to-do, thanked me in a very manly sort of manner for this, conducting himself altogether, I must say, in a way that gives me a high opinion of him, and went and took as comfortable a little house as you or I could wish to clap eyes on. That little house is now furnished right through, as neat and complete as a doll's parlour. And but for Barkis's illness having taken this bad turn, poor fellow, they would have been man and wife, I dare say, by this time. As it is, there's a postponement. And Emily, Mr. Omar, I inquired, has she become more settled? Why that, you know, he returned, rubbing his double chin again, can't naturally be expected. The prospect of the change and separation and all that is, as one may say, close to her and far away from her both at once. Barkis's death needn't put it off much, but his lingering might. Anyway, it's an uncertain state of matters, you see. I see, said I. Consequently, pursued Mr. Omar, Emily's still a little down, and a little fluttered, perhaps. 
Upon the whole, she's more so than she was. Every day she seems to get fonder and fonder of her uncle, and more loath to part from all of us. A kind word from me brings the tears into her eyes, and if it was you to see her with my daughter Minnie's little girl, you'd never forget it. Bless my heart alive, said Mr. Omar, pondering. How she loves that child! Having so favorable an opportunity, it occurred to me to ask Mr. Omar, before our conversation should be interrupted by the return of his daughter and her husband, whether he knew anything of Martha. Ah, he rejoined, shaking his head and looking very much dejected. No good. A sad story, however you come to know it. I never thought there was harm in the girl. I wouldn't wish to mention it before my daughter Minnie, for she'd take me up directly, but I never did. None of us ever did. Mr. Omar, hearing his daughter's footsteps before I heard it, touched me with his pipe and shut up one eye as a caution. She and her husband came in immediately afterwards. Their report was that Mr. Barkis was as bad as bad could be, that he was quite unconscious, and that Mr. Chillip had mournfully said in the kitchen, on going away just now, that the College of Physicians, the College of Surgeons, and the Apothecary's Hall, if they were all called in together, couldn't help him. He was past both colleges, Mr. Chillip said, and the hall could only poison him. Hearing this, and learning that Mr. Pigotti was there, I determined to go to the house at once. I bade good night to Mr. Omar, and to Mr. and Mrs. Joram, and directed my steps thither, with a solemn feeling, which made Mr. Barkis quite a new and different creature. My low tap at the door was answered by Mr. Pigotti. He was not so much surprised to see me as I had expected. I remarked this in Pigotti, too, when she came down and I have seen it since, and I think, in the expectation of that dread surprise, all other changes and surprises dwindled into nothing. I shook hands with Mr. Pigotti and passed into the kitchen while he softly closed the door. Little Emily was sitting by the fire, with her hands before her face. Ham was standing near her. We spoke in whispers, listening, between whiles, for any sound in the room above. I had not thought of it on the occasion of my last visit, but how strange it was to me, now, to miss Mr. Barkis out of the kitchen. "'This is very kind of you, Massa Davy,' said Mr. Pigotti. "'It's uncommon kind,' said Ham. "'Emily, my dear,' cried Mr. Pigotti. "'See here, here's Master Davy come. What, cheer up, pretty. Not a word to Master Davy?' There was a trembling upon her that I can see now, the coldness of her hand when I touched it. I can feel yet. Its only sign of animation was to shrink from mine, and then she glided from the chair, and creeping to the other side of her uncle, bowed herself, silently and trembling still, upon his breast. "'It's such a loving art, said Mr. Pigotti, smoothing her rich hair with his great, hard hand that it can't abear the sorrer of this. It's natural in young folk, Massa Davy, when they're new to these here trials and timid like my little bird. It's natural. She clung closer to him, but neither lifted up her face, nor spoke a word. It's getting late, my dear, said Mr. Pigotti, and here's Ham come for to take you home. There, go along with t'other loving aunt. What, Emily? Eh, my pretty? The sound of her voice had not reached me, but he bent his head as if he listened to her, and then said, "'Let you stay with your uncle. Why, you don't mean to ask me that. Stay with your uncle, Moppet, when your husband that'll be so soon is here for to take you home. Now a person wouldn't think it, for to see this little thing alongside a rough-weather chap like me,' said Mr. Pigotti, looking around at both of us, with infinite pride. "'But the sea ain't more salt in it than she has fondness in her for her uncle. A foolish little Emily.' "'Emily's in the right in that, Master Davy,' said Ham. "'Look a year. As Emily's wishes of it, and as she's hurried and frightened like, besides, I'll leave her till morning. Let me stay, too.' "'No, no,' said Mr. Pigotti. "'You do and ought a married man like you, or what's as good, to take and hull away a day's work. And you do and ought to watch and work both. That won't do. 
You go home and turn in, and you ain't afeard of Emily not being took good care on, I know. Ham yielded to this persuasion, and took his hat to go. Even when he kissed her, and I never saw him approach her, but I felt that nature had given him the soul of a gentleman. She seemed to cling closer to her uncle, even to the avoidance of her chosen husband. I shut the door after him, that it might cause no disturbance of the quiet that prevailed, and when I turned back, I found Mr. Pagotti still talking to her. "'Now I'm going upstairs to tell your aunt as Master Davies here, and that'll cheer her up a bit,' he said. "'Sit ye down by the fire the while, my dear, and warm those mortal cold hands. Ye don't need to be so fearsome, and take on so much. What, you'll go along with me?' "'Well, come along with me. Come. "'If her uncle was turned out of my house and home, "'and forced to lay down in a dyke, Master Davy,' said Mr. Pigotti, "'with no less pride than before, "'it's my belief she'd go along with him now. "'But there'll be someone else soon. "'Someone else soon, Emily.' "'Afterwards, when I went upstairs, "'as I passed the door of my little chamber, which was dark, "'I had an indistinct impression of her being within it, "'cast down upon the floor.' But whether it was really she, or whether it was a confusion of the shadows in the room, I don't know now. I had leisure to think, before the kitchen fire, of pretty little Emily's dread of death, which added to what Mr. Omar had told me, I took to be the cause of her being so unlike herself, and I had leisure, before Pigotti came down, even to think more leniently of the weakness of it. As I sat, counting the ticking of the clock, and deepening my sense of the solemn hush around me. Pigotti took me in her arms, and blessed and thanked me over and over again for being such a comfort to her. That was what she said, in her distress. She then entreated me to come upstairs, sobbing that Mr. Barkis had always liked me and admired me, that he had often talked of me, before he fell into a stupor, and that she believed, in case of his coming to himself again, he would brighten up at the sight of me if he could brighten up at any earthly thing the probability of his ever doing so appeared to me when i saw him to be very small he was lying with his head and shoulders out of bed in an uncomfortable attitude half resting on the box which had cost him so much pain and trouble i learned that when he was past creeping out of bed to open it and past assuring himself of its safety by means of the divining rod i had seen him use he had required to have it placed on the chair at the bedside, where he had ever since embraced it night and day. His arm lay on it now. Time and the world were slipping from beneath him. But the box was there, and the last words he had uttered were, in an explanatory tone, "'Old clothes!' "'Barkus, my dear,' said Pigotti, almost cheerfully, bending over him while her brother and I stood at the bed's foot. "'Here's my dear boy.' "'My dear boy, Master Davy, who brought us together, Barkis, that you sent messages by, you know. "'Won't you speak to Master Davy?' "'He was as mute and senseless as the box, from which his form derived the only expression it had. "'He's a-going out with the tide,' said Mr. Pigotti to me, behind his hand. "'My eyes were dim, and so were Mr. Pigotti's, but I repeated in a whisper, with the tide. "'Oh, people can't die along the coast,' said Mr. Pigotti. "'Except when the tide's pretty nigh out. "'They can't be born unless it's pretty nigh in. "'Well, not properly born till flood. "'He's going out with the tide. "'It's ebb at half out of three, slack water half an hour. "'If he lives till it turns, he'll hold his own till past the flood "'and go out with the next tide.' "'We remained there, watching him, a long time. "'Hours. "'What mysterious influence my presence had upon him "'in that state of his senses, I shall not pretend to say, but when he at last began to wander feebly, it is certain he was muttering about driving me to school. "'He is coming to himself,' said Pigotti. Mr. Pigotti touched me, and whispered with much awe and reverence, "'They are both a-going out fast.' "'Barkus, my dear,' said Pigotti. "'See me, Barkus,' he cried faintly. "'No better woman anywhere. Look, here's Master Davy.' said Pigotti, for he now opened his eyes. I was on the point of asking him if he knew me, when he tried to stretch out his arms, and said to me, distinctly, 
with a pleasant smile, Bacchus is willing, and, it being low water, he went out with the tide. End of chapter 30、Chapter、Thirty One of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty One A Greater Loss. It was not difficult for me, on Peggotty's solicitation, to resolve to stay where I was. Until after the remains of the poor carrier should have made their last journey to Blunderston. She had long ago bought, out of her own savings, a little piece of ground in our old churchyard near the grave of her sweet girl, as she was called my mother, and there they were to rest. In keeping Peggotty company and doing all I could for her, little enough at the utmost, I was as grateful, I rejoice to think, as even now I could wish myself to have been. But I am afraid I had a supreme satisfaction of a personal and professional nature in taking charge of Mr. Barkis's will and expanding its contents. I may claim the merit of having originated the suggestion that the will should be looked for in the box. After some search, it was found in the box, at the bottom of a horse's nose bag, wherein, besides hay, there was discovered an old gold watch with chain and seals. Which Mr. Barkis had worn on his wedding day, and which had never been seen before or since, a silver tobacco stopper in the form of a leg, an imitation lemon full of minute cups and saucers, which I have some idea Mr. Barkis must have purchased to present to me when I was a child, and afterwards found himself unable to part with, eighty-seven guineas and a half in guineas and half guineas, two hundred and ten pounds in perfectly clean bank notes. Certain receipts for Bank of England stock, an old horseshoe, a bad shilling, a piece of camphor, and an oyster shell. From the circumstance of the latter article having been much polished and displaying prismatic colours on the inside, I conclude that Mr. Barkis had some general ideas about pearls, which never resolved themselves into anything definite. For years and years, Mr. Barkis had carried this box on all his journeys every day, that it might the better escape notice. He had invented a fiction that it belonged to Mr. Blackboy, and was to be left with Barkis till called for. A fable he had elaborately written on the lid, in characters now scarcely legible. He had hoarded all these years, I found, to good purpose. His property and money amounted to nearly three thousand pounds. Of this, he bequeathed the interest of one thousand to Mr. Peggotty for his life. On his decease. The principal to be equally divided between Peggotty, little Emily, and me, or the survivor or survivors of us, share and share alike. All the rest he died possessed of, he bequeathed to Peggotty, whom he left residuary legatee and sole executrix of that his last will and testament. I felt myself quite a proctor when I read this document aloud with all possible ceremony, and set forth its provisions any number of times. To those whom they concerned, I began to think there was more in the Commons than I had supposed. I examined the will with the deepest attention, pronounced it perfectly formal in all respects, made a pencil mark or so in the margin, and thought it rather extraordinary that I knew so much. In this abstruse pursuit, in making an account for Peggotty of all the property into which she had come, in arranging all the affairs in an orderly manner. And in being her referee and adviser on every point, to our joint delight, I passed the week before the funeral. I did not see little Emily in that interval, but they told me she was to be quietly married in a fortnight. I did not attend the funeral in character, if I may venture to say so. I mean, I was not dressed up in a black coat and a streamer to frighten the birds, but I walked over to Blunderston early in the morning, and was in the churchyard when it came. Attended only by Peggotty and her brother. The mad gentleman looked on out of my little window. Mr. Chillip's baby wagged its heavy head and rolled its goggle eyes at the clergyman over its nurse's shoulder. Mr. Omer breathed short in the background. No one else was there, and it was very quiet. 
we walked about the churchyard for an hour after all was over, and pulled some young leaves from the tree above my mother's grave. A dread falls on me here. A cloud is lowering on the distant town towards which I retraced my solitary steps. I fear to approach it. I cannot bear to think of what did come upon that memorable night, of what must come again if I go on. It is no worse, because I write of it, it would be no better if I stopped my most unwilling hand. It is done. Nothing can undo it. Nothing can make it otherwise than as it was. My old nurse was to go to London with me next day on the business of the will. Little Emily was passing that day at Mr. Omer's. We were all to meet in the old boat-house that night. Ham would bring Emily at the usual hour. I would walk back at my leisure. The brother and sister would return as they had come and be expecting us when the day closed in at the far side. I parted from them at the wicket gate, where visionary Strap had rested with Roderick Random's knapsack in the days of yore, and instead of going straight back, walked a little distance on the road to Lurstoft. Then I turned and walked back towards Yarmouth. I stayed to dine at a decent alehouse some mile or two from the ferry I have mentioned before, and thus the day wore away, and it was evening when I reached it. Rain was falling heavily by that time, and it was a wild night, but there was a moon behind the clouds, and it was not dark. I was soon within sight of Mr. Peggotty's house, and of the light within it shining through the window. A little floundering across the sand, which was heavy, brought me to the door, and I went in. It looked very comfortable indeed. Mr. Peggotty had smoked his evening pipe, and there were preparations for some supper by and by. The fire was bright, the ashes were thrown up, the locker was ready for little Emily in her old place. In her old, old place sat Peggotty once more, looking, but for her dress, as if she had never left it. She had fallen back already on the society of the work-box with St. Paul's carved upon the laid, the yard measure in the cottage, and the bit of wax candle. And there they all were, just as if they had never been disturbed. Mrs. Gummidge appeared to be fretting a little in her old corner, and consequently looked quite natural, too. "'You're first of the lot, Master Davy,' said Mr. Peggotty, with a happy face. "'Don't keep in that coat, sir, if it's wet.' "'Thank you, Mr. Peggotty,' said I, giving him my outer coat to hang up. "'It's quite dry.' "'So it is, said Mr. Peggotty, feeding my shoulders. "'As a chip, sit ye down, sir. "'You don't have no use saying welcome to you, "'but you're welcome, kind and hearty.' "'Thank you, Mr. Peggotty, I'm sure of that.' "'Well, Peggotty,' said I, giving her a kiss, "'and how are you, old woman?' "'Ha-ha!' <laughs> laughed Mr. Peggotty, sitting down beside us, "'and rubbing his hands in his sense of relief from recent trouble "'and in the genuine heartiness of his nature. "'There's not a woman in the world, sir, as I tell her, "'that need to feel more easy in her mind than her. "'She done her duty by the departed, and the departed knowed it, "'and the departed done what was right by her, "'as she has done what was right by the departed, "'and, and, and it's all right.' Mrs. Gummidge groaned. "'Cheer up, me pretty mother,' said Mr. Peggotty. But he shook his head aside at us, evidently sensible of the tendency of the late occurrences to recall the memory of the old one. "'Don't be down. Cheer up for your own self only a little bit, and see if a good deal more don't come natural.' "'Not to me, Daniel,' returned Mrs. Gummidge. "'Nothing's natural to me but to be lone and lone.' "'No, no,' said Mr. Peggotty, soothing her sorrows. "'Yes, yes, Daniel,' said Mrs. Gummidge. "'I ain't a person to live with them as has money left. "'Things go too contrary with me. "'I'd better be a riddance.' "'Why, how should I ever spend it without you?' said Mr. Peggotty, with an air of serious remonstrance. "'What are you talking on? "'Don't I want you more now than I ever did?' "'I knowed I was never wanted before,' cried Mrs. Gummidge, with a pitiable whimper, "'and now I'm told so.' "'How could I expect to be wanted being so lone and lorn, and so contrary?' Mr. Peggotty seemed very much shocked at himself for having made a speech capable of this unfeeling construction, but was prevented from replying by Peggotty's pulling his sleeve and shaking her head. After looking at Mrs. Gummidge for some moments, in sore distress of mind, he glanced at the Dutch clock, rose, snuffed the candle, and put it in the window. "'There!' 
said Mr. Peggotty cheerily. "'There we are, Mrs. Gummidge.' Mrs. Gummidge slightly groaned. "'I light it up according to custom. "'You're a wondering what that's for, sir. "'Well, it's for our little Emily. "'You see, the path ain't over light or cheerful out of dark, "'and when I'm here at the hour as she's a coming home, "'I put the light on the window. "'That, you see,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'bending over me with great glee, "'meets two objects. "'She says, there's Emily. "'There's home,' she says. "'And likewise says Emily, "'Me uncle's there. "'For I ain't there. I never have no light showed. "'You're a baby,' said Peggotty, very fond of him for it, if she thought so. "'Well,' returned Mr. Peggotty, standing with his legs pretty wide apart, and rubbing his hands up and down them in his comfortable satisfaction, as he looked alternately at us and at the fire, "'I don't know, but I am. Not, you see, to look at.' "'Not exactly,' observed Peggotty. "'No,' laughed Mr. Peggotty. "'Not to look at, but to, to consider on, you know. "'I don't care, bless you. "'Now, I tell you, when I go a-looking and looking about that "'thear pretty house of our Emily's, I'm—I'm I'm gormed,' "'said Mr. Peggotty with sudden emphasis. "'There, I can't say more. "'If I don't feel as if the littlest things was her, almost. "'I takes em up, and I put em down, "'and I touches of them as delicate as if they were our Emily. "'So tis with her little bonnets and that. "'I couldn't see one of em on rough used a purpose.' "'Not for the old world. "'There's a baby for you in the form of a great sea porcupine,' "'said Mr. Peggotty, relieving his earnestness with a roar of laughter. "'Peggotty and I both laughed, but not so loud. "'It's my opinion, you see,' said Mr. Peggotty, with a delighted face, "'after some further rubbing of his legs, "'as this is along of my having played with her so much, and may believe as he we was Turks and French and sharks and every variety of foreigners, bless you, yes, and lands and whales and I don't know what all, when she weren't no eye of the mind knee. I've got into the way of it, you know. Why, this here candle now, said Mr. Peggotty, gleefully holding out his hand towards it. I know very well that after she's married and gone, I shall put that candle there just the same as now. I know very well that when I'm here o' nights, where else should I live, bless your hearts, where I have a fortune I come into? And she ain't here, or I ain't there. I shall put the candle in the window, and sit afore the fire, pretending I'm expecting of her like I'm a-doing now. There's a baby for you, said Mr. Peggotty with another roar, in the form of a sea porcupine. Why, at the present minute, when I see the candle sparkle up, I says to myself, she's a-looking at it. Emily's a-coming. There's a baby for you in the form of a sea porcupine. Right for all that— said Mr. Peggotty, stopping in his roar, and smiting his hands together. "'For here she is!' It was only Ham. The night should have turned more wet since I came in, for he had a large sou'wester hat on, slouched over his face. "'Where's Emily?' said Mr. Peggotty. Ham made a motion with his head, as if she were outside. Mr. Peggotty took the light from the window, trimmed it, put it on the table, and was busily stirring the fire, when Ham, who had not moved, said, "'Er, Master Davy, uh, will you come out a minute and see what Emily and me has got to show you?' We went out. As I passed him at the door, I saw to my astonishment and fright that he was deadly pale. He pushed me hastily into the open air and closed the door upon us, only upon us too. "'Ham, what's the matter?' "'Master Davy!' Over his broken heart how dreadfully he wept!' I was paralysed by the sight of such grief. I don't know what I thought or, or what I dreaded. I could only look at him. Ham! Poor good fellow, for heaven's sake, tell me what's the matter. My love, Master Davy, the bright and open my heart, her that I never died for and would die for now, she's gone. Gone? Emily's run away. Oh, Master Davy, think how she's run away when I pray my good and gracious God to kill her. Oh, that is so dear above all things, sooner than let her come to ruin and disgrace. The face he turned up to the, to the troubled sky, the quivering of his clasped hands, the agony of his figure, remain associated with the lonely waste in my remembrance to this hour. It is always night there, and he is the only object in the scene. Y you're a scholar? he said hurriedly, and know what's right and best. What, what, what am I to say indoors? How am I ever to break it to him, Master Davy? 
I saw the door move, and instinctively tried to hold the latch on the outside, to gain a moment's time. It was too late. Mr. Peggotty thrust forth his faith, and never could I forget the change that came upon it when he saw us, if I were to live five hundred years. I remember a great wail and cry, and the women hanging about him, and we all standing in the room, I with a paper in my hand which Ham had given me, Mr. Peggotty with his vest torn open, his hair wild, his face and lips quite white, and blood trickling down his bosom, it had sprung from his mouth, I think, looking fixedly at me. R "'Read it, sir,' he said, in a low, shivering voice. S -s "'Slow, please. I, I don't know as I can understand.' In the midst of the silence of death, I read thus from a blotted letter. When you, who loved me so much better than I ever have deserved, even when my mind was innocent, see this, I shall be far away. I shall be far away, he repeated slowly. Stop! Emily, far away! Well! When I leave my dear home, my dear home, oh, my dear home, in the morning, the letter bore date of the previous night, it will be never to come back unless he brings me back a lady. This will be found at night, many hours after, instead of me. Oh, if you knew how my heart is torn, if even you, that I have wronged so much, that never can forgive me, could only know what I suffer. I am too wicked to write about myself. Oh, take comfort in thinking that I am so bad. Oh, for mercy's sake, tell Uncle that I never left loved him half so dear as now. Oh, don't remember how affectionate and kind you've all been to me. Don't remember we were ever to be married. But try to think as if I died when I was little and was buried somewhere. Pray heaven that I may going away from have compassion on my uncle. Tell him that I never loved him half so dear. Be his comfort. Love some good girl that will be what I was once to uncle, and be true to you and worthy of you and know no shame but me. God bless all. I'll pray for all, often on my knees. If you don't bring me back a lady, and I don't pray for my own self, I'll pray for all. My parting love to Uncle, my last tears and my last thanks for Uncle. That was all. He stood, long after I had ceased to read, still looking at me. At length I ventured to take his hand, and to entreat him as well as I could to endeavour to get some command of himself. He replied, I thank ye, sir, I thank ye, without moving. Ham spoke to him. Mr. Peggotty was so far sensible of his affliction that he wrung his hand, but otherwise he remained in the same state, and no one dared to disturb him. Slowly at last he moved his eyes from my face, as if he were walking from a vision, and cast them round the room. Then he said in a low voice, "'Who's the man?' I want to know his name. Ham glanced at me, and suddenly I felt a shock that struck me back. There's a man suspected, said Mr. Peggotty. Who is it? Master Davy, implored Ham. Go on a bit, and tell him, tell me what I must. You don't ought to hear it, sir. I felt the shock again. I sank down in a chair and tried to utter some reply, but my tongue was fettered and my sight was weak. I want to know his name, I heard said once more. For some time past, Ham faltered, there's been a servant about here at odd times, there's been a gentleman too. Both of them belong to one another. Mr. Peggotty too fixed as before, but now looking at him. The servant, pursued Ham, was seen along with our poor girl last night. He's been in hiding about here this week or over. He's thought to have gone, but he was hiding. Don't stay, Master Davy, don't! I felt Peggotty's arm round my neck, but I could not have moved if the house had been about to fall upon me. A strange chay and osses was outside town this morning on the Norwich Road almost before the day broke, Ham went on. The servant went to it, and come from it, and went to it again. When he went to it again, Emily was nigh him. T'other was inside. He's the man. For the Lord's love, 
said Mr. Peggotty, falling back and putting out his hand, as if to keep off what he dreaded. "'Don't tell me his name, Steerforth!' "'Master Davy,' exclaimed Ham in a broken voice, "'it ain't no fault of yourn, and I'm far from laying it on to you, but his name is Steerforth, and he's a damned villain!' Mr. Peggotty uttered no cry, and shed no tear, and moved no more, until he seemed to wake again all at once, and pulled down his rough coat from its peg in a corner. "'Bear I am with this. I'm struck up a heap, and can't do it,' he said impatiently. "'Bear hand and help me.' "'Well,' when somebody had done so, "'now give me that there at. Ham asked him whether he was going. "'I'm a-going to seek my niece. "'I'm a-going to seek my Emily. "'I'm a-going first to stave in that there boat "'and sink it where I should have drowned him, "'and I'm a living soul if I had one thought of what was in him. "'Has he set afore me?' he said wildly, "'holding out his clenched right hand. "'Has he set afore me face to face, strike me down dead? "'But I'd have drowned him and thought it right.' "'I'm a-going to seek my niece.' "'Where?' cried Ham, interposing himself before the door. "'Anywhere. I'm a-going to seek my niece through the world. I'm a-going to find my poor niece in her shame and bring her back. No one stop me. I tell you, I'm a-going to seek my niece.' "'No, no!' cried Mrs. Gummidge, coming between them in a fit of crying. "'No, no, Daniel, not as you are now. Seek her in a little while, my lone lorn Daniel, and that'll be all right, but not as you are now.' "'Sit ye down and give me forgiveness for having ever been a worry to you, Daniel. "'What have my contraries ever been to this? "'And let us speak a word about them times when we was first an orphan, "'and when Anne was too, and when I was a poor widow woman, and you took me in. "'It'll soften your poor heart, Daniel,' laying her head upon his shoulder, "'and you'll bear your sorrow better, for you know the promise, Daniel. "'As you've done it unto one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. "'And that can never fail under this roof.' "'that's been our shelter for so many, many years.' "'He was quite passive now, "'and when I heard him crying, "'the impulse that had been upon me to go down upon my knees "'and ask their pardon for the desolation I had caused "'and curse Steerforth, "'yielded to a better feeling. "'My overcharged heart found the same relief, "'and I cried too. "'End of chapter 31 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 32 of David Copperfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Simon Evers David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 32 The Beginning of a Long Journey what is natural in me is natural in many other men, I infer, and so I am not afraid to write that I never had loved Steerforth better than when the ties that bound me to him were broken. In the keen distress of the discovery of his unworthiness, I thought more of all that was brilliant in him, I softened more towards all that was good in him, I did more justice to the qualities that might have made him a man of a noble nature and a great name than ever I had done in the height of my devotion to him. Deeply as I felt my own unconscious part in his pollution of an honest home, I believed that if I had been brought face to face with him, I could not have uttered one reproach. I should have loved him so well still, though he fascinated me no longer, I should have held in so much tenderness the memory of my affection for him, that I think I should have been as weak as a spirit-wounded child, in all but the entertainment of a thought that we could ever be reunited. That thought I never had. I felt, as he had felt, that all was at an end between us. What his remembrances of me were, I have never known. They were light enough, perhaps, and easily dismissed. But mine of him were as the remembrances of a cherished friend who was dead. Yes, Steerforth, long removed from the scenes of this poor history. My sorrow may bear involuntary witness against you at the judgment throne, but my angry thoughts of my reproaches never will, I know. The news of what had happened soon spread through the town, insomuch that as I passed along the streets next morning I overheard the people speaking of it at their doors. 
Many were hard upon her. Some few were hard upon him. But towards her second father and her lover there was but one sentiment. Among all kinds of people a respect for them in their distress prevailed, which was full of gentleness and delicacy. The seafaring men kept apart when those two were seen early, walking with slow steps on the beach, and stood in knots, talking compassionately among themselves. It was on the beach, close down by the sea, that I found them. It would have been easy to perceive that they had not slept at all last night, even if Peggotty had failed to tell me of their still sitting just as I had left them when it was broad day. They looked worn, and I thought Mr. Peggotty's head was bowed in one night more than in all the years I had known him. But they were both as grave and steady as the sea itself, then lying beneath a deep dark sky, waveless, yet with a heavy roll upon it, as if it breathed in its rest, and touched, on the horizon, with a strip of silvery light from the unseen sun. "'We've had a mortal of talk, sir,' said Mr. Peggotty to me, when we had all three walked a little while in silence, of what we ought and don't ought to do. But we see our course now. I happened to glance at Ham, then looking out to sea upon the distant light, and a frightful thought came to my mind, not that his face was angry, for it was not. I recall nothing but an expression of turned stern determination upon it, that if ever he encountered Steerforth, he would kill him. "'My duty here, sir,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'is done. "'Am I going to see my—' "'He stopped, and went on in a firmer voice. "'I'm a-going to seek her. "'That's my duty evermore.' "'He shook his head when I asked him where he would seek her, "'and inquired if I were going to London to-morrow. "'I told him I had not gone to-day, "'fearing to lose the chance of being of any service to him, "'but that I was ready to go when he would.' "'I'll go along with you, sir,' he rejoined, "'if you're agreeable, to-morrow.' We walked again for a while in silence. "'Ham,' he presently resumed, "'he'll hold to his present work and go and live along with my sister. "'The old boat yonder—' "'Will you desert the old boat, Mr. Peggotty?' I gently interposed. "'My station-master, Davy,' he returned, "'ain't here no longer.' Never a boat founded since there was darkness on the face of the deep. That one's gone down. But no, sir, no. I don't mean as it should be deserted. Far from that. We walked again for a while as before, until he explained, My wishes is, sir, as it shall look day and night, winter and summer, as it has always looked, since she first knowed it. If ever she should come wandering back, I wouldn't have the old place seem to cast her off, you understand, but seemed to tempt her to draw nigh to it, and to peep in, maybe, like a ghost, out of the wind and rain, through the old window, at the old seat by the fire. Then, maybe, Marsa Davy, seeing none but Mrs. Gummidge there, she might take heart to creep in, trembling, and might come to be laid down in her old bed, and rest her weary head where it was once so gay. I could not speak to him in reply, though I tried. Every night, said Mr. Peggotty. As regular as the night comes, the candle must be stood in its old pane of glass, that if ever she should see it, it may seem to say, Come back, my child, come back. If ever there's a knock on, particular soft knock, after dark, at your aunt's door, don't you go near nigh it. Let it be her, not you, that sees my fallen child. He walked a little in front of us, and kept before us for some minutes. During this interval I glanced at Ham again, and observing the same expression on his face, and his eyes still directed to the distant light, I touched his arm. Twice I called him by his name, in the tone in which I might have tried to rouse a sleeper, before he heeded me. When I at last inquired on what his thoughts were so bent, he replied, "'I must have for me, Master Davy. I know where you're on.' "'On the life before you, do you mean?' He pointed confusedly out to sea. "'Aye, Master Davy. I don't rightly know how it is, but from over yon there seems to me to become the end of it like.' Looking at me as though he were waking, but with the same determined face. "'What? 
end? I asked, possessed by my former fear. I don't know, he said thoughtfully. I was calling to mind that the beginning of it all did take place here, and then the end come. But it's gone. Master Davy, he added, answering as I think my look, you ain't no call to be afeard of me, but I'm kind of muddled. I don't fan to feel no matters. Which was as much as to say that he was not himself, and quite confounded. Mr. Peggotty stopping for us to join him, we did so, and said no more. The remembrance of this, in connection with my former thought, however, haunted me at intervals, even until the inexorable end came as its appointed time. We insensibly approached the old boat, and entered. Mrs. Gummidge, no longer moping in her especial corner, was busy preparing breakfast. She took Mr. Peggotty's hat, and placed his seat for him, and spoke so comfortably and softly that I hardly knew her. "'Daniel, my good man,' said he, "'you must eat and drink, and keep up your strength, for without it you'll do nought. Try, that's a dear soul. And if I disturb you with my clickertin' she meant her chattering, "'tell me so, Daniel, and I won't.' When she had served us all, she withdrew to the window, where she sedulously employed herself in repairing some shirts and other clothes belonging to Mr. Peggotty, and neatly folding and packing them in an old oilskin bag such as sailors carry. Meanwhile, she continued talking in the same quiet manner. "'All times and seasons, you know, Daniel,' said Mrs. Gummidge. "'I shall be all as here, and everything will look according to your wishes. I'm a poor scholar, but I shall write to you odd times when you're away, and send my letters to Master Davy. Maybe you'll write to me too, Daniel, odd times, and tell me how you fare to feel upon your lone, lone journeys. You'll be a solitary woman here, I'm afeard, said Mr. Peggotty. No, no, Daniel, she returned. I shan't be that. Don't you mind me. I shall have enough to do to keep a being for you. Mrs. Gummidge meant a home. Again you come back to keep a being here for any that might have to come back, Daniel. In the fine time I shall set outside the door as I used to do. If any should come nigh, they shall see the old widow woman true to em a long way off. What a change in Mrs. Gummidge in a little time! She was another woman. She was so devoted, she had such a quick perception of what it would be well to say, and what it would be well to leave unsaid. She was so forgetful of herself, and so regardful of the sorrower about her, that I held her in a sort of veneration. The work she did that day. There were many things to be brought up from the beach and stored in the outhouse, as oars, nets, sails, cordage, spars, lobster pots, bags of ballast, and the like. And though there was abundance of assistance rendered, there being not a pair of working hands on all that shore but would have laboured hard for Mr. Peggotty, and been well paid in being asked to do it, yet she persisted all day long, in toiling under weights that she was quite unequal to, and fagging to and fro on all sorts of unnecessary errands. As to deploring her misfortunes, she appeared to have entirely lost the recollection of ever having had any. She preserved an equable cheerfulness in the midst of her sympathy, which was not the least astonishing part of the change that had come over her. Querulousness was out of the question. I did not even observe her voice to falter, or a tear to escape from her eyes the whole day through, until twilight, when she and I and Mr. Peggotty being alone together, and he having fallen asleep in perfect exhaustion, she broke into a half-suppressed fit of sobbing and crying, and taking me to the door said, "'Ever bless you, Marcia Davy, be a friend to him, poor dear!' Then she immediately ran out of the house to wash her face, in order that she might sit quietly beside him, and be found at work there when he should awake. In short, I left her, when I went away at night, the prop and staff of Mr. Peggotty's affliction, and I could not meditate enough upon the lesson that I had read in Mrs. Gummidge, and the new experience she unfolded to me. It was between nine and ten o'clock when, strolling in a melancholy manner through the town, I stopped at Mr. Omer's door. Mr. Omer had taken it so much to heart, his daughter told me, that he had been very low and poorly all day, and had gone to bed without his pipe. 
"'A deceitful, bad-hearted girl,' said Mrs. Joram. "'There was no good in her ever.' "'Don't say so,' I returned. You, "'You don't think so?' "'Yes, I do,' cried Mrs. Joram angrily. "'No, no,' said I. Mrs. Joram tossed her head, endeavouring to be very stern and cross, but she could not command her softer self, and began to cry. I was young, to be sure, but I thought much the better of her for this sympathy, and fancied it became her, as a virtuous wife and mother, very well indeed. "'What will she ever do?' sobbed Minnie. "'Where will she go? What will become of her? Oh, how could she be so cruel to herself and to him?' I remember the time when Minnie was a young and pretty girl, and I was glad she remembered it too so feelingly. "'My little Minnie,' said Mrs. Joram, "'has only just now been got to sleep. Even in her sleep she's sobbing for Emily. All day long little Minnie has cried for her and asked me over and over again whether Emily was wicked. What can I say to her, when Emily tied a ribbon off her own neck round little Minnie's the last night she was here, and laid her head down on the pillow beside her till she was fast asleep?' The ribbons round my little Minnie's neck now. It ought not to be, perhaps, but, but what can I do? Emily's is so very bad, but they were fond of one another, and the child knows nothing. Mrs. Joram was so unhappy that her husband came out to take care of her. Leaving them together, I went home to Peggotty's, more melancholy myself, if possible, than I had been yet. That good creature, I mean Peggotty, all untarred by her late anxieties and sleepless nights, was at her brother's, where she meant to stay till morning. An old woman, who had been employed about the house for some weeks past, while Peggotty had been unable to attend to it, was the house's only other occupant besides myself. As I had no occasion for her services, I sent her to bed, by no means against her will, and sat down before the kitchen fire a little while, to think about all this. I was blending it with the deathbed of the late Mr. Barkis, and was driving out with the tide towards the distance at which Ham had looked so singularly in the morning, when I was recalled from my wanderings by a knock at the door. There was a knocker upon the door, but it was not that which made the sound. The tap was from a hand, and low down upon the door, as if it were given by a child. It made me start as much as if it had been the knock of a footman to a person of distinction. I opened the door, and at first looked down, to my amazement, on nothing but a great umbrella that appeared to be walking about of itself. But presently I discovered underneath it Miss Moucher. I might not have been prepared to give the little creature a very kind reception if, on her removing the umbrella, which her utmost efforts were unable to shut up, she had shown me the volatile expression of face which had made so great an impression on me at our first and last meeting. But her face, as she turned it up to mine, was so earnest, and when I relieved her of the umbrella, which would have been as an inconvenient one for the Irish giant, she wrung her little hands in such an afflicted manner that I rather inclined towards her. "'Miss Moucher," said I, after glancing up and down the empty street, without distinctly knowing what I expected to see besides. Uh, "'How do you come here? What is the matter?' She motioned to me with her short right arm to shut the umbrella for her, and, passing me hurriedly, went into the kitchen. When I had closed the door, and followed with the umbrella in my hand, I found her sitting on the corner of the fender. It was a low iron one, with two flat bars at top to stand plates upon in the shadow of the boiler, swaying herself backwards and forwards, and chafing her hands upon her knees, like a person in pain. Quite alarmed at being the only recipient of this untimely visit, and the only spectator of this portentous behaviour, I exclaimed again, "'Pray tell me, Miss Moucher, what is the matter? Are you ill?' "'My dear young soul,' replied Miss Moucher, squeezing her hands upon her heart one over the other, I am ill here, I am very ill, to think that you should come to this, when I might have known it, and perhaps prevented it, if I hadn't been a thoughtless fool. Again her large bonnet, 
very disproportionate to the figure, went backwards and forwards in her swaying of her little body to and fro, while a most gigantic bonnet rocked in unison with it upon the wall. "'I am surprised I began to, to see you so distressed and, and serious,' when she interrupted me. "'Yes, it's always so,' she said. "'They are all surprised, these inconsiderate young people, fairly and full-grown, to see any natural feeling in a little thing like me. They make a plaything of me, use me for their amusement, throw me away when they are tired, and wonder that I feel more than a toy horse or a wooden soldier. Yes, yes, that's the way, the old way.' "'It may be with others,' I returned, "'but I do assure you it is not with me. "'Perhaps I ought not to be at all surprised to see you as you are now. "'I know so little of you. "'I said without consideration what I thought.' "'What can I do?' returned the little woman, "'standing up and holding out her arms to show herself. "'See, what I am, my father was, "'and my sister is, and my brother is. "'I have worked for sister and brother these many years.' hard, Mr. Copperfield, all day. I must live. I do no harm. If there are people so unreflecting or so cruel as to make a jest of me, what is left for me to do but to make a jest of myself, them, and everything? If I do so for the time, whose fault is that? Mine? No, not Miss Matcher's, I perceived. If I had shown myself a sensitive dwarf to your false friend, pursued the little woman, shaking her head at me with respro reproachful earnestness, how much of his help or good will do you think I should ever have had? If little Moucher, who had no hand, young gentleman, in the making of herself, addressed herself to him or the like of him because of her misfortunes, when do you suppose her small voice would have been heard? Little Moucher would have as much need to live if she was the bitterest and dullest of pygmies. But she couldn't do it. No, she might whistle for her bed and butter till she died of air. Miss Moucher sat down on the fender again, and took out her handkerchief, and wiped her eyes. "'Be thankful for me, if you have a kind heart, as I think you have,' she said, "'that while I know well what I am, I can be cheerful and endure it all. I am thankful for myself, at any rate, that I can find my tiny way through the world without being beholden to any one, and that in return for all that is thrown of me, in folly or vanity as I go along, I can throw bubbles back.' If I don't brood over all what I want, it is the better for me, and not the worse for any one. If I am a plaything for you, Jantz, be gentle with me." Miss Moucher replaced her handkerchief in her pocket, looking at me with very intent expression all the while, and pursued, "'I saw you in the street just now. You may suppose I am not able to walk as fast as you with my short legs and short breath, and I couldn't overtake you. But I guessed where you came, and came after you. I have been here before, to-day, but the good woman wasn't at home. "'Do you know her?' I demanded. "'I know of her and about her,' she replied, from Omer and Joram. I was there at seven o'clock this morning. Do you remember what Steerforth said to me about this unfortunate girl, that time when I saw you both at the inn?' The great bonnet on Miss Moucher's head and the greater bonnet on the wall began to go backwards and forwards again when she asked this question. I remembered very well what she referred to, having had it in my thoughts many times that day. I told her so. "'May the father of all evil confound him!' said the little woman, holding up her forefinger between me and her sparkling eyes. "'And ten times more confound that wicked servant! But I believed it was you who had a boyish passion for her.' "'I?' I repeated. "'Child, child, in the name of blind ill-fortune!' cried Miss Moucher, wringing her hands impatiently she went to and fro again upon the fender. Why did you praise her so, and blush, and look disturbed? I could not conceal from myself that I had done this, though a reason for a reason very different from her supposition. "'What did I know?' said Miss Moucher, taking out her handkerchief again, and giving one little stamp on the ground, whenever at short intervals she applied it to her eyes with both hands at once. He was crossing you and wheedling you, I saw. You were soft wax in his hands, I saw. Had I left the room a minute when his man told me that young innocence, so he called you, and you may call him old guilt all the days of your life, had set his heart upon her, and she was giddy and liked him. 
but his master was resolved that no harm should come of it, more for your sake than for hers, and that that was their business here. How could I but believe him? I saw Steerforth soothe and please you by his praise of her. You were the first to mention her name. You owed to an old aberration of her. You were hot and cold and red and white all at once when I spoke to you of her. What could I think, what did I think, but that you were a young libertine in everything but experience, and had fallen into hands that had experience enough and could manage you, having the fancy, for your own good? Oh, oh, oh! They were afraid of my finding out the truth, exclaimed Miss Moucher, getting off the fender and trotting up and down the kitchen with her two short arms distressfully lifted up. "'because I am a sharp little thing. I need to be to get through the world at all. "'And they deceived me altogether, and I gave the poor unfortunate girl a letter, "'which I fully believe is with the beginning of her ever speaking to Littimer, "'who was left behind on purpose.' "'I stood amazed at the revelation of all this perfidy, "'looking at Miss Moucher as she walked up and down the kitchen "'until she was out of breath, "'when she sat upon the fender again, and— drying her face with a handkerchief, shook her head for a long time, without otherwise moving, and without otherwise breaking silence. "'My country rounds,' she added at length, "'brought me to Norwich, Mr. Copperfield, the night before last. What I happened to find there, about their secret way of coming and going without you, which was strange, led to my suspecting something wrong.' I got into the coach from London last night, as it came through Norwich, and was here this morning. Oh, oh, too late! Poor little Moucher turned so chilly after all her crying and fretting, that she turned round on the fender, putting her poor little wet feet in among the ashes to warm them, and sat looking at the fire like a large doll. I sat in a chair on the other side of the hearth, lost in unhappy reflections, and looking at the fire too, and sometimes at her. "'I must go,' she said at last, rising as she spoke. "'It's late. You don't mistrust me?' Meeting her sharp glance, which was as sharp as ever when she asked me, I could not on that short challenge answer no, quite frankly. "'Come,' said she, accepting the offer of my hand to help her over the fender, and looking wistfully up into my face. "'You know you wouldn't mistrust me if I was a fool-sized woman.' I felt that there was much truth in this, and I felt rather ashamed of myself. "'You are a young man,' she said, nodding. "'Take a word of advice, even from three foot nothing. Try not to associate bodily defects with mental, my good friend, except for a solid reason.' She had got over the fender now, and I had got over my suspicion. I told her that I believed she had given me a faithful account of herself, and that we had both been hapless instruments in designing hands. She thanked me, and said I was a good fellow. "'Now mind,' she exclaimed, turning back on her way to the door, and looking shrewdly at me, with her forefinger up again, "'I have some reason to suspect, from what I have heard, my ears are always open, I can't afford to spare what powers I have, that they are gone abroad. But if ever they return, if ever any one of them returns, while I am alive, I am, more likely than another, going about as I do, to find it out soon.' "'Whatever I know, you shall know. "'If ever I can do anything to serve the poor betrayed girl, "'I will do it faithfully, please heaven. "'And Littimer had better have a bloodhound at his back than little Moucher.' "'I placed implicit faith in this last statement "'when I marked the look with which it was accompanied. "'Trust me no more, but trust me no less than you would trust a full-sized woman,' "'said the little creature, touching me appealingly on the wrist.' If ever you see me again, unlike what I am now, and like what I was when you first saw me, observe what company I am in. Call to mind that I am a very helpless and defenceless little thing. Think of me at home with my brother like myself and my sister like myself, when my day's work is done. Perhaps you won't then be very hard upon me, or surprised, if I can be distressed and serious. Good night. I gave Miss Moucher my hand with a very different opinion of her from that which I had hitherto entertained, and opened the door to let her out. It was not a trifling business to get the great umbrella up and properly balanced in her grasp, but at last I successfully accomplished this, 
and saw it go bobbing down the street through the rain, without the least appearance of having anybody underneath it, except when a heavier fall than usual from some overcharged water-spout sent it toppling over on one side, and discovered Miss Moucher struggling violently to get it right. After making one or two sallies to her relief, which were rendered futile by the umbrellas hopping on again like an immense bird before I could reach it, I came in, went to bed, and slept till morning. In the morning I was joined by Mr. Peggotty and by my old nurse, and we went at an early hour to the coach office, where Mrs. Gummidge and Ham were waiting to take leave of us. "'Master Davy,' Ham whispered, drawing me aside, while Mr. Peggotty was stowing his bag among the luggage, "'his life is quite broke up. He don't know where he's going. He don't know what's afore him. He's bound upon a voyage that'll last on and off all the rest of his days, take my word for it, until he finds what he's a-seeking of. I'm sure you'll be a friend to him, Master Davy.' "'Trust me, I will indeed,' said I, shaking hands with Ham earnestly. "'Thank ye. Thank ye very kind, sir. Uh, one thing further. I'm in good employ, you know, Mr. Davy, and I ain't no way now of spending what I gets. Money's of no use to me no more except to live. If you can lay it out for him, I should do my work with a better art. Though as to that, sir,' and he spoke very steadily and mildly, you're not to think but I shall work at all times like a man, and at the best that lays in my power. I told him I was well convinced of it, and I hinted that I hoped the time might even come when he would cease to lead the lonely life he naturally contemplated now. No, sir, he said, shaking his head. All that's past and over with me, sir. No one can ever fill the place that's empty. But you'll bear in mind about the money, as there's at all times some laying by for him. Reminding him of the fact that Mr. Peggotty had arrived a steady, though certainly a very moderate, income from the bequest of his late brother-in-law, I promised to do so. We then took leave of each other. I cannot leave him even now without remembering with a pang at once his modest fortitude and his great sorrow. As to Mrs. Gummidge, if I were to endeavour to describe how she ran down the street by the side of the coach, seeing nothing but Mr. Peggotty on the roof through the tears she tried to repress, and dashing herself against the people who were coming in the opposite direction, I should enter on a task of some difficulty. Therefore I had better leave her sitting on a baker's doorstep out of breath, with no shape at all remaining in her bonnet, and one of her shoes off, lying on the pavement at a considerable distance. When we got to our journey's end, our first pursuit was to look about for a little lodging for Peggotty, where her brother could have a bed. We were so fortunate as to find one, of a very clean and cheap description, over a chandler's shop, only two streets removed from me. When we had engaged this domicile, I bought some cold meat at an eating-house, and took my fellow-travellers home to tea, a proceeding, I regret to state, which did not meet with Mrs. Crupp's approval, but quite the contrary. I ought to observe, however, in explanation of that lady's state of mind, that she was much offended by Peggotty's tucking up her widow's gown before she had been ten minutes in the place, and setting to work to dust my bedroom. This Mrs. Crupp regarded in the light of a liberty, and a liberty, she said, was a thing she never allowed. Mr. Peggotty had made a communication to me on the way to London for which I was not unprepared. It was that he purposed first seeing Mrs. Steerforth. As I felt bound to assist him in this, and also to mediate between them, with a view of sparing the mother's feelings as much as possible, I wrote to her that night. I told her, as mildly as I could, what his wrong was, and what my own share in his injury. I said, he was a man in very common life, but of a most gentle and upright character, and that I ventured to express a hope that she would not refuse to see him in his heavy trouble. I mentioned two o'clock in the afternoon as the hour of our coming, and I sent the letter myself by the first coach in the morning. At the appointed time we stood at the door, the door of that house where I had been a few days since so happy, where my youthful confidence and warmth of heart had been yielded up so freely, which was closed against me henceforth, which was now a waste, a ruin. No Littimer appeared. 
The pleasanter face which had replaced his on the occasion of my last visit answered to our summons, and went before us to the drawing-room. Mrs. Steerforth was sitting there. Rosa Dartle glided, as we went in, from another part of the room, and stood behind her chair. I saw, directly, in his mother's face, that she knew from himself what he had done. It was very pale, and bore the traces of deeper emotion than my letter alone, weakened by the doubts her fondness would have raised upon it, would have been likely to create. I thought her more like him than ever I had thought her, and I felt rather than saw, that the resemblance was not lost on my companion. She sat upright in her armchair with a stately, immovable, passionless air that it seemed as if nothing could disturb. She looked very steadfastly at Mr. Peggotty when he stood before her, and he looked quite as steadfastly at her. Rosa Dartle's keen glance comprehended all of us. For some moments not a word was spoken. She motioned to Mr. Peggotty to be seated. He said, in a low voice, "'I shouldn't feel it natural, ma'am, to sit down in this house. I'd sooner stand.' And this was succeeded by another silence, which she broke thus. "'I know, with deep regret, what has brought you here. What do you want of me? What do you ask me to do?' He put his hat under his arm, and, feeling in his breast for Emmy's letter, took it out, unfolded it, and gave it to her. "'Please to read that, ma'am. That's my niece's hand.' She read it, in the same stately and impassive way, untouched by its contents, as far as I could see, and returned it to him. "'Unless he brings me back a lady,' said Mr. Peggotty, tracing out that part with his finger. "'I come to know, ma'am, whether he will keep his word.' "'No,' she returned. "'Why not?' said Mr. Peggotty. "'It is impossible. He would disgrace himself. You cannot fail to know that she is far below him.' "'Raise her up,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'She is uneducated and ignorant.' "'Maybe she's not. Maybe she is,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'I think not, ma'am.' but I'm no judge of them things. Teach her better. Since you oblige me to speak more plainly, which I am very unwilling to do, her humble connections would render such a thing impossible, if nothing else did. Hark to this, ma'am, he returned, slowly and quietly. You know what it is to love your child. So do I. If she was a hundred times my child, I couldn't love her more. You don't know what it is to lose your child. I do. All the heaps of riches in the world would be naught to me, if there was mine, to buy her back. But save her from this disgrace, and she shall never be disgraced by us. Not one of us that she's growed up among, not one of us that's lived along with her, and had her for there all in all, these many year, will ever look upon her pretty face again. We'll be content to let her be. We'll be content to think of her far off, as if she was underneath another sun and sky, will be content to trust her to her husband, to her little children, perhaps, and by the time when all of us shall be alike in equality afore our God. The rugged eloquence with which he spoke was not devoid of all effect. She still preserved her proud manner, but there was a touch of softness in her voice as she answered, I justify nothing, I make no counter accusations. But I am sorry to repeat, it is impossible. Such a marriage would irretrievably blight my son's career and ruin his prospects. Nothing is more certain than it never can take place and never will. If there is any other compensation— I am looking at the likeness of the face, interrupted Mr. Peggotty, with a steady but a kindling eye, that has looked at me in my home at my far side, in me boat, where not, smiling and friendly when it was so treacherous that I go half wild when I think of it. If the likeness of that face don't turn to burning fire at the thought of offering money to him if my child's blight and ruin, it's as bad. I don't know, being a lady's, but what it's worse. She changed now in a moment. An angry flush overspread her features, and she said, 
in an intolerant manner, grasping the armed chair tightly with her hands. "'What compensation can you make to me for opening such a pit between me and my son? What is your love to mine? What is your separation to ours?' Miss Dartle softly touched her, and bent down her head to whisper, but she would not hear a word. "'No, Rosa, not a word. Let the man listen to what I say. My son, who has been the object of my life, to whom its every thought has been devoted, whom I have gratified from a child in every wish, from whom I have had no separate existence since his birth, to take up in a moment with a miserable girl and avoid me, to repay my confidence with systematic deception for her sake and quit me for her, to set this wretched fancy against his mother's claims upon his duty, love, respect, gratitude, claims that every day and hour of his life should have strengthened into ties that nothing could be proof against. Is this no injury?" Again Rosa Dartle tried to soothe her, again ineffectually. "'I say, Rosa, not a word. If he can stake his all upon the lightest object, I can stake my all upon a greater purpose. Let him go where he will with the means that my love has secured to him. Does he think to reduce me by long absence? He knows his mother very little if he does. Let him put away his whim now, and he is welcome back. Let him not put her away now, and he never shall come near me, living or dying, while I can raise my hand to make a sign against it, unless, being rid of her for ever, he comes humbly to me and begs for my forgiveness. This is my right. This is the acknowledgment I will have, and this is the separation that there is between us. And is this she added, looking at her visitor with the proud, intolerant air with which she had begun. No injury? While I heard and saw the mother as she said these words, I seemed to hear and see the son defying them. All that I had ever seen in him of an unyielding, willful spirit I saw in her. All the understanding that I had now of his misdirected energy became an understanding of her character too and a perception that it was, in its strongest springs, the same. She now observed to me aloud, resuming her former restraint, that it was useless to hear more or to say more, and that she begged to put an end to the interview. She rose with an air of dignity to leave the room, when Mr. Peggotty signified that it was needless. "'Don't fear me being any hindrance to you. I have no more to say, ma'am.' he remarked, as he moved towards the door. "'I come here with no hope, and I take away no hope. I have done what I thought should be done, but I never look for any good to come of my standing where I do. This has been too evil hours for me and mine, for me to be my right senses and expect it.' With this we departed, leaving her standing by her elbow-chair, a picture of a noble presence and a handsome face. We had on our way out to cross a paved hall, with glass sides and roof, over which a vine was trained. Its leaves and shoots were green then, and the day being sunny, a pair of glass doors leading to the garden were thrown open. Rosa Dartle, entering this way with a noiseless step when we were close to them, addressed herself to me. "'You do well,' she said, "'indeed, to bring this fellow here.' Such a concentration of rage and scorn as darkened her face and flashed in her jet-black eyes, I could not have thought compressible even into that face. The scar made by the hammer was, as usual in this excited state of her features, strongly marked. When the throbbing I had seen before came into it as I looked at her, she absolutely lifted up her hand and struck it. "'This is a fellow,' she said, "'to champion and bring here, is he not?' You are a true man. Miss Dartle, I returned, you are surely not so unjust as to condemn me. Why do you bring division upon these two mad creatures? she returned. Don't you know that they are both mad with their own self-will and pride? Is it my doing? I returned. Is it your doing? she retorted. Why do you bring this man here? "'He is a deeply injured man, Miss Dartle,' I replied. "'You may not know it.' "'I know that James Steerforth,' she said, with her hand on her bosom, 
as if to prevent the storm that was raging there from being loud, has a false, corrupt heart and is a traitor. But what need I know or care about this fellow and his common niece? Miss Dartle, I returned, you deepen the injury. It is sufficient already. I will only say, at parting, that you do him a great wrong. I do him no wrong, she returned. They are a depraved, worthless set. I would have her whipped. Mr. Peggotty passed on without a word and went out at the door. Oh, shame, Miss Dartle, shame, I said indignantly. How can you bear to trample on his undeserved affliction? I would trample on them all, she said. I would have his house pulled down. I would have her branded on the face, dressed in rags, and cast out in the streets to starve. If I had the power to sit in judgment on her, I would see it done. See it done? I would do it. I detest her. If I ever could reproach her with her infamous condition, I would go anywhere to do so. If I could hunt her to her grave, I would. If there was any word of comfort that would be a solace to her in her dying hour, and only I possessed it, I wouldn't part with it for life itself. The mere vehemence of her words can convey, I am sensible, but a weak impression of the passion by which she was possessed, and which made itself articulate in her whole figure, though her voice, instead of being raised, was lower than usual. No description I could give of her would do justice to my recollection of her, or to her entire deliverance of herself to her anger. I have seen passion in many forms, but I have never seen it in such a form as that. When I joined Mr. Peggotty, he was walking slowly and thoughtfully down the hill. He told me, as soon as I came up with him, that having now discharged his mind of what he had purposed doing in London, he meant to set out on his travels that night. I asked him where he meant to go. He only answered, I'm a going, sir, to see my niece. We went back to the little lodging over the chandler's shop, and there I found an opportunity of repeating to Peggotty what he had said to me. She informed me, in return, that he had said the same to her that morning. She knew, knew, knew no more than I did where he was going, but she thought he had some project shaped out in his mind. I did not like to leave him under such circumstances and we all three did dine together off a beefsteak pie, which was one of the many good things for which Peggotty was famous, and which was curiously flavoured on this occasion, I recollect well, by a miscellaneous taste of tea, coffee, butter, bacon, cheese, new loaves, firewood, candles, and walnut ketchup, continually ascending from the shop. After dinner we sat for an hour or so near the window, without talking much, and then Mr. Peggotty got up, and brought his oilskin bag and his stout stick, and laid them on the table. He accepted, from his sister's stock of ready money, a small sum on account of his legacy. Barely enough, I should have thought, to keep him for a month. He promised to communicate with me when anything befell him, and he slung his bag about him, took his hat and stick, and bade us both good-bye. "'All good attend you, dear old woman,' he said, embracing Peggotty. And you too, Master Davy, shaking hands with me. I'm a-going to seek her fur and wide. If she should come home while I'm away, and ah, then I'd like to be, or if I should bring her back, my meaning is that she and me shall live and die where no one can't reproach her. If any hurt should come to me, remember that the last words I left for her was, My unchanged love is with my darling child, and I forgive her. He said this solemnly, bareheaded. Then, putting on his hat, he went down the stairs and away. We followed to the door. It was a warm, dusty evening, just the time when, in the great main thoroughfare out of which that byway turned, there was a temporary lull in the eternal tread of feet upon the pavement, and a strong red sunshine. He turned alone, at the corner of our shady street, into a glow of light in which we lost him. Rarely did that hour of the evening come, rarely did I wake at night, rarely did I look up at the moon or stars, or watch the falling rain, or hear the wind, but I thought of his solitary figure toiling on, poor pilgrim, 
and recalled the words. I am going to seek her far and wide. If any hurt should come to me, remember that the last words I left for her was, My unchanged love is with my darling child, and I forgive her. End of chapter 32 Recording by Simon Evers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Nicodemus David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 33 Blissful All this time I had gone on loving Dora, harder than ever. Her idea was my refuge in disappointment and distress, and made some amends to me even for the loss of my friend. The more I pitied myself, or pitied others, the more I sought for consolation in the image of Dora. The greater the accumulation of deceit and trouble in the world, the brighter and the purer shone the star of Dora high above the world. I don't think I had any definite idea where Dora came from, or in what degree she was related to a higher order of beings, but I am quite sure I should have scouted the notion of her being simply human, like any other young lady, with indignation and contempt. If I may so express it, I was steeped in Dora. I was not merely over head and ears in love with her, but I was saturated through and through. Enough love might have been wrung out of me, metaphorically speaking, to drown anybody in, and yet there would have remained enough within me and all over me to pervade my entire existence. The first thing I did, on my own account, when I came back, was to take a night walk to Norwood, and like the subject of a venerable riddle of my childhood, to go round and round the house without ever touching the house, thinking about Dora. I believe the theme of this incomprehensible conundrum was the moon. No matter what it was, I, the moonstruck slave of Dora, perambulated round and round the house and garden for two hours, looking through crevices in the palings, getting my chin by dint of violent exertion above the rusty nails on the top, blowing kisses at the lights in the windows, and romantically calling on the night at intervals to shield my Dora. I don't know exactly what from, I suppose from fire, perhaps from mice to which she had a great objection. My love was so much in my mind, and it was so natural to me to confide in Pagotti, when I found her again by my side of an evening with the old set of industrial implements, busily making the tour of my wardrobe, that I imparted to her, in a sufficiently roundabout way, my great secret. Pagotti was strongly interested, but I could not get her into my view of the case at all. She was audaciously prejudiced in my favor and quite unable to understand why I should have any misgivings or be low-spirited about it. The young lady might think herself well off, she observed, to have such a beau. And as to her pa, she said, what did the gentleman expect, for gracious sake? I observed, however, that Mr. Spinlow's proctoral gown and stiff cravat took Pigotti down a little and inspired her with a greater reverence for the man who was gradually becoming more and more etherealized in my eyes every day, and about whom a reflected radiance seemed to me to beam when he sat erect in court among his papers, like a little lighthouse in a sea of stationery. And by the by, it used to be uncommonly strange to me to consider, I remember as I sat in court too, how those dim old judges and doctors wouldn't have cared for Dora, if they had known her, how they wouldn't have gone out of their senses with rapture if marriage with Dora had been proposed to them. How Dora might have sung and played upon that glorified guitar until she led me to the verge of madness, yet not, yet not have tempted one of those slow-goers an inch out of his road. I despised them to a man, frozen out old gardeners in the flower-beds of the heart. I took a personal fence against them all. The bench was nothing to me but an insensible blunderer. The bar had no more tenderness or poetry in it than the bar of a public house. Taking the management of Pigotti's affairs into my own hands, with no little pride, I proved the will and came to a settlement with the legacy duty office, and took her to the bank, 
and soon got everything into an orderly train. We varied the legal character of these proceedings by going to see some perspiring waxwork in Fleet Street, melted, I should hope, these twenty years, and by visiting Miss Linwood's exhibition, which I remember as a mausoleum of needlework, favorable to self-examination and repentance, and by inspecting the Tower of London and going to the top of St. Paul's. All these wonders afforded Pigotti as much pleasure as she was able to enjoy under the existing circumstances. Except, I think, St. Paul's, which from her long attachment to her work-box became a rival of the picture on the lid, and was in some particulars vanquished, she considered, by that work of art. Pigotti's business, which was what we used to call common-form business in the commons, and very light and lucrative the common-form business was, being settled, I took her down to the office one morning to pay her bill. Mr. Spinlow had stepped out, old Tiffy said, to get a gentleman sworn for a marriage license. But as I knew he would be back directly, our place lying close to the surrogates and to the vicar general's office too, I told Pigotti to wait. We were a little like undertakers in the commons, as regarded probate transaction, generally making it a rule to look more or less cut up when we had to deal with clients in mourning. In a similar feeling of delicacy, we were always blithe and light-hearted with the licensed clients. Therefore I hinted to Pigotti that she would find Mr. Spinlow much recovered from the shock of Mr. Barkis's decease, and indeed he came in like a bridegroom. But neither Pigotti nor I had, had eyes for him, when we saw, in company with him, Mr. Murdston. He was very little changed, his hair looked as thick and was certainly as black as ever, and his glance was as little to be trusted as of old. "'Ah, Copperfield,' said Mr. Spenlow, "'you know this gentleman, I believe.' I made my gentleman a distant bow, and Pigotti barely recognized him. He was at first somewhat disconcerted to meet us two together, but quickly decided what to do, and came up to me. "'I hope,' he said, "'that you are doing well.' "'It can hardly be interesting to you,' said I. Yes, if you wish to know. We looked at each other, and he addressed himself to Pigotti. And you, he said, I'm sorry to observe that you have lost your husband. It's not the first loss I have had in my life, Mr. Murdston, replied Pigotti, trembling from head to foot. I am glad to hope that there is nobody to blame for this one, nobody to answer for it. Ha, said he, that's a comfortable reflection. You have done your duty. I have not worn anybody's life away, said Pigotti. I am thankful to think. No, Mr. Murdston, I have not warranted and frightened any sweet creature to an early grave. He eyed her gloomily, remorsefully, I thought, for an instant, and said, turning his head towards me, but looking at my feet instead of my face. We are not likely to encounter soon again, a source of satisfaction to us both, no doubt, for such meetings as this can never be agreeable. I do not expect that you, who have always rebelled against my just authority, exerted for your benefit and reformation, should owe me any good will now. There is an antipathy between us. An old one, I believe, said I, interrupting him. He smiled and shot as evil a glance at me as could come from his dark eyes. It rankled in your baby breast, he said. It embittered the life of your poor mother. You are right. I hope you may do better yet. I hope you may correct yourself. Here he ended the dialogue, which had been carried in a low voice in a corner of the outer office, by passing into Mr. Spenlow's room and saying aloud in his smoothest manner, Gentlemen of Mr. Spenlow's profession are accustomed to family differences and know how complicated and difficult they always are. With that he paid the money for his license and receiving it neatly folded from Mr. Spinlow, together with a shake of the hand and a polite wish for his happiness and the ladies, went out of the office. I might have had more difficulty in constraining myself to be silent under his words if I had had less difficulty in impressing upon Pigotti, who was only angry on my account, good creature, that we were not in a place for recrimination, and that I besought her to hold her peace. She was so unusually roused that I was glad to compound for an affectionate hug, 
elicited by this revival in her mind of our old injuries, and to make the best I could of it before Mr. Spinlow and the clerks. Mr. Spinlow did not appear to know what the connection between Mr. Murdston and myself was, which I was glad of, for I could not bear to acknowledge him, even in my own breast, remembering what I did of the history of my poor mother. Mr. Spinlow seemed to think, if he thought anything about the matter, that my aunt was the leader of the state party in our family, and that there was a rebel party, commanded by someone else. So I gathered at least from what he said, while we were waiting for Mr. Tiffey to make out Pigotti's bill of costs. Miss Trotwood, he remarked, is very firm, no doubt, and not likely to give way to opposition. I have an admiration for her character, and I may congratulate you, Copperfield, on being on the right side. Differences between relations are much to be deplored, but they are extremely general, and the great thing is to be on the right side, meaning I take it on the side of the moneyed interest. Rather a good marriage, this, I believe, said Mr. Spenlow. I explained that I knew nothing about it. Indeed, he said, speaking from the few words Mr. Murdston dropped, as a man frequently does on these occasions, and from what Miss Murdston let fall, I should say it was rather a good marriage. Do you mean that there is money, sir? I asked. Yes, said Mr. Spenlow, I understand there's money. Beauty, too, I am told. Indeed, is his new wife young? Just of age, said Mr. Spenlow, so lately that I should think that they had been waiting for that. Lord, deliver her, said Peggotty so very emphatically and unexpectedly that we were all three discomposed, until Tiffy came in with the bill. Old Tiffy soon appeared, however, and handed it to Mr. Spinlow to look over. Mr. Spinlow, sitting his chin in his cravat and rubbing it softly, went over the items with a de deprecatory air, as if it were all Jorkin's doing, and handed it back to Tiffy with a bland sigh. Yes, he said, that's right. Quite right. I should have been extremely happy, Copperfield, to have limited these charges to the actual expenditure out of pocket, but it is an irksome incident in my professional life that I am not at liberty to consult my own wishes. I have a partner, Mr. Jorkins. As he said this with a gentle melancholy, which was the next thing to making no charge at all, I expressed my acknowledgments on Pigotti's behalf and paid Tiffy in banknotes. Pigotti then retired to her lodging, and Mr. Spenlow and I went into court, where we had a divorce suit coming on, under an ingenious little statute, repealed now, I believe, but in virtue of which I have seen several marriages annulled, of which the merits were these. The husband, whose name was Thomas Benjamin, had taken out his marriage license as Thomas only, suppressing the Benjamin, in case he should not find himself as comfortable as he expected. Not finding himself as comfortable as he expected, or being a little fatigued with his wife, poor fellow, he now came forward by a friend, after being married a year or two, and declared that his name was Thomas Benjamin, and therefore he was not married at all, which the court confirmed to his great satisfaction. I must say I had my doubts about the strict justice of this, and was not even frightened out of them by the bushel of wheat which reconciles all anomalies, but Mr. Spinlow argued the matter with me. He said, Look at the world. There was good and evil in that. Look at the ecclesiastical law. There was good and evil in that. It was all part of a system. Very good. There you were. I had not the hardihood to suggest to Dora's father that possibly we might even improve the world a little, if we got up early in the morning, and took off our coats to the work, but I confessed that I thought we might improve the commons. Mr. Spinlow replied that he would particularly advise me to dismiss that idea from my mind as not being worthy of my gentlemanly character, but that he would be glad to hear from me of what improvement I thought the commons susceptible. Taking that part of the commons which happened to be nearest to us, for our man was unmarried by this time and we were out of court, and strolling past the prerogative office, I submitted that the prerogative office rather a queerly managed institution. Mr. Spinlow inquired in what respect. I replied with all due deference to his experience, but with more deference I am afraid to his being Dora's father, that perhaps it was a little nonsensical that the registry of that court, containing the original wills of all persons leaving effects within the immense province of Canterbury for three whole centuries, should be an accidental building, never designed for the purpose, leased by the registrars for their own private emolument, unsafe, not even ascertained to be fireproof choked with the important documents it held, and positively from the roof to the basement, a mercenary speculation of the registrars, who took great fees from the public, and crammed the public's wills away anyhow and anywhere, 
having no other object than to get rid of them cheaply. That perhaps it was a little unreasonable that these registrars in the receipt of profits amounting to eight or nine thousand pounds a year, to say nothing of the profits of the deputy registrars and clerks of seats, should not be obliged to spend a little of that money in finding a reasonably safe place for the important documents which all classes of people were compelled to hand over to them, whether they would or no. That perhaps it was a little unjust that all the great offices in this great office should be magnificent sinecures, while the unfortunate working clerks in the cold dark room upstairs were the worst rewarded, and the least considered men doing important services in London. That perhaps it was a little indecent that the principal registrar of all, whose duty it was to find the public, constantly restoring to this place all needful accommodation, should be an enormous sinecurist in virtue of that post and might be besides a clergyman, a pluralist, the holder of a staff in a cathedral, and what not, while the public was put to the inconvenience of which we had a specimen every afternoon when the office was busy, and which we knew to be quite monstrous, that perhaps, in short, this prerogative office of the Diocese of Canterbury was altogether such a pestilent job, and such a pernicious absurdity, that but for its being squeezed away in a corner of St. Paul's churchyard, which few people knew, it must have been turned completely inside out and upside down long ago. Mr. Spenlow smiled as I became modestly warm on the subject, and then argued this question with me as he had argued the other. He said, what was it after all? It was a question of feeling. If the public felt that their wills were in safe keeping, and took it for granted that the office was not to be made better, who was the worse for it? Nobody. Who was the better for it? All the sinecurists. Very well then the good predominated. It might not be a perfect system, nothing was perfect, but what he objected to was the insertion of the wedge. Under the prerogative office, the country had been glorious. Insert the wedge into the prerogative office, and the country would cease to be glorious. He considered it the principle of a gentleman to take things as he found them, and he had no doubt the prerogative office would last our time. I deferred to his opinion, though I had great doubts of it myself. I find he was right, however, for it has not only lasted to the present moment, but has done so in the teeth of a great parliamentary report made, not too willingly, eighteen years ago, when all these objections of mine were set forth in detail, and when the existing stowage for wills was described as equal to the accumulation of only two years and a half more. What they have done with them since, whether they have lost many, or whether they sell any now and then to the butter shops, I don't know. I am glad mine is not there, and I hope it may not go there yet a while. I have set all this down in my present blissful chapter, because here it comes into its natural place. Mr. Spinlow and I falling into this conversation, prolonged it and our saunter to and fro, until we diverged into general topics. And so it came about, in the end, that Mr. Spinlow told me this day week was Dora's birthday and he would be glad if I would come down and join a little picnic on the occasion. I went out of my senses immediately, became a mere driveller next day, on receipt of a little lace-edged sheet of note-paper, favoured by Papa to remind, and passed the intervening period in a state of dotage. I think I committed every possible absurdity in the way of preparation for this blessed event. I turn hot when I remember the cravat I bought, my boots might be placed in any collection of instruments of torture. I provided, and sent down by the Norwood coach the night before, a delicate little hamper, amounting in itself, I thought, almost to a declaration. There were crackers in it, with the tenderest mottoes that could be got for money. At six in the morning I was in Covent Garden Market, buying a bouquet for Dora. At ten I was on horseback. I hired a gallant grey for the occasion with the bouquet in my hat to keep it fresh, trotting down to Norwood. I suppose that when I saw Dora in the garden, and pretended not to see her, and rode past the house, pretending to be anxiously looking for it, I committed two small fooleries which other young gentlemen in my circumstances might have committed, because they came so very natural to me. But, oh, when I did find the house, and did dismount at the garden gate, and dragged those stony-hearted boots across the lawn to Dora, sitting on a garden seat under a lilac tree. What a spectacle she was, upon that beautiful morning, among the butterflies in a white chip bonnet and a dress of celestial blue. There was a young lady with her, 
comparatively stricken in years, almost twenty, I should say. Her name was Miss Mills, and Dora called her Julia. She was the bosom friend of Dora. Happy Miss Mills. Jip was there, and Jip would bark at me again. When I presented my bouquet, he gnashed his teeth with jealousy. Well, he might. If he had the least idea how I adored his mistress, well, he might. Oh, thank you, Mr. Copperfield. What dear flowers, said Dora. I had an intention of saying, and had been studying the best form of words for three miles, that I thought them beautiful before I saw them so near her. But I couldn't manage it. She was too bewildering. To see her lay the flowers against her little dimpled chin was to lose all presence of mind and power of language in a feeble ecstasy. I wonder I didn't say, Kill me if you have a heart, Miss Mills. Let me die here. Then Dora held my flowers to Jip to smell. Then Jip growled and wouldn't smell them. Then Dora laughed and held them a little closer to Jip to make him. Then Jip laid hold of a bit of geranium with his teeth and worried imaginary cats in it. Then Dora beat him and pouted and said, My poor beautiful flowers, as compassionately, I thought, as if Jip had laid hold of me. I wished he had. You'll be so glad to hear, Mr. Copperfield, said Dora, that that cross Miss Murdstone is not here. She has gone to her brother's marriage and will be away at least three weeks. Isn't that delightful? I said I was sure it must be delightful to her, and all that was delightful to her was delightful to me. Miss Mills, with an air of superior wisdom and benevolence, smiled upon us. She is the most disagreeable thing I ever saw, said Dora. You can't believe how ill-tempered and shocking she is, Julia. Yes, I can, my dear, said Julia. You can, perhaps, love, returned Dora with her hand on Julia's. Forgive my not accepting you, my dear, at first. I learnt from this that Miss Mills had had her trials in the course of a checkered existence, and that to these, perhaps, I might refer that wise benignity of manner which I had already noticed. I found in the course of the day that this was the case, Miss Mills having been unhappy in a misplaced affection, and being understood to have retired from the world on her awful stock of experience, but still to take a calm interest in the unblighted hopes and loves of youth. But now Mr. Spinlow came out of the house, and Dora went to him, saying, Look, Papa, what beautiful flowers! And Miss Mills smiled thoughtfully, as who should say, Ye may flies, enjoy your brief existence in the bright morning of life and we walked from the lawn towards the carriage which was getting ready. I shall never have such a ride again. I have never had such another. There were only these three, their hamper, my hamper, and the guitar case, in the phaeton. And of course the phaeton was open, and I rode behind it. And Dora sat with her back to the horses, looking towards me. She kept the bouquet close to her on the cushion, and wouldn't allow Jip to sit on that side of her at all, for fear he should crush it. She often carried it in her hand, often refreshed herself with its fragrance. Our eyes at those times often met, and my great astonishment is that I didn't go over the head of my gallant grey into the carriage. There was dust, I believe. There was a good deal of dust, I believe. I have a faint impression that Mr. Spinlow remonstrated with me for riding in it, but I knew of none. I was sensible of a mist of love and beauty about Dora, but of nothing else. He stood up sometimes and asked me what I thought of the prospect. I said it was delightful, and I dare say it was, but it was all Dora to me. The sun shone Dora, and the birds sang Dora. The south wind blew Dora, and the wildflowers in the hedges were all Dora's, to a bud. My comfort is Miss Mills understood me. Miss Mills alone could enter into my feelings thoroughly. I don't know how long we were going and to this hour I know as little where we went. Perhaps it was near Guildford. Perhaps some Arabian night magician opened up the place for the day and shut it up forever when we came away. It was a green spot on a hill carpeted with soft turf. There were shady trees and heather and as far as the eye could see a rich landscape. It was a trying thing to find people here waiting for us and my jealousy even of the ladies knew no bounds. But all of my own sex, especially one impostor, three or four years my elder, with a red whisker, 
on which he established an amount of presumption not to be endured, were my mortal foes. We all unpacked our baskets and employed ourselves in getting dinner ready. Red Whisker pretended he could make a salad, which I don't believe, and obtruded himself on public notice. Some of the young ladies washed the lettuces for him and sliced them under his directions. Dora was among these. I felt that fate had pitted me against this man, and one of us must fall. Red Whisker made his salad. I wondered how they could eat it. Nothing should have induced me to touch it and voted himself into the charge of the wine cellar, which he constructed, being an ingenious beast, in the hollow trunk of a tree. By and by I saw him, with the majority of a lobster on his plate, eating his dinner at the feet of Dora. I have but an indistinct idea of what happened for some time after this baleful object presented itself to my view. I was very merry, I know, but it was hollow merriment. I attached myself to a young creature in pink with little eyes and flirted with her desperately. She received my attentions with favor, but whether on my account solely or because she had any designs on Red Whisker, I can't say. Dora's health was drunk. When I drank it, I affected to interrupt my conversation for that purpose and to resume it immediately afterwards. I caught Dora's eye as I bowed to her, and I thought it looked appealing, but it looked at me over the head of Red Whisker and I was adamant. The young creature in pink had a mother in green, and I rather think the latter separated us from motives of policy. Howbeit, there was a general breaking up of the party, while the remnants of the dinner were being put away, and I strolled off by myself among the trees in a raging and remorseful state. I was debating whether I should pretend that I was not well and fly, I don't know where, upon my gallant grey, when Dora and Miss Mills met me. "'Mr. Copperfield,' said Miss Mills, "'you are dull.' "'I begged her pardon. Not at all.' "'And Dora,' said Miss Mills, "'you are dull.' "'Oh, dear, no, not in the least. "'Mr. Copperfield and Dora,' said Miss Mills, "'with an almost venerable air, "'enough of this. "'Do not allow a trivial misunderstanding "'to wither the blossoms of spring, "'which once put forth and blighted cannot be renewed.' I speak, said Miss Mills, from experience of the past, the remote, irrevocable past. The gushing fountains which sparkle in the sun must not be stopped in mere caprice. The oasis in the desert of Sahara must not be plucked up idly. I hardly knew what I did. I was burning all over to that extraordinary extent, but I took Dora's little hand and kissed it, and she let me. I kissed Miss Mills's hand, and we all seemed, to my thinking, to go straight up to the seventh heaven. We did not come down again. We stayed up there all the evening. At first we strayed to and fro among the trees, I with Dora's shy arm drawn through mine, and heaven knows, folly as it all was, it would have been a happy fate to have been struck immortal with those foolish feelings, and have stayed among the trees forever. But much too soon we heard the others laughing and talking and calling, Where's Dora? So we went back, and they wanted Dora to sing. Red Whisker would have got the guitar case out of the carriage, but Dora told him nobody knew where it was, but I. So Red Whisker was done for in a moment, and I got it, and I unlocked it, and I took the guitar out, and I sat by her, and I held her handkerchief and gloves, and I drank in every note of her dear voice, and she sang to me, who loved her, and all the others might applaud as much as they liked, but they had nothing to do with it. I was intoxicated with joy. I was afraid it was too happy to be real, and that I should wake in Buckingham Street presently, and hear Miss Crupp clinking the teacups and getting breakfast ready. But Dora sang, and others sang, and Miss Mills sang, about the slumbering echoes in the caverns of memory, as if she were a hundred years old, and the evening came on and we had tea with the kettle boiling gypsy fashion, and I was still as happy as ever. I was happier than ever when the party broke up, and the other people, defeated Red Whisker and all, went their several ways, and we went ours through the still evening and the dying light, with sweet scents rising up around us. Mr. Spinlow, being a little drowsy after the champagne, honor to the soil that grew the grape, to the grape that made the wine, to the sun that ripened it, and to the merchant who adulterated it, and being fast asleep in a corner of the carriage, I rode by the side and talked to Dora. She admired my horse and patted him. 
Oh, what a dear little hand it looked upon a horse, and her shawl would not keep right, and now and then I drew it round her with my arm, and I even fancied that Jip began to see how it was, and to understand that he must make up his mind to be friends with me. That sagacious Miss Mills, too, that amiable, though quite used up recluse, that little patriarch of something less than twenty, who had done with the world and mustn't on any account have the slumbering echoes in the caverns of memory awakened, what a kind thing she did. Mr. Copperfield, said Miss Mills, come to this side of the carriage a moment. If you can spare a moment, I want to speak to you. Behold me on my gallant grey, bending at the side of Miss Mills, with my hand upon the carriage door. Dora is coming to stay with me. She is coming home with me the day after tomorrow. If you would like to call, I am sure Papa would be happy to see you. What could I do but invoke a silent blessing on Miss Mills's head, and store Mrs. Mills's address in the securest corner of my memory? What could I do but tell Miss Mills, with grateful looks and fervent words, how much I appreciated her good offices, and what an inestimable value I set upon her friendship? Then Miss Mills benignantly dismissed me, saying, Go back to Dora, and I went. And Dora leaned out of the carriage to talk to me, and we talked all the rest of the way, and I rode my gallant grey so close to the wheel that I grazed his foreleg against it and took the bark off, as his owner told me, to the tune of three puns seven, which I paid, and though extremely cheap for so much joy. What time Miss Mills sat looking at the moon, murmuring verses and recalling, I suppose, the ancient days when she and the earth had anything in common. Norwood was many miles too near, and we reached it many hours too soon. But Mr. Spenlow came to himself a little short of it, and said, You must come in, Copperfield, and rest. And I consenting, we had sandwiches and wine and water. In the light room, Dora blushing looked so lovely that I could not tear myself away, but sat there staring in a dream until the snoring of Mr. Spinlow inspired me with sufficient consciousness to take my leave. So we parted, I riding all the way to London with the farewell touch of Dora's hand still light on mine, recalling every incident and word ten thousand times, lying down in my own bed at last, as enraptured a young noodle as ever was carried out of his five wits by love. When I awoke next morning, I was resolute to declare my passion to Dora and know my fate. Happiness or misery was now the question. There was no other question that I knew of in the world, and only Dora could give the answer to it. I passed three days in a luxury of wretchedness, torturing myself by putting every conceivable variety of discouraging construction on all that ever had taken place between Dora and me. At last arrayed for the purpose, at a vast expense, I went to Mrs. Mills, fraught with the declaration. How many times I went up and down the street, and round the square, painfully aware of being a much better answer to the old riddle than the original one, before I could persuade myself to go up the steps and knock, is no matter now. Even when at last I had knocked and was waiting at the door, I had some flurried thought of asking if that were Mr. Blackboy's, in imitation of poor Barkus, begging pardon and retreating, but I kept my ground. Mr. Mills was not at home. I did not expect he would be. Nobody wanted him. Miss Mills was at home. Miss Mills would do. I was shown into a room upstairs where Miss Mills and Dora were. Jip was there. Miss Mills was copying music. I recollect it was a new song called Affection's Dirge, and Dora was painting flowers. What were my feelings when I recognized my own flowers, the identical Covent Garden market purchase? I cannot say that they were very like or that they particularly resembled any flowers that have ever come under my observation, but I knew from the paper round them, which was accurately copied, what the composition was. Miss Mills was very glad to see me, and very sorry her papa was not at home, though I thought we all bore that with fortitude. Miss Mills was conversational for a few minutes, and then laying down her pen upon affection's dirge, got up and left the room. I began to think I would put it off until tomorrow. I hope your poor horse was not tired when he got home at night, said Dora, lifting up her beautiful eyes. It was a long way for him. I began to think I would do it today. 
It was a long way for him, said I, for he had nothing to uphold him on the journey. Wasn't he fed, poor thing? asked Dora. I began to think I would put it off till tomorrow. Yes, I said, he was well taken care of. I mean, he had not the unutterable happiness that I had in being so near you. Dora bent her head over the drawing and said, after a little while, I had sat in the interval in a burning fever and with my legs in a very rigid state. You don't seem to be sensible of that happiness yourself at one time of the day. I saw now that I was in for it, and it must be done on the spot. You didn't care for that happiness in the least, said Dora, slightly raising her eyebrows and shaking her head, when you were sitting by Miss Kit. Kit, I should observe, was the name of the creature in pink with the little eyes. Though certainly I don't know why you should, said Dora, or why you should call it a happiness at all. But of course you don't mean what you say, and I am sure no one doubts your being at liberty to do whatever you like. Jip, you naughty boy, come here. I don't know how I did it. I did it in a moment. I intercepted Jip. I had Dora in my arms. I was full of eloquence. I never stopped for a word. I told her how I loved her. I told her I should die without her. I told her that I idolized and worshipped her. Jip barked madly all the time. When Dora hung her head and cried and trembled, my eloquence increased so much the more. If she would like me to die for her, she had but to say the word and I was ready. Life without Dora's love was not a thing to have on any terms. I couldn't bear it and I wouldn't. I had loved her every minute day and night since I first saw her. I loved her at that minute to distraction. I should always love her every minute to distraction. Lovers have loved before, and lovers would love again, but no lover had loved, might, could, would, or should ever love as I loved Dora. The more I raved, the more Jip barked. Each of us, in his own way, got more mad every moment. Well, well, Dora and I were sitting on the sofa by and by, quiet enough, and Jip was lying in her lap, winking peacefully at me. It was off my mind. I was in a state of perfect rapture. Dora and I were engaged. I suppose we had some notion that this was to end in marriage. We must have had some, because Dora stipulated that we were never to be married without her papa's consent. But in our youthful ecstasy... I don't think that we really looked before us or behind us, or had any aspiration beyond the ignorant present. We were to keep our secret from Mr. Spinlow, but I am sure the idea never entered my head then that there was anything dishonorable in that. Miss Mills was more than usually pensive when Dora, going to find her, brought her back. I apprehend because there was a tendency in what had passed to awaken the slumbering echoes in the caverns of memory. But she gave us her blessing and the assurance of her lasting friendship, and spoke to us generally, as became a voice from the cloister. What an idle time it was, what insubstantial, happy, foolish time it was. When I measured Dora's finger for a ring that was to be made of forget-me-nots, and when the jeweler to whom I took the measure found me out and laughed over his order book, and charged me anything he liked for the pretty little toy, with its blue stones, so associated in my remembrance with Dora's hand that yesterday, when I saw such another by chance on the finger of my own daughter, there was a momentary stirring in my heart like pain. When I walked about exalted with my secret and full of my own interest and felt the dignity of loving Dora and of being beloved so much that if I had walked the air I could not have been more above the people not so situated who were creeping on the earth. When we had those meetings in the garden of the square, and sat within the dingy summer-house, so happy, that I love the London sparrows to this hour for nothing else, and see the plumage of the tropics in their smoky feathers. When we had our first great quarrel, within a week of our betrothal, and when Dora sent me back the ring enclosed in a despairing cocked hat note, wherein she used the terrible expression that our love had begun in folly and ended in madness which dreadful words occasioned me to tear my hair and cry that all was over. When under cover of the night I flew to Miss Mills, whom I saw by stealth in a back kitchen where there was a mangle, and implored Miss Mills to interpose between us and avert insanity, 
when Miss Mills undertook the office and returned with Dora, exhorting us, from the pulpit of her own bitter youth, to mutual concession and the avoidance of the desert of Sahara. When we cried and made it up, and were so blessed again that the back kitchen, mangle and all, changed to love's own temple, where we arranged a plan of correspondence through Miss Mills, always to comprehend at least one letter on each side every day. What an idle time! What an insubstantial, happy, foolish time! Of all the times of mine that time has in his grip, there is none that in one retrospect I can smile at half so much and think of half so tenderly. End of chapter 33 of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Reading by Nicodemus Chapter 34 of David Copperfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Deborah Lynn. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 34. My Aunt Astonishes Me. I wrote to Agnes as soon as Dora and I were engaged. I wrote her a long letter in which I tried to make her comprehend how blessed I was and what a darling Dora was. I entreated Agnes not to regard this as a thoughtless passion which could ever yield to any other, or had the least resemblance to the boyish fancies that we used to joke about. I assured her that its profundity was quite unfathomable, and expressed my belief that nothing like it had ever been known. Somehow, as I wrote to Agnes on a fine evening by my open window, and the remembrance of her clear calm eyes and gentle face came stealing over me, it shed such a peaceful influence upon the hurry and agitation in which I had been living lately, and of which my very happiness partook in some degree, that it soothed me into tears. I remember that I sat resting my head upon my hand when the letter was half done, cherishing a general fancy as if Agnes were one of the elements of my natural home, as if, in the retirement of the house made almost sacred to me by her presence, Dora and I must be happier than anywhere, as if, in love, joy, sorrow, hope, or disappointment, in all emotions, my heart turned naturally there and found its refuge and best friend. Of Steerforth I said nothing. I only told her there had been sad grief at Yarmouth on account of Emily's flight, and that on me it made a double wound by reason of the circumstances attending it. I knew how quick she always was to divine the truth, and that she would never be the first to breathe his name. To this letter I received an answer by return of post. As I read it I seemed to hear Agnes speaking to me. It was like her cordial voice in my ears. What can I say more? While I had been away from home lately, Traddles had called twice or thrice. Finding Peggotty within, and being informed by Peggotty, who always volunteered that information to whomsoever would receive it, that she was my old nurse, he had established a good-humoured acquaintance with her, and had stayed to have a little chat with her about me. So Peggotty said, but I am afraid the chat was all on her own side, and of immoderate length as she was very difficult indeed to stop, God bless her, when she had me for her theme. This reminds me, not only that I expected Traddles on a certain afternoon of his own appointing, which was now come, but that Mrs. Crupp had resigned everything appertaining to her office, the salary accepted, until Peggotty should cease to present herself. Mrs. Crupp, after holding divers conversations respecting Peggotty, in a very high-pitched voice on the staircase, with some invisible familiar, it would appear, for corporeally speaking she was quite alone at those times, addressed a letter to me developing her views. Beginning it with that statement of universal application, which fitted every occurrence of her life, namely that she was a mother herself, she went on to inform me that she had once seen very different days, but that at all periods of her existence she had had a constitutional objection to spies, intruders, and informers. She named no names, she said. Let them the cap fitted wear it. But spies, intruders, and informers, especially in widder's weeds, this clause was underlined, she had ever accustomed herself to look down upon. If a gentleman was the victim of spies, intruders, and informers, but still naming no names, that was his own pleasure. He had a right to please himself, so let him do. 
all that she, Mrs. Crupp, stipulated for was that she should not be brought in contract with such persons. Therefore she begged to be excused from any further attendance on the top set until things were as they formerly was, and as they could be wished to be, and further mentioned that her little book would be found upon the breakfast-table every Saturday morning when she requested an immediate settlement of the same, with the benevolent view of saving trouble and an ill convenience to all parties. After this Mrs. Crupp confined herself to making pitfalls on the stairs, principally with pitchers, and endeavouring to delude Peggotty into breaking her legs. I found it rather harassing to live in this state of siege, but was too much afraid of Mrs. Crupp to see any way out of it. "'My dear Copperfield,' cried Traddles, punctually appearing at my door, in spite of all these obstacles, "'how do you do?' "'My dear Traddles,' said I, "'I am delighted to see you at last, and very sorry I have not been at home before, but I have been so much engaged—' "'Yes, yes, I know,' said Traddles, "'of course. Yours lives in London, I think.' "'What did you say?' "'She—excuse me, Miss D., you know,' said Traddles, colouring in his great delicacy, "'lives in London, I believe.' "'Oh, yes, near London.' "'Mine, perhaps you recollect,' said Traddles, with a serious look, "'lives down in Devonshire, one of ten. "'Consequently, I am not so much engaged as you, in that sense.' "'I wonder you can bear,' I returned, "'to see her so seldom.' "'Ha!' said Traddles thoughtfully. "'It does seem a wonder. "'I suppose it is, Copperfield, "'because there is no help for it.' "'I suppose so,' I replied with a smile, "'and not without a blush. "'And because you have so much constancy and patience, Traddles.' "'Dear me,' said Traddles, considering about it, "'do I strike you in that way, Copperfield? "'Really, I didn't know that I had.' "'but she is such an extraordinarily dear girl herself "'that it's possible she may have imparted "'something of those virtues to me. "'Now you mention it, Copperfield, "'I shouldn't wonder at all. "'I assure you she is always forgetting herself "'and taking care of the other nine. "'Is she the eldest?' I inquired. "'Oh, dear, no,' said Traddles. "'The eldest is a beauty.' "'He saw, I suppose, that I could not help smiling "'at the simplicity of this reply, "'and added, with a smile upon his own ingenuous face, "'Not, of course, but that my Sophie—pretty name, Copperfield, I always think.' "'Very pretty,' said I. "'Not, of course, but that Sophie is beautiful, too, in my eyes, "'and would be one of the dearest girls that ever was in anybody's eyes, I should think. "'But when I say the eldest is a beauty, I mean she really is a—' "'He seemed to be describing clouds about himself with both hands. "'Splendid, you know,' said Traddles energetically. "'Indeed,' said I. "'Oh, I assure you,' said Traddles, "'something very uncommon indeed. "'Then, you know, being formed for society and admiration, "'and not being able to enjoy much of it "'in consequence of their limited means, "'she naturally gets a little irritable and exacting sometimes. "'Sophie puts her in good humour. "'Is Sophie the youngest?' I hazarded. "'Oh, dear, no,' said Traddles, stroking his chin. "'The two youngest are only nine and ten. "'Sophie educates them. "'The second daughter, perhaps,' I hazarded. "'No,' said Traddles. "'Sarah's the second. "'Sarah has something the matter with her spine, poor girl. "'The malady will wear out by and by, the doctors say, "'but in the meantime she has to lie down for a twelve-month. "'Sophie nurses her. "'Sophie's the fourth. "'Is the mother living?' I inquired. "'Oh, yes,' said Traddles. "'She is alive. "'She is a very superior woman indeed.' "'but the damp country is not adapted to her constitution, "'and, in fact, she has lost the use of her limbs.' "'Dear me!' said I. "'Very sad, is it not?' returned Traddles. "'But in a merely domestic view it is not so bad as it might be, "'because Sophie takes her place. "'She is quite as much a mother to her mother as she is to the other nine. "'I felt the greatest admiration for the virtues of this young lady.' and honestly, with the view of doing my best to prevent the good nature of Traddles from being imposed upon, to the detriment of their joint prospects in life, inquired how Mr. Micawber was. "'He is quite well, Copperfield, thank you,' said Traddles. "'I am not living with him at present.' "'No?' "'No. You see, the truth is,' said Traddles, in a whisper, "'he had changed his name to Mortimer in consequence of his temporary embarrassments, "'and he don't come out till after dark, and then in spectacles. "'There was an execution put into our house for rent. "'Mrs. Micawber was in such a dreadful state "'that I really couldn't resist giving my name to that second bill we spoke of here. 
you may imagine how delightful it was to my feelings, Copperfield, to see the matter settled with it, and Mrs. Micawber recover her spirits.' "'Hum,' said I. "'Not that her happiness was of long duration,' pursued Traddles, "'for, unfortunately, within a week another execution came in. "'It broke up the establishment. "'I have been living in a furnished apartment since then, "'and the Mortimers have been very private indeed. "'I hope you won't think it selfish, Copperfield, "'if I mention that the broker carried off my little round table "'with the marble top, and Sophie's flower-pot and stand.' "'What a hard thing!' I exclaimed indignantly. "'It was a—it was a pull,' said Traddles, with his usual wince at that expression. "'I don't mention it reproachfully, however, but with a motive. "'The fact is, Copperfield, I was unable to repurchase them at the time of their seizure, "'in the first place, because the broker, having an idea that I wanted them, "'ran the price up to an extravagant extent, "'and in the second place because I hadn't any money.' "'Now I have kept my eyes since upon the broker's shop,' said Traddles, with a great enjoyment of his mystery, which is up at the top of Tottenham Court Road, and at last to-day I find them put out for sale. I have only noticed them from over the way, because if the broker saw me, bless you, he'd ask any price for them. What has occurred to me, having now the money, is that perhaps you wouldn't object to ask that good nurse of yours to come with me to the shop. I can show it her from round the corner of the next street.' and make the best bargain for them, as if they were for herself, that she can. The delight with which Traddles propounded this plan to me, and the sense he had of its uncommon artfulness, are among the freshest things in my remembrance. I told him that my old nurse would be delighted to assist him, and that we would all three take the field together, but on one condition. That condition was that he should make a solemn resolution to grant no more loans of his name or anything else to Mr. Micawber. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Traddles, "'I have already done so, because I begin to feel that I have not only been inconsiderate, but that I have been positively unjust to Sophie. My word being passed to myself, there is no longer any apprehension, but I pledge it to you, too, with the greatest readiness. That first unlucky obligation I have paid. I have no doubt Mr. Micawber would have paid it if he could, but he could not. One thing I ought to mention, which I like very much in Mr. Micawber, Copperfield,' It refers to the second obligation, which is not yet due. He don't tell me that it is provided for, but he says it will be. Now I think there is something very fair and honest about that. I was unwilling to damp my good friend's confidence, and therefore assented. After a little further conversation, we went round to the chandler's shop to enlist Peggotty. Traddles declining to pass the evening with me, both because he endured the liveliest apprehensions that his property would be bought by somebody else before he could repurchase it, and because it was the evening he always devoted to writing to the dearest girl in the world. I never shall forget him peeping round the corner of the street in Tottenham Court Road while Peggotty was bargaining for the precious articles, or his agitation when she came slowly towards us after vainly offering a price, and was hailed by the relenting broker, and went back again. The end of the negotiation was that she bought the property on tolerably easy terms, and Traddles was transported with pleasure. "'I am very much obliged to you indeed,' said Traddles, on hearing it was to be sent to where he lived that night. "'If I might ask one other favour—I hope you would not think it absurd, Copperfield.' "'I said beforehand, certainly not.' "'Then, if you would be good enough—' said Traddles to Peggotty, to get the flower-pot now, I think I should like, it being Sophie's Copperfield, to carry it home myself. Peggotty was glad to get it for him, and he overwhelmed her with thanks, and went his way up Tottenham Court Road, carrying the flower-pot affectionately in his arms, with one of the most delighted expressions of countenance I ever saw. We then turned back towards my chambers. As the shops had charms for Peggotty, which I never knew them possess in the same degree for anybody else, I sauntered easily along, amused by her staring in at the windows, and waiting for her as often as she chose. We were thus a good while in getting to the Adelphi. On our way upstairs I called her attention to the sudden disappearance of Mrs. Crupp's pitfalls, and also to the prints of recent footsteps. We were both very much surprised, coming higher up, to find my outer door standing open, which I had shut, and to hear voices inside. We looked at one another without knowing what to make of this, and went into the sitting-room. What was my amazement to find, of all people upon earth, my aunt there, 
and Mr. Dick. My aunt, sitting on a quantity of luggage, with her two birds before her, and her cat on her knee, like a female Robinson Crusoe, drinking tea. Mr. Dick, leaning thoughtfully on a great kite, such as we had often been out together to fly, with more luggage piled about him. "'My dear aunt!' cried I. "'Why, what an unexpected pleasure!' We cordially embraced, and Mr. Dick and I cordially shook hands, and Mrs. Crupp, who was busy making tea and could not be too attentive, cordially said she had knowed well as Mr. Copperfull would have his heart in his mouth when he see his dear relations. Hullo, said my aunt to Peggotty, who quailed before her awful presence. "'How are you?' "'You remember my aunt, Peggotty,' said I. "'For the love of goodness, child!' exclaimed my aunt. "'Don't call the woman by that South Sea Island name. If she married and got rid of it, which was the best thing she could do, why don't you give her the benefit of the change?' "'What's your name now, P?' said my aunt, as a compromise for the obnoxious appellation. "'Barkis, ma'am,' said Peggotty, with a curtsy. "'Well, that's human,' said my aunt. "'It sounds less as if you wanted a missionary. "'How do you do, Barkis? I hope you're well.' Encouraged by these gracious words, and by my aunt's extending her hand, Barkis came forward and took the hand, and curtsied her acknowledgments. "'We are older than we were, I see,' said my aunt. "'We have only met each other once before, you know. "'A nice business we made of it, then. "'Trot, my dear, another cup.' "'I handed it dutifully to my aunt, "'who was in her usual inflexible state of figure, "'and ventured a remonstrance with her "'on the subject of her sitting on a box. "'Let me draw the sofa here, or the easy chair, aunt,' said I. "'Why should you be so uncomfortable?' "'Thank you, Trot,' replied my aunt. "'I prefer to sit upon my property.' Here my aunt looked hard at Mrs. Crupp, and observed, "'We needn't trouble you to wait, ma'am.' "'Shall I put a little more tea in the pot afore I go, ma'am?' said Mrs. Crupp. "'No, I thank you, ma'am,' replied my aunt. "'Would you let me fetch another pad of butter, ma'am?' said Mrs. Crupp. "'Or would you be persuaded to try a new-laid hag, or should I brile a rasher? "'Ain't there nothing I could do for your dear aunt, Mr. Copperful?' "'Nothing, ma'am,' returned my aunt. "'I shall do very well, I thank you.' Mrs. Crupp, who had been incessantly smiling to express sweet temper, and incessantly holding her head on one side to express a general feebleness of constitution, and incessantly rubbing her hands to express a desire to be of service to all deserving objects, gradually smiled herself, one-sided herself, and rubbed herself out of the room. "'Dick,' said my aunt, "'you know what I told you about time-servers and wealth worshippers. Mr. Dick, with rather a scared look, as if he had forgotten it, returned a hasty answer in the affirmative. "'Mrs. Crupp is one of them,' said my aunt. "'Barkus, I'll trouble you to look after the tea and let me have another cup, for I don't fancy that woman's pouring out.' I knew my aunt sufficiently well to know that she had something of importance on her mind, and that there was far more matter in this arrival than a stranger might have supposed. I noticed how her eye lighted on me, when she thought my attention otherwise occupied, and what a curious process of hesitation appeared to be going on within her, while she preserved her outward stiffness and composure. I began to reflect whether I had done anything to offend her, and my conscience whispered me that I had not yet told her about Dora. Could it by any means be that, I wondered? As I knew she would only speak in her own good time, I sat down near her, and spoke to the birds, and played with the cat, and was as easy as I could be. But I was very far from being really easy, and I should still have been so, even if Mr. Dick, leaning over the great kite behind my aunt, had not taken every secret opportunity of shaking his head darkly at me, and pointing at her. "'Trot,' said my aunt at last, when she had finished her tea, and carefully smoothed down her dress, and wiped her lips. "'You needn't go, Barkis. "'Trot, have you got to be firm and self-reliant?' "'I hope so, Aunt.' "'What do you think?' inquired Miss Betsy. "'I think so, Aunt.' "'Then why, my love,' said my Aunt, looking earnestly at me, "'why do you think I prefer to sit upon this property of mine to-night?' I shook my head, unable to guess. "'Because,' said my Aunt, "'it's all I have. "'Because I'm ruined, my dear.' If the house and every one of us had tumbled out into the river together, I could hardly have received a greater shock. "'Dick knows it,' said my aunt, laying her hand calmly on my shoulder. 
"'I am ruined, my dear Trot. All I have in the world is in this room, except the cottage, and that I have left Janet to let. Barkis, I want to get a bed for this gentleman to-night. To save expense, perhaps, you can make up something here for myself. Anything will do. It's only for to-night. We'll talk about this more to-morrow.' I was roused from my amazement and concern for her, I am sure for her, by her falling on my neck for a moment, and crying that she only grieved for me. In another moment she suppressed this emotion, and said, with an aspect more triumphant than dejected, "'We must meet reverses boldly, and not suffer them to frighten us, my dear. We must learn to act the play out. We must live misfortune down, Trot.'" End of chapter 34《Chapter Thirty Five of David Copperfield》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Five Depression. As soon as I could recover my presence of mind, which quite deserted me in the first overpowering shock of my aunt's intelligence, I proposed to Mr. Dick to come round to the chandler's shop and take possession of the bed which Mr. Peggotty had lately vacated, the chandler's shop being in Hungerford Market, and Hungerford Market being a very different place in those days, there was a low wooden colonnade before the door, not very unlike that before the house where the little man and woman used to live in the old weather-glass, which pleased Mr. Dick mightily. The glory of lodging over this structure would have compensated him, I dare say, for many inconveniences. But as there were really few to bear beyond the compound of flavours I have already mentioned, and perhaps the want of a little more elbow-room, he was perfectly charmed with his accommodation. Mrs. Crupp had indignantly assured him that there wasn't room to swing a cat there. But, as Mr. Dick justly observed to me, sitting down on the foot of the bed nursing his leg, "'You know, Trotwood, I don't want to swing a cat. I never do swing a cat. Therefore, what does that signify to me?' I tried to ascertain whether Mr. Dick had any understanding of the causes of this sudden and great change in my aunt's affairs. As I might have expected, he had none at all. The only account he could give of it was that my aunt had said to him the day before yesterday, "'Now, Dick, are you really and truly the philosopher I take you for?' That then he had said, yes, he hoped so, that then my aunt had said, Dick, I am ruined. That then he had said, oh, indeed, that then my aunt had praised him highly, which he was glad of, and that then they had come to me and had had bottled porter and sandwiches on the road. Mr. Dick was so very complacent, sitting on the foot of the bed, nursing his leg and telling me this, with his eyes wide open, and a surprising smile, that I am sorry to say I was provoked into explaining to him that ruin meant distress, want, and starvation. But I was soon bitterly reproved for this harshness, by seeing his face turn pale, and tears course down his lengthened cheeks, while he fixed upon me a look of such unutterable woe, that it might have softened a far harder heart than mine." I took infinitely greater pains to cheer him up again than I had taken to depress him, and I soon understood, as I ought to have known at first, that he had been so confident merely because of his faith in the wisest and most wonderful of women, and his unbounded reliance on my intellectual resources. The latter, I believe, he considered a match for any kind of disaster not absolutely mortal. "'What can we do, Trotwood?' said Mr. Dick. "'There's the memorial.' "'To be sure there is,' said I. "'But all we can do just now, Mr. Dick, is to keep a cheerful countenance, "'and not let my aunt see that we are thinking about it.' "'He assented to this in the most earnest manner, "'and implored me, if I should see him wandering an inch out of the right course, "'to recall him by some of those superior methods which were always at my command. "'But I regret to state that the fright I had given him "'proved too much for his best attempts at concealment.' All the evening his eyes wandered to my aunt's face with an expression of the most dismal apprehension, as if he saw her growing thin on the spot. He was conscious of this, and put a constraint upon his head. But his keeping that immovable, and sitting rolling his eyes like a piece of machinery, did not mend the matter at all. 
I saw him look at the loaf at supper, which happened to be a small one, as if nothing else stood between us and famine, and when my aunt insisted on his making his customary repast, I detected him in the act of pocketing fragments of his bread and cheese. I have no doubt for the purpose of reviving us with those savings when we should have reached an advanced stage of attenuation. My aunt, on the other hand, was in a composed frame of mind which was a lesson to all of us. To me, I am sure. She was extremely gracious to Peggotty, except when I inadvertently called her by that name, and strange as I knew she felt in London, appeared quite at home. She was to have my bed, and I was to lie in the sitting-room to keep guard over her. She made a great point of being so near the river in case of a conflagration, and I suppose really did find some satisfaction in that circumstance. "'Trot, my dear,' said my aunt, when she saw me making preparations for compounding her usual night draught. "'No. "'Nothing, aunt? "'Not wine, my dear. "'Ale. "'But there is wine here, aunt, "'and you always have it made of wine. "'Keep that, in case of sickness,' said my aunt. "'We mustn't use it carelessly, Trot. "'Ale for me, half a pint. "'I thought Mr. Dick would have fallen insensible. "'My aunt being resolute, "'I went out and got the ale myself.' As it was growing late, Peggotty and Mr. Dick took that opportunity of repairing to the chandler's shop together. I parted from him, poor fellow, at the corner of the street, with his great kite at his back, a very monument of human misery. My aunt was walking up and down the room when I returned, crimping the borders of her nightcap with her fingers. I warmed the ale and made the toast on the usual infallible principles. When it was ready for her, she was ready for it, with her nightcap on and the skirt of her gown turned back on her knees. "'My dear,' said my aunt, after taking a spoonful of it, "'it's a great deal better than wine, not half so bilious.' "'I suppose I looked doubtful, for she added, "'Tut, tut, child, if nothing worse than ale happens to us, we are well off.' "'I should think so myself, aunt, I am sure,' said I. "'Well, then, why don't you think so?' said my aunt. "'Because you and I are very different people,' I returned. "'Stuff and nonsense, Trot,' replied my aunt. My aunt went on with a quiet enjoyment, in which there was very little affectation, if any, drinking the warm ale with a teaspoon, and soaking her strips of toast in it. "'Trot,' said she, "'I don't care for strange faces in general, but I rather like that Barkis of yours, do you know?' "'It's better than a hundred pounds to hear you say so,' said I. "'It's a most extraordinary world,' observed my aunt, rubbing her nose. "'How that woman ever got into it with that name is unaccountable to me. "'It would be much more easy to be born a Jackson or something of that sort, one would think.' "'Perhaps she thinks so, too. It's not her fault,' said I. "'I suppose not,' returned my aunt, rather grudging the admission. "'But it's very aggravating.' However, she's Barkis now, that's some comfort. Barkis is uncommonly fond of you, Trot. There is nothing she would leave undone to prove it, said I. Nothing, I believe, returned my aunt. Here the poor fool has been begging and praying about handing over some of her money, because she has got too much of it. A simpleton. My aunt's tears of pleasure were positively trickling down into the warm ale. "'She's the most ridiculous creature that ever was born,' said my aunt. "'I knew from the first moment when I saw her with that poor, dear, blessed baby of a mother of yours "'that she was the most ridiculous of mortals. "'But there are good points in Barkis.' "'Affecting to laugh, she got an opportunity of putting her hand to her eyes. "'Having availed herself of it, she resumed her toast and her discourse together. "'Ah, mercy upon us,' sighed my aunt. "'I know all about it, Trot.' "'Barkis and myself had quite a gossip while you were out with Dick. "'I know all about it. "'I don't know where these wretched girls expect to go, for my part. "'I wonder they don't knock out their brains against—against against mantelpieces,' said my aunt, "'an idea which was probably suggested to her by her contemplation of mine. "'Poor Emily,' said I. "'Oh, don't talk to me about poor,' returned my aunt. "'She should have thought of that before she caused so much misery.' "'Give me a kiss, Trot. I am sorry for your early experience.' As I bent forward, she put her tumbler on my knee to detain me, and said, "'Oh, Trot, Trot, and so you fancy yourself in love, do you?' "'Fancy, Aunt,' I exclaimed, as red as I could be. 
I adore her with my whole soul.' "'Dora, indeed,' returned my aunt. "'And you mean to say the little thing is very fascinating, I suppose?' "'My dear aunt,' I replied, "'no one can form the least idea what she is.' "'Ah, and not silly?' said my aunt. "'Silly, aunt?' I seriously believe it had never once entered my head for a single moment to consider whether she was or not. I resented the idea, of course, but I was in a manner struck by it as a new one altogether. "'Not light-headed?' said my aunt. "'Light-headed, aunt?' I could only repeat this daring speculation with the same kind of feeling with which I had repeated the preceding question. "'Well, well,' said my aunt, "'I only ask, I don't depreciate her.' "'Poor little couple! And so you think you were formed for one another, and are to go through a party-supper-table kind of life, like two pretty pieces of confectionery, do you, Trot?' She asked me this so kindly, and with such a gentle air, half playful and half sorrowful, that I was quite touched. "'We are young and inexperienced, Aunt, I know,' I replied, "'and I dare say we say and think a good deal that is rather foolish. But we love one another truly, I am sure.' If I thought Dora could ever love anybody else, or cease to love me, or that I could ever love anybody else, or cease to love her, I don't know what I should do. Go out of my mind, I think. "'Ah, Trot,' said my aunt, shaking her head and smiling gravely. "'Blind, blind, blind!' "'Someone that I know, Trot,' my aunt pursued, after a pause, though of a very pliant disposition, has an earnestness of affection in him that reminds me of poor baby.' earnestness is what that somebody must look for to sustain him and improve him, Trot. Deep, downright, faithful earnestness. "'If you only knew the earnestness of Dora, Aunt,' I cried. "'Oh, Trot,' she said again, "'blind, blind!' And without knowing why, I felt a vague, unhappy loss, or want of something, overshadow me like a cloud. "'However,' said my aunt, "'I don't want to put two young creatures out of conceit with themselves, or to make them unhappy.' So, though it is a girl and boy attachment, and girl and boy attachments very often, mind, I don't say always, come to nothing, still we'll be serious about it, and hope for a prosperous issue one of these days. There's time enough for it to come to anything. This was not upon the whole very comforting to a rapturous lover, but I was glad to have my aunt in my confidence, and I was mindful of her being fatigued. So I thanked her ardently for this mark of her affection, and for all her other kindnesses towards me, and after a tender good night she took her nightcap into my bedroom. How miserable I was when I lay down! How I thought and thought about my being poor in Mr. Spenlow's eyes, about my not being what I thought I was when I proposed to Dora, about the chivalrous necessity of telling Dora what my worldly condition was, and releasing her from her engagement if she thought fit, about how I should contrive to live during the long term of my articles when I was earning nothing, about doing something to assist my aunt, and seeing no way of doing anything, about coming down to have no money in my pocket, and to wear a shabby coat, and to be able to carry Dora no little presents, and to ride no gallant greys, and to show myself in no agreeable light. Sordid and selfish as I knew it was, and as I tortured myself by knowing that it was, to let my mind run on my own distress so much, I was so devoted to Dora that I could not help it. I knew that it was base in me not to think more of my aunt and less of myself, but so far selfishness was inseparable from Dora, and I could not put Dora on one side for any mortal creature. How exceedingly miserable I was that night! As to sleep, I had dreams of poverty in all sorts of shapes, but I seemed to dream without the previous ceremony of going to sleep. Now I was ragged, wanting to sell Dora matches, six bundles for a halfpenny. Now I was at the office in a nightgown and boots, remonstrated with by Mr. Spenlow on appearing before the clients in that airy attire. Now I was hungrily picking up the crumbs that fell from old Tiffy's daily biscuit, regularly eaten when St. Paul struck one. Now I was hopelessly endeavouring to get a license to marry Dora, having nothing but one of Uriah Heep's gloves to offer in exchange, which the whole commons rejected, and still, more or less conscious of my own room, I was always tossing about like a distressed ship in a sea of bedclothes. My aunt was restless, too, for I frequently heard her walking to and fro. Two or three times in the course of the night, attired in a long flannel wrapper in which she looked seven feet high, she appeared like a disturbed ghost in my room, 
and came to the side of the sofa on which I lay. On the first occasion I started up in alarm to learn that she inferred from a particular light in the sky that Westminster Abbey was on fire, and to be consulted in reference to the probability of its igniting Buckingham Street in case the wind changed. Lying still after that, I found that she sat down near me, whispering to herself, "'Poor boy!' And then it made me twenty times more wretched to know how unselfishly mindful she was of me, and how selfishly mindful I was of myself. It was difficult to believe that a night so long to me could be short to anybody else. This consideration set me thinking and thinking of an imaginary party where people were dancing the hours away until that became a dream too, and I heard the music incessantly playing one tune, and saw Dora incessantly dancing one dance without taking the least notice of me. The man who had been playing the harp all night was trying in vain to cover it with an ordinary-sized nightcap when I awoke, or I should rather say when I left off trying to go to sleep, and saw the sun shining in through the window at last. There was an old Roman bath in those days at the bottom of one of the streets out of the Strand. It may be there still, in which I have had many a cold plunge. Dressing myself as quietly as I could, and leaving Peggotty to look after my aunt, I tumbled head foremost into it, and then went for a walk to Hampstead. I had a hope that this brisk treatment might freshen my wits a little, and I think it did them good, for I soon came to the conclusion that the first step I ought to take was to try if my articles could be cancelled and the premium recovered. I got some breakfast on the heath and walked back to Doctors' Commons, along the watered roads and through a pleasant smell of summer flowers, growing in gardens and carried into town on hucksters' heads, intent on this first effort to meet our altered circumstances. I arrived at the office so soon after all that I had half an hour's loitering about the commons before old Tiffy, who was always first, appeared with his key. Then I sat down in my shady corner, looking up at the sunlight on the opposite chimney-pots, and thinking about Dora, until Mr. Spenlow came in, crisp and curly. "'How are you, Copperfield?' said he. "'Fine morning.' "'Beautiful morning, sir,' said I. "'Could I say a word to you before you go into court?' "'By all means,' said he. "'Come into my room.' I followed him into his room, and he began putting on his gown, and touching himself up before a little glass he had hanging inside a closet door. "'I am sorry to say,' said I, "'that I have some rather disheartening intelligence from my aunt.' "'No,' said he. "'Dear me, not paralysis, I hope.' "'It has no reference to her health, sir,' I replied. "'She has met with some large losses. "'In fact, she has very little left, indeed.' "'You astound me, Copperfield!' cried Mr. Spenlow. I shook my head. "'Indeed, sir,' said I, "'her affairs are so changed that I wish to ask you whether it would be possible, at a sacrifice on our part of some portion of the premium, of course, I put in this on the spur of the moment, warned by the blank expression of his face, to cancel my articles.' "'What it cost me to make this proposal nobody knows.' It was like asking, as a favour, to be sentenced to transportation from Dora. "'To cancel your articles, Copperfield? Cancel?' I explained with tolerable firmness that I really did not know where my means of subsistence were to come from unless I could earn them for myself. I had no fear for the future, I said, and I laid great emphasis on that, as if to imply that I should still be decidedly eligible for a son-in-law one of these days— but for the present I was thrown upon my own resources. "'I am extremely sorry to hear this, Copperfield,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'Extremely sorry. It is not usual to cancel articles for any such reason. It is not a professional course of proceeding. It is not a convenient precedent at all. Far from it. At the same time—' "'You are very good, sir,' I murmured, anticipating a concession. "'Not at all. Don't mention it,' said Mr. Spenlow. At the same time, I was going to say, if it had been my lot to have my hands unfettered, if I had not a partner, Mr. Jorkins, my hopes were dashed in a moment, but I made another effort. "'Do you think, sir,' said I, "'if I were to mention it to Mr. Jorkins?' Mr. Spenlow shook his head discouragingly. "'Heaven forbid, Copperfield,' he replied, "'that I should do any man an injustice, still less Mr. Jorkins.' 
"'But I know my partner, Copperfield. "'Mr. Jorkins is not a man to respond to a proposition of this peculiar nature. "'Mr. Jorkins is very difficult to move from the beaten track. "'You know what he is.' "'I am sure I knew nothing about him except that he had originally been alone in the business, "'and now lived by himself in a house near Montague Square, "'which was fearfully in want of painting, "'that he came very late of a day and went away very early.' that he never appeared to be consulted about anything, and that he had a dingy little black hole of his own upstairs where no business was ever done, and where there was a yellow old cartridge paper pad upon his desk, unsoiled by ink, and reported to be twenty years of age. "'Would you object to my mentioning it to him, sir?' I asked. "'By no means,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'But I have some experience of Mr. Jorkins, Copperfield. I wish it were otherwise, for I should be happy to meet your views in any respect.' "'I cannot have the objection to your mentioning to Mr. Jorkins, Copperfield, if you think it worth while.' Availing myself of this permission, which was given with a warm shake of the hand, I sat thinking about Dora, and looking at the sunlight stealing from the chimney-pots down the wall of the opposite house, until Mr. Jorkins came. I then went up to Mr. Jorkins's room, and evidently astonished Mr. Jorkins very much by making my appearance there. "'Come in, Mr. Copperfield,' said Mr. Jorkins. "'Come in.' I went in and sat down, and stated my case to Mr. Jorkins pretty much as I had stated it to Mr. Spenlow. Mr. Jorkins was not by any means the awful creature one might have expected, but a large, mild, smooth-faced man of sixty, who took so much snuff that there was a tradition in the commons that he lived principally on that stimulant, having little room in his system for any other article of diet." "'You have mentioned this to Mr. Spenlow, I suppose,' said Mr. Jorkins, when he had heard me very restlessly to an end. I answered yes, and told him that Mr. Spenlow had introduced his name. "'He said I should object?' asked Mr. Jorkins. I was obliged to admit that Mr. Spenlow had considered it probable. "'I am sorry to say, Mr. Copperfield, I can't advance your object,' said Mr. Jorkins nervously. "'The fact is, but I have an appointment at the bank. "'If you'll have the goodness to excuse me.' "'With that he rose in a great hurry and was going out of the room "'when I made bold to say that I feared, then, "'there was no way of arranging the matter.' "'No,' said Mr. Jorkins, stopping at the door to shake his head. "'Oh, no, I object, you know,' which he said very rapidly and went out. "'You must be aware, Mr. Copperfield,' he added, "'looking restlessly in at the door again. "'If Mr. Spenlow objects—' "'Personally, he does not object, sir,' said I. "'Oh, personally,' repeated Mr. Jorkins, in an impatient manner. "'I assure you there's an objection, Mr. Copperfield. "'Hopeless. What you wish to be done can't be done. "'I—I I really have got an appointment at the bank.' "'With that he fairly ran away, and to the best of my knowledge "'it was three days before he showed himself in the commons again. "'Being very anxious to leave no stone unturned, "'I waited until Mr. Spenlow came in, and then described what had passed, giving him to understand that I was not hopeless of his being able to soften the adamantine Jorkins if he would undertake the task. "'Copperfield,' returned Mr. Spenlow, with a gracious smile, "'you have not known my partner, Mr. Jorkins, as long as I have. Nothing is farther from my thoughts than to attribute any degree of artifice to Mr. Jorkins. But Mr. Jorkins has a way of stating his objections which often deceives people.' "'No, Copperfield, shaking his head, Mr. Jorkins is not to be moved, believe me.' I was completely bewildered between Mr. Spenlow and Mr. Jorkins as to which of them really was the objecting partner, but I saw with sufficient clearness that there was obduracy somewhere in the firm, and that the recovery of my aunt's thousand pounds was out of the question. In a state of despondency, which I remember with anything but satisfaction, for I know it still had too much reference to myself, though always in connection with Dora, I left the office and went homeward. I was trying to familiarize my mind with the worst, and to present to myself the arrangements we should have to make for the future in their sternest aspect, when a hackney chariot coming after me and stopping at my very feet occasioned me to look up. A fair hand was stretched forth to me from the window, and the face I had never seen without a feeling of serenity and happiness, from the moment when it first turned back on the old oak staircase with the great broad balustrade, and when I associated its softened beauty with the stained-glass window in the church, was smiling on me. "'Agnes!' I joyfully exclaimed. "'Oh, my dear Agnes, of all people in the world, what a pleasure to see you!' 
"'Is it indeed?' she said in her cordial voice. "'I want to talk to you so much,' said I. "'It's such a lightening of my heart only to look at you. "'If I had had a conjurer's cap, there was no one I should have wished for but you.' "'What?' returned Agnes. "'Well, perhaps Dora first, I admitted with a blush. "'Certainly Dora first, I hope,' said Agnes, laughing. "'But you next,' said I. "'Where are you going?' "'She was going to my rooms to see my aunt. "'The day being very fine, she was glad to come out of the chariot, "'which smelt, I had my head in it all this time, "'like a stable put under a cucumber frame.' I dismissed the coachman, and she took my arm, and we walked on together. She was like hope embodied to me. How different I felt in one short minute having Agnes at my side. My aunt had written her one of the odd abrupt notes, very little longer than a bank note, to which her epistolary efforts were usually limited. She had stated therein that she had fallen into adversity, and was leaving Dover for good, but had quite made up her mind to it, and was so well that nobody need be uncomfortable about her. Agnes had come to London to see my aunt, between whom and herself there had been a mutual liking these many years. Indeed, it dated from the time of my taking up my residence in Mr. Wickfield's house. She was not alone, she said. Her papa was with her, and Uriah Heep. "'And now they are partners,' said I. "'Confound him!' "'Yes,' said Agnes, "'they have some business here, "'and I took advantage of their coming to come too. "'You must not think my visit all friendly and disinterested, Trotwood, "'for I am afraid I may be cruelly prejudiced. "'I do not like to let Papa go away alone with him.' "'Does he exercise the same influence over Mr. Wickfield still, Agnes?' "'Agnes shook her head. "'There is such a change at home,' said she, "'that you would scarcely know the dear old house. "'They live with us now.' Day, said I. "'Mr. Heap and his mother. He sleeps in your old room,' said Agnes, looking up into my face. "'I wish I had the ordering of his dreams,' said I. "'He wouldn't sleep there long.' "'I keep my own little room,' said Agnes, where I used to learn my lessons. "'How the time goes. You remember the little panelled room that opens from the drawing-room?' "'Remember, Agnes?' "'When I saw you for the first time coming out at the door "'with your quaint little basket of keys hanging at your side?' "'It is just the same,' said Agnes, smiling. "'I am glad you think of it so pleasantly. "'We were very happy.' "'We were indeed,' said I. "'I keep that room to myself still, "'but I cannot always desert Mrs. Heap, you know. "'And so,' said Agnes quietly, "'I feel obliged to bear her company "'when I might prefer to be alone.' "'but I have no other reason to complain of her. "'If she tires me sometimes by her praises of her son, "'it is only natural in a mother. "'He is a very good son to her.' "'I looked at Agnes when she said these words, "'without detecting in her any consciousness of Uriah's design. "'Her mild but earnest eyes met mine with their own beautiful frankness, "'and there was no change in her gentle face. "'The chief evil of their presence in the house,' said Agnes, "'is that I cannot be as near Papa as I could wish, "'Uriah Heat being so much between us, "'and cannot watch over him, "'if that is not too bold a thing to say, "'as closely as I would. "'But if any fraud or treachery is practising against him, "'I hope that simple love and truth will be strong in the end. "'I hope that real love and truth are stronger in the end "'than any evil or misfortune in the world.' A certain bright smile, which I never saw on any other face, died away even while I thought how good it was and how familiar it had once been to me. And she asked me, with a quick change of expression—we were drawing very near my street—if I knew how the reverse in my aunt's circumstances had been brought about. On my replying no, she had not told me yet, Agnes became thoughtful, and I fancied I felt her arm tremble in mine. We found my aunt alone in a state of some excitement. A difference of opinion had arisen between herself and Mrs. Crupp on an abstract question, the propriety of chambers being inhabited by the gentler sex, and my aunt, utterly indifferent to spasms on the part of Mrs. Crupp, had cut the dispute short by informing that lady that she smelt of my brandy and that she would trouble her to walk out. Both of these expressions Mrs. Crupp considered actionable, and had expressed her intention of bringing before a British Judy, meaning, it was supposed, the bulwark of our national liberties. 
My aunt, however, having had time to cool while Peggotty was out showing Mr. Dick the soldiers at the horse guards, and being, besides, greatly pleased to see Agnes, rather plumed herself on the affair than otherwise, and received us with unimpaired good humour. When Agnes laid her bonnet on the table, and sat down beside her, I could not but think, looking on her mild eyes and her radiant forehead, how natural it seemed to have her there, how trustfully, although she was so young and inexperienced, my aunt confided in her, how strong she was indeed in simple love and truth. We began to talk about my aunt's losses, and I told them what I had tried to do that morning. "'Which was injudicious, Trot,' said my aunt, but well meant. "'You are a generous boy. I suppose I must say young man now. And I am proud of you, my dear. So far, so good. Now, Trot and Agnes, let us look the case of Betsy Trotwood in the face and see how it stands.' I observed Agnes turn pale as she looked very attentively at my aunt. My aunt, patting her cat, looked very attentively at Agnes. "'Betsy Trotwood,' said my aunt, who had always kept her money matters to herself, "'I don't mean your sister, Trot, my dear, but myself, "'had a certain property, it don't matter how much, enough to live on. "'More, for she had saved a little and added to it. "'Betsy funded her property for some time, "'and then, by the advice of her man of business, "'laid it out on landed security. "'That did very well and returned very good interest, "'till Betsy was paid off.' I am talking of Betsy as if she was a man of war. Well, then Betsy had to look about her for a new investment. She thought she was wiser now than her man of business, who was not such a good man of business by this time as he used to be. I am alluding to your father, Agnes. And she took it into her head to lay it out for herself. So she took her pigs, said my aunt, to a foreign market, and a very bad market it turned out to be. First she lost in the mining way, and then she lost in the diving way, fishing up treasure or some such Tom Tiddler nonsense, explained my aunt, rubbing her nose, and then she lost in the mining way again, and last of all, to set the thing entirely to rights, she lost in the banking way. I don't know what the bank shares were worth for a little while, said my aunt, cent per cent was the lowest of it, I believe, but the bank was at the other end of the world and tumbled into space, for what I know. Anyhow, it fell to pieces, and never will, and never can pay sixpence, and Betsy's sixpences were all there, and there's an end of them. Least said, soonest mended. My aunt concluded this philosophical summary by fixing her eyes with a kind of triumph on Agnes, whose colour was gradually returning. "'Dear Miss Trotwood, is that all the history?' said Agnes. "'I hope it's enough, child,' said my aunt. If there had been more money to lose, it wouldn't have been all, I dare say. Betsy would have contrived to throw that after the rest and make another chapter, I have little doubt. But there was no more money, and there's no more story. Agnes had listened at first with suspended breath. Her colour still came and went, but she breathed more freely. I thought I knew why. I thought she had had some fear that her unhappy father might be in some way to blame for what had happened. My aunt took her hand in hers and laughed. "'Is that all?' repeated my aunt. "'Why, yes, that's all, except—' "'And she lived happy ever afterwards. "'Perhaps I may add that of Betsy yet one of these days. "'Now, Agnes, you have a wise head. "'So have you, Trot, in some things, "'though I can't compliment you always. "'And here my aunt shook her own at me "'with an energy peculiar to herself. "'What's to be done? "'Here's the cottage. "'Taking one time with another will produce, say, seventy pounds a year.' I think we may safely put it down at that. Well, that's all we've got, said my aunt, with whom it was an idiosyncrasy, as it is with some horses, to stop very short when she appeared to be in a fair way of going on for a long while. Then, said my aunt, after a rest, there's Dick. He's good for a hundred a year, but of course that must be expended on himself. I would sooner send him away, though I know I am the only person who appreciates him, than have him and not spend his money on himself. How can Trot and I do best upon our means? What do you say, Agnes? I say, Aunt, I interpose, that I must do something. Go for a soldier, do you mean? returned my aunt, alarmed. Or go to sea? I won't hear of it. You are to be a proctor. We're not going to have any knockings on the head in this family, if you please, sir. 
I was about to explain that I was not desirous of introducing that mode of provision into the family, when Agnes inquired if my rooms were held for any long term. "'You come to the point, my dear,' said my aunt. "'They are not to be got rid of for six months at least, unless they could be underlet, and that I don't believe. The last man died here. Five people out of six would die, of course, of that woman in Nankeen with a flannel petticoat.' I have a little ready money, and I agree with you. The best thing we can do is to live the term out here and get a bedroom hard by. I thought it my duty to hint at the discomfort my aunt would sustain from living in a continual state of guerrilla warfare with Mrs. Crupp, but she disposed of that objection summarily by declaring that on the first demonstration of hostilities she was prepared to astonish Mrs. Crupp for the whole remainder of her natural life. "'I have been thinking, Trotwood,' said Agnes, diffidently, "'that if you had time—' "'I have a good deal of time, Agnes. "'I am always disengaged after four or five o'clock, "'and I have time early in the morning. "'In one way and another,' said I, "'conscious of reddening a little "'as I thought of the hours and hours I had devoted "'to fagging about town and to and fro upon the Norwood Road, "'I have abundance of time.' "'I know you would not mind,' said Agnes, coming to me and speaking in a low voice, so full of sweet and hopeful consideration, that I hear it now, the duties of a secretary. "'Mind, my dear Agnes?' "'Because,' continued Agnes, "'Dr. Strong has acted on his intention of retiring, and has come to live in London, and he asked Papa, I know, if he could recommend him one. Don't you think he would rather have his favourite old pupil near him than anybody else?' "'Dear Agnes,' said I, "'what should I do without you? "'You are always my good angel. "'I told you so. "'I never think of you in any other light.' "'Agnes answered with her pleasant laugh "'that one good angel, meaning Dora, was enough, "'and went on to remind me that the doctor "'had been used to occupy himself in his study "'early in the morning and in the evening, "'and that probably my leisure would suit his requirements very well. "'I was scarcely more delighted with the prospect of earning my own bread than with the hope of earning it under my old master. In short, acting on the advice of Agnes, I sat down and wrote a letter to the doctor, stating my object, and appointing to call on him next day at ten in the forenoon. This I addressed to Highgate, for in that place, so memorable to me, he lived, and went and posted myself without losing a minute. Wherever Agnes was, some agreeable token of her noiseless presence seemed inseparable from the place. When I came back I found my aunt's birds hanging, just as they had hung so long in the parlour window of the cottage, and my easy-chair imitating my aunt's much easier chair in its position at the open window, and even the round green fan, which my aunt had brought away with her, screwed on to the window-sill. I knew who had done all this by its seeming to have quietly done itself, and I should have known in a moment who had arranged my neglected books in the old order of my school-days even if I had supposed Agnes to be miles away, instead of seeing her busy with them, and smiling at the disorder into which they had fallen. My aunt was quite gracious on the subject of the Thames. It really did look very well with the sun upon it, though not like the sea before the cottage. But she could not relent towards the London smoke, which, she said, peppered everything. A complete revolution, in which Peggotty bore a prominent part, was being effected in every corner of my rooms, in regard of this pepper, and I was looking on, thinking how little even Peggotty seemed to do with a good deal of bustle, and how much Agnes did without any bustle at all, when a knock came at the door. "'I think,' said Agnes, turning pale, "'it's Papa. He promised me that he would come.' I opened the door, and admitted, not only Mr. Wickfield, but Uriah Heep. I had not seen Mr. Wickfield for some time. I was prepared for a great change in him, after what I had heard from Agnes, but his appearance shocked me. It was not that he looked many years older, though still dressed with the old scrupulous cleanliness, or that there was an unwholesome ruddiness upon his face, or that his eyes were full and bloodshot, or that there was a nervous trembling in his hand, the cause of which I knew, and had for some years seen at work. It was not that he had lost his good looks or his old bearing of a gentleman, for that he had not. But the thing that struck me most was that with the evidences of his native superiority still upon him, he should submit himself to that crawling impersonation of meanness, Uriah Heep. 
The reversal of the two natures and their relative positions, Uriah's of power and Mr. Wickfield's of dependence, was a sight more painful to me than I can express. If I had seen an ape taking command of a man, I should hardly have thought it a more degrading spectacle. He appeared to be only too conscious of it himself. When he came in, he stood still, and with his head bowed as if he felt it. This was only for a moment, for Agnes softly said to him, "'Papa, here is Miss Trotwood, and Trotwood, whom you have not seen for a long while.' And then he approached, and constrainedly gave my aunt his hand, and shook hands more cordially with me. In the moment's pause I speak of, I saw Uriah's countenance form itself into a most ill-favoured smile. Agnes saw it too, I think, for she shrank from him. What my aunt saw, or did not see, I defy the science of physiognomy to have made out without her own consent. I believe there never was anybody with such an imperturbable countenance when she chose. Her face might have been a dead wall on the occasion in question, for any light it threw upon her thoughts, until she broke silence with her usual abruptness. "'Well, Wickfield,' said my aunt, and he looked up at her for the first time, I have been telling your daughter how well I have been disposing of my money for myself, because I couldn't trust it to you, as you were growing rusty in business matters. We have been taking counsel together and getting on very well, all things considered. Agnes is worth the whole firm, in my opinion. If I may humbly make the remark, said Uriah Heep, with a writhe, I fully agree with Miss Betsy Trotwood, and should be only too happy if Miss Agnes was a partner. You're a partner yourself, you know, returned my aunt. "'And that's about enough for you, I expect. "'How do you find yourself, sir?' "'In acknowledgment of this question addressed to him with extraordinary curtness, "'Mr. Heap, uncomfortably clutching the blue bag he carried, "'replied that he was pretty well. "'He thanked my aunt, and hoped she was the same. "'And you, master, I should say Mr. Copperfield,' pursued Uriah, "'I hope I see you well. "'I am rejoiced to see you, Mr. Copperfield, even under present circumstances.' I believed that, for he seemed to relish them very much. Present circumstances is not what your friends would wish for you, Mr. Copperfield, but it isn't money makes the man, it's— I am really unequal with my humble powers to express what it is, said Uriah, with a fawning jerk, but it isn't money. Here he shook hands with me, not in the common way, but standing at a good distance from me, and lifting my hand up and down like a pump handle, that he was a little afraid of. "'And how do you think we are looking, Master Copperfield? "'I should say Mr. Fond Uriah. "'Don't you find Mr. Wickfield blooming, sir? "'Years don't tell much in our firm, Master Copperfield, "'except in raising up the umble, namely mother and self, "'and in developing,' he added as an afterthought, "'the beautiful, namely Miss Agnes.' "'He jerked himself about after this compliment "'in such an intolerable manner "'that my aunt, who had sat looking straight at him, "'lost all patience.' "'Deuce take the man!' said my aunt sternly. "'What's he about? Don't be galvanic, sir.' "'I ask your pardon, Miss Trotwood,' returned Uriah. "'I'm aware you're nervous.' "'Go along with you, sir,' said my aunt, anything but appeased. "'Don't presume to say so. I am nothing of the sort. "'If you're an eel, sir, conduct yourself like one. "'If you're a man, control your limbs, sir. "'Good God!' said my aunt, with great indignation. "'I am not going to be serpentine and corkscrewed out of my senses.' Mr. Heap was rather abashed, as most people might have been, by this explosion, which derived great additional force from the indignant manner in which my aunt afterwards moved in her chair, and shook her head as if she were making snaps or bounces at him. But he said to me aside, in a meek voice, "'I am well aware, Master Copperfield, that Miss Trotwood, though an excellent lady, has a quick temper. Indeed, I think I had the pleasure of knowing her when I was a numble clerk before you did, Master Copperfield, and it's only natural, I am sure, that it should be made quicker by present circumstances. The wonder is that it isn't much worse. I only called to say that if there was anything we could do in present circumstances, mother or self, or Whitfield and Heath, we should be really glad. I may go so far, said Uriah, with a sickly smile at his partner. Uriah Heap said Mr. Wickfield, in a monotonous forced way, is active in the business, Trotwood. What he says I quite concur in. You know, I had an old interest in you. Apart from that, what Uriah says I quite concur in. Oh, what a reward it is, said Uriah, drawing up one leg at the risk of bringing down upon himself another visitation from my aunt, to be so trusted in. But I hope I am able to do something to relieve him from the fatigues of business, Master Copperfield. 
"'Uriah Heep is a great relief to me,' said Mr. Whitfield, in the same dull voice. "'It's a load off my mind, Trotwood, to have such a partner.' The Red Fox made him say all this, I knew, to exhibit him to me in the light he had indicated on the night when he poisoned my rest. I saw the same ill-favoured smile upon his face again, and saw how he watched me. "'You are not going, Papa,' said Agnes, anxiously. "'Will you not walk back with Trotwood and me?' He would have looked to Uriah, I believe, before replying, if that worthy had not anticipated him. "'I am bespoke myself,' said Uriah, on business. "'Otherwise I should have been happy to have kept with my friends. "'But I leave my partner to represent the firm. "'Miss Agnes, ever yours. "'I wish you good day, Master Copperfield, "'and leave my humble respects for Miss Betsy Trotwood.' "'With those words he retired, "'kissing his great hand and leering at us like a mask. "'We sat there talking about our pleasant old Canterbury days an hour or two. "'Mr. Wickfield, left to Agnes, soon became more like his former self, "'though there was a settled depression upon him which he never shook off. "'For all that he brightened, and had an evident pleasure in hearing us recall "'the little incidents of our old life, many of which he remembered very well. "'He said it was like those times to be alone with Agnes and me again, "'and he wished to heaven they had never changed.' I am sure there was an influence in the placid face of Agnes, and in the very touch of her hand upon his arm, that did wonders for him. My aunt, who was busy nearly all this while with Peggotty in the inner room, would not accompany us to the place where they were staying, but insisted on my going, and I went. We dined together. After dinner Agnes sat beside him as of old, and poured out his wine. He took what she gave him, and no more, like a child and we all three sat together at a window as the evening gathered in. When it was almost dark, he lay down on a sofa, Agnes pillowing his head and bending over him a little while, and when she came back to the window it was not so dark, but I could see tears glittering in her eyes. I pray heaven that I never may forget the dear girl in her love and truth at that time of my life, for if I should I must be drawing near the end, and then I would desire to remember her best." She filled my heart with such good resolutions, strengthened my weakness so by her example, so directed, I know not how, she was too modest and gentle to advise me in many words, the wandering ardour and unsettled purpose within me, that all the little good I have done, and all the harm I have forborne, I solemnly believe I may refer to her. And how she spoke to me of Dora, sitting at the window in the dark, listened to my praises of her, praised again, and round the little fairy figure shed some glimpses of her own pure light that made it yet more precious and more innocent to me. O oh, Agnes, sister of my boyhood, if I had known then what I knew long afterwards! There was a beggar in the street when I went down, and as I turned my head towards the window, thinking of her calm, seraphic eyes, he made me start by muttering, as if he were an echo of the morning, Blind, blind, blind! End of chapter 35「Chapter 36 of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. CHAPTER Thirty Six: ENTHUSIASM I began the next day with another dive into the Roman bath, and then started for Highgate. I was not dispirited now. I was not afraid of the shabby coat, and had no yearnings after gallant greys. My whole manner of thinking of our late misfortune was changed. What I had to do was to show my aunt that her past goodness to me had not been thrown away on an insensible, ungrateful object. What I had to do was to turn the painful discipline of my younger days to account by going to work with a resolute and steady heart. What I had to do was to take my woodman's axe in my hand and clear my own way through the forest of difficulty by cutting down the trees until I came to Dora. And I went on at a mighty rate, as if it could be done by walking. When I found myself on the familiar Highgate Road, pursuing such a different errand from that old one of pleasure, with which it was associated. It seemed as if a complete change had come on my whole life. But that did not discourage me. 
With the new life came new purpose, new intention. Great was the labour, priceless the reward. Dora was the reward, and Dora must be won. I got into such a transport that I felt quite sorry my coat was not a little shabby already. I wanted to be cutting at those trees in the forest of difficulty, under circumstances that should prove my strength. I had a good mind to ask an old man in wire spectacles, who was breaking stones upon the road, to lend me his hammer for a little while, and let me begin to beat a path to Dora out of granite. I stimulated myself into such a heat, and got so out of breath, that I felt as if I had been earning I don't know how much. In this state I went into a cottage that I saw was to let, and examined it narrowly, for I felt it necessary to be practical. It would do for me and Dora admirably, with a little front garden for Jip to run about in, and bark at the tradespeople through the railings, and a capital room upstairs for my aunt. I came out again, hotter and faster than ever, and dashed up to Highgate at such a rate that I was there an hour too early, and though I had not been, should have been obliged to stroll about to cool myself before I was at all presentable. My first care, after putting myself under this necessary course of preparation, was to find the doctor's house. It was not in that part of Highgate where Mrs. Steerforth lived, but quite on the opposite side of the little town. When I had made this discovery, I went back, in an attraction I could not resist, to a lane by Mrs. Steerforth's, and looked over the corner of the garden wall. His room was shut up close. The conservatory doors were standing open, and Rosa Dartle was walking, bareheaded, with a quick impetuous step, up and down a gravel walk on one side of the lawn. She gave me the idea of some fierce thing that was dragging the length of its chain to and fro upon a beaten track and wearing its heart out. I came softly away from my place of observation, and avoiding that part of the neighborhood and wishing I had not gone near it, strolled about until it was ten o'clock. The church with the slender spire that stands on the top of the hill now was not there then to tell me the time. An old red-brick mansion, used as a school, was in its place, and a fine old house it must have been to go to school at, as I recollect it. When I approached the doctor's cottage, a pretty old place, on which he seemed to have expended some money, if I might judge from the embellishments and repairs that had the look of being just completed, I saw him walking in the garden at the side, gaiters and all, as if he had never left off walking since the days of my pupilage. He had his old companions about him, too, for there were plenty of high trees in the neighborhood, and two or three rooks were on the grass, looking after him, as if they had been written to about him by the Canterbury rooks, and were observing him closely in consequence. Knowing the utter hopelessness of attracting his attention from that distance, I made bold to open the gate and walk after him, so as to meet him when he should turn round. When he did, and came towards me, he looked at me thoughtfully for a few moments, evidently without thinking about me at all, and then his benevolent face expressed extraordinary pleasure, and he took me by both hands. "'Why, my dear Copperfield,' said the doctor, "'you are a man. How do you do? I am delighted to see you. My dear Copperfield, how very much you have improved. You are quite—yes, dear me. I hoped he was well, and Mrs. Strong, too.' "'Oh, dear, yes,' said the doctor. "'Annie's quite well, and she'll be delighted to see you. "'You were always her favourite. "'She said so last night when I showed her your letter. "'And yes, to be sure, you recollect Mr. Jack Malden, Copperfield?' "'Perfectly, sir.' "'Of course,' said the doctor, to be sure. "'He's pretty well, too.' "'Has he come home, sir?' I inquired. "'From India?' said the doctor. "'Yes. Mr. Jack Malden couldn't bear the climate, my dear.' "'Mrs. Markleham, you have not forgotten Mrs. Markleham. "'Forgotten the old soldier, and in that short time? "'Mrs. Markleham, said the doctor, was quite vexed about him, poor thing. "'So we have got him at home again, and we have bought him a little patent place, "'which agrees with him much better. "'I knew enough of Mr. Jack Malden to suspect from this account "'that it was a place where there was not much to do, and which was pretty well paid.' The doctor, walking up and down with his hand on my shoulder, and his kind face turned encouragingly to mine, went on. "'Now, my dear Copperfield, in reference to this proposal of yours, it's very gratifying and agreeable to me, I am sure. But don't you think you could do better? You achieved distinction, you know, when you were with us. You are qualified for many good things. 
you have laid a foundation that any edifice may be raised upon. And is it not a pity that you should devote the springtime of your life to such a poor pursuit as I can offer? I became very glowing again, and expressing myself in a rhapsodical style, I am afraid, urged my request strongly, reminding the doctor that I had already a profession. "'Well, well,' said the doctor, "'that's true. Certainly your having a profession and being actually engaged in studying it makes a difference. But, my good young friend, what's seventy pounds a year?' "'It doubles our income, Dr. Strong,' said I. "'Dear me,' replied the doctor, "'to think of that. "'Not that I mean to say it's rigidly limited to seventy pounds a year, "'because I have always contemplated making any young friend "'I might thus employ a present, too. "'Undoubtedly,' said the doctor, "'still walking me up and down with his hand on my shoulder, "'I have always taken an annual present into account. "'My dear tutor,' said I, "'now really without any nonsense,' "'to whom I owe more obligations already than I ever can acknowledge.' "'No, no,' interposed the doctor. "'Pardon me. "'If you will take such time as I have, and that is my mornings and evenings, "'and can think it worth seventy pounds a year, "'you will do me such a service as I cannot express.' "'Dear me,' said the doctor innocently, "'to think that so little should go for so much. "'Dear, dear, and when you can do better you will, on your word now,' said the doctor, which he had always made a very grave appeal to the honour of us boys. "'On my word, sir,' I returned, answering in our old school manner. "'Then be it so,' said the doctor, clapping me on the shoulder, and still keeping his hand there as we still walked up and down. "'And I shall be twenty times happier, sir,' said I, with a little, I hope, innocent flattery, "'if my employment is to be on the dictionary.' The doctor stopped, smilingly clapped me on the shoulder again, and exclaimed, with a triumph most delightful to behold, as if I had penetrated to the profoundest depths of mortal sagacity, "'My dear young friend, you have hit it. It is the dictionary!' How could it be anything else? His pockets were as full of it as his head. It was sticking out of him in all directions. He told me that since his retirement from scholastic life he had been advancing with it wonderfully and that nothing could suit him better than the proposed arrangements for morning and evening work, as it was his custom to walk about in the daytime with his considering cap on. His papers were in a little confusion, in consequence of Mr. Jack Malden having lately proffered his occasional surfaces as an amanuensis, and not being accustomed to that occupation. But we should soon put right what was amiss, and go on swimmingly. Afterwards, when we were fairly at our work, I found Mr. Jack Malden's efforts more troublesome to me than I had expected, as he had not confined himself to making numerous mistakes, but had sketched so many soldiers and ladies' heads over the doctor's manuscript that I often became involved in labyrinths of obscurity. The doctor was quite happy in the prospect of our going to work together on that wonderful performance, and we settled to begin next morning at seven o'clock. We were to work two hours every morning, and two or three hours every night, except on Saturdays, when I was to rest. On Sundays, of course, I was to rest also, and I considered these very easy terms. Our plans being thus arranged to our mutual satisfaction, the doctor took me into the house to present me to Mrs. Strong, whom we found in the doctor's new study, dusting his books, a freedom which he never permitted anybody else to take with those sacred favourites. They had postponed their breakfast on my account, and we sat down to table together. We had not been seated long when I saw an approaching arrival in Mrs. Strong's face before I heard any sound of it. A gentleman on horseback came to the gate, and leading his horse into the little court, with the bridle over his arm, as if he were quite at home, tied him to a ring in the empty coach-house wall, and came into the breakfast parlour whip in hand. It was Mr. Jack Malden and Mr. Jack Malden was not at all improved by India, I thought. I was not in a state of ferocious virtue, however, as to young men who were not cutting down trees in the forest of difficulty, and my impression must be received with due allowance. "'Mr. Jack,' said the doctor, "'Copperfield.' Mr. Jack Malden shook hands with me, but not very warmly, I believed, and with an air of languid patronage, at which I secretly took great umbrage.' but his languor altogether was quite a wonderful sight, except when he addressed himself to his cousin Annie. "'Have you breakfasted this morning, Mr. Jack?' said the doctor. "'I hardly ever take breakfast, sir,' he replied, with his head thrown back in an easy chair. 
I find it bores me. Is there any news today? inquired the doctor. Nothing at all, sir, replied Mr. Malden. There's an account about the people being hungry and discontented down in the north, but they are always being hungry and discontented somewhere. The doctor looked grave and said, as though he wished to change the subject, Then there's no news at all. And no news, they say, is good news. There's a long statement in the papers, sir, about a murder, observed Mr. Malden. But somebody is always being murdered, and I didn't read it. A display of indifference to all the actions and passions of mankind was not supposed to be such a distinguished quality at that time, I think, as I have observed it to be considered since. I have known it very fashionable, indeed. I have seen it displayed with such success that I have encountered some fine ladies and gentlemen who might as well have been born caterpillars. Perhaps it impressed me the more, then, because it was new to me, but it certainly did not tend to exalt my opinion of, or to strengthen my confidence in, Mr. Jack Malden. "'I came out to inquire whether Annie would like to go to the opera to-night,' said Mr. Malden, turning to her. "'It's the last good night there will be this season, and there's a singer there whom she really ought to hear. She is perfectly exquisite. Besides which, she is so charmingly ugly.' relapsing into languor. The doctor, ever pleased with what was likely to please his young wife, turned to her and said, "'You must go, Annie, you must go.' "'I would rather not,' she said to the doctor. "'I prefer to remain at home. I would much rather remain at home.' Without looking at her cousin, she then addressed me, and asked me about Agnes, and whether she should see her, and whether she was not likely to come that day, and was so much disturbed that I wondered how even the doctor, buttering his toast, could be blind to what was so obvious. But he saw nothing. He told her, good-naturedly, that she was young, and ought to be amused and entertained, and must not allow herself to be made dull by a dull old fellow. Moreover, he said, he wanted to hear her sing all the new singer's songs to him, and how could she do that well unless she went? So the doctor persisted in making the engagement for her, and Mr. Jack Malden was to come back to dinner. This concluded, he went to his patent place, I suppose, but at all events went away on his horse, looking very idle. I was curious to find out next morning whether she had been. She had not, but had sent into London to put her cousin off, and had gone out in the afternoon to see Agnes, and had prevailed upon the doctor to go with her. And they had walked home by the fields, the doctor told me, the evening being delightful. I wondered then whether she would have gone if Agnes had not been in town, and whether Agnes had some good influence over her, too. She did not look very happy, I thought, but it was a good face, or a very false one. I often glanced at it, for she sat in the window all the time we were at work, and made our breakfast, which we took by snatches as we were employed. When I left at nine o'clock, she was kneeling on the ground at the doctor's feet, putting on his shoes and gaiters for him. There was a softened shade upon her face, thrown from some green leaves overhanging the open window of the low room, and I thought all the way to Doctor's Commons of the night when I had seen it looking at him as he read. I was pretty busy now, up at five in the morning and home at nine or ten at night, but I had infinite satisfaction in being so closely engaged, and never walked slowly on any account, and felt enthusiastically that the more I tired myself, the more I was doing to deserve Dora. I had not revealed myself in my altered character to Dora yet, because she was coming to see Miss Mills in a few days, and I deferred all I had to tell her until then, merely informing her in my letters, all our communications were secretly forwarded through Miss Mills, that I had much to tell her. In the meantime I put myself on a short allowance of bear's grease, wholly abandoned scented soap and lavender water, and sold off three waistcoats at a prodigious sacrifice as being too luxurious for my stern career. Not satisfied with all these proceedings, but burning with impatience to do something more, I went to see Traddles, now lodging up behind the parapet of a house in Castle Street, Holborn. Mr. Dick, who had been with me to Highgate twice already, and had resumed his companionship with the doctor, I took with me. I took Mr. Dick with me because, acutely sensitive to my aunt's reverses, and sincerely believing that no galley slave or convict worked as I did, he had begun to fret and worry himself out of spirits and appetite as having nothing useful to do. In this condition he felt more incapable of finishing the memorial than ever, 
and the harder he worked at it, the oftener that unlucky head of King Charles I got into it. Seriously apprehending that his malady would increase, unless we put some innocent deception upon him, and caused him to believe that he was useful, or unless we could put him in the way of being really useful, which would be better, I made up my mind to try if Traddles could help us. Before we went, I wrote Traddles a full statement of all that had happened, and Traddles wrote me back a capital answer, expressive of his sympathy and friendship. We found him hard at work with his inkstand and papers, refreshed by the sight of the flower-pot stand and the little round table in a corner of the small apartment. He received us cordially, and made friends with Mr. Dick in a moment. Mr. Dick professed an absolute certainty of having seen him before, and we both said, very likely, The first subject on which I had to consult Traddles was this. I had heard that many men distinguished in various pursuits had begun life by reporting the debates in Parliament. Traddles having mentioned newspapers to me as one of his hopes, I had put the two things together, and told Traddles in my letter that I wished to know how I could qualify myself for this pursuit. Traddles now informed me, as the result of his inquiries, that the mere mechanical acquisition necessary, except in rare cases, for thorough excellence in it, that is to say a perfect and entire command of the mystery of shorthand writing and reading, was about equal in difficulty to the mastery of six languages, and that it might perhaps be attained by dint of perseverance in the course of a few years. Traddles reasonably supposed that this would settle the business, but I, only feeling that here indeed were a few tall trees to be hewn down, immediately resolved to work my way on to Dora through this thicket, axe in hand. "'I am very much obliged to you, my dear Traddles,' said I. "'I'll begin to-morrow.' Traddles looked astonished, as he well might, but he had no notion as yet of my rapturous condition. "'I'll buy a book,' said I, "'with a good scheme of this art in it. "'I'll work at it at the Commons, where I haven't half enough to do. "'I'll take down the speeches in our court for practice. "'Traddles, my dear fellow, I'll master it.' "'Dear me,' said Traddles, opening his eyes, "'I had no idea you were such a determined character, Copperfield. "'I don't know how he should have had, for it was new enough to me. "'I passed that off and brought Mr. Dick on the carpet. "'You see,' said Mr. Dick wistfully, "'if I could exert myself, Mr. Traddles, "'if I could beat a drum or blow anything. "'Poor fellow, I have little doubt "'he would have preferred such an employment in his heart to all others. "'Traddles, who would not have smiled for the world, "'replied composedly, "'But you are a very good penman, sir. "'You told me so, Copperfield.' "'Excellent,' said I. "'And, indeed, he was. "'He wrote with extraordinary neatness.' "'Don't you think,' said Traddles, "'you could copy writings, sir, if I got them for you?' "'Mr. Dick looked doubtfully at me. "'Eh, Trotwood?' "'I shook my head. "'Mr. Dick shook his and sighed. "'Tell him about the memorial,' said Mr. Dick. "'I explained to Traddles that there was a difficulty "'in keeping King Charles the First out of Mr. Dick's manuscripts. Mr. Dick, in the meanwhile, looking very deferentially and seriously at Traddles, and sucking his thumb. "'But these writings, you know, that I speak of, are already drawn up and finished,' said Traddles, after a little consideration. "'Mr. Dick has nothing to do with them. Wouldn't that make a difference, Copperfield? At all events, wouldn't it be well to try?' This gave us new hope. Traddles and I, laying our heads together apart, while Mr. Dick anxiously watched us from his chair, we concocted a scheme in virtue of which we got him to work next day with triumphant success. On a table by the window in Buckingham Street, we set out the work Traddles procured for him, which was to make, I forget how many copies, of a legal document about some right-of-way, and on another table we spread the last unfinished original of the great memorial. Our instructions to Mr. Dick, were that he should copy exactly what he had before him, without the least departure from the original, and that when he felt it necessary to make the slightest allusion to King Charles I, he should fly to the memorial. We exhorted him to be resolute in this, and left my aunt to observe him. My aunt reported to us afterwards that at first he was like a man playing the kettle-drums, and constantly divided his attentions between the two, but that finding this confuse and fatigue him, and having his copy there plainly before his eyes, he soon sat at it in an orderly business-like manner, and postponed the memorial to a more convenient time. In a word, 
although we took great care that he should have no more to do than was good for him, and although he did not begin with the beginning of a week, he earned by the following Saturday night ten shillings and ninepence, and never while I live shall I forget his going about to all the shops in the neighbourhood to change this treasure into sixpences, or his bringing them to my aunt arranged in the form of a heart upon a waiter, with tears of joy and pride in his eyes. He was like one under the propitious influence of a charm, from the moment of his being usefully employed. And if there were a happy man in the world that Saturday night, it was the grateful creature who thought my aunt the most wonderful woman in existence, and me the most wonderful young man. "'No starving now, Trotwood,' said Mr. Dick, shaking hands with me in a corner. "'I'll provide for her, sir.' and he flourished his ten fingers in the air as if they were ten banks. I hardly know which was the better pleased, Traddles or I. It really, said Traddles, suddenly taking a letter out of his pocket and giving it to me, put Mr. Micawber quite out of my head. The letter, Mr. Micawber never missed any possible opportunity of writing a letter, was addressed to me, by the kindness of T. Traddles, Esquire, of the Inner Temple. It ran thus. My dear Copperfield, you may possibly not be unprepared to receive the intimation that something has turned up. I may have mentioned to you on a former occasion that I was in expectation of such an event. I am about to establish myself in one of the provincial towns of our favoured island, where the society may be described as a happy admixture of the agricultural and the clerical, in immediate connection with one of the learned professions. Mrs. Micawber and our offspring will accompany me. Our ashes, at a future period, will probably be found commingled in a cemetery attached to a venerable pile, for which the spot to which I refer has acquired a reputation. Shall I say from China to Peru? In bidding adieu to the modern Babylon, where we have undergone many vicissitudes, I trust not ignobly. Mrs. Micawber and myself cannot disguise from our minds that we part— it may be for years, and it may be for ever, with an individual linked by strong associations to the altar of our domestic life. If, on the eve of such a departure, you will accompany our mutual friend, Mr. Thomas Traddles, to our present abode, and there reciprocate the wishes natural to the occasion, you will confer a boon on one who is ever yours, Wilkins Micawber. I was glad to find that Mr. Micawber had got rid of his dust and ashes, and that something really had turned up at last. Learning from Traddles that the invitation referred to the evening then wearing away, I expressed my readiness to do honour to it, and we went off together to the lodging which Mr. Micawber occupied as Mr. Mortimer, and which was situated near the top of the Gray's Inn Road. The resources of this lodging were so limited that we found the twins, now some eight or nine years old, reposing in a turn-up bedstead in the family sitting-room, where Mr. Micawber had prepared, in a wash-hand-stand jug, what he called a brew of the agreeable beverage for which he was famous. I had the pleasure on this occasion of renewing the acquaintance of Master Micawber, whom I found a promising boy of about twelve or thirteen, very subject to that restlessness of limb which is not an unfrequent phenomenon in youths of his age. I also became once more known to his sister, Miss Micawber, in whom, as Mr. Micawber told us, her mother renewed her youth like the phoenix. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, "'yourself and Mr. Traddles find us on the brink of migration, and will excuse any little discomforts incidental to that position.' Glancing round, as I made a suitable reply, I observed that the family effects were already packed, and that the amount of luggage was by no means overwhelming." I congratulated Mrs. Micawber on the approaching change. "'My dear Mr. Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'of your friendly interest in all our affairs I am well assured. My family may consider it banishment, if they please, but I am a wife and mother, and I never will desert Mr. Micawber.' Traddles, appealed to by Mrs. Micawber's eye, feelingly acquiesced. "'That,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'that, at least, is my view, my dear Mr. Copperfield,' and Mr. Traddles, of the obligation which I took upon myself when I repeated the irrevocable words, I, Emma, take thee Wilkins. I read the service over with a flat candle on the previous night, and the conclusion I derived from it was that I never could desert Mr. Micawber. And, said Mrs. Micawber, 
though it is possible I may be mistaken in my view of the ceremony, I never will. My dear, said Mr. Micawber, a little impatiently, I am not conscious that you are expected to do anything of the sort. I am aware, my dear Mr. Copperfield, pursued Mrs. Micawber, that I am now about to cast my lot among strangers, and I am also aware that the various members of my family, to whom Mr. Micawber has written in the most gentlemanly terms, announcing that fact, have not taken the least notice of Mr. Micawber's communication. Indeed, I may be superstitious, said Mrs. Micawber, but it appears to me that Mr. Micawber is destined never to receive any answers whatever to the great majority of the communications he writes. I may augur from the silence of my family that they object to the resolution I have taken, but I should not allow myself to be swerved from the path of duty, Mr. Copperfield, even by my papa and mamma, were they still living. I expressed my opinion that this was going in the right direction. It may be a sacrifice, said Mrs. Micawber, to immure oneself in a cathedral town, but surely, Mr. Copperfield, if it is a sacrifice in me, it is much more a sacrifice than a man of Mr. Micawber's abilities. "'Oh, you are going to a cathedral town,' said I. Mr. Micawber, who had been helping us all out of the wash-hand stand jug, replied, "'To Canterbury. In fact, my dear Copperfield, I have entered into arrangements, by virtue of which I stand pledged and contracted to our friend Heap, to assist and serve him in the capacity of, and to be, his confidential clerk.' I stared at Mr. Micawber, who greatly enjoyed my surprise. "'I am bound to state to you,' he said, with an official air, "'that the business habits and the prudent suggestions of Mrs. Micawber "'have in a great measure conduced to this result.' "'The gauntlet to which Mrs. Micawber referred upon a former occasion, "'being thrown down in the form of an advertisement, "'was taken up by my friend Heep, and led to mutual recognition. "'Of my friend Heep,' said Mr. Micawber, who is a man of remarkable shrewdness, I desire to speak with all possible respect. My friend Heap has not fixed the positive remuneration at too high a figure, but he has made a great deal in the way of extrication from the pressure of pecuniary difficulties contingent on the value of my services, and on the value of those services I pin my faith. Such address and intelligence as I chance to possess, said Mr. Micawber, boastfully disparaging himself with the old genteel air, will be devoted to my friend Heap's service. I have already some acquaintance with the law, as a defendant on civil process, and I shall immediately apply myself to the commentaries of one of the most eminent and remarkable of our English jurists. I believe it is unnecessary to add that I allude to Mr. Justice Blackstone. These observations, and indeed the greater part of the observations made that evening, were interrupted by Mrs. Micawber's discovering that Master Micawber was sitting on his boots, or holding his head on with both arms as if he felt it loose, or accidentally kicking traddles under the table, or shuffling his feet over one another, or producing them at distances from himself apparently outrageous to nature, or lying sideways with his hair among the wine-glasses, or developing his restlessness of limb in some other form incompatible with the general interests of society, and by Master Micawber's receiving those discoveries in a resentful spirit." I sat all the while amazed by Mr. Micawber's disclosure, and wondering what it meant, until Mrs. Micawber resumed the thread of the discourse, and claimed my attention. "'What I particularly request Mr. Carver to be careful of is,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'that he does not, my dear Copperfield, in applying himself to this subordinate branch of the law, place it out of his power to rise ultimately to the top of the tree. I am convinced that Mr. Micawber, giving his mind to a profession so adapted to his fertile resources and his flow of language, must distinguish himself. Now, for example, Mr. Traddles, said Mrs. Micawber, assuming a profound air, a judge, or even, say, a chancellor, does an individual place himself beyond the pale of those preferments by entering on such an office as Mr. Micawber has accepted? My dear, observed Mr. Micawber, but glancing inquisitively at Traddles, too, we have time enough before us for the consideration of those questions. Micawber, she returned, no, your mistake in life is that you do not look forward far enough. You are bound in justice to your family, if not to yourself, to take in at a comprehensive glance the extremest point in the horizon to which your abilities may lead you. Mr. Micawber coughed and drank his punch with an air of exceeding satisfaction, 
still glancing at Traddles as if he desired to have his opinion. "'Why, the plain state of the case, Mrs. Micawber,' said Traddles, mildly breaking the truth to her. "'I mean the real prosaic fact, you know.' "'Just so,' said Mrs. Micawber. "'My dear Mr. Traddles, I wish to be as prosaic and literal as possible on a subject of so much importance.' "'Is,' said Traddles, "'that this branch of the law, even if Mr. Micawber were a regular solicitor—' "'Exactly so,' returned Mrs. Micawber. "'Wilkins, you are squinting, and will not be able to get your eyes back. "'Has nothing,' pursued Traddles, "'to do with that. "'Only a barrister is eligible for such preferments, "'and Mr. Micawber could not be a barrister "'without being entered at an inn of court as a student for five years. "'Do I follow you?' said Mrs. Micawber, "'with her most affable air of business. "'Do I understand, my dear Mr. Traddles?' that at the expiration of that period Mr. Micawber would be eligible as a judge or chancellor? "'He would be eligible,' returned Traddles, with a strong emphasis on that word. "'Thank you,' said Mrs. Micawber. "'That is quite sufficient. If such is the case, and Mr. Micawber forfeits no privilege by entering on these duties, my anxiety is set at rest. I speak,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'as a female necessarily,' "'but I have always been of opinion that Mr. Micawber possesses "'what I have heard my papa call, when I lived at home, the judicial mind, "'and I hope Mr. Micawber is now entering on a field "'where that mind will develop itself and take a commanding station. "'I quite believe that Mr. Micawber saw himself, in his judicial mind's eye, on the woolsack. "'He passed his hand complacently over his bald head, "'and said, with ostentatious resignation, "'My dear!' We will not anticipate the decrees of fortune. If I am reserved to wear a wig, I am at least prepared externally, in allusion to his baldness, for that distinction. I do not, said Mr. Micawber, regret my hair, and I may have been deprived of it for a specific purpose. I cannot say. It is my intention, my dear Copperfield, to educate my son for the church. I will not deny that I should be happy on his account to attain to eminence. For the church, said I, "'still pondering between whiles on Uriah Heep. "'Yes,' said Mr. Micawber. "'He has a remarkable head-voice, and will commence as a chorister. "'Our residence at Canterbury and our local connection will, no doubt, "'enable him to take advantage of any vacancy that may arise in the cathedral corps. "'On looking at Master Micawber again, "'I saw that he had a certain expression of face, "'as if his voice were behind his eyebrows, where it presently appeared to be,' on his singing us, as an alternative between that and bed, the woodpecker tapping. After many compliments on this performance, we fell into some general conversation, and as I was too full of my desperate intentions to keep my altered circumstances to myself, I made them known to Mr. and Mrs. Micawber. I cannot express how extremely delighted they both were by the idea of my aunt's being in difficulties, and how comfortable and friendly it made them. When we were nearly come to the last round of the punch, I addressed myself to Traddles, and reminded him that we must not separate without wishing our friends health, happiness, and success in their new career. I begged Mr. Micawber to fill us bumpers, and proposed the toast in due form, shaking hands with him across the table, and kissing Mrs. Micawber to commemorate that eventful occasion. Traddles imitated me in the first particular, but did not consider himself a sufficiently old friend to venture on the second. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, rising with one of his thumbs in each of his waistcoat pockets, "'the companion of my youth, if I may be allowed the expression, and my esteemed friend Traddles, if I may be permitted to call him so, will allow me, on the part of Mrs. Micawber, myself, and our offspring, to thank them in the warmest and most uncompromising terms for their good wishes.' It may be expected that on the eve of a migration, which will consign us to a perfectly new existence, Mr. Micawber spoke as if they were going five hundred thousand miles, I should offer a few valedictory remarks to two such friends as I see before me. But all that I have to say in this way I have said. Whatever station in society I may attain, through the medium of the learned profession of which I am about to become an unworthy member, I shall endeavour not to disgrace— and Mrs. Micawber will be safe to adorn. Under the temporary pressure of pecuniary liabilities, contracted with a view to their immediate liquidation, but remaining unliquidated through a combination of circumstances, I have been under the necessity of assuming a garb from which my natural instincts recoil. 
I allude to spectacles, and possessing myself of a cognomen to which I can establish no legitimate pretensions. All I have to say on that score is that the cloud has passed from the dreary scene, and the god of day is once more high upon the mountain tops. On Monday next, on the arrival of the four o'clock afternoon coach at Canterbury, my foot will be on my native heath. My name, Micawber. Mr. Micawber resumed his seat on the close of these remarks, and drank two glasses of punch in grave succession. He then said, with much solemnity, "'One thing more I have to do before this separation is complete, and that is to perform an act of justice. My friend, Mr. Thomas Traddles, has, on two several occasions, put his name, if I may use a common expression, to bills of exchange for my accommodation.' On the first occasion, Mr. Thomas Traddles was left, let me say, in short, in the lurch. The fulfilment of the second has not yet arrived. The amount of the first obligation, here Mr. Micawber carefully referred to the papers, was, I believe, twenty-three, four, nine, and a half. Of the second, according to my entry of that transaction, eighteen, six, two. These sums, united, make a total, if my calculation is correct, amounting to forty-one, ten, eleven, and a half. My friend Copperfield will perhaps do me the favour to check that total. I did so, and found it correct. To leave this metropolis, said Mr. Micawber, and my friend Mr. Thomas Traddles, without acquitting myself of the pecuniary part of this obligation, would weigh upon my mind to an insupportable extent. I have therefore prepared for my friend Mr. Thomas Traddles, and I now hold in my hand a document which accomplishes the desired object. I beg to hand to my friend Mr. Thomas Traddles my I.O.U. for forty-one, ten, eleven and a half, and I am happy to recover my moral dignity and to know that I can once more walk erect before my fellow man. With this introduction, which greatly affected him, Mr. Micawber placed his I.O.U. in the hands of Traddles and said he wished him well in every relation of life. I am persuaded, not only that this was quite the same to Mr. Micawber as paying the money, but that Traddles himself hardly knew the difference until he had had time to think about it. Mr. Micawber walked so erect before his fellow man, on the strength of this virtuous action, that his chest looked half as broad again when he lighted us downstairs. We parted with great heartiness on both sides, and when I had seen Traddles to his own door, and was going home alone, I thought, among the other odd and contradictory things I mused upon, that slippery as Mr. Micawber was, I was probably indebted to some compassionate recollection he retained of me as his boy lodger, for never having been asked by him for money. I certainly should not have had the moral courage to refuse it, and I have no doubt he knew that, to his credit be it written, quite as well as I did. End of chapter 36 Recorded by Deborah Lynn Chapter thirty seven of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Noonday. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty seven A Little Cold Water. My new life had lasted for more than a week and I was stronger than ever in those tremendous practical resolutions that I felt the crisis required. I continued to walk extremely fast, and to have a general idea that I was getting on. I made it a rule to take as much out of myself as I possibly could, in my way of doing everything to which I applied my energies. I made a perfect victim of myself. I even entertained some idea of putting myself on a vegetable diet, vaguely conceiving that, in becoming a grimnivorous animal, I should sacrifice to Dora. As yet little Dora was quite unconscious of my desperate firmness, otherwise than as my letters darkly shadowed it forth. But another Saturday came, and on that Saturday evening she was to beat Miss Millis, and when Mr. Millis had gone to his whist club, telegraphed to me in the street by a birdcage in the drawing-room middle window, I was to go there to tea. 
by this time you were quite settled down in buckingham street where mr dick continued his copying in a state of absolute felicity my aunt had obtained the signal victory over mrs crupp by paying her off throwing the first pitcher she planted on the stairs out of the window and protecting in person up and down the staircase a supernumerary whom she engaged from the outer world these vigorous measures struck such terror to the breast of mrs crupp that she subsided into her own kitchen under the impression that my aunt was mad my aunt being supremely indifferent to mrs crupp's opinion and everybody else's and rather favouring than discouraging the idea mrs crupp of late the bold became within a few days so faint-hearted that rather than encounter my aunt upon the staircase she would endeavour to hide her portly form behind doors leaving visible however a wide margin of flannel petticoat or would shrink into dark corners this gave my aunt such unspeakable satisfaction that i believe she took a delight in prowling up and down with her bonnet insanely perched on the top of her head at times when mrs crupp was likely to be in the way my aunt being uncommonly neat and ingenious made so many little improvements in our domestic arrangements that i seemed to be richer instead of poorer among the rest she converted the pantry into a dressing-room for me and purchased and embellished a bedstead for my occupation which looked like a bookcase in the daytime i was the object of her constant solicitude and my poor mother herself could not have loved better or studied more how to make me happy peggotty had considered herself highly privileged in being allowed to participate in these labors and although she still retained something of her old sentiment of awe in reference to my aunt had received so many marks of encouragement and confidence that they were the best friends possible but the time had now come i am speaking of the saturday when i was to take tea at miss mills when it was necessary for her to return home and enter on the discharge of the duties she had undertaken in behalf of ham so good-bye barkies said my aunt and take care of yourself i am sure i never thought i could be sorry to lose you i took peggotty to the coach office and saw her off she cried at parting and confided her brother to my friendship as ham had done we had heard nothing of him since he went away that sunny afternoon and now my own dear davy said peggotty if while you're apprentice you should want any money to spend or if when you're out of your time my dear you should want any to set you up and you must do one or other or both my darling who has such a good right to ask leave to lend it to you as my sweet girl's own old stupid me i was not so savagely independent as to say anything in reply but that if i ever borrowed money of any one i would borrow it of her next to accepting a large sum on the spot i believe this gave peggotty more comfort than anything i could have done and my dear whispered peggotty tell the pretty little angel that i should so have liked to see her only for a minute and tell her that before she marries my boy i'll come and make your house so beautiful for you if you let me i declared that nobody else should touch it and this gave peggotty such delight that she went away in good spirits i fatigued myself as much as i possibly could in the commons all day by a variety of devices and at the appointed time in the evening repaired to mr millis's street mr millis who was a terrible fellow to fall asleep after dinner was not yet gone out and there was no birdcage in the middle window he kept waiting so long that i fervently hoped the club would fine him for being late at last he came out and then i saw my own door hang up the birdcage and peep into the balcony to look for me and run in again when she saw i was there while jip remained behind to bark injuriously at an immense butcher's dog in the street who would have taken him like a pill dora came to the drawing-room door to meet me and jip came scrambling out tumbling over his own growls under the impression that i was a bandit and we all three went in as happy and loving as could be i soon carried desolation into the bosom of our joys not that i meant to do it but that i was so full of the subject by asking dora without the smallest preparation if she could love a beggar my pretty little startled dora 
her only association with the word was a yellow face in a nightcap or a pair of crutches or a wooden leg or a dog with a decanter stand in his mouth or something of that kind and she stared at me with the most delightful wonder how can you ask me anything so foolish pouted dora love a beggar dora my own dearest said i i am a beggar how can you be such a silly thing replied dora slapping my hand asked to sit there telling such stories i'll make you bite you her childish way was the most delicious way in the world to me but it was necessary to be explicit and i solemnly repeated dora my own life i am your ruined david i'll declare i'll make you bite you said dora shaking her curls if you are so ridiculous but i looked so serious that dora left off shaking her curls and laid her trembling little hand upon my shoulder and first looked scared and anxious then began to cry that was dreadful i fell upon my knees before the sofa caressing her and imploring her not to rend my heart for some time poor little dora did nothing but exclaim oh dear oh dear and oh she was so frightened and there was julia mills and oh take her to julia mills and go away please until i was almost beside myself at last after an agony of supplication and protestation i got dora to look at me with a horrified expression on her face which i gradually soothed until it was only loving and her soft pretty cheek was lying against mine then i told her with my arms clasped round her how i loved her so dearly and so dearly how i felt it right to offer to release her from her engagement because now i was poor how i never could bear it or recover it if i lost her how i had no fears of poverty if she had none my arm being nerved and my heart inspired by her how i was already working with a courage such as none but lovers knew how i had begun to be practical and look into the future how a crust well earned was sweeter far than a feast inherited and much more to the same purpose which i delivered in a burst of passionate eloquence quite surprising to myself though i had been thinking about it day and night ever since my aunt had astonished me is your heart mine still dear dora said i rapturously for i knew by her clinging to me that it was oh yes cried dora yes it's all yours oh don't be dreadful i dreadful to dora don't talk about being poor and working hard said dora nestling closer to me oh don't don't my dearest love said i the crust well earned oh yes but i don't want to hear any more about crusts said dora and jip must have a mutton chop every day at twelve or he'll die i was charmed with her childish winning way i fondly explained to dora that jip should have his mutton chop with his accustomed regularity and i drew a picture of our frugal home made independent by my labor sketching in the little house i had seen at highgate and my aunt in her room upstairs i'm not dreadful now dora said i tenderly oh no no cried dora but i hope your aunt will keep in her own room a good deal and i hope she's not a scolding old thing if it were possible for me to love dora more than ever i am sure i did but i felt she was a little impracticable it damped my newborn ardor to find that ardor so difficult of communication to her i made another trial when she was quite herself again and was curling jip's ears as he lay upon her lap i became grave and said my own may i mention something oh please don't be practical said dora coaxingly because it frightens me so sweetheart i returned there's nothing to alarm you in all this i want you to think of it quite differently i want to make it nerve you and inspire you dora oh but that's so shocking cried dora my love no perseverance and strength of character will enable us to bear much worse things but i haven't got any strength at all said dora shaking her curls have i chip oh do kiss chip and be agreeable it was impossible to resist kissing chip when she held him up to me for that purpose putting her own bright rosy little mouth into kissing form as she directed the operation which she insisted should be performed symmetrically on the centre of his nose i did as she bade me rewarding myself afterwards for my obedience and she charmed me out of my graver character for i don't know how long 
but dora my beloved said i at last resuming it i was going to mention something the judge of the prerogative court might have fallen in love with her to see her fold her little hands and hold them up begging and praying me not to be dreadful any more indeed i am not going to be my darling i assured her but dora my love if you will sometimes think not despondingly you know far from that but if you will sometimes think just to encourage yourself that you are engaged to a poor man don't don't pray don't cried dora it's so very dreadful my soul not at all said i cheerfully if you will sometimes think of that and look about now and then at your papa's housekeeping and endeavour to acquire a little habit of accounts for instance poor little dora received the suggestion with something that was half a sob and half a scream it would be so useful to us afterwards i went on and if you would promise to me to read a little a little cookery book that i would send you it would be so excellent for both of us for our path in life my dora said i warming with the subject is stony and rugged now and it rests with us to smooth it we must fight our way onward we must be brave there are obstacles to be met and we must meet and crush them i was going on at a great rate with a clenched hand and the most enthusiastic countenance but it was quite unnecessary to proceed i had said enough i had done it again oh she was so frightened oh where was julia mills oh take her to julia mills and go away please so that in short i was quite distracted and raved about the drawing-room i thought i had killed her this time i sprinkled water on her face i went down on my knees i plucked at my hair i denounced myself as a remorseless brute and a ruthless beast i implored her forgiveness i besought her to look up i ravaged mrs mills workbox for a smelling bottle and in my agony of mind applied an ivory needle case instead and dropped all the needles over nora i shook my fist at jeep who was as frantic as myself i did every wild extravagance that could be done and was a long way beyond the end of my wits when miss mills came into the room who has done this exclaimed miss mills succoring her friend i replied i miss mills i have done it behold the destroyer or words to that effect and hid my face from the light in the sofa cushion at first miss mills thought it was a quarrel and that we were verging on the desert of sahara but she soon found out how matters stood for my dear affectionate little dora embracing her began exclaiming that i was a poor laborer and then cried for me and embraced me and asked me would i let her give me all her money to keep and then fell on miss mills neck sobbing as if her tender heart were broken miss mills must have been born to be a blessing to us she ascertained from me in a few words what it was all about comforted dora and gradually convinced her that i was not a laborer from my manner of stating the case i believe dora concluded that i was a navigator and went balancing myself up and down a plank all day with a wheelbarrow and so brought us together in peace when we were quite composed and dora had gone upstairs to put some rose water to her eyes miss millis rang for tea in the ensuing interval i told miss millis that she was ever more my friend and that my heart must cease to vibrate ere i could forget her sympathy i then expounded to miss mellis what i had endeavoured so very unsuccessfully to expound to dora miss mills replied on general principles that the cottage of content was better than the palace of cold splendour and that where love was all was i said to miss mills that this was very true and who should know it better than i who loved dora with a love that never mortal had experienced yet but on miss mills observing with despondency that it were well indeed for some hearts if this were so i explained that i begged leave to restrict the observation to mortals of the masculine gender i then put it to miss mills to say whether she considered that there was or was not any practical merit in the suggestion i had been anxious to make concerning the accounts the housekeeping and the cookery book miss mills after some consideration thus replied mr copperfield i will be plain with you mental suffering and trial supply in some natures the place of years and i will be as plain with you as if i were a lady abbess no 
the suggestion is not appropriate to our Dora. Our dearest Dora is a favored child of nature. She is a thing of light, of airiness and joy. I am free to confess that if it could be done, it might be well. But, and Miss Mills shook her head, I was encouraged by this closing admission on the part of Miss Mills to ask her whether for Dora's sake, if she had any opportunity of luring her attention to such preparations for an earnest life, she would avail herself of it. Miss Mills replied in the affirmative so readily that I further asked her if she would take charge of the cookery book, and if she could ever insinuate it upon Dora's acceptance, without frightening her, undertake to do me that crowning service. Miss Mills accepted this trust, too, but was not sanguine, and Dora returned looking such a lovely little creature that I really doubted whether she ought to be troubled with anything so ordinary, and she loved me so much and was so captivating particularly when she made Jip stand on his hind legs for toast and when she pretended to hold that nose of his against the hot teapot for punishment because he wouldn't that I felt like a sort of monster who had got into a fairy's bower when I thought of having frightened her and made her cry. After tea we had the guitar and Dora sang those same dear old French songs about the impossibility of ever on any account leaving off dancing la da la la da la until I felt a much greater monster than before. We had only one check to our pleasure, and that happened a little while before I took my leave when Miss Mills, chancing to make some allusion to tomorrow morning, I unluckily let out that, being obliged to exert myself now, I got up at five o'clock. Whether Dora had any idea that I was a private watchman, I'm unable to say, but made a great impression on her, and she neither played nor sang any more. It was so in her mind when I bade her adieu and she said to me in her pretty coaxing way as if i were a doll i used to think now don't get up at five o'clock you naughty boy it's so nonsensical my love said i i have work to do but don't do it returned dora why should you it was impossible to say to that sweet little surprised face otherwise than lightly and playfully that we must work to live oh how ridiculous cried dora how shall we live without dora said i how anyhow said dora she seemed to think she had quite settled the question and gave me such a triumphant little kiss direct from her innocent heart that i would hardly have put her out of conceit with her answer for a fortune well i loved her and i went on loving her most absorbingly entirely and completely but going on too working pretty hard and beat and busily keeping red hot all the irons i now had in the fire i would sit sometimes of a night opposite my aunt thinking how I had frightened Dora that time, and how I could best make my way with a guitar case through the rest of the forest of difficulty, until I used to fancy that my head was turning quite gray. End of a little cold water. Recording by Noonday. Chapter 38 of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 38 A Dissolution of Partnership I did not allow my resolution with respect to the parliamentary debates to cool. It was one of the irons I began to heat immediately, and one of the irons I kept hot and hammered at with a perseverance I may honestly admire. I bought and approved a scheme of the noble art and mystery of stenography, which cost me ten and sixpence, and plunged into a sea of perplexity that brought me, in a few weeks, to the confines of distraction. The changes that were rung upon dots, which in such a position meant such a thing, and in such another position something else, entirely different, the wonderful vagaries that were played by circles, the unaccountable consequences that resulted from marks like flies' legs, the tremendous effects of a curve in a wrong place, not only troubled my waking hours, but reappeared before me in my sleep. When I had groped my way, blindly, through these difficulties, and had mastered the alphabet, which was an Egyptian temple in itself, there then appeared a procession of new horrors called arbitrary characters, the most despotic characters I have ever known, who insisted, for instance, that a thing like the beginning of a cobweb meant expectation, that a pen-and-ink skyrocket stood for disadvantageous. 
when I have fixed these wretches in my mind, I found that they had driven everything else out of it. Then beginning again, I forgot them. While I was picking them up, I dropped the other fragments of the system. In short, it was almost heartbreaking. It might have been quite heartbreaking, but for Dora, who was the stay and anchor of my tempest-driven bark. Every scratch in the scheme was a gnarled oak in the forest of difficulty, and I went on cutting them down, one after another, with such vigour that in three or four months I was in a condition to make an experiment on one of our crack speakers in the Commons. Shall I ever forget how the crack speaker walked off from me before I began, and left my imbecile pencil staggering about the paper as if it were in a fit? This would not do, it was quite clear. I was flying too high, and should never get on so. I resorted to Traddles for advice, who suggested that he should dictate speeches to me at a pace, and with occasional stoppages, adapted to my weakness. Very grateful for this friendly aid, I accepted the proposal, and night after night, almost every night, for a long time, we had a sort of private parliament in Buckingham Street, after I came home from the doctor's. I should like to see such a parliament anywhere else. My aunt and Mr. Dick represented the government or the opposition as the case might be, and Traddles, with the assistance of Enfield's speakers, or a volume of parliamentary orations, thundered astonishing invectives against them. Standing by the table, with his finger in the page to keep the place, and his right arm flourishing above his head, Traddles, as Mr. Pitt, Mr. Fox, Mr. Sheridan, Mr. Burke, Lord Castlereagh, Viscount Sidmouth, or Mr. Canning, would work himself into the most violent heats, and deliver the most withering denunciations of the profligacy and corruption of my aunt and Mr. Dick, while I used to sit at a little distance, with my notebook on my knee, fagging after him with all my might and main. The inconsistency and recklessness of Traddles were not to be exceeded by any real politician. He was for any description of policy in the compass of a week, and nailed all sorts of colours to every denomination of mast. My aunt, looking very like an immovable Chancellor of the Exchequer, would occasionally throw in an interruption or two, as here, or no, or oh, when the text seemed to require it, which was always a signal to Mr. Dick, a perfect country gentleman, to follow lustily with the same cry. But Mr. Dick got taxed with such things in the course of his parliamentary career, and was made responsible for such awful consequences, that he became uncomfortable in his mind sometimes. I believe he actually began to be afraid he really had been doing something, tending to the annihilation of the British Constitution and the ruin of the country. Often and often we pursued these debates until the clock pointed to midnight and the candles were burning down. The result of so much good practice was, that by and by I began to keep pace with Traddles pretty well, and should have been quite triumphant if I had had the least idea what my notes were about. But as to reading them after I had got them, I might as well have copied the Chinese inscriptions of an immense collection of tea-chests, or the golden characters on all the red and green bottles in the chemist's shops. There was nothing for it but to turn back and begin all over again. It was very hard, but I turned back, though with a heavy heart, and began, laboriously and methodically, to plod over the same tedious ground at a snail's pace, stopping to examine minutely every speck in the way on all sides, and making the most desperate efforts to know these elusive characters by sight wherever I met them. I was always punctual at the office, at the doctor's too, and I really did work, as the common expression is, like a cart-horse. One day, when I went to the Commons as usual, I found Mr. Spenlow in the doorway looking extremely grave, and talking to himself. As he was in the habit of complaining of pains in his head, he had naturally a short throat, and I do seriously believe he overstarched himself, I was at first alarmed by the idea that he was not quite right in that direction, but he soon relieved my uneasiness. Instead of returning my good morning, with his usual affability, he looked at me in a distant, ceremonious manner, and coldly requested me to accompany him to a certain coffee-house, 
which in those days had a door opening into the commons just within the little archway in St. Paul's churchyard. I complied, in a very uncomfortable state and with a warm shooting all over me, as if my apprehensions were breaking out into buds. When I allowed him to go on a little before, on account of the narrowness of the way, I observed that he carried his head with a lofty air that was particularly unpromising, and my mind misgave me that he had found out about my darling Dora. If I had not guessed this on the way to the coffee-house, I could hardly have failed to know what was the matter when I followed him into an upstairs room and found Miss Murdstone there, supported by a background of sideboard, on which were several inverted tumblers sustaining lemons, and two of those extraordinary boxes, all corners and flutings, for sticking knives and forks in, which, happily for mankind, are now obsolete. Miss Murdstone gave me her chilly fingernails, and sat severely rigid. Mr. Spenlow shut the door, motioned to me to a chair, and stood on the hearth-rug in front of the fireplace. "'Have the goodness to show, Mr. Copperfield,' said Mr. Spenlow, "'what you have in your reticule, Miss Murdstone?' I believe it was the old, identical steel clasps reticule of my childhood that shut up like a bite. Compressing her lips in sympathy with the snap, Miss Murdstone opened it, opening her mouth a little at the same time, and produced my last letter to Dora, teeming with expressions of devoted affection. "'I believe that is your writing, Mr. Copperfield?' said Mr. Spenlow. I was very hot, and the voice I heard was very unlike mine when I said, "'It is, sir.' "'If I am not mistaken,' said Mr. Spenlow, as Miss Murdstone brought a parcel of letters out of her reticule, tied round with the dearest bit of blue ribbon, "'those are also from your pen, Mr. Copperfield?' I took them from her with a most desolate sensation, and glancing at such phrases at the top as, My ever dearest to known Dora, My best beloved angel, My blessed one for ever, and the like, blushed deeply, and inclined my head. No, thank you, said Mr. Spenlow coldly, as I mechanically offered them back to him. I will not deprive you of them. Miss Birdstone, be so good as to proceed. That gentle creature, after a moment's thoughtful survey of the carpet, delivered herself with much dry unction as follows. "'I must confess to having entertained my suspicions of Miss Spenlow in reference to David Copperfield for some time. I observed Miss Spenlow and David Copperfield when they first met, and the impression made upon me then was not agreeable. The depravity of the human heart is such—' "'You will oblige me, ma'am,' interrupted Mr. Spenlow, by confining yourself to facts. Miss Murdstone cast down her eyes, shook her head as if protesting against this unseemly interruption, and with frowning dignity resumed, Since I am to confine myself to facts, I will stake them as dryly as I can. Perhaps that will be considered an acceptable course of proceeding. I have already said, sir, that I have had my suspicions of Miss Spenlow in reference to David Copperfield for some time. I have frequently endeavoured to find decisive corroboration of those suspicions, but without effect. I have therefore forborne to mention them to Miss Spenlow's father, looking severely at him, knowing how little disposition there usually is in such cases to acknowledge the conscientious discharge of duty. Mr. Spenlow seemed quite cowed by the gentlemanly sternness of Miss Murdstone's manner, and deprecated her severity with a considerate little wave of his hand. "'On my return to Norwood, after the period of absence occasioned by my brother's marriage,' pursued Miss Murdstone in a disdainful voice, "'and on the return of Miss Spenlow from her visit to her friend Miss Mills, I imagined that the manner of Miss Spenlow gave me greater occasion for suspicion than before. Therefore I watched Miss Spenlow closely. Dear, tender little Dora, so unconscious of this dragon's eye. Still, resumed Miss Murdstone, I found no proof until last night. It appeared to me that Miss Spenlow received too many letters from her friend Miss Mills, but Miss Mills being her friend with her father's full concurrence— another telling blur, Mr. Spenlow, it was not for me to interfere. If I may not be permitted to allude to the natural depravity of the human heart, at least I may, I must be permitted, so far to refer to misplaced confidence. 
Mr. Spenlow apologetically murmured his assent. "'Last evening after tea,' pursued Miss Murdstone, "'I observed the little dog starting, rolling, and growling about the drawing-room, worrying something. "'I said to Miss Spenlow, "'Dora, what is it that the dog has in his mouth? It's paper!' Miss Spenlow immediately put her hand to her frock, gave a sudden cry, and ran to the dog. I interposed, and said, "'Dora, my love, you must permit me.' "'Oh, Jip, miserable spaniel! This wretchedness, then, was your work.' "'Miss Spenlow endeavoured,' said Miss Murdstone, "'to bribe me with kisses, work-boxes, and small articles of jewellery. That, of course, I pass over.' The little dog retreated under the sofa on my approaching him, and was with great difficulty dislodged by the fire-irons. Even when dislodged, he still kept the letter in his mouth, and on my endeavouring to take it from him, at the imminent risk of being bitten, he kept it between his teeth so pertinaciously as to suffer himself to be held suspended in the air by means of the document. At length I obtained possession of it. After perusing it, I taxed Miss Spenlow with having many such letters in her possession, and utterly obtained from her the packet which is now in David Copperfield's hand. Here she ceased, and snapping her reticule again and shutting her mouth, looked as if she might be broken, but could never be bent. "'You've heard, Miss Murdstone,' said Mr. Spenlow, looked turning to me. "'I beg to ask Mr. Copperfield if you have anything to say in reply.' The picture I had before me, of the beautiful little treasure of my heart sobbing and crying all night, of her being alone, frightened and wretched, then of her having so piteously begged and prayed that stony-hearted woman to forgive her, of her Amy offering those kitchens, work-boxes and trinkets, of her being in such grievous distress, and all for me, very much impair the little dignity I had been able to muster. I am afraid I was in a tremulous state for a minute or so, though I did my best to disguise it. "'There is nothing I can say, sir,' I returned, except that all the blame is mine. "'Dora, Miss Spenlow, if you please,' said her father majestically, "'was induced and persuaded by me,' I went on, swallowing that colder designation, "'to consent to this concealment, and I bitterly regret it.' "'You are very much to blame, sir,' said Mr. Spenlow, walking to and fro upon the hearth-rug, and emphasising what he said with his whole body instead of his head, on account of the stiffness of his cravat and spine. "'You have done a stealthy and unbecoming action, Mr. Copperfield. When I take a gentleman to my house, no matter whether he is nineteen, twenty-nine, or ninety, I take him there in a spirit of confidence. If he abuses my confidence, he commits a dishonourable action, Mr. Copperfield.' "'I feel it, sir, I assure you,' I returned. "'But I never thought so before. "'Sincerely, honestly, indeed, Mr. Spenlow, "'I never thought so before. "'I love Miss Spenlow to that extent. "'Poh! Nonsense!' said Mr. Spenlow, reddening. "'Pray don't tell me to my face that you love my daughter, Mr. Copperfield.' "'Could I defend my conduct if I did not, sir?' "'I returned with all humility.' "'Can you defend your conduct if you do, sir?' said Mr. Spenlow, stopping short upon the hearth-rug. "'Have you considered your years, and my daughter's years, Mr. Copperfield? "'Have you considered what it is to undermine the confidence that should subsist between my daughter and myself? "'Have you considered my daughter's station in life, the projects I may contemplate for her advancement, "'the testamentary intentions I may have with reference to her? "'Have you considered anything, Mr. Copperfield?' "'Very little, sir, I am afraid,' I answered, speaking to him as respectfully and sorrowfully as I felt. "'But, pray believe me, I have considered my own worldly position. "'When I explained it to you, you we were already engaged. "'I beg!' said Mr. Spenlow, all like punch than I had ever seen him, as he energetically struck one hand upon the other. I could not help noticing that, even in my despair. "'That you will not talk to me of engagements, Mr. Copperfield!' The otherwise immovable Miss Murdstone laughed contemptuously in one short syllable. "'When I explained my altered position to you, sir,' I began again, 
substituting a new form of expression for what was so unpalatable to him, this concealment, into which I am so unhappy as to have led Miss Spenlow, had begun. Since I have been in that altered position, I have strained every nerve, I have exerted every energy to improve it. I am sure I shall improve it in time. Will you grant me time, any length of time? We are both so young, sir. You are right, interrupted Mr. Spenlow, nodding his head a great many times, and frowning very much. You are both very young. It's all nonsense. Let there be an end of the nonsense. Take away those letters and throw them in the fire. Give me Miss Spenlow's letters to throw in the fire, and although our future intercourse must, you are aware, be restricted to the commons here, we will agree to make no further mention of the past. Come, Mr. Copperfield, you don't want sense, and this is the sensible course. No, I couldn't think of agreeing to it. I was very sorry, but there was a higher consideration than sense. Love was above all earthly considerations, and I loved Dora to idolatry, and Dora loved me. I didn't exactly say so. I softened it down as much as I could. But I implied it, and I was resolute upon it. I don't think I made myself very ridiculous, but I know I was resolute. "'Very well, Mr. Copperfield,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'I must try my influence with my daughter.' Miss Murdstone, by an expressive sound, a long-drawn respiration, which was neither a sigh nor a moan, but was like both, gave it as her opinion that he should have done this at first. "'I must try,' said Mr. Spenlow, confirmed by this support, "'my influence with my daughter. Do you decline to take those letters, Mr. Copperfield?' For I had laid them on the table. "'Yes. I told him I hoped he would not think it wrong, but I couldn't possibly take them from Miss Murdstone.' "'Nor from me?' said Mr. Spenlow. "'No,' I replied with the profoundest respect, "'nor from him.' "'Very well,' said Mr. Spenlow. A silence succeeding, I was undecided whether to go or stay. At length I was moving quietly towards the door, with the intention of saying that perhaps I should consult his feelings best by withdrawing, when he said, with his hands in his coat-pockets, into which it was as much as he could do to get them, and with what I should call upon the whole a decidedly pious air, "'You are probably aware, Mr. Copperfield, that I am not altogether destitute of worldly possessions, and that my daughter is my nearest and dearest relative?' I hurriedly made a reply to the effect that I hoped the error into which I had been betrayed by the desperate nature of my love did not induce him to think me mercenary too. "'I don't allude to the matter in that light,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'It would be better for yourself, and all of us, if you were a mercenary, Mr. Copperfield. I mean, if you were more discreet and less influenced by all this youthful nonsense. No, I merely say, with quite another view, you are probably aware I have some property to bequeath to my child. I certainly suppose so. And you can hardly think, said Mr. Spenlow, having experience of what we see in the commons here every day, of the various unaccountable and negligent proceedings of men in respect of their testamentary arrangements, of all subjects, the one on which perhaps the strangest revelations of human inconsistency are to be met with, but that mine are made. I inclined my head in acquiescence. I should not allow, said Mr. Spenlow, with an evident increase of pious sentiment, and slowly shaking his head as he poised himself upon his toes and heels alternately. My suitable provision for my child to, to be influenced by a piece of youthful folly like the present. It is mere folly, mere nonsense, and in a little while it will weigh lighter than any feather. But I might, I might, if this silly business were not completely relinquished altogether, be induced in some anxious moment to guard her from, and surround her with protections against, the consequences of any foolish step in the way of marriage. Now, Mr. Copperfield, I hope that you will not render it necessary for me to open, even for a quarter of an hour, that closed page in the Book of Life, and unsettle, even for a quarter of an hour, grave affairs long since composed. There was a serenity, a tranquillity, a calm sunset air about him which quite affected me. He was so peaceful and resigned, 
clearly had his affairs in such perfect train, and so systematically wound up, that he was a man to feel touched in the contemplation of. I really think I saw tears rise to his eyes from the depth of his own feeling of all this. But what could I do? I could not deny Nora and my own heart. When he told me I had better take a week to consider of what he had said, how could I say I wouldn't take a week? It, how could I fail to know that no amount of weeks could influence such love as mine? "'In the meantime, confer with Miss Trotwood, or with any person with any knowledge of life,' said Mr. Spenlow, adjusting his cravat with both hands. "'Take a week, Mr. Copperfield.' I submitted, and with a countenance as expressive as I was able to make it of dejected and despairing constancy, came out of the room. Miss Murdstone's heavy eyebrows followed me to the door. I say her eyebrows rather than her eyes, because they were much more important in her face, and she looked so exactly as she used to look, at about that hour of the morning in our parlour at Blunderston, that I could have fancied I had been breaking down in my lessons again, and that the dead weight on my mind was that horrible old spelling-book with oval woodcuts, shaped to my youthful fancy, like the glasses out of spectacles. When I got to the office, and, shutting out old Tiffy and the rest of them with my hands, sat at my desk in my own particular nook, thinking of this earthquake that had taken place so unexpectedly, and in the bitterness of my spirit cursing Jip, I fell into such a state of torment about Dora, that I wonder I did not take up my hat and rush insanely to Norwood. The idea of their frightening her and making her cry, and of my not being there to comfort her, was so excruciating that it impelled me to write a wild letter to Mr. Spenlow, beseeching him not to visit upon her the consequences of my awful destiny. I implored him to spare her gentle nature, not to crush a fragile flower, and addressed him generally, to the best of my remembrance, as if, instead of being her father, he had been an ogre, or the dragon of Wantley. This letter I sealed and laid upon his desk before he returned, and when he came in I saw him, through the half-opened door of his room, take it up and read it. He said nothing about it all the morning, but before he went away in the afternoon he called me in and told me that I need not make myself at all uneasy about his daughter's happiness. He had assured her, he said, that it was all nonsense, and he had nothing more to say to her. He believed he was an indulgent father, as indeed he was, and I might spare myself any solicitude on her account. "'You may make it necessary, if you are foolish or obstinate, Mr. Copperfield,' he observed, "'for me to send my daughter abroad again for a term. But I have a better opinion of you. I hope you will be wiser than that in a few days. As to Miss Murdstone, for I had alluded to her in the letter, I respect that lady's vigilance, and feel obliged to her.' but she has strict charge to avoid the subject. All I desire, Mr. Copperfield, is that it should be forgotten. All you have got to do, Mr. Copperfield, is to forget it. All. In the note I wrote to Miss Mills, I bitterly quoted this sentiment. All I had to do, I said, with gloomy sarcasm, was to forget Dora. That was all, and what was that? I entreated Miss Mills to see me that evening. If it could not be done with Mr. Mills's sanction and concurrence, I besought a clandestine interview in the back kitchen, where the mangle was. I informed her that my reason was tottering on its throne, and only she, Miss Mills, could prevent its being deposed. I signed myself, hers distractedly, and I couldn't help feeling when I read this composition over before sending it by a porter, that it was something in the style of Mr. Micawber. However, I sent it. At night I repaired to Miss Mills's street, and walked up and down, until I was stealthily fetched in by Miss Mills's maid, and taken the area away to the back kitchen. I have since seen reason to believe that there was nothing on earth to prevent my going in at the front door, and being shown up into the drawing-room, except Miss Mills's love of the romantic and mysterious. In the back kitchen I raved as became me. I went there, I suppose, to make a fool of myself, 
and I am quite sure I did it. Miss Mills had received a hasty note from Dora, telling her that all was discovered, and saying, "'Oh, pray come to me, Julia, do, do!' But Miss Mills, to mistrusting the acceptability of her presence to the higher powers, had not yet gone, and we were all benighted in the desert of Sahara. Miss Mills had a wonderful flow of words, and liked to pour them out. I could not help feeling, that she mingled her tears with mine, that she had a dreadful luxury in our afflictions. She petted them, as I may say, and made the most of them. A deep gulf, she observed, had opened between Dora and me, and love could only span it with its rainbow. Love must suffer in this stern world. It ever had been so, it ever would be so. No matter, Miss Mills remarked, hearts confined by cobwebs would burst at last, and then love was avenged. This was small consolation, but Miss Mills wouldn't encourage fallacious hopes. She may be much more wretched than I was before, and I felt, and told her with the deepest gratitude, that she was indeed a friend. We resolved that she should go to Dora the first thing in the morning, and find some means of assuring her, either by looks or words, of my devotion and misery. We parted, overwhelmed with grief, and I think Miss Mills enjoyed herself completely. I confided all to my aunt when I got home, and in spite of all she could say to me, went to bed despairing. I got up despairing, and went out despairing. It was Saturday morning, and I went straight to the Commons. I was surprised when I came within sight of our office door to see the ticket-porters standing outside talking together, and some half-dozen stragglers gazing at the windows which were shut up. I quickened my pace, and passing among them, wondering at their looks, went hurriedly in. The clerks were there, but nobody was doing anything. Old Tiffy, for the first time in his life, I should think, was sitting on somebody else's stool, and had not hung up his hat. "'This is a dreadful calamity,' Mr. Copperfield said he, as I entered. "'What is?' I exclaimed. "'What's the matter?' "'Don't you know?' cried Tiffy, and all the rest of them, coming round me. "'No,' said I, looking from face to face. "'Mr. Spinlow,' said Tiffy. "'What about him?' "'Dead!' I thought it was the office reeling, and not I, as one of the clerks caught hold of me. They sat me down in a chair, untied my neckcloth, and brought me some water. I have no idea whether this took any time. "'Dead?' said I. "'He dined in town yesterday, and drove down in the Phaeton by himself,' said Tiffy, "'having sent his own groom home by the coach, as he sometimes did, you know.' "'Well? "'The Phaeton went home without him. "'The horses stopped at the stable gate. "'The man went out with a lantern. "'Nobody in the carriage. "'Had they run away?' "'They were not hot,' said Tiffy, putting on his glasses. "'No hotter, I understand, than they would have been going down at the usual place.' The reins were broken, but they had been dragging on the ground. The house was roused up directly, and three of them went out along the road. They found him a mile off. "'More than a mile off, Mr. Tiffy,' interposed the junior. Oh, "'Was it? I believe you are right,' said Miss Tiffy. "'More than a mile off, not far from the church, lying partly on the roadside, partly on the path, upon his face.' Whether he fell out in a fit, or got out feeling ill before the fit came on, or even whether he was quite dead then, though there is no doubt he was quite insensible, no one appears to know. If he breathed, certainly he never spoke. Medical assistance was got as soon as possible, but it was quite useless. I cannot describe the state of mind into which I was thrown by this intelligence, the shock of such an event happening so suddenly, and happening to one with whom I had been in any respect at variance, the appalling vacancy in the room he had occupied so lately, where his chair and table seemed to wait for him, and his handwriting of yesterday was like a ghost. The indefinable impossibility of separating himself from the place, and feeling, when the door opened, as if he might come in. The lazy hush and rest there was in the office, and the insatiable reddish with which our people talked about it, and other people came in and out all day, and gorged themselves with the subject. This is easily intelligible to any one. What I cannot describe is how, in the innermost recesses of my own heart, 
I had a lurking jealousy, even of death. How I felt as if its might would push me from my ground in Dora's thoughts. How I was, in a grudging way I have no words for, envious of her grief. How it made me restless to think of her weeping to others, of being consoled by others. How I had a grasping, avaricious wish to shut out everybody from her but myself, and to be all in all to her at that unseasonable time of all times. In the trouble of this state of mind, not exclusively of my own, I hope, but known to others, I went down to Norwood that night, and finding from one of the servants, when I made my inquiries at the door, that Miss Mills was there, got my aunt to direct a letter to her, which I wrote. I deplored the untimely death of Mr. Spenlow most sincerely, and shed tears in doing so. I entreated her to tell Dora, if Dora were in a state to hear it, that he had spoken to me with the utmost kindness and consideration, and had coupled nothing but tenderness, not a single or reproachful word with her name. I know I did this selfishly, to have my name brought before her, but I tried to believe it was an act of justice to his memory. Perhaps I did believe it. My aunt received a few lines next day in reply, addressed outside to her, within to me. Dora was overcome by grief, and when her friend had asked her should she send her love to me, had only cried as she was always crying, "'Oh, dear papa! Oh, poor papa!' But she had not said no, and that I made the most of. Mr. Jorkins, who had been at Norwood since the occurrence, came to the office a few days afterwards. He and Tiffy were closeted together for some few moments, and then Tiffy looked out at the door and beckoned me in. "'Oh,' said Mr. Dawkins, uh, "'Mr. Tiffy and myself, Mr. Copperfield, are about to examine the desks, the drawers, and other such repositories of the deceased, with a view of sealing up his private papers and searching for a will. There is no trace of any elsewhere. It may be as well for you to assist us, if you please.' I had been in agony to obtain some knowledge of the circumstances in which my Dora would be placed, as in whose guardianship, and so forth, and this was something towards it. We began the search at once, Mr. Jorkins unlocking the drawers and desks, and we all taking out the papers. The office papers we placed on one side, and the private papers, which were not numerous, on the other. We were very grave, and when we came to a stray seal, or pencil-case, or ring, or any little article of that kind which we associated personally with him, we spoke very low. We had sealed up several packets, and were still going on dustily and quietly, when Mr. Dawkins said to us, applying exactly the same words to his late partner as his late partner had applied to him, "'Mr. Spendler was very difficult to move from the beaten track. You know what he was. I am disposed to think he had made no mill.' "'Oh, I know he had,' said I. They both stopped and looked at me. "'On the very day when I last saw him,' said I, "'he, he told me that he had, and that his affairs were long since settled.' Mr. Jorkins and old Tiffy shook their heads with one accord. "'That looks unpromising,' said Tiffy. "'Very unpromising,' said Mr. Jorkins. "'Surely you don't doubt,' I began. "'My good Mr. Copperfield,' said Tiffy, laying his hand upon my arm and shutting up both his eyes as he shook his head, "'if you had been in the Commons as long as I have, you would know there is no subject on which men are so inconsistent and so little to be trusted.' "'Why, bless my soul, he made that very remark,' I replied persistently. "'I should call that almost final,' observed Tiffy. "'My opinion is, no will.' It appeared a wonderful thing to me, but it turned out that there was no will. He had never so much as thought of making one, so far as his papers afforded any evidence, for there was no kind of hint, sketch, or memorandum, or any testamentary intention whatever.' What was scarcely less astonishing to me was that his affairs were in a most disordered state. It was extremely difficult, I heard, to make out what he owed, or what he had paid, or of what he had died possessed. It was considered likely that for years he could have had no clear opinion on these subjects himself. By little and little it came out that, in the competition on all points of appearance and gentility then running high in the Commons, he had spent more than his professional income, 
which was not a very large one, and had reduced his private means, if they ever had been great, which was exceedingly doubtful, to a very low ebb indeed. There was a sale of the furniture and lease at Norwood, and Tiffy told me, little thinking how interested I was in the story, that, paying all the just debts of the deceased and deducting his share of outstanding bad and doubtful debts due to the firm, he would give a thousand pounds for all the assets remaining. This was at the expiration of about six weeks. I had suffered tortures all the time, and thought I really must have laid violent hands upon myself, when Miss Mills still reported to me that my broken-hearted little Dora would say nothing when I was mentioned, but, "'Oh, poor papa! Oh, dear papa!' Also, that she had no other relations than two aunts, maiden sisters of Mr. Spenlow, who lived at Putney, and who had not held any other than chance communication with their brother for many years. Not that they had ever quarrelled, Miss Mills informed me, but that, that having been on the occasion of Dora's christening invited to tea, when they considered themselves privileged to be invited to dinner, they had expressed their opinion in writing that it was better for the happiness of all parties that they should stay away. Since which they had gone their road, and their brother had gone his. These two ladies now emerged from their retirement and proposed to take Dora to live at Putney. Dora, clinging to them both and weeping, exclaimed, "'Oh, yes, aunts, please take Julia Mills and me and Jip to Putney.' So they went, very soon after the funeral. How I found time to haunt Putney, I am sure I don't know, but I contrived, by some means or other, to prowl about the neighbourhood pretty often. Miss Mills, for the more exact discharge of the duties of friendship, kept a journal, and she used to meet me sometimes on the common and read it, or, if she had not had time to do that, lend it to me. How I treasured up the entries, of which I subjoin a sample. Monday. My sweet D, still much depressed. Headache. Called attention to J, has been beautifully sleek. D, fondled J. Associations thus awakened, open floodgates of sorrow. Rush of grief admitted. Our tears the dewdrops of the heart. J. M. Tuesday. D, weak and nervous. Beautiful impaler. Do we not remark this in moon likewise? J. M. D, J. M. and J. took airing in carriage. J, looking out of window and barking violently at dustman, occasioned smile to overspread features of D. Of such slight links is chain of life composed. J. M. Wednesday. D. comparatively cheerful, sang to her as congenial melody, Evening Bells. Effect not soothing, but reverse. D. inexpressibly affected, found sobbing afterwards in own room. Quoted verses respecting self and young gazelle, ineffectually. Also referred to patience on monument. Question. Why on monument? J. M. Thursday. D. certainly improved. Better night. Slight tinge of damask revisiting cheek. Resolved to mention name of D. C. Introduced same cautiously in course of airing. D. immediately overcome. Oh, dear, dear Julia, oh, I have been a naughty and undutiful child. Soothed and caressed drew ideal picture of D.C. on verge of tomb. D. again ever come. Oh, what shall I do, what shall I do? Oh, take me somewhere. Much alarmed. Fainting of D. and glass of water from public house. Poetical affinity, chequered sign on doorpost, chequered human life. Alas, J. M. Friday, day of incident. Man appears in kitchen with blue bag, for ladies' boots left out to heel. Cook replies, No such orders. Man argues point. Cook withdraws to inquire, leaving man alone with J. On Cook's return, man still argues point, but ultimately goes. J. missing. D. distracted. Information sent to police. Man to be identified by broad nose and legs like balustrades of bridge. Search made in every direction. No J. D. weeping bitterly and inconsolable. Renewed reference to young gazelle. Appropriate, but unavailing. 
Towards evening, strange boy calls, brought into parlour. Broad nose, but no balustrades. Says he wants a pound, and knows a dog. Declines to explain further, though much pressed. Pound, being produced by D, takes cook to little house, where J alone tied up to leg of table. Joy of D, who dances round J while he eats his supper. Emboldened by this happy change, mention D, C, upstairs. D weeps afresh, cries piteously, Oh, don't, don't, don't! It is so wicked to think of anything but poor papa! Embraces J, and sobs herself to sleep. Must not D. C. confine himself to the broad pinions of time? J. M. Miss Mills and her journal were my sole consolation of this period. To see her, who had seen Dora but a little while before, to trace the initial letter of Dora's name through her sympathetic pages, to be made more and more miserable by her, were my only comforts. I felt as if I had been living in a palace of cards which had tumbled down, leaving only Miss Mills and me among the ruins. I felt as if some grim enchanter had drawn a magic circle round the innocent goddess of my heart, which nothing, indeed, but those same strong pinions, capable of carrying so many people over so much, would enable me to enter. End of chapter 38 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 39 of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 39 Wickfield and Heap. My aunt, beginning, I imagine, to be made seriously uncomfortable by my prolonged dejection, made a pretence of being anxious that I should go to Dover, to see that all was working well at the cottage, which was let, and to conclude an agreement with the same tenant for a longer term of occupation. Janet was drafted into the service of Mrs. Strong, where I saw her every day. She had been undecided on leaving Dover, whether or no to give the finishing touch to that renunciation of mankind in which she had been educated by marrying a pilot, but she decided against that venture. Not so much for the sake of principle, I believe, as because she happened not to like him. Although it required an effort to leave Miss Mills, I fell rather willingly into my aunt's pretense, as a means of enabling me to pass a few tranquil hours with Agnes. I consulted the good doctor relative to an absence of three days, and the doctor, wishing me to take that relaxation, he wished me to take more, but my energy could not bear that, I made up my mind to go. As to the commons, I had no great occasion to be particular about my duties in that quarter. To say the truth, we were getting in no very good odour among the tip-top proctors, and were rapidly sliding down to but a doubtful position. The business had been indifferent under Mr. Jorkins, before Mr. Spenlow's time, and although it had been quickened by the infusion of new blood, and by the display which Mr. Spenlow made, still it was not established as a sufficiently strong basis to bear, without being shaken, such a blow as the sudden loss of its active manager. It fell off very much. Mr. Jorkins, notwithstanding his reputation in the firm, was an easy-going, incapable sort of man, whose reputation out of doors was not calculated to back it up. I was turned over to him now, and when I saw him take his snuff and let the business go, I regretted my aunt's thousand pounds more than ever. But this was not the worst of it. There were a number of hangers-on and outsiders about the commons, who, without being proctors themselves, dabbled in common-form business, and got it done by real proctors, who lent their names in consideration of a share in the spoil. And there were a good many of these, too. As our house now wanted business on any terms, we joined this noble band, and threw out lures to the hangers-on and outsiders to bring their business to us. Marriage licences and small probates were what we all looked for, and what paid us best, and the competition for these ran very high indeed. Kidnappers and invaders were planted at all the avenues of entrance to the commons, with instructions to do their utmost to cut off all persons in mourning, and all gentlemen with anything bashful in their appearance, 
and entice them to the offices in which their respective employees were in interested, which instructions were so well observed that I myself, before I was known by sight, was twice hustled into the premises of our principal opponent. The conflicting interests of these touting gentlemen being of a nature to irritate their feelings, personal collisions took place, and the Commons was even scandalised by our principal inveigler, who had formerly been in the wine trade and afterwards in the sworn brokery line, walking about for some days with a black eye. Any one of these scouts used to think nothing of politely assisting an old lady in black out of a vehicle, killing any proctor whom she inquired for, representing his employer as the lawful successor and representative of that proctor, and bearing the old lady off, sometimes greatly affected, to his employer's office. Many captives were brought to me in this way. As to marriage licences, the competition rose to such a pitch that a shy gentleman in want of one had nothing to do but submit himself to the first invader, or be fought for, and become the prey of the strongest. One of our clerks, who was an outsider, used, in the height of this contest, to sit with his hat on, that he might be ready to rush out and swear before a surrogate any victim who was brought in. The system in Vagling continues, I believe, to this day. The last time I was in the Commons, a civil, able-bodied person in a white apron pounced out upon me from a doorway, and whispering the word, marriage license, in my ear, was with great difficulty prevented from taking me up in his arms and lifting me into a proctor's. From this digression let me proceed to Dover. I found everything in a satisfactory state at the cottage, and was enabled to gratify my aunt exceedingly by reporting that the tenant inherited her feud, and waged incessant war against donkeys. Having settled the little business I had to transact there, and slept there one night, I walked on to Canterbury early in the morning. It was now winter again, and the fresh, cold, windy day and the sweeping downland brightened up my hopes a little. Coming into Canterbury, I loitered through the old streets with a sober pleasure that calmed my spirits and eased my heart. There were the old signs, the old names over the shops, the old people serving in them. It appeared so long since I had been a schoolboy there, that I wondered the place was so little changed, until I reflected how little I was changed myself. Strange to say, that quiet influence which was inseparable in my mind from Agnes seemed to pervade even the city where she dwelt. The venerable cathedral towers, and the old jackdaws and rooks whose airy voices made them more retired than perfect silence would have done, the battered gateways, one stuck full with statues long thrown down and crumbled away like the reverential pilgrims who had gazed upon them. The still nooks, where the ivied growth of centuries crept over gabled ends and ruined walls, the ancient houses, the pastoral landscape of field, orchard and garden, everywhere, on everything, I felt the same serener air, the same calm, thoughtful, softening spirit. Arrived at Mr. Wickfield's house, I found, in the little lower room on the ground floor, where Uriah Heap had been of old accustomed to sit, Mr. Micawber plying his pen with great assiduity. He was dressed in a legal-looking suit of black, and loomed, burly and large, in that small office. Mr. Micawber was extremely glad to see me, but a little confused, too. He would have conducted me immediately into the presence of Uriah, but I declined. "'I know the house of old, you recollect,' said I, "'and I will find my way upstairs. "'How do you like the law, Mr. Micawber?' "'My dear Copperfield,' he replied, "'to a man possessed of the higher imaginative powers, "'the objection to legal studies is the amount of detail which they involve. "'Even in our professional correspondence,' said Mr. Micawber, "'glancing at some letters he was writing, "'the mind is not at liberty to soar to any exalted form of expression. "'Still, it is a great pursuit.' a great pursuit. He then told me that he had become the tenant of Uriah Heap's old house, and that Mrs. Micawber would be delighted to receive me once more under her own roof. "'It is humble,' said Mr. Micawber, uh, to quote a favourite expression of my friend Heap, "'but it may prove the stepping-stone to more ambitious domiciliary accommodation.' I asked him whether he had a reason, so far, to be satisfied with his friend Heap's treatment of him. 
He got up to ascertain if the door were close shut before he replied, in a lower voice, "'My dear Copperfield, a man who labours under the pressure of pecuniary embarrassments is, with the generality of people, at a disadvantage. That disadvantage is not diminished when that pressure necessitates the drawing of stipendiary emoluments before those emoluments are strictly due and payable. All I can say is that my friend Heap has responded to appeals to which I need not more particularly refer, in a manner calculated to redound equally to the honour of his head and of his heart. "'I should not have supposed him to be very free with his money, either,' I observed. Uh, "'Pardon me,' said Mr. Micawber, with an air of constraint. "'I speak of my friend Heap as I have experience.' "'I am glad your experience is so favourable. I returned. "'You are very obliging, my dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, and hummed a tune. Uh, "'Do you see much of Mr. Wickfield?' I asked, to change the subject. "'Not much.' said Mr. Micawber, slightingly. "'Mr. Wickfield is, I dare say, a man of very excellent intentions, but he is—in short, he is obsolete.' "'I'm afraid his partner seeks to make him so,' said I. "'My dear Copperfield,' returned Mr. Micawber, after some uneasy evolutions on his stool, "'allow me to offer a remark. I am here in a capacity of confidence. I am here in a position of trust.' The discussion of some topics, even with Mrs. Micawber herself, so long the partner of my various vicissitudes and a woman of a remarkable lucidity of intellect, is, I am led to consider, incompatible with the functions now devolving on me. I would therefore take the liberty of suggesting that in our friendly intercourse, which I trust will never be disturbed, we draw a line. On one side of this line, said Mr. Micawber, representing it on the desk with the office ruler, is the whole range of the human intellect, with a trifling exception. On the other is that exception, that is to say, the affairs of Messrs. Wickfield and Heap, with all belonging and appertaining thereunto. I uh, trust I give no offence to the companion of my youth in submitting this proposition to his cooler judgment. Though I saw an uneasy change in Mr. Micawber, which sat tightly on him, as if his new duties were a misfit, I felt I had no right to be offended. My telling him so appeared to relieve him, and he shook hands with me. "'I am charmed, Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber. "'Let me assure you, with Miss Wickfield, she is a very superior young lady of very remarkable attractions, graces, and virtues.' "'Upon my honour," said Mr. Micawber, indefinitely kissing his hand and bowing with his genteelest air, "'I do homage to Miss Whitfield.' <laughs> "'I am glad of that, at least,' said I. "'If you had not assured us, my dear Copfield, on the occasion of that agreeable afternoon we had the happiness of passing with you, that D was your favourite letter,' said Mr. Micawber, "'I should unquestionably have supposed that A had been so.' "'We have all some experience of a feeling that comes over us occasionally, of what we are saying and doing having been said and done before, in a remote time, of our having been surrounded, dim years ago, by the same faces, objects, and circumstances, of our knowing perfectly what will be said next, as if we suddenly remembered it. I never had this mysterious impression more strongly in my life than before he uttered those words. I took my leave of Mr. Micawber, for the time, charging him with my best remembrances to all at home. As I left him, resuming his stool and his pen, and rolling his head in his stock, to get it into easier writing order, I clearly perceived that there was something interposed between him and me, since he had come into his new functions, which prevented our getting at each other as we used to do, and quite altered the character of our intercourse. There was no one in the quaint old drawing-room, though it presented tokens of Mrs. Heap's whereabouts. I looked into the room still belonging to Agnes, and saw her sitting by the fire at a pretty old-fashioned desk she had, writing. My darkening the light made her look up. What a pleasure to be the cause of that bright change in her attentive face, and the object of that sweet regard and welcome. "'Ah, oh, Agnes,' said I, when we were sitting together side by side, "'I have missed you so much lately.' "'Indeed,' she replied, "'again, and so soon.' I shook my head. "'I don't know how it is, Agnes. I seem to want some faculty of mind that I ought to have.' 
you were so much in the habit of thinking for me in the happy old days here, and I came so naturally to you for your counsel and support that I really think I have missed acquiring it. "'And what is it?' said Agnes cheerfully. "'I don't know what to call it,' I replied. "'I think I am earnest and persevering.' "'I am sure of it,' said Agnes. "'And patient, Agnes?' I inquired, with a little hesitation. "'Yes,' returned Agnes, laughing. "'Pretty well.' "'And yet,' said I, "'I get so miserable and worried, and am so unsteady and irresolute in my power of assuring myself, that I know I must want, shall I call it, reliance of some kind?' "'Call it so, if you will,' said Agnes. "'Well,' I returned, "'see here, you come to London, I rely on you, and I have an object and a course at once. I am driven out of it. I come here, and in a moment I feel an altered person. The circumstances that distress me are not changed since I came into this room, but an influence comes over me in that short interval that alters me. Oh, how much for the better! What is it? What is your secret, Agnes?' Her head was bent down, looking at the fire. "'It's the old story,' said I. "'Don't laugh when I say it was always the same in little things as it is in greater things. My old troubles were nonsense, and now they are serious. But whenever I have gone away from my adopted sister—' Agnes looked up with such a heavenly face, and gave me her hand, which I kissed. "'Whenever I have not had you, Agnes, to advise and approve in the beginning, I have seemed to go wild and to get into all sorts of difficulty. When I have come to you, at last, as I has always done, I have come to peace and happiness. I come home now like a tired traveller, and find such a blessed sense of rest." I felt so deeply what I said, it affected me so sincerely, that my voice failed, and I covered my face with my hand, and broke into tears. I write the truth. Whatever contradictions and inconsistencies there were within me, as there are within so many of us, whatever might have been so different and so much better, whatever I had done in which I had perversely wandered away from the voice of my own heart, I knew nothing of. I only knew that I was fervently in earnest, when I felt the rest and peace of having Agnes near me. In her placid, sisterly manner, with her beaming eyes, with her tender voice, and with that sweet composure which had long ago made the house that held her quite a sacred place to me, she soon won from me this weakness, and led me on to tell all that had happened since our last meeting. "'And there is not another word to tell, Agnes,' said I, when I had made an end of my confidence. "'Now, my reliance is on you.' "'But it must not be on me, Trotwood.' returned Agnes, with a pleasant smile. "'It must be on someone else.' "'On Dora,' said I. "'Assuredly.' "'Why, I have not mentioned, Agnes,' said I, a little embarrassed, "'that Dora is rather difficult to—I would not for the world say to rely upon, because she is the soul of purity and truth, but rather difficult to—I hardly know how to express it, really, Agnes. She is a timid little thing, and easily disturbed and frightened.' some time ago before her father's death, when I thought it right to mention to her, but I'll tell you, if you will bear with me, how it was. Accordingly, I told Agnes about my declaration of poverty, about the cookery book, the housekeeping accounts, and all the rest of it. Oh, Trotwood, she remonstrated with a smile, just your old headlong way. You might have been in earnest in striving to get on in the world, without being so very sudden with a timid, loving, inexperienced girl. Poor Dora! I never heard such sweet, forbearing kindness expressed in a voice as she expressed in making this reply. It was as if I had seen her admiringly and tenderly embracing Dora, and tacitly reproving me by her considerate protection for my hot haste in fluttering that little heart. It was as if I had seen Dora in all her fascinating artlessness, caressing Agnes, and thanking her, and coaxingly appealing against me, and loving me with all her childish innocence. I felt so grateful to Agnes, and admired her so, I saw those two together, in a bright perspective, such well-associated friends, each adorning the other so much. "'What ought I to do, then, Agnes?' I inquired, after looking at the fire a little while. What would it be right to do? 
"'I think,' said Agnes, "'that the honourable course to take would be to write to those two ladies. "'Don't you think that any secret course is an unworthy one?' "'Yes, if you think so,' said I. "'I am poorly qualified to judge of such matters,' replied Agnes, with a modest hesitation. "'But I certainly feel—in short, I feel that your being secret and clandestine is not being like yourself.' "'Like myself, in the too high opinion you have of me, Agnes, I am afraid,' said I. "'Like yourself in the candour of your nature,' she returned, "'and therefore I would write to those two ladies. "'I would relate as plainly and as openly as possible all that has taken place.' and I might ask their permission to visit sometimes at their house. Considering that you are young and striving for a place in life, I think it would be well to say that you would readily abide by any conditions they might impose upon you. I would entreat them not to dismiss your request without a reference to Dora, and to discuss it with her when they should think the time suitable. I would not be too vehement, said Agnes gently, or propose too much. I would trust to my fidelity and perseverance, and to Dora. "'But if they were to frighten Dora again, Agnes, by speaking to her,' said I, and, "'and if Dora were to cry and say nothing about me—' "'Is that likely?' inquired Agnes, with the same sweet consideration in her face. "'God bless her, she is as easily scared as a bird,' said I. "'It might be. Or if the two Miss Spenlows, elderly ladies of that sort, are odd characters sometimes, should not be likely persons to address in that way.' "'I don't think, Trotwood,' returned Agnes, raising her soft eyes to mine, "'I would consider that. "'Perhaps it would be better only to consider whether it is right to do this, "'and if it is, to do it.' "'I had no longer any doubt on the subject. "'With a lightened heart, though with a profound sense of the weighty importance of my task, "'I devoted the whole afternoon to the composition of the draft of this letter.' for which great purpose Agnes relinquished her desk to me. But first I went downstairs to see Mr. Wickfield and Uriah Heap. I found Uriah in possession of a new plaster-smelling office, built out in the garden, looking extraordinarily mean, in the midst of a quantity of books and papers. He received me in his usual fawning way, and pretended not to have heard of my arrival from Mr. Micawber, a pretence I took the liberty of disbelieving. He accompanied me into Mr. Wickfield's room, which was the shadow of its former self, having been divested of a variety of conveniences for the accommodation of the new partner, and stood before the fire, warming his back and shaving his chin with his bony hand, while Mr. Wickfield and I exchanged greetings. Uh, "'You stay with the Strotwood while you remain in Canterbury?' said Mr. Wickfield, not without a glance at Uriah for his approval. "'Is there room for me?' said I. "'I'm sure, Master Gopfield, I should say, Mr. But the other comes so natural,' said Uriah. "'I would turn out of your old room with pleasure, if it would be agreeable.' "'No, no,' said Mr. Wickfield. "'Why should you be inconvenienced? There's another room, there's another room.' "'Oh, but you know,' returned Uriah with a grin, "'I should really be delighted.' To cut the matter short, I said I would have the other room or none at all. So it was settled that I should have the other room, and taking my leave of the firm until dinner, I went upstairs again. I had hoped to have no other companion than Agnes, but Mrs. Heap had asked permission to bring herself and her knitting near the fire in that room, on pretence of its having an aspect more favourable for her rheumatics, as the wind then was, than the drawing-room or dining-parlour. Though I could almost have consigned her to the mercies of the wind on the topmost pinnacle of the cathedral without remorse, I made a virtue of necessity, and gave her a friendly salutation. "'I'm humbly thankful to you, sir,' said Mrs. Heap, in acknowledgment of my inquiries concerning her health. "'But I'm only pretty well. I haven't much to boast of. If I could see my Uriah well settled in life, I couldn't expect much more, I think. How do you think my Uri looking, sir?' I thought him looking as villainous as ever, and I replied that I saw no change in him. "'Oh, don't you think he's changed?' said Mrs. Heap. "'There I must humbly beg leave to differ from you. "'Don't you see a thinness in him?' "'Not more than usual,' I replied. "'Don't you, though?' said Mrs. Heap. "'But you don't take notice of him with a mother's eye.' His mother's eye was an evil eye to the rest of the world, I thought, as it met mine, 
howsoever affectionate to him, and I believe she and her son were devoted to one another. It passed me, and went on to Agnes. "'Don't you see a wasting and a wearing in him, Miss Wickfield?' inquired Mrs. Heap. "'No,' said Agnes, quietly pursuing the work on which she was engaged. "'You are too solicitous about him. He is very well.' Mrs. Heap, with a prodigious sniff, resumed her knitting. She never left off, or left us, for a moment. I had arrived early in the day, and we had still three or four hours before dinner, but she sat there, plying her knitting needles as monotonously as an hourglass might have poured out its sands. She sat on one side of the fire, I sat at the desk in front of it, a little beyond me on the other side sat Agnes. Whensoever, slowly pondering over my letter, I lifted up my eyes, and meeting the thoughtful face of Agnes, saw its clear and beam encouragement upon me with its own angelic expression, I was conscious presently of the evil eye passing me and going on to her, and coming back to me again, and dropping furtively upon the knitting. What the knitting was I don't know, not being learned in that art, but it looked like a net, and as she worked away with those Chinese chopsticks of knitting needles, she showed in the firelight like an ill-looking enchantress, balked as yet by the radiant goodness opposite, but getting ready for a cast of her net by and by. At dinner she maintained her watch with the same unwinking eyes. After dinner her son took his turn, and when Mr. Wickfield himself and I were left alone together, leered at me and writhed until I could hardly bear it. In the drawing-room there was the mother knitting and watching again. All the time that Agnes sang and played, the mother sat at the piano. Once she asked for a particular ballad, which she said her Yori, who was yawning in a great chair, doted on, and at intervals she looked round at him and reported to Agnes that he was in raptures with the music but she hardly ever spoke. I question if she ever did, without making some mention of him. It was evident to me that this was the duty assigned to her. This lasted until bedtime. To have seen the mother and son like two great bats hanging over the whole house, and darkening it with their ugly forms, may be so uncomfortable that I would rather have remained downstairs knitting and all than gone to bed. I hardly got any sleep. Next day the knitting and watching began again, and lasted all day. I had not had an opportunity of speaking to Agnes for ten minutes. I could barely show her my letter. I proposed to her to walk out with me. But Mrs. Heap repeatedly complaining that she was worse, Agnes charitably remained within to bear her company. Towards the twilight I went out by myself, musing on what I ought to do, and whether I was justified in withholding from Agnes any longer what Uriah Heap had told me in London, for that began to trouble me again very much. I had not walked out far enough to be quite clear of the town upon the Ramsgate Road, where there was a good path, when I was hailed through the dust by somebody behind me. The shambling figure and the scanty greatcoat were not to be mistaken. I stopped, and Uriah Heap caught up. "'Well,' said I, "'How fast you walk!' said he. "'My legs are pretty long, but you've given him quite a job.' "'Where are you going?' said I. "'I'm going with you, Master Copperfield, "'if you'll allow me the pleasure of a walk with an old acquaintance.' Saying this, with a jerk of his body, which might have been either propitiatory or derisive, he fell into step beside me. "'Uriah,' said I, as civilly as I could, after a silence. "'Master Copperfield,' said Uriah. Uh, "'To tell you the truth, at which you will not be offended, I came out to walk alone, because I have had so much company.' He looked at me sideways, and said with his hardest grin, "'You mean mother?' "'Why, yes, I do,' said I. "'Ah, but you know we are so very humble,' he returned, "'and having such a knowledge of our own humbleness, we must really take care that we are not pushed to the wall by them as isn't humble. All stratagems are fair in love, sir.' Raising his great hands until they touched his chin, he rubbed them softly, and softly chuckled, looking as like a malevolent baboon, I thought, as anything human could look. "'You see,' he said, still hugging himself in that unpleasant way, and shaking his head at me, "'you're quite a dangerous rival, Master Copperfield. You always was, you know. "'Do you set a watch upon Miss Wickfield, and make her home no home because of me?' 
said I. "'Oh, Master Copperfield, those are very harsh words.' "'Put my meaning into any words you like,' said I. "'You know what it is, your ire, as well as I do.' "'Oh, no, you must put it into words,' he said. "'Oh, really, I couldn't myself.' "'Do you suppose,' said I, constraining myself to be very temperate and quiet with him, on account of Agnes, "'that I regard Miss Wickfield otherwise than as a very dear sister?' "'Well, Master Copperfield,' he replied, "'you perceive I am not bound to answer that question. "'You may not, you know, but then, you see, you may.' "'Anything to equal the low cunning of his visage "'and of his shadowless eyes without the ghost of an eyelash, "'I never saw.' "'Come, then,' said I, "'for the sake of Miss Wickfield, "'My Agnes,' he exclaimed, "'with a sickly, angular contortion of himself, "'would you be so good as to call her Agnes, Master Copperfield?' "'For the sake of Agnes Wickfield, heaven bless her.' "'Thank you for that blessing, Master Copperfield,' he interposed. "'I will tell you what I should, under any other circumstances, "'have sooner thought of telling to Jack Ketch.' "'To who, sir?' said Uriah, stretching out his neck and shading his ear with his hand. "'To the hangman,' I returned. "'The most unlikely person I could think of.' "'Though his own face had suggested the illusion quite as a natural sequence.' "'I am engaged to another young lady. I hope that contents you.' "'Upon your soul!' said Uriah. I was about indignantly to give my assertion the confirmation he required, when he caught hold of my hand and gave it a squeeze. "'Oh, Master Copperfield,' he said, "'if you had only had the condescension to return my confidence when I poured out the fullness of my art, the night I put you so much out of the way by sleeping before your sitting-room fire, I never should have doubted you.' "'As it is, I'm sure I'll take off Mother directly, and only too happy. "'I know you'll excuse the precautions of affection, won't you? "'What a pity, Master Copperfield, that you didn't condescend to return my confidence. "'I'm sure I gave you every opportunity. "'But you never have condescended to me as much as I could have wished. "'I know you have never liked me, as I have liked you.' "'All this time he was squeezing my hand with his damp, fishy fingers.' while I made every effort I decently could to get it away. But I was quite unsuccessful. He drew it under the sleeve of his mulberry-coloured greatcoat, and I walked on, almost upon compulsion, arm in arm with him. "'Shall we turn?' said Uriah, by and by wheeling me about to, towards the town, on which the early moon was now shining, silvering the distant windows. Uh, "'Before we leave the subject, you ought to understand,' said I, "'making a pretty long silence, "'that I believe Agnes Wickfield to be as far above you "'and as far removed from all your aspirations "'as that moon herself.' "'Peaceful, ain't she?' said Uriah. "'Very. Uh, "'Now confess, Master Copperfield, "'that you haven't liked me quite as I have liked you. "'All along you've thought me too humble now, I shouldn't wonder.' "'I am not fond of professions of humility,' I returned, "'or professions of anything else.' "'There, now,' said Uriah, "'looking flabby and lead-coloured in the moonlight. "'Didn't I know it? "'But how little you think of the rightful humbleness "'of a person in my station, Master Copperfield? "'Father and me was both brought up at a foundation school for boys, "'and Mother, she was likewise brought up at a public sort of charitable establishment. "'They taught us all a deal of humbleness, "'not much else that I know of from morning to night. "'We was to be humble to this person and humble to that, "'and to pull off our caps here, and to make bows there, "'and always to know our place, and abase ourselves before our betters. "'And we had such a lot of betters. "'Father got the monitor medal by being humble, and so did I. "'Father got made a sexton by being humble. "'He had the character among the gentlefolks of being such a well-behaved man "'that they were determined to bring him in. "'Be humble, Uriah,' says Father to me, "'and you'll get on.' "'It was what was always been dinned into you and me at school. "'It's what goes down best. "'Be humble,' says Father, "'and you'll do. "'And really, it ain't done bad.' "'It was the first time it had ever occurred to me "'that this detestable cant of false humility "'might have originated out of the Heap family. "'I had seen the harvest, but had never thought of the seed. "'When I was quite a young boy,' says Uriah, "'I got to know what humbleness did,' "'and I took to it. "'I ate humble pie with an appetite. "'I stopped at the humble point of my learning, and says I, "'Old art! "'When you offered to teach me Latin, I knew better. 
people like to be above you, says father, keep yourself down. I am very humble to the present moment, Master Copperfield, but I've got a little power. And he said all this, I knew, as I saw his face in the moonlight, that I might understand he was resolved to recompense himself by using his power. I had never doubted his meanness, his craft, and malice. But I fully comprehended now, for the first time, what a base, unrelenting, and revengeful spirit must have been engendered by this early and this long suppression. His account of himself was so far attended with an agreeable result that it led to his withdrawing his hand in order that he might have another hug of himself under the chin. Once apart from him, I was determined to keep apart, and we walked back side by side, saying very little more by the way. Whether his spirits were elevated by the communication I had made to him, or by his having indulged in this retrospect, I don't know, but they were raised by some influence. He talked more at dinner than was usual for him, asked his mother, off duty from the moment of our re-entering the house, whether he was not growing too old for a bachelor, and once looked at Agnes so, that I would have given all I had for leave to knock him down. When we three males were left alone after dinner, he got into a more adventurous state. He had taken little or no wine, and I presume it was the mere insolence of triumph that was upon him, flushed, perhaps, by the temptation my presence furnished to his exhibition. I had observed yesterday that he tried to entice Mr. Wickfield to drink, and interpreting the look which Agnes had given me as she went out, had limited myself to one glass, and then proposed that we should follow her. I would have done so again to-day, but Uriah was too quick for me. "'We seldom see our present visitor, sir,' he said, addressing Mr. Wickfield, sitting, such a contrast to him, at the end of the table, "'and I should propose to give him welcome in another glass or two of wine, if you have no objections. Mr. Copperfield, your health and happiness!' I was obliged to make a show of taking the hand he stretched across to me, and then, with very different emotions, I took the hand of the broken gentleman, his partner. "'Come, fellow partner,' said Uriah, "'if I may take the liberty. Now suppose you give us something or another appropriate to Copperfield.' I passed over Mr. Wickfield's proposing my aunt, his proposing Mr. Dick, his proposing Doctor's Commons, his proposing Uriah, his drinking everything twice, his consciousness of his own weakness, the ineffectual effort that he made against it, the struggle between his shame in Uriah's deportment and his desire to conciliate him, the manifest exultation with which Uriah twisted and turned and held him up before me. It may be sick at heart to see, and my hand recoils from writing it. "'Come, fellow partner,' said Uriah at last, "'I'll give you another one, and I humbly ask for bumpers, seeing I intend to make it the divinest of her sex.' Her father had his empty glass in his hand. I saw him set it down, look at the picture she was so like, put his hand to his forehead, and shrink back in his elbow-chair. "'I am an humble individual to give you her health,' proceeded Uriah. "'But I am uh, adore her.' No physical pain that her father's grey head could have borne, I think, could have been more terrible to me than the mental endurance I saw compressed now within both his hands. "'Agnes,' said Uriah, either not regarding him or not knowing what the nature of his action was, "'Agnes Wickfield is, I am safe to say, the divinest of her sex. May I speak out among friends? To be her father is a proud distinction, but to be her husband—' "'Spare me from ever again hearing such a cry as that with which her father rose up from the table.' "'What's the matter?' asked Uriah turning of a deadly colour. "'You are not gone mad after all, Mr. Wickfield, I hope. If I say I am ambition to make your Agnes my Agnes, I have as good a right to do it as any other man. I have a better right to it than any other man.' I had my arms round Mr. Wickfield, imploring him by everything that I could think of, oftenest of all by his love for Agnes, to calm himself a little. He was mad for the moment, tearing out his hair, beating his head, trying to force me from him, and to force himself from him, not answering a word, not looking at or seeing any one, blindly striving, for he knew not what, his face all staring and distorted, a frightful spectacle. 
I conjured him incoherently, but in the most impassioned manner, not to abandon himself to this wildness, but to hear me. I besought him to think of Agnes, to connect me with Agnes, to recollect how Agnes and I had grown up together, how I honoured her and loved her, how she was his pride and joy. I tried to bring her idea before me in any form. I even reproached him with her not having firmness to spare her the knowledge of such a scene as this. I may have effected something, or his wildness may have spent itself. But by degrees he struggled less, and began to look at me, strangely at first, then with recognition in his eyes. At length he said, "'I know, Trotwood, my darling child and you, I know, but look at him!' He pointed to Uriah, pale and glowering in a corner, evidently very much out in his calculations, and taken by surprise. "'Look at my torture,' he replied. "'Before him I have step by step abandoned name and reputation, peace and quiet house and home.' "'I have kept your name and reputation for you, and your peace and quiet, and your house and home, too,' said Uriah, with a sulky, hurried, defeated air of compromise. "'Don't be foolish, Mr. Wickfield. If I have gone a little beyond what you were prepared for, I can go back, I suppose. There's no harm done.' "'I looked for single motives in every one,' said Mr. Wickfield, "'and I was satisfied I have bound him to me by motives of interest. But see what he is, oh, see what he is!' "'You'd better stop him, Copperfield, if you can,' cried Uriah, with his long forefinger pointing towards me. "'He'll say something presently, mind you. He'll be sorry to have said afterwards, and you'll be sorry to have heard.' "'I'll say anything,' cried Mr. Wickfield, with a desperate air. "'Why should I not be in all the world's power if I am in yours?' "'Mind, I tell you,' said Uriah, continuing to warn me, "'if you don't stop his mouth, you're not his friend.' "'Why shouldn't you be in all the world's power, Mr. Wickfield? "'Because you've got a daughter. "'You me know what we know, don't we? "'Let sleeping dogs lie. "'Who wants to rouse them? "'I don't. "'Can't you see I am as humble as I can be? "'I tell you, if I've gone too far, I'm sorry. "'What would you have, sir?' "'Oh, Trotwood, Trotwood!' exclaimed Mr. Wickfield, wringing his hands. "'What have I come down to be since I first saw you in this house?' I was on my downward way then, but the dreary, dreary road I have traversed since. Weak indulgence has ruined me. Indulgence in remembrance, and indulgence in forgetfulness. My natural grief for my child's mother turned to disease. My natural love for my child turned to disease. I have infected everything I touched. I have brought misery on what I dearly love. I know. You know. I thought it possible that I could truly love one creature in the world, and not love the rest. I thought it possible that I could truly mourn for one creature gone out of the world, and not have some part in the grief of all who mourned. Thus the lessons of my life have been perverted. I have preyed on my own morbid, coward heart, and it has preyed on me. Sordid in my grief, sordid in my love, sordid in my miserable escape from the darker side of both. Oh, see the ruin I am, and hate me, shun me! He dropped into a chair, and weakly sobbed. The excitement with which he had been roused was leaving him. Uriah came out of his corner. "'I don't know all I have done in my fatuity,' said Mr. Wickfield, putting out his hands as if to deprecate my condemnation. "'He knows best,' meaning Uriah Heep, "'for he has always been at my elbow, whispering me. "'You see the millstone that he is about my neck. "'You find him in my house, you find him in my business.' You heard him but a little time ago. What need have I to say more? You haven't need to say so much, nor half so much, nor anything at all, observed Uriah, half defiant and half fawning. You wouldn't have took it up so, if it hadn't been for the wine. You'll think better of it to-morrow, sir. If I have said too much, or more than I meant, what of it? I haven't stood by it. The door opened, and Agnes, gliding in without a vestige of colour in her face, put her arm round his neck, and steadily said, "'Papa, you are not well. Come with me.' He laid his head upon her shoulder, as if he were oppressed with heavy shame, and went out with her. Her eyes met mine for but an instant, yet I saw how much she knew of what had passed. "'I didn't expect he cut up so rough, Master Copperfield,' said Uriah. "'But it's nothing. I'll be friends with him to-morrow. 
It's for his good. I'm humbly anxious for his good. I gave him no answer, and went upstairs into the quiet room where Agnes had so often sat beside me at my books. Nobody came near me until late at night. I took up a book and tried to read. I heard the clocks strike twelve, and was still reading without knowing what I read, when Agnes touched me. "'You'll be going early in the morning, Trotwood. Let us say good-bye, now.' She had been weeping, but her face then was so calm and beautiful. "'Heaven bless you,' she said, giving me her hand. "'Dearest Agnes,' I returned, "'I see you asked me not to speak of to-night, but is there nothing to be done?' "'There is God to trust in,' she replied. "'Can I do nothing, I, who come to you with my poor sorrows?' "'And make mine so much lighter,' she replied. "'Dear Trotwood, no.' "'Dear Agnes,' I said, "'it is presumptuous for me, who am so poor in all which in which you are so rich, goodness, resolution, all noble qualities, to doubt or direct you, but you know how much I love you and how much I owe you.' "'You will never sacrifice yourself to a mistaken sense of duty, Agnes?' "'More agitated for a moment than I have ever seen her, "'she took her hands from me and moved a step back. "'Say you have no such thought, dear Agnes, much more than sister. "'Think of the priceless gift of such a heart as yours, "'of such a love as yours.' "'Oh, long, long afterwards, "'I saw that face rise up before me with its momentary look, not wondering, not accusing, not regretting. Oh, long, long afterwards I saw that look subside, as it did now, into the lovely smile with which she told me she had no fear for herself, I need have none for her, and parted from me by the name of brother, and was gone. It was dark in the morning when I got upon the coach at the inn door. The day was just breaking when we were about to start, and then— as I sat thinking of her, came struggling up the coach-side through the mingled day and night, Uriah's head. "'Copperfield!' said he, in a croaking whisper, as he hung by the iron on the roof. "'I thought you'd be glad to hear, before you went off, that there are no squares broke between us. I've been into his room already, and we've made it all smooth. Why, though I'm humble, I'm useful to him, you know, and he understands his interest when he isn't in liquor.' "'What an agreeable man he is, after all, Master Copperfield!' I obliged myself to say that I was glad he had made his apology. "'Oh, to be sure,' said Uriah. "'When a person's humble, you know, what's an apology? "'So easy,' I say. "'I suppose,' with a jerk, "'you have sometimes plucked a pear before it was ripe, Master Copperfield?' "'I suppose I have,' I replied. "'I did that last night,' said Uriah. "'But it'll ripen yet.' "'It only wants attending to. I can wait.' Profuse in his farewells, he got down again as the coachman got up. For anything I know, he was eating something to keep the raw morning air out. But he made motions with his mouth, as if the pear were ripe already, and he was smacking his lips over it. End of chapter 39 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 40 of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vivian Bush. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 40 The Wanderer. We had a very serious conversation in Buckingham Street that night about the domestic occurrences I have detailed in the last chapter. My aunt was deeply interested in them, and walked up and down the room with her arms folded for more than two hours afterwards. Whenever she was particularly discomposed, she always performed one of these pedestrian feats, and the amount of her discomposure might always be estimated by the duration of her walk. On this occasion she was so much disturbed in mind as to find it necessary to open the bedroom door and make a course for herself, comprising the full extent of the bedrooms from wall to wall and while Mr. Dick and I sat quietly by the fire, she kept passing in and out, along this measured track, at an unchanging pace with the regularity of a clock pendulum. 
When my aunt and I were left to ourselves by Mr. Dick's going out to bed, I sat down to write my letter to the two old ladies. By that time she was tired of walking, and sat by the fire with her dress tucked up as usual. But instead of sitting in her usual manner, holding her glass upon her knee, she suffered it to stand neglected on the chimney-piece, and resting her left elbow on her right arm, and her chin on her left hand, looked thoughtfully at me. As often as I raised my eyes from what I was about, I met hers. "'I am in the lovingest of tempers, my dear,' she would assure me with a nod, "'but I am fidgeted and sorry.' I had been too busy to observe, until after she was gone to bed, that she had left her night-mixture, as she always called it, untasted on the chimney-piece. She came to her door, with even more than her usual affection of manner, when I knocked to acquaint her with this discovery, but only said, I have not the heart to take it, Trot, to-night, and shook her head, and went in again. She read my letter to the two old ladies, in the morning, and approved of it. I posted it, and had nothing to do then but wait, as patiently as I could, for the reply. I was still in the state of expectation, and had been for nearly a week, when I left the doctor's one snowy night, to walk home. It had been a bitter day, and a cutting northeast wind had blown for some time. The wind had gone down with the light, and so the snow had come on. It was a heavy, settled fall, I recollect, in great flakes, and it lay thick. The noise of wheels and tread of people were as hushed, as if the streets had been strewn that depth with feathers. My shortest way home, and I naturally took the shortest way on such a night, was through St. Martin's Lane. Now the church which gives its name to the lane stood in a less free situation at that time, there being no open space before it, and the lane winding down to the strand. As I passed the steps of the portico, I encountered at the corner a woman's face. It looked in mine, passed across the narrow lane, and disappeared. I knew it. I had seen it somewhere, but I could not remember where. I had some association with it that struck upon my heart directly, but I was thinking of anything else when it came upon me, and was confused. On the steps of the church there was the stooping figure of a man who had put down some burden on the smooth snow to adjust it. My seeing the face and my seeing him were simultaneous. I don't think I had stopped at my surprise, but in any case, as I went on, he rose, turned, and came down towards me. I stood face to face with Mr. Peggotty. Then I remembered the woman. It was Martha, to whom Emily had given the money that night in the kitchen. Martha Indle, side by side with whom he would not have seen his dear niece, Ham had told me, for all the treasures wrecked in the sea. We shook hands heartily. At first neither of us could speak a word. "'Master Davy,' he said, gripping me tight, "'it do my art good to see you, sir. Well met, well met.' "'Well met, my dear old friend,' said I. "'I had my thoughts o coming to make incoration for you, sir, to-night,' he said, "'but knowing as your aunt was living along with you, for I've been down yonder, Yarmouth way, I was afeard it was too late. I should have come early in the morning, sir, afore going away.' again said i yes sir he replied patiently shaking his head i'm away to-morrow where were you going now i asked well he replied shaking the snow out of his long hair i was a-going to turn in somewheres in those days there was a side entrance to the stable-yard of the golden cross the inn so memorable to me in connection with his misfortune nearly opposite to where we stood i pointed out the gateway put my arm through his and we went across Two or three public rooms opened out of the stable-yard, and looking into one of them, and finding it empty, and a good fire burning, I took him in there. When I saw him in the light, I observed not only that his hair was long and ragged, but that his face was burnt dark by the sun. He was grayer, the lines in his face and forehead were deeper, and he had every appearance of having toiled and wandered through all varieties of weather but he looked very strong, and like a man upheld by steadfastness of purpose, whom nothing could tire out. He shook the snow from his hat and clothes, and brushed it away from his face, while I was inwardly making these remarks. As he sat down opposite to me at a table, with his back to the door by which we had entered, he put out his rough hand again, and grasped mine warmly. "'I'll tell you, Master Davy,' he said, "'where all I've been, and what all we've heard. I've been fur, and we've heard little.' but I'll tell you. I rang the bell for something hot to drink. 
he would have nothing stronger than ale, and while it was being brought, and being warmed at the fire, he sat thinking. There was a fine massive gravity in his face that I did not venture to disturb. When she was a child, he said, lifting up his head soon after we were left alone, she used to talk to me a deal about the sea, and about them coasts where the sea got to be dark blue, and to lay a-shining and a-shining in the sun. I thought, odd times, as her father being drowned made her think on it so much. I don't know, you see, but maybe she believed, or hoped, he had drifted out to them parts, where the flowers is always a-blowing, and the country bright. It is likely to have been a childish fancy, I replied. When she was lost, said Mr. Peggotty, I knowed in my mind as he would take her to them countries. I knowed in my mind as he'd have told her wonders of em, and how as she was to be a lady there, and how he got her to listen to him first, along a such like. When we see his mother, I knowed quite well as I was right. I went across channel to France, and landed there, as if I fell down from the sky. I saw the door move, and the snow drift in. I saw it move a little more, and a hand softly interposed to keep it open. I found out an English gentleman, as was an authority, said Mr. Peggotty, and told him I was a-going to seek my niece. He got me them papers as I wanted for to carry me through. I don't rightly know what, how they're called. And he would have given me money, but that I was thankful to have no need on. I thank him kind for all he done, I'm sure. I've wrote afore you, he said to me, and I shall speak it to many as will come that way, and many will know you, fur distant from here, when you're a-travelling alone. I told him as best as I was able what my gratitude was, and went away through France. Alone, and on foot, said I. Mostly afoot, he rejoined, sometimes in carts along with people going to market, sometimes in empty coaches, many mile a day afoot, and often with some poor soldier or another, travelling to see his friends. I couldn't talk to him, said Mr. Peggotty, nor he to me, but we was company for one another, too, along the dusty roads. I should have known that by his friendly tone. When I come to any town, he pursued, I found the inn, and waited about the yard till someone turned up, someone mostly did, as knowed English. Then I told how that I was on my way to seek my niece, and they told me what manner of gentlefolks was in the house, and I waited to see any as seemed like her, going in or out. When it warn't Emily, I went on again. By little and little, when I come to a new village or that, among the poor people, I found they knowed about me. They would set me down at their cottage doors, and give me what not for to eat and drink, and show me where to sleep. And many a woman, Master Davy, as had a daughter of about Emily's age, I found a waitin' for me at our Saviour's cross outside the village, for to do me similar kindnesses. Some as had daughters as was dead, and God only knows how good them mothers was to me. It was Martha at the door. I saw her haggard, listening face distinctly. My dread was lest he should turn his head and see her too. They would often put their children particular the little girls, said Mr. Peggotty, upon my knee, and many a time you might have seen me sitting at their doors when night was coming in, almost as if they had been my darling's children. Oh, my darling! Overpowered by sudden grief, he sobbed aloud. I laid my trembling hand upon the hand he put before his face. Thank you, sir, he said. Don't take no notice. In a very little while he took his hand away and put it on his breast, and went on with his story. They often walked with me, he said, in the morning, maybe a mile or two upon my road, and when we parted, I said, I'm very thankful to you, God bless you. They always seemed to understand, and answered pleasant. At last I come to the sea. It weren't hard, you may suppose, for a seafaring man like me to work his way over to Italy. When I got there, I wandered on as I had done afore. The people were just as good to me, and I should have gone from town to town, maybe the country through but that I got news of her being seen among them Swiss mountains yonder. One as knowed his servants see him there, all three, and told me how they travelled, and where they was. I made for them mountains, Master Davy, day and night. Ever so fur as I went, ever so fur the mountains seemed to shift away from me. But I come up with them, and I crossed them. When I got nigh the place as I'd been told of, I began to think within my own self, what shall I do when I see her? The listening face, insensible to the inclement night, still drooped at the door, 
and the hands begged me, prayed me, not to cast it forth. "'I never doubted her,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'No, not a bit. Only let her see my face. Only let her hear my voice. Only let my standing still afore her bring to her thoughts the home she had fled from, and the child she had been, and if she had growed to be a royal lady, she'd have fell down at my feet. I knowed it well. Many a time in my sleep I had heard her cry out, Uncle, and seen her fall like death afore me. Many a time in my sleep had I raised her up and whispered to her, Emily, my dear, I am come for to bring forgiveness and to take you home. He stopped and shook his head, and went on with a sigh. He was not to me now. Emily was all. I bought a country dress to put upon her, and I know that once found she would walk beside me over them stony roads, go where I would, and never, never leave me more, to put that dress upon her and to cast off what she wore, to take her on my arm again and wander towards home, to stop sometimes upon the road and heal her bruised feet and her worst bruised heart was all that I thought of now, and I don't believe I should have done so much as look at him. But, Master Davy, it weren't to be. Not yet. I was too late, and they was gone. Where, I couldn't learn. Some said here, some said there. I travelled here, and I travelled there, but I found no Emily, and I travelled home. How long ago, I asked. A matter of four days, said Mr. Peggotty. I sighted the old boat out o' dark and the light a-shinin' in the winder. When I come nigh and looked in through the glass, I see the faithful creature Mrs. Gummidge sittin' by the fire, as we had fixed upon, alone. I called out, Don't be afeard, it's Dan'l. And I went in. I never could have thought the old boat would have been so strange. From some pocket in his breast he took out, with a very careful hand, a small paper bundle containing two or three letters, or little packets, which he laid upon the table. This first one come, he said, selecting it from the rest, afore I'd been gone a week, a fifty-pound bank-note, and a sheet of paper directed to me, and put underneath the door in the night. She tried to hide her writing, but she couldn't hide it from me. He folded up the note again, with great patience and care, in exactly the same form, and laid it on one side. This come to Mrs. Gummidge, he said, opening another, two or three months ago. After looking at it for some moments, he gave it to me, and added in a low voice, "'Be so good as to read it, sir.' I read as follows. "'Oh, what will you feel when you see this writing, and know it comes from my wicked hand? But try, try, not for my sake, but for uncle's goodness, try to let your heart soften to me, only for a little, little time. Try, pray do, to relent towards a miserable girl, and write down on a bit of paper whether he is well, and what he said about me before you left off ever naming me among yourselves, and whether of a night, when it is my old time of coming home, you ever see him look as if he thought of one he used to love so dear. Oh, my heart is breaking when I think about it. I am kneeling down to you, begging and praying you not to be as hard with me as I deserve, as I well, well know I deserve, but to be so gentle and so good as to write down something of him, and send it to me. You need not call me little, you need not call me by the name I have disgraced. But, oh, listen to my agony, and have mercy on me, so far as to write me some word of uncle, never, never to be seen in this world by my eyes again. Dear, if your heart is hard towards me, justly hard, I know. But listen, if it is hard, dear, ask him I have wronged the most, him whose wife I was to have been, before you quite decide against my poor, poor prayer. If he should be so compassionate as to say that you might write something for me to read, I think he would, oh, I think he would, if you'd only ask him, for he always was so brave and so forgiving. Tell him then, but not else, that when I hear the wind blowing at night, I feel as if it was passing angrily from seeing him and uncle, and was going up to God against me. Tell him that if I was to die to-morrow, and oh, if I was fit, I would be so glad to die. I would bless him and uncle with my last words, and pray for his happy home with my last breath. Some money was enclosed in this letter also. Five pounds. It was untouched like the previous sum, and he refolded it in the same way. Detailed instructions were added relative to the address of a reply, which although they betrayed the intervention of several hands, and made it difficult to arrive at any very probable conclusion in reference to her place of concealment, 
made it at least not unlikely that she had written from that spot where she was stated to have been seen. "'What answer was sent?' I inquired of Mr. Peggotty. "'Mrs. Gummidge,' he returned, "'not being a good scholar, sir, Ham kindly drawed it out, and she made a copy on it. They told her I was gone to seek her, and what my parting words was. "'Is that another letter in your hand?' said I. "'It's money, sir,' said Mr. Peggotty, unfolding it a little way. Ten pound, you see, and wrote inside, from a true friend, like the first. But the first was put under the door, and this come by the post, day afore yesterday. I'm a-going to seek her at the postmark. He showed it to me. It was a town on the Upper Rhine. He had found out at Yarmouth some foreign dealers who knew that country, and they had drawn him a rude map on paper, which he could very well understand. He laid it between us on the table, and with his chin resting on one hand, tracked his course upon it with the other. I asked him how Ham was. He shook his head. He works, he said, as bold as a man can. His name's as good, in all that part, as any man's is, anywhere's in the world. Anyone's hand is ready to help him, you understand, and his is ready to help them. He's never been heard for to complain, but my sister's belief is, twixt ourselves, as it has cut him deep. Poor fellow, I can believe it. He ain't no care, Master Davy, said Mr. Peggotty in a solemn whisper. Kinder no care no how for his life. When a man's wanted for rough service and rough weather, he's there. When there's hard duty to be done with danger in it, he steps forward afore all his mates. And yet he's as gentle as any child. There ain't a child in Yarmouth that don't know him. He gathered up the letters thoughtfully, smoothing them with his hand, put them into their little bundle, and placed it tenderly in his breast again. The face was gone from the door. I still saw the snow drifting in, but nothing else was there. Well, he said, looking to his bag, having seen you to-night, Master Davy, and that doos me good, I shall away betimes to-morrow morning. You have seen what I've got here, putting his hand on where the little packet lay. All that troubles me is to think that any harm might come to me afore that money was give back. If I was to die, and it was lost, or stole, or elseways made away with, and it was never knowed by him but what I took it, I believe the other world wouldn't hold me. I believe I must come back. He rose, and I rose too. We grasped each other by the hand again, before going out. I'd go ten thousand mile, he said. I'd go till I drop dead, to lay that money down afore him. If I do that, and find my Emily, I'm content. If I don't find her, maybe she'll come to hear some time, as her loving uncle only ended his search for her when he ended his life. And if I know her, even that will turn her home at last. As he went out into the rigorous night, I saw the lonely figure flit away before us. I turned him hastily on some pretense, and held him in conversation until it was gone. He spoke of a traveller's house on the Dover Road, where he knew he could find a clean, plain lodging for the night. I went with him over Westminster Bridge, and parted from him on the Surrey shore. Everything seemed, in my imagination, to be hushed in reverence for him, as he resumed his solitary journey through the snow. I returned to the inn-yard, and, impressed by my remembrance of the face, looked awfully around for it. It was not there. The snow had covered our late footprints. My new track was the only one to be seen, and even that began to die away, it snowed so fast, as I looked back over my shoulder. End of chapter 40 Recording by Vivian Bush, Houston, Texas, October 4, 2007